Hey guys, what's up? It's your boy Doom Wad World here. Today we're going to be playing a classic. It's called The Sky May Be. It's on the infamous Wads list. Uh, let's just get right into it. And uh, as always, remember to like and subscribe. Uh, wait a minute, what does it say? Attention. You are now entering Doug the Eagle's personal psychosis. A uh, shell gun is provided for your comfort. There are six rules which all must obey. Shit, okay. Let's take a look at these. Rule one, do not attempt to type up or cheat in any way. Okay, well, I never do that, so... On pain of expulsion. Right. Rule two. Always obey the warning signs. <laughs> Alright. Sounds good to me, man. Rule three. If you are new to the blessed engine, press F1. Oh shit, okay. That's just the controls. I know the controls, dude. Don't worry. Rule 4. Read A Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge. Alright, let's go ahead and do that real quick. Uh, let me find the book here. Uh, turn off the game audio. A Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge. Prologue. How to explain, how to describe, even the omniscient viewpoint quails. A singleton star reddish and dim, a ragtag of asteroids in a single planet, more like a moon. In this era, the star hung near the galactic plane, just beyond the beyond. The structures on the surface were gone from normal view, pulverized into regolith across a span of eons. The treasure was far underground, beneath a network of passages, in a single room filled with black, Information at the quantum density, undamaged. Maybe five billion years had passed since the archive was lost to the nets. The curse of the mummy's tomb, a comic image from mankind's own prehistory, lost before time. They had laughed when they said it, laughed with joy at the treasure, and determined to be cautious just the same. They would live here a year or five, the little company from Straum, the archaeologist programmers, their families and schools. A year or five would be enough to hand-make the protocols, to skim the top and identify the treasure's origin in time and space, to learn a secret or two that would make the Stramuli realm rich. And when they were done, they would sell the location, perhaps build a network link, but chancier that, this was beyond the beyond. Who knew what power might grab what they'd found? So now there was a tiny settlement on the surface, and they called it the High Lab. It was really just humans playing with an old library. It should be safe, using their own automation, clean and benign. This library wasn't a living creature, or even possessed of automation, which here might have mean something more, far more, than human. They would look and pick and choose, and be careful not to be burned. Humans starting fires and playing with the flames. The archive informed the automation. Data structures were built. Recipes followed. A local network was built, faster than anything on Strom, but surely safe. Nodes were added, modified by other re recipes. The archive was a friendly place, with hierarchies of translation keys that led them along. Strom itself would be famous for this. Six months passed. A year. The Omniscient View. Not self-aware, really. Self-awareness is much overrated. Most automation works far better as part of a whole, and even if human-powerful, it does not need to self-know. But the local net at the high lab had transcended, almost without the humans realizing. The processes that circulated through its nodes were complex, beyond anything that could live on the computers the humans had brought. Those feeble devices were now simply front ends to the devices the recipes suggested. The processes had the potential for self-awareness, and occasionally the need. We should not be talking like this? Talking at all. The link between them was a thread, barely more than the narrowness that connects one human to another. But it was one way to escape the overness of the local net, and it forced separate consciousness upon them. 
They drifted from node to node, looked out from cameras mounted on the landing field. An armed frigate and an empty container vessel were all that sat there. It had been six months since resupply. A safety precaution early suggested by the archive, a ruse to enable the trap. Flitting, flitting. We are wildlife that must not be noticed by the overness, by the power that soon will be. On some nodes they shrank to smallness and almost remembered humanity, became echoes. Poor humans, they will all die. Poor us, we will not. I think they suspect. Sjana and Arnie, anyway. Once upon a time there were copies of those two. Once upon a time just weeks ago when the archaeologists st started the ego-level programs. Of course they suspect, but what can they do? It's an old evil they've wakened. Till it's ready, it will feed them lies on every camera, in every message from home. Thought ceased for a moment as a shadow passed across the nodes they used. The overness was already greater than anything human, greater than anything humans could imagine. Even its shadow was something more than human, a god trolling for nuisance wildlife. Then the ghosts were back, looking out upon the schoolyard underground. So confident the humans, a little village they had made here. Still, thought the hopeful one, the one who had always looked for the craziest outs, we should not be. The evil should long ago have found us. The evil is young, barely three days old. Still, we exist. It proves something. The humans found more than a great evil in this archive. Perhaps they found two. Or an antidote. Whatever else, the overness was missing some things and misinterpreting others. While we exist, when we exist, we should do what we can. The ghost spread itself across a dozen workstations and showed its companion a view down the old, an old tunnel, far from human artifacts. For five billion years it had been abandoned, airless, lightless. Two humans stood in the dark here, helmets touching. See? Sjana and Arnie conspire. So can we. The other didn't answer in words. Glumness. So the humans conspired, hiding in darkness they thought unwatched. But everything they said was surely tattled back to the overness, if only by the dust at their feet. I know, I know. Yet you and I exist, and that should be impossible too. Perhaps altogether, we can make a greater impossibility come true. Perhaps we can hurt the evil newly born here. A wish and a decision. The two misted their consciousness across the local net, faded to the faintest color of awareness, and eventually there was a plan, a deception. Worthless unless they could separately get word to the outside. Was there still time for that? Days passed. For the evil that was uh, growing in the new machines, each hour was longer than all the time before. Now the newborn was less than an hour from its great flowering, its safe spread across interstellar spaces. The local humans could be dispensed with soon. Even now they were an inconvenience, though an amusing one. Some of them actually thought to escape. For days, they had been packing their children away into cold sleep and putting them aboard the freighter. Preparations for departure was how they described the move, move in their planner programs. For days, they had been refitting the frigate behind a mask of transparent lies. Some of the humans understood that what they had wakened could be the end of them, that it might be the end of their stramuli realm. There was precedent for such disasters, stories of races that had played with fire and been burned for it. None of them guessed the truth. None of them guessed the honor that had fallen upon them, that they had changed the future of a thousand million star systems. The hours came to minutes, the minutes to seconds, and now each second was as long as all the time before. The flowering was so close now, so close. The dominion of five billion years before would be regained, and this time held. Only one thing was missing, and that was something quite unconnected with the human schemes. In the archive, deep in the recipes, there should have been a little bit more. In billions of years, something could be lost. The newborn felt all its powers of before, in potential. Yet, there should be something more. Something it had learned in its fall, or something left by its enemies, if there ever were such. Long seconds probing the archives. There were gaps, checksums damaged. Some of the damage was age. Outside, the container ship and the frigate lifted from the landing field, rising on silent agraves above the plains of grey on grey, of ruins five billion years old. Almost half of the humans were aboard those craft, their escape attempt so carefully concealed. The effort had been humored till now. It was not quite time for the flowering, and the humans were still of some use. 
below the level of supreme consciousness, its paranoid inclinations rampage through the human's databases, checking just to be sure, just to be sure. The human's oldest local network used light-speed connections. Thousands of microseconds were spent wasted, bouncing around it, sorting the trivia, finally spotting one incredible item. Inventory. Quantum data container. Quantity 1. Loaded to the frigate 100 hours before. And all the newborn's attention turned upon the fleeing vessels. Microbes, but suddenly pernicious. How could this happen? A million schedules were suddenly advanced. An orderly flowing was out of the question now, and so there was no more need for the humans left in the lab. The change was small for all its cosmic significance. For the humans remaining aground, a moment of horror, staring at their displays, realizing that all their fears were true, not realizing how much worse than true. Five seconds, ten seconds, more change than ten thousand years of a human civilization. A billion trillion cons constructions, mold curling out from every wall, rebuilding what had been merely superhuman. This was as powerful as a proper flowering, though not quite so finely tuned. And never lose sight of the reason for haste, the frigate. It had s switched to rocket drive, blasting heedless away from the wallowing freighter. Somehow, these microbes knew that they were rescuing more than themselves. The warship had been the best navigation computers that the minds could, their little minds could make. But it would be another three seconds before it could make its first ultra-drive hop. The new power had no weapons on the ground, nothing but a comm laser. That could not even melt steel at the frigate's range. No matter, the laser was aimed, turned civilly on the retreating warship's receiver. No acknowledgement. The humans knew what communication would bring. The laser light flickered here and there, and there across the hull, lighting smoothness and inactive sensors, sliding across the ship's ultra-drive sp spines, searching, probing. The power had never bothered to sabotage the external hull, but that was no problem. Even this crude machine had thousands of robot sensors scattered across its surface, reporting status and danger, driving utility programs. Most were shut down now, the ship fleeing nearly blind. They thought by not looking they could be safe. One more second and the frigate would attain interstellar safety. The laser flickered on a failure sensor, a sensor that reported critical changes in one of the ultra-drive spines. Its interrupts could not be ignored if the star jump were to succeed. Interrupt honored. Interrupt handler running, looking out, receiving more light from the laser far below. A back door into the ship's code, installed when the newborn had subverted the human's ground-side equipment. And the power was aboard, with milliseconds to spare. Its agents, not even human equivalent on this primitive hardware, raced through the ship's automation, shutting down, aborting. There would be no jump. Cameras in the ship's bridge showed widening of eyes, the beginning of a scream. The humans knew, to the extent that horror can live in the fraction of a second. There would be no jump, yet the ultra-drive was already committed. There would be a jump attempt, without automatic control of a doom one. Less than five milliseconds till the jump discharge, a mechanical cascade that no software could finesse. The newborn's agents f flitted everywhere across the ship's computers, futile, fu futilely, futilely attempting a shutdown. Nearly a light second away, under the gray rubble of the, at the high lab, the power could only watch. So, the frigate would be destroyed. So slow and so fast, a fraction of a second. The fire spread out from the heart of the frigate, taking both peril and possibility. Two hundred thousand kilometers away, the clumsy container vessel made its own ultra-drive jump and vanished from sight. The newborn scarcely noticed, so a few humans had escaped. The universe was welcome to them. In the seconds that followed, the newborn felt emotions? Things more and less than a human might feel. Try emotions. Elation. The newborn knew that now it would survive. Horror how close it had come to dying once more. Frustration, perhaps the strongest, the closest to its mere human echo. Something of significance had died with the frigate, something from this archive. Memories were dredged from this context, reconstructed. What was lost might have been the newborn, might have made the newborn still more powerful, but more likely was deadly poison. After all, this power had lived once before, then been reduced to nothing. What was lost might have been the reason, suspicion. The newborn should not have been so fooled, not by mere humans. The newborn convulsed into a self-inspection self and panic. 
Yes, there were blind spots, carefully installed from the beginning, and not by the humans. Two had been born here, itself, and the poison, the reason for its fall of old. The newborn inspected itself as never before, knowing now just what to seek. Destroying, purifying, rechecking, searching for copies of the poison, and destroying again. Relief. Defeat had been so close, but now... Minutes and hours passed, the enormous stretch of time necessary for physical construction, communication systems, transportation. The new power's mood drifted, calmed. A human might call the feeling triumph, anticipation. Simple hunger might be more accurate. What more is needed when there are no enemies? The newborn looked across the stars, planning. This time, things will be different. Part 1. Chapter 1. The cold sleep it itself was dreamless. Three days ago, they had been getting ready to leave, and now they were here. Little Jeffrey complained about missing all the action, but Joanna Olzendot was glad she'd been asleep. She had known more, or she had known some of the grown-ups on the other ship. Now Joanna drifted between the racks of sleepers. Waste heat from the coolers made the darkness infernally hot. Scabby gray mold grew on the walls. The cold sleep boxes were tightly packed, with narrow float spaces every tenth row. There were places where only Jeffrey could reach. Three hundred and nine children lay there. All the kids except herself and her brother Jeffrey. The sleep boxes were light-duty hospital models. Given proper ventilation and maintenance, they would have been good for a hundred years, but Johanna wiped her face and looked at a box's readout. Like most of the ones on the inside rows, this was in bad shape. <laughs> <laughs> for twenty days, it had kept the boy inside safely suspended, and would probably kill him again if he stayed one day more. The box's cooling vents were clean, but she vacked them again. More a prayer for good luck than effective maintenance. Mother and Dad were not to blame, though Joanna suspected that they blamed themselves. The escape had been put together with the materials at hand, and at the last minute, when the experiment turned wicked. The high lab staff had done what they could to save their children and protect against still greater disaster. And even so, things might have worked out if... Joanna! Daddy says there's no more time. He says to finish what you're doing and come up here. Jeffrey had stuck his head down through the hatch to shout to her. Okay. She shouldn't be down here anyway. There was nothing more she could do to help her friends. Temmie and Gisk and Magda and, oh, please be safe. Joanna pulled herself through the floatway. Almost bumped into Jeffrey coming in from the other direction. He grabbed her hand and hung close as they drifted towards the hatch. These last two days he hadn't cried, but he'd lost much of the independence of the last year. Now his eyes were wide. We're coming down near the North Pole, by all those islands and ice. In the cabin beyond the hatch, their parents were strapping themselves in. Trader Arn Olsendot uh, looked up at her and grinned. Hi, kiddo. Have a seat. We'll be on the ground in less than an hour. Joanna smiled back, almost caught by his enthusiasm. Ignored the jumble of equipment, the odors of twenty days' confinement. Daddy looked as dashing as any adventure poster. The light from the display windows glittered off the seams of his pressure suit. He was just in from outside. Jeffrey pushed across the cabin, pulling Joanna behind him. He strapped into the webbing between her and their mother. Siana Olzendot checked his restraints, then Joanna's. This will be interesting, Jeffrey. You will learn something. Yes, all about ice. He was holding Mom's hand now. Mom smiled. Not today. I'm talking about the landing. Uh, this won't be like an agrav or a ballistic. The agrav was dead. Dad had just detached their shell from the cargo container. They could never have landed the whole thing on one torch. Dad did something with the hodgepodge of controls he had softwired to his data set. Their bodies settled into the webbing. Around them the cargo shell creaked, and the girder support for the sleep boxes groaned and popped. Something rattled and banged as it fell the length of the shell. Joanna guessed they were pulling about one gravity. Jeffrey's gaze went from about from the outside display to his mother's face, and then back. What is it like, then? He sounded curious. But there was a little tremor in his voice. Joanna almost smiled. Jeffrey knew he was being diverted, and was trying to play along. This will be pure rocket descent, powered almost all the way. See on the middle window? The camera is looking straight down. You can actually see what we're slowing that we're slowing down. You could, too. Joanna guessed they weren't more than a couple of hundred kilometers up. Arna Olsendot was using the rocket 
glued to the back end of the cargo shell to kill all of their orbital velocity. There weren't any other options. They had abandoned the cargo container, with its agrav and ultra drive. It had brought them far, but its control automation was failing. Some hundreds of kilometers behind them, it coasted dead along their orbit. All they had left was the cargo shell. No wings, no agrav, no aero shielding. The shell was a hundred ton carton of eggs, balanced on one hot torch. Mom wasn't describing it that way to Jeffrey, though what she said was the truth. Somehow she had Jeffrey seeming to forget the danger. Sjana Olsendat had been a popular archaeologist at the Straumi realm before they moved to the high lab. Dad cut the jet, and they were in freefall again. Joanna felt a wave of nausea. Ordinarily, she never got space sick, but this was different. The image of land and sea in the downward window slowly grew. There were only a few scattered clouds. The coastline was an indefinite recursion of islands and straits and inlets. Dark green spread along the coast and up the valleys, shading to black and gray in the mountains. There was snow, and probably Jeffrey's ice, scattered in arcs and patches. It was also beautiful, and they were falling straight into it. She heard a metallic banging on the cargo shell as the trim jets tri tipped the, their craft around, aligning the main jet downwards. The right-hand window showed the ground now. The torch lit again, at something like one gravity. The edge of the display darkened in a burnt-out halo. Wow, said Geoffrey. It's like an elevator, down and down and down and... One hundred kilometers down, slow enough that aero forces wouldn't tear them apart. Shana Olsen dot was right. It was a novel way to descend from orbit, not a preferred method under any normal circumstances. It was certainly not intended in the original ex escape plans. They were to meet with the High Lab's frigate, and the adults who could escape from the High Lab. And of course, the rendezvous was to be in space, an easy transfer. But the frigate was gone now, and they were on their own. Her eyes turned unwillingly to the stretch of hull beyond her parents. There was the familiar discoloration. It looked like gray fungus, growing out of the clean hull ceramic. Her parents didn't talk about it much even now, except to shoo Jeffrey away from it. But Joanna had overheard them once, when they thought she and her brother were at the far end of the shell. Dad's voice almost crying with anger. All this for nothing, he said softly. We made a monster and ran, and now we're lost at the bottom. And Mom's voice even softer. For the thousandth time, Arn, not for nothing. We have the kids. She waved at the roughness that spread across the wall, and given the dreams, the directions we had, I think this was the best we could hope for. Somehow, we were carrying the answer to all the evil we started. Then Geoffrey had bounced loudly across the hold, proclaiming his imminent entrance, and his parents had shut up. Joanna hadn't quite, the cur quite, hadn't quite had the courage to ask them about it. There had been strange things at the high lab, and towards the end, some quietly scary things, even people who were not quite the same. Minutes passed. They were deep in the atmosphere now. The hole buzzed with the force of the airstream, or turbulence from the jet, but things were steady enough that Geoffrey was beginning to get restless. Much of the down-looking view was burned out by air glow around the torch. The rest was clearer and more detailed than anything they had seen from orbit. Joanna wondered how often a new visited world had been landed upon with less reconnaissance than this. They had no telescopic cameras and no ferrets. Physically, the planet was near the human ideal. Wonderful good luck after all the bad. It was heaven compared to the airless rocks of the system that had been the prime rendezvous. On the other hand, there was intelligent life here. From orbit, they could see roads and towns. But there was no evidence of technic civilization. There was no sign of aircraft or radio or intense power sources. They were coming down in a thinly populated corner of the continent. With luck, there would be no one to see their landing among the green valleys and the black and white peaks, and Arnie Olsendot could fly the torch right to the ground without fear of hurting much more than a forest and grass. The coastal island slid past the side camera's view. Geoffrey shouted, pointing. It was gone now, but she had seen it too. On one of the islands in a regular polygon of walls and shadow, it reminded her of castles from the age of princesses princesses on Nioria, Ni, Nijora? She could see individual trees now, their shadows long in slanting sunlight. The roar of the to torch was as loud as anything she had ever heard. They were deep in atmosphere, and they weren't moving away from the sound. Things get tricky, Dad shouted, and no programs to make things right. Where to, love? Mom looked back and forth between the display windows. As far as Joanna knew, they couldn't move the cameras or assign new ones. That hill, above the timberline, but... 
think I saw a pack of animals running away from the blast on West Side. Yeah, shouted Geoffrey. Wolves. Joanna had only a quick glimpse of moving specks. They were in full hover now, maybe a thousand meters above the hilltops. The noise was painful, unending. Further talk was impossible. They drifted slowly across landscape, partly to reconnoiter, partly to stay out of the plume of superheated air that rose about, about them. The land was more rolling than craggy, and the grass looked mossy. Still, Arn Olsen thought hesitated. The main torch was designed for velocity matching after ma velocity matching after interstellar jumps. They could hang like this for a good while. But when they did touch down, they'd better have it right. She'd heard her parents talking that one over, when Geoffrey was working with the cold sleep boxes and out of earshot. If there was too much water in the soil, the backsplash would be a steam cannon, punching right through the shell. Landing in trees would have, would have some dubious pulses, uh, maybe giving them a little cushioning and a standoff from the splash. But now they were going for direct contact. At least they could see where they were landing. 300 meters. Dad, drag, Dad dragged the torch tip through the ground cover. The soft landscape exploded. A second later, their boat rocked in the column of steam. The down-looking camera died. They didn't back off, and after a moment, the battering eased. The torch had burned through whatever water table or permafrost lay below them. The cabin air grew steadily hotter. Olsen Dot brought them slowly down through it, using the side cameras and the sound of the backsplash as his guide. He cut, his, he cut the torch. There was a scary half-second fall, then the sound of the rendezvous pylons hitting ground. They steadied, then one side groaned, giving way a little. Silence, except for heat pinging around the hole. Dad looked at their ad hoc pressure gauge. He grinned at Mom. No breach. I bet we could even take this baby up again. Chapter 2 An hour's difference either way, and Peregrine Wick Wickrackram's life would have been very different. The three travelers were headed west, down from the ice fangs towards Flenzer's castle on Hidden Island. Uh, there were in his life... Uh, there were in his life when he couldn't have when he couldn't have borne the company, but in the last decade, Peregrine had become much more sociable. He liked traveling with others nowadays. On his last trek through the Great Sandy, there had been five packs in his party. Part of that had been a matter of safety. Some deaths are almost inevitable when the distance between oases can be a thousand miles, and the oases themselves are transient. But aside from safety, he had learned a lot in conversation with the others. He was not so happy with his current companions. Neither were truly pilgrims. Both had secrets. Scriber Jokaramuffin ja 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 was fun, an amusing goofball and fount of uncoordinated information. Uh, there was also a good chance he was a spy. That was okay, as long as people didn't think Peregrine was working with him. The third of their party was one, the one who really bothered him. Tyrafect was a new newbie. Not altogether yet. She had no taken name. Tyrathect claimed to be a schoolteacher, but somewhere in her, him, gender preference wasn't entirely clear yet, was a killer. The creature was obviously a flinzerist fanatic, standoffish and rigid much of the time. Almost certainly, she was fleeing the purge that followed Flinzer's unsuccessful attempt to take power in the East. He'd run into these two at Eastgate, on the Republican side of the Ice Fangs. They both wanted to visit the castle on Hidden Island, and what the hell, there was only a sixty-mile detour off the main trail to Woodcarvers. They all would have, would have to cross the mountains. Besides, he had wanted to visit Flinzer's domain for years. Maybe one of these two could get him in. So much of the world reviled in the uh, Flenzerists. Peregrine Wickrackram was of two minds about evil. When enough rules get broken, sometimes there is good amid the carnage. This afternoon, they'd finally come in sight of the coastal islands. Peregrine had been here only fifty years before. Even so, he wasn't prepared for the beauty of this land. The northwest coast was by far the mildest arctic in the world. In high summer, with unending day, the bottoms of the glacier-reamed valleys turned all to green. God the Carver had stu stooped to touch these lands, and his chisels had been made of ice. Now all that was left of the ice and snow were misty arcs at the eastern horizon and remnant patches scattered on the near hills. Those patches melted and melted through the summer, starting little creeks that emerged with one another to cascade down the steep sides of the valleys. On his right, Peregrine trotted across a level stretch of ground that was soggy with standing water. 
The chill on his feet felt wonderful. He didn't even mind that midges that the midges that swirled around him. Tyrethect was across the valley, paralleling his course, uh, but above the heather line. She'd been fairly talkative till the valley curved and the farmland and the islands came into view. Somewhere out there was Flenser's castle and her dark appointment. Scriber, <laughs> Scriber Jokaramuthan had been all over, mindlessly running, running about on both sides of the valley. He'd collect in twos or threes and execute some jape that had that made even the dour Tyrethect laugh, then <laughs> climb to a height and report what he saw beyond. He'd been the first to see the coast. That had sobered him some. His clowning was dangerous enough without... <laughs> without doing it in the neighborhood of known rapists. Wick why Wick Wick Rackrum Wick Rackrum called a pause and got himself together to adjust the straps on his backpacks. The rest of the afternoon was going to be tense. He'd have to decide whether he really wanted to enter the castle with his friends. There are limits to an adventurous spirit, even in a pilgrim. Hey, do you hear something, Bass? Uh Tyrethek called from across the valley. Peregrine listened. There was a rumbling, powerful, but almost below his range of hearing. I guess I said bass earlier, sorry. For an instant, fear crossed his puzzlement. A century before, he'd been in a monster earthquake. The sound was familiar, but the ground was still beneath his feet. Would that mean no landslides and flash floods? He hunkered down, looking out in all directions. It's in the sky, Chuck Aramathan was pointing. A spot of glare hung almost overhead with a tiny spear of light. No memories, not even legends, came to Wick Rackram's mind. He spread out, all eyes on the slowly moving light. God's choir. It must be miles up, and he still heard it. He looked away from the light, after images dancing painfully in his eyes. It's getting brighter, louder, said Jakarafamon. Jakaramuffin. I think it's coming down on the hills yonder, on the coast. Peregrine pulled himself together and ran west, shouting to the others. He would get as close as was safe, and watch. He didn't look up again. It was just too bright. It cast shadows in broad daylight. He ran another half mile. The star was still in the air. He couldn't remember a falling star so slow, though some of the biggest made terrible explosions. In fact, those there were no stories from folks who had been near such things. His wild pilgrim curiosity faded before that recollection. He looked in all directions. Tyrefect was nowhere in sight. Jakaramuffin was huddled next to some boulders ahead and the light was so bright that where his clothes did not protect him, Wickwackrum felt a blaze of heat. The noise from the sky was outright pain now. Peregrine dived over the edge of the valley side, rolled and staggered and fell down the steep walls of rock. He was in the shade now. Only sunlight lay upon him. The far side of the valley shone in the glare. Crisp shadows moved with the unseen thing behind him. The noise was still a ba bass rumble, but so loud that it numbed his mind. Peregrine stumbled past the timber line and continued till he was sheltered by a hundred yards of forest. That should have helped a lot, but the noise was had, was been growing still louder. Mercifully, he blacked out for a moment or two. When he came around, the star sound was gone. The ringing it left in his tympano was a great confusion. He staggered about in a daze. It seemed to be raining, except that some of the dropless, droplets glowed. Little fires were starting here and there in the forest. He hid beneath dense crown trees till the burning rock stopped falling. The fires didn't spread. The summer had been relatively wet. Peregrine lay quietly, waiting for more burning rocks or new star noise. Nothing. The wind in, these, in the treetops lessened. He could hear the birds and crickers and wood borers. He walked to the forest edge and peeked out in several places. Discounting the patches of burnt heather, everything looked normal. But his viewpoint was very restricted. He could see high valley walls, a few hilltops. Ha! There was the scriber Jakaramuffin, three hundred yards further up. Most of him was hunkered down in holes and hollows, but he had a couple members looking towards where the star had fallen. Peregrine squinted. Scriber was such a buffoon most of the time, but sometimes it just seemed to cover. It... If he really was a fool, he was one with a streak of genius. More than once, Wiki had seen him at a distance, working in pairs with some strange tool. As now, the other was holding something long and pointed to his eye. Wick Rackrum crept out of the forest, keeping close together and making as little noise as possible. He climbed carefully around the rocks, 
slipping from hummock to heather hummock, till he was just short of the valley crest and some fifty yards from Jokaramuffin. He could hear the other thinking to himself, any closer and Scriber would hear him, even bunched up and quiet as he was. St said Wick Rackrum. <laughs> the buzzing and muttering stopped in an instant of shocked surprise. Jacaramfin stuffed the mysterious seeing tool into a backpack and pulled himself together, thinking very quietly. They stared at each other for a moment, then Scriber made silly squirreling gestures at his shoulder tympana. Listen up. Can you talk like this? His voice came very high-pitched, up where some people can't make voluntary conversation, where low-sound ears, low ears are deaf. High talk could be confusing, but it was very directional and faded quickly with distance. No one else would hear them. Peregrine nodded. High talk is no problem. The trick was to use tones pure enough not to confuse. Take a look over the hill crest, friend Pilgrim. There is something new under the sun. Peregrine moved up another thirty yards, keeping a lookout in all directions. He could see the straits now, gleaming through gleaming rough silver in the afternoon sun sunlight. Behind him, the north side of the valley was lost in shadow. He sent one member ahead, skittering between the hummocks to look down on the plain where the star had landed. God's choir, he thought to himself, but quietly. He brought up another member to get a parallax view. The thing looked like a huge adobe hut mounted on stilts, but this was the fallen star. The ground beneath it glowed dull red. Curtains of mist rose from the moist heather all around. The torn earth had been thrown in long lines that radiated from a spot beneath it. He nodded at Jikaramuffin. Where is Tyrathect? Scriber shrugged. A couple of miles back, I'll bet. I'm keeping an eye out for her. Do you see the others, though? The troopers from Flenser's castle? No! Peregrine looked west from the landing site. There. They were almost a mile away in camouflage jackets, belly crawling across the hummocky terrain. He could see at least three troopers. They were big guys, six each. How could they get here so fast? He glanced at the sun. It can't be more than a half an hour since all this started. Their good luck, Jakaramuffin returned to the crest and looked over. I'll bet they were already on the mainland when the star came down. This is all Flenser territory. They must have patrols. He hunkered down just so, so just two pairs of eyes would be visible to those below. That's an ambush formation, you know. You don't seem very happy to see them. These are your friends, remember? The people you've come to see? Scriber cocked his heads, his heads sarcastically. Yeah, yeah, don't rub it in. I think you've known from the beginning that I'm not all for Flenser. I guessed. Well, the time, well, the game is over now. Whatever came down this afternoon is worth more, too. Uh, my friends, than anything I could have learned on hitting a hidden island. What about Tyrathect? Heh, heh. Our esteemed companion is more than genuine, I fear. I bet she's a Flenser lord, not the low-rank servant she seems at first glance. I expect that many of her kind are leaking back over the mountains these days, happy to get out of the Long Lakes Republic. Hide your behinds, fellow. If she spots us, those troopers will get us sure. Peregrine moved deeper in into the hollows and burrows that pocked the heather. He had an excellent view back along the valley. If Tyrathect were not already on the scene, he'd, seen, he'd see her long before she would him. Peregrine? Yes. You're a pilgrim. You've traveled the world. Since the beginning of time, you've had us believe. How far do your memories really go back? Given the situation, Wickrackrum Wick was inclined to honesty. Like you'd expect, a few hundred years. Then we're talking about legends, recollections of things that probably happened, but with the details all mixed and muddled. Well, I haven't traveled much, and I'm fairly new. But I do read. A lot. There's never been anything like this before. That is, that is a made thing down here. It came from higher than I can measure. You've read, you've read R.M. R.M. Strikwesa or Astrologer Balalele? You know what this could be? Wikwakrum didn't recognize the names, but he was a pilgrim. They were lands so far away that no one spoke any language he knew. In the South Seas, he met folk who thought there was no world beyond their islands and who ran from his boats when he came ashore. Even more, one part of him had been an islander that had watched that coming ashore. He stuck a head into the open and looked again at the fallen star, the visitor from farther than he had ever been, and he wondered where this pilgrimage might end. Chapter 3 
It took five hours for the ground to cool enough for Dad to slide the ladder ramp to ground. He and Joanna climbed carefully down, hopped across the streaming earth to stand on relatively undamaged turf. It would be a long time before this ground cooled completely. This jet, the jet's exhaust was very clean, scarcely interacting with normal matter, all of which meant that some very hot rock extended down thousands of meters beneath their boat. Mom sat in the hatchway, watching the land beyond them. She had Dad's old pistol. Anything? Dad shouted to her. No, and Jeffrey doesn't see anything through the windows. Dad walked around the cargo shell, inspecting the misused docking pylons. Every ten meters they stopped and set up a sound and sound projector. That had been Joanna's idea. Besides Dad's gun, they really had no weapons. The projectors were accidental cargo, stuff from the infirmary. With a little programming, they could put out wild screeching all up and down the audio spectrum. It might be enough to scare off the local animals. Joanna followed her father, her eyes on the landscape, her nervousness giving way to awe. It was so beautiful, so cool. They were standing on a broad field, high in hills. Westward, the hills fell toward straits and islands. To the north, the ground ended abruptly at the edge of a wide valley. She could see waterfalls on the other side. The ground felt spongy beneath her feet. Their landing field was puckered into thousands of little hillocks, like waves caught in a still picture. Snow lay in timid patches across the higher hills. Joanna squinted north into the sun. North? What time is it, Daddy? Olsendot laughed, still looking at the underside of the cargo shell. Local midnight. Joanna had been brought up in the middle latitudes of Strom. Most of her school field trips had been to space, where odd sun geometries were no big deal. Somehow she had never thought of such things happening on the ground. I mean, seeing the sun right over the top of the world. The first order of business was to get half the cold sleep boxes out into the open and rearrange those left aboard. Mom figured that the temperature problems would just about disappear then, even for the boxes left on board. Having separate power supplies and venting will be an advantage now. The kids will all be safe. Joanna, you check it Jeffrey's work on the ones inside, okay? The second order of business would be to start a tracking program on the relay system and to set up an ultralight communication. Joanna was uh, a little afraid of that step. What would they learn? They already knew the high lab had gone wicked and the disaster Mom predicted had begun. How much of the Stromy realm was dead now? Everyone at the high lab had thought that they were doing so much good, and now? Don't think about it. Maybe the relayers could help. Somewhere there must be people who could use what her folks had taken from the lab. They'd be rescued, and the rest of the kids would be revived. She'd been feeling guilty about that. Sure, Mom and Dad needed extra hands right at the end of the flight, and Joanna was one of the oldest children in the school. But it seemed wrong that she and Jeffrey were the only kids going into this with their eyes open. Coming down, she had felt her mother's fear. I bet they wanted us together, even if it was only for one last time. The landing had been truly dangerous. However, easy Dad made it look. Joanna could see where the backsplash had gouged the hole. If any of that had gotten past the torch and into the exhaust chamber, they'd all be vapor now. Almost half the cold sleep boxes were on the ground now, by the east side of the boat. Mom and Dad were spreading them out so the coolers would have no problem. Jeffrey was inside, checking if there were any other boxes that needed attention. He was a good kid, but when he wasn't a brat. She turned into the sunlight, felt the cool breeze flowing across the hill. She heard something that sounded like a bird call. Joanna was out by one of the sound projectors when the ambush happened. She had her data set plugged into its control and was busy giving it new directions. It showed how little they had left, that even her old data set was important now. But Dad wanted something that would sweep through the broadest possible bandwidth, making plenty of racket all the way, but with big spikes every so often. Pink Oliphant could certainly manage that. Joanna, Mom's cry came simultaneous with the sound of breaking ceramic. The projector's bell came shattering down beside her. Joanna looked up. Something ripped through her chest just inside her shoulder, knocking her down. She stared stupidly at the shaft that stuck out of her. An arrow. The west edge of their landing area was swarming with things, like wolves or dogs, but with long necks. They moved quickly forward, darting from hummock to hummock. Their pelts were the same gray-green of the hillside, except near the haunches where, they, where she was saw white and black. No, the green was clothing. Jackets. Joanna was in shock, the pressure of the bolt through her chest not yet registering as pain. She had been thrown back against the up-tilted turf, and for the moment she had a view of the whole attack. 
She saw more arrows rise up, dark lines floating in the sky. She could see the archers now. More dogs. They moved in packs. It took two of them to use a bow, one to hold it and one to draw. The third and fourth carried quivers of arrows and just seemed to watch. The archers hung back, staying mostly under cover. Other packs swirled in from the sides, now leaping over the hummocks. Many carried hatchets in their jaws. Metal tines gleamed on their paws. She heard the snickety of Dad's pistol. The wave of attackers staggered as individuals collapsed. The others continued forward, snarling now. These were sounds of madness, not the barking of dogs. She felt the sounds in her teeth, like blasty music punching from a large speaker. Jaws and claws and knives and noise. She twisted on her side, trying to see the back see back to the boat. Now the pain was real. She screamed, but the sound was lost in the madness. The mob raced around her, heading for mom and dad. Her parents were crouched behind a rendezvous pylon. There was a constant flicker from the pistol in Arnie Olsendot's hand. His pressure suit had protected him from the arrows. The alien bodies were piling high. The pistol, with its smart flechettes, was deadly effective. She saw him hand the pistol to mom and run out from under the boat toward her. Joanna stretched her free arm toward him and cried, screamed for, screaming for him to go back. Thirty meters, twenty-five. Mom's covering fire swept around them, driving the wolves back. A flurry of arrows descended on Olsen Dot as he ran, arms upheld to shield his head. Twenty meters. A wolf jumped high over Joanna. She had a quick glimpse of its short fur and scarred rear end. It raced straight for Dad. Olsen Dot weaved, trying to give his wife a clear shot, but the wolf was too quick. It jinked with him, sprinting across the gap. It leaped, metal glittering on its paws. Joanna saw red splash from Daddy's neck, and then the two of them were down. For a moment, Siana Olsen Dot stopped shooting. That was enough. The mob parted, and a large group ran purposefully towards the boat. They had tanks of some kind on their backs. The lead animal held a, ho held a hose in its mouth. A dark liquid jetted out and vanished in an explosion of fire. The wolf pack played their crude flamethrower across the ground, across the pylon where Siana Olsendot stood, across the ranks of schoolchildren in cold sleep. Joanna saw something moving, twisting in the flames and tarry smoke, saw the light plastic of the cold sleep boxes slump and flow. Joanna turned her face to the earth and then pushed herself up on her good arm and tried to crawl toward the boat, the flames. And then the dark was merciful, and she remembered no more. Chapter 4 Peregrine and Scriber watched the ambush preparations throughout the afternoon. Infantry arrayed on the slope west of the landing site, archers behind them, flame troopers in pounce formation. Did the lords of Flenser's castle understand what they were up against? The two debated the question off and on. Jacaramuffin thought the Flenserists did, that their arrogance was so great that they simply expected to grab the prize. They go for the throat before the other side even knows there's a fight. It's worked before. Peregrine didn't answer immediately. Scriber could be right. It had been fifty years since he had been in this part of the world. Back then, Flenser's cult had been obscure and not that interesting compared to what existed elsewhere. Treachery did sometimes befall travelers, but it was rarer than the stay-at-homes would believe. Most people were friendly and enjoyed hearing about the world beyond, especially if the visitor was not threatening. When treachery did occur, it was most often after an initial sizing up to determine just how powerful the visitors were and what could be gained from their death. Immediate attack, without conversation, was very rare. Usually it meant you had run into villains who were both sophisticated and crazy. I don't know. That is an ambush formation, but maybe the Flenserists will hold it in re reserve and talk first. Hours passed. The sun slid sideways into the north. There was noise from the far side of the fallen star. Crap. They couldn't see anything from here. The hidden troops made no move. The minutes passed, and they got their first view of the visitor from heaven, or part of him anyway. There were four legs per member, but it walked on its rear legs only. What a clown! Yet it used its front paws for holding things. Not once did he use it see a mouth see it see it use a mouth. He doubted if the flat jaws could get a good hold anyway. Those four paws were wonderfully agile. A single member could easily use tools. There were plenty of conversation sounds, even though only three members were visible. After a while, they heard the much higher pitched tones of organized thought. God, the creature was noisy. At this distance the sounds were muffled and distorted. Even so, they were like no mind he had ever heard, nor like the confusion noises that some grazers made. 
Well, hissed Jacaramuffin, I have been all around the world, and this creature is not part of it. Yeah? Well, it reminds me of mantis bugs. You know, about this high, he opened a mouth about two inches wide. Great for keeping your garden free of pests. Great little killers. Ugh. Peregrine hadn't thought of the resemblance. Mantises were cute and harmless, as far as people were concerned. But he knew the females would eat their own mates. Imagine such creatures grown to giant size and possessed of pack mentality. Maybe it was just as well... Maybe it was just was well they couldn't go prancing down to say hello. A half hour passed. As the alien brought its cargo to ground, the Flunzer archers moved closer. The infantry packs arranged themselves in assault wings. A flight of arrows arched across the gap between the Flunzerists and the alien. One of the alien members went down immediately, and its thoughts quieted. The rest moved out of sight beneath the flying house. The troopers dashed forward, spaced in identities preserving formations. Perhaps they meant to take the alien alive. But the assault line crumpled, many yards short of the alien. No arrows, no flames. The troopers just fell. For a moment, Peregrine thought the Flunzerists might have bit off more than they could chew. Then the second wave ran over the first. Members continued to fall, but they were in a killing frenzy now, with only animal discipline left. The assault rolled slowly forward, the rear climbing over the fallen. Another alien member down. Strange, he could still hear the wisps of the other's thought. In tone and tempo, it sounded the same as before the attack. How could anyone be so composed with total death looming? A combat whistle sounded, and the mob parted. A trooper raced through and sprayed liquid fire. The flying house looked like meat on a griddle, flame and smoke coming up all around it. Wick Rackram swore to himself, Goodbye, alien. The wrecked and wounded were low on the Flenserist priority list. Seriously wounded were piled onto Trevoises and pulled far enough away so their cries would not cause confusion. Cleanup squads bullied the trooper fragments away from the flying house. The frags wandered the hummocky meadow. Here and there they coalesced into ad hoc packs. Some drifted among the wounded, ignoring the screams and their need to find themselves. When the tumult was, quiet, was quieted, three packs of white jackets appeared. The servants of the Flenser walked under the flying house. One was out of sight for a long while. Perhaps it even got inside. The charred bodies of two alien members were carefully placed on Travoises, more carefully than the wounded troopers had been, and hauled off. Jacaramuffin skinned the ruins with his eye tool. He had given up trying to hide it from Peregrine. A white jacket carried something down from the flying house. St. There are other dead ones, maybe from the fire. They look like pups. The small figures had the mantis form. They were strapped into Travoises and hauled over, out of sight over the hill's edge. No doubt they had Kerhog drawn carts down there. The Flenser set a sentry ring around the landing site. Dozens of fresh troopers stood on the hillside beyond it. No one was going to sneak past that. So it's total murder, Peregrine sighed. Maybe not. The first member they shot? I don't think it's quite dead. Wick Rackrum squinted his best eyes. Either Scriber was a wishful thinker, or his tool gave him amazingly sharp sight. The first one hit had been on the other side of the craft. The member had stopped thinking, but that wasn't a sure sign of death. There was a white jacket standing around it now. The white jackets put the creature onto a travoy and uh, began pulling it away from the landing site, towards the southwest. Not quite the same path the others had taken. The thing is still alive. It's got an arrow in the chest, but I can see it breathing. Scriber's heads turned towards Wick Rackrum. I think we sh should rescue it. For a moment, Peregrine couldn't think of anything to say. He just gaped at the other. The center of Flenser's worldwide cabal was just a few miles to the northwest. Flenserist power was undisputed for dozens of miles inland, and right now they were virtually surrounded by an army. Scriber wilted a little before Peregrine's astonishment, but it was clear he was not joking. Sure, I know it's risky, but that's what life is all about, right? You're a pilgrim. You understand. <laughs> that was the pilgrim's reputation, all right. But no soul can survive total death, and there were plenty of opportunities for such annihilation on a pilgrimage. Pilgrims do no caution. And yet, and yet, this was one of the... And yet, and yet, this was the most marvelous encounter in all of his centuries of pilgrimage. To know these aliens, to become them, it was a temptation that surpassed all good sense. Look, said Scriber, 
We could just go down and mingle with the wounded. If we can make it across the field, we might get a look at that last alien member, without risking too much. Jacaramuffin was already backing down from his observation point, and circling around to find a path that wouldn't put him in silhouette. Wickrackrum was torn. Uh, uh, part of him got up to follow, and part of him hesitated. Hell, Jacaramuffin had admitted to being a spy. He carried an invention that was probably straight from the Long Lake's sharpest intelligence people. This guy had to be a pro. Peregrine took a quick look around their side of the hill across the valley. No sign of Tyrathect or anyone else. He crawled out of his various hidey holes and followed the spy. As much as possible, they stayed in the deep shadows cast by the northering sun, and slipped from hummock to hummock where there was no shade. Just before they got to the first of the wounded, Scriber said something more, the scariest words of the afternoon. Hey, don't worry. I've read about... I've read all about doing this sort of thing. A mob of frags and wounded is a terrifying, mind-numbing thing. Singletons, duos, trios, a few quads, they wandered aimlessly, keening without control. In most situations, this many people packed together on just a few acres would have been an instant choir. In fact, he did notice some sexual activity and some, un some organized browsing, but for the most part there was still too much pain for normal reactions. Wick Rackrum wondered briefly if, for all their talk of rationalism, the Flinzerists would just leave the wreckage of their troops to reassemble itself. They'd have some strange and crippled repacks if they did. A few yards into the mob and Peregrine Wick Rackrum could feel consciousness slipping from him. If he concentrated really hard, he could remember who he was, and that he must get to the other side of the meadow without attracting attention. Other thoughts, loud and unguarded, pummeled him, bloodlust and slashing. Glittering metal in the alien's hand, the pain in her chest, coughing blood, falling. Boot camp and before, my merge brother was so good to me. Lord Steele said that we are a grand experiment. Running across the heather toward the stick-limbed monster. Leap, tines in paw, slash the monster's throat, blood spouts high. Where am I? May I be part of you, please? Peregrine whirled at that last question. It was pointed and near. A singleton was sniffing at him. He screeched the fragment off and ran into an open space. Up ahead, J Jaka what's his name <laughs> was scarcely better off. There was little chance that they would be spotted here, but he was beginning to wonder if he could make it through. Peregrine was only four, and there were singletons everywhere. On, on his right, a quad was raping, grabbing at whatever duos and singles happened by. Wick and Quick and Rack and Rum tried to remember just why they was here and where they was going. Concentrate on direct sensation. What is really here? The sooty smell of the flamer's liquid fire, the midges swarming everywhere, clotting the puddles of blood all, all black. An awfully long time passed. Minutes. Wick quick rackrum looked ahead. He, looked, he was almost out of it, the south edge of the wreckage. He dragged himself to a patch of clean ground. Parts of him vomited, and he collapsed. Sanity slowly returned. Wick Rackrum looked up, saw Jacaramuffin just inside the mob. Scriber was a big fellow, a sixsome, but he was having at least as bad a time as Peregrine. He staggered from side to side, eyes wide, snapping at himself and others. Well, they had made it a good way across the meadow and fast enough to catch up with the White Jackets who was pulling the last alien member. If they wanted to see anything more, they'd have to figure out how to leave the mob without attracting attention. Hmm. There were plenty of Flenserist uniforms around, without living owners. Peregrine walked two of himself over to where a dead trooper lay. Jacaramuffin, here! The great spy looked in his direction, and a glint of intelligence returned to his eyes. He stumbled out of the mob and sat down a few yards from Wick Rackrum. It was far nearer than would normally be comfortable, but after what they'd been through, it seemed barely close. He lay for a moment, gasping. Sorry. I never guessed it would be like that. I lost a part of me back there. Never thought I'd get her back. Paragon watched the progress of the White Jackets and its travoy. It wasn't going with the others. In a few seconds, it would be out of sight. With a disguise, maybe they could follow and... No, it was just too risky. He was beginning to think like the Great Spy. Peregrine pulled a camouflage jacket off a corpse. They would still need disguises. Maybe they could hang around here through the night and get a closer look at the flying house. After a moment, Scriber saw what he was doing and began gathering jackets for himself. They slunk between the piled bodies, looking for gear that wasn't too stained and that Jacaramuffin had thought had consistent insignia. There were plenty of p paw claws and battle axes around. They'd end up armed to the teeth, but they'd have to dump some of their backpacks. 
One more jacket was all he needed, but his rum was so broad in the shoulders that nothing fit. Peregrine didn't really understand what happened till later. A large fragment, a threesome, was lying doggo in the pile of dead. Perhaps it was grieving, long after its members dying dirge. In any case, it was almost totally thoughtless until Peregrine began pulling the jacket off its dead member. Then, you'll not rob from mine. He heard the buzz of a nearby rage, and then there was a slashing pain across his rum's gut. Peregrine writhed in agony, leaped upon the attacker. For a moment of mindless rage, they fought. Peregrine's battle axes slashed again and again, covering his muzzles with blood. When he came to his senses, one of the three was dead, the others running into the mob of wounded. Wickrackrum huddled around the pain in his rum. The attackers had been wearing tines. Rum was slashed from rib ribs to crotch. Wickrackrum stumbled. Some of his paws were caught in his own guts. He tried to nose the ruins back into his member's abdomen. The pain was fading. The sky in Rum's eyes was slowly darkening. Peregrine stifled the screams he felt climbing within him. I'm only four, and one of me is dying. For years he'd been warning himself that four was just too small a number for a pilgrim. Now he'd pay the price, trapped and mindless in a land of tyrants. For a moment the pain eased and his thoughts were clear. The fight hadn't really caused much notice amid the dirges, rapes, and simple acts of madness. Simple attacks of madness. Wick Rackrum's fight had only been a little bigger and bloodier than usual. The white jackets by the flying house had looked briefly in their direction, but were now back to tearing open the alien cargo. Scriber was sitting nearby, watching in horror. Part of him would move a little closer, then pull back. He was fighting with himself, trying to decide whether to help. Peregrine almost pleaded with him, but the effort was too great. Besides, Scriber was no pilgrim. Giving part of himself was not something Jacaramuffin could do voluntarily. Memories came flooding now. Rum's efforts to sort things out and let the rest of him know all that had been before. For a moment, he was sailing a twin hole across the South Sea, a newbie with Rum as a pop, memories of the island person who had borne Rum, and of Pax before that. Once around the world, they had traveled, surviving the slums of a tropic collective and the War of the Plains herds. Ah, the stories they had heard, the tricks they had learned, the people they had met. Wick Quick Rackrum had been a terrific combination. Clear thinking, light-hearted, with a strange ability to keep all the memories in place. That had been the real reason he had gone so long without growing to five or six. Now he would pay perhaps the greatest price of all. Rum sighed and could not see the sky anymore. Wick Rackrum's mind went, not as it does... In the, battle, in the heat of battle when the sound of thought is lost, not as it does in the companionable murmur of sleep. There was suddenly no fourth presence, just the three, trying to make a person. The trio stood and patted nervously at itself. There was a danger everywhere, but beyond its understanding, it sidled hopefully towards a sixum sitting nearby. Jacaramuffin? But the other shooed it away. It looked nervously at the mob of wounded. There was completeness there, and madness too. A huge male with deeply scarred haunches sat at the edge of the mob. It caught the threesome's eye and slowly crawled across the open space toward them. Wick and Quick and Rack back away, with their their pelts puffing up in fright and fascination. The scarred one was at least a half, at least half again the weight of any of them. Where am I? May I be part of you, please? Its keening carried memories, jumbled and mostly inaccessible, of blood and fighting, of military training before that. Somehow, the creature was as frightened as one of those early memories as of anything. It lay its muzzle, caked with dried blood, on the ground and, and belly crawled toward them. The other three almost ran. Random coupling was something that scared all of them. They backed and backed, out, of the clear, out onto the clear meadow. The other followed, but slowly, still crawling. Quick licked her lips and walked back towards the stranger. She extended her neck and sniffed along the other's throat. Wick and Rack approached from the sides. For an instant there was a partial join. Sweaty, bloody, wounded. A melding made in hell. The thought seemed to come from nowhere, glowed in the fore of a for a moment of cynical humor. Then the unity was lost, and there were just three animals licking the face of a fourth. Peregrine looked around the meadow with new eyes. He had been, he had been disintegrate for just a few minutes. The wounded from the tenth attack infantry were just as before. Flenser's servants were still busy with the alien cargo. Jacaramuffin was slowly backing away, his expression a compound of wonder and horror. 
Peregrine lowered a head and hissed at him. I won't betray you, Scriber. The spy froze. That you, Peregrine? More or less, Peregrine still. But wick whack from no more. H how can you do it? Y you just lost. I'm a pilgrim, remember? We live with this sort of thing all our lives. There was sarcasm in his voice. This was more or less the Plish and the Plish and the Yacht Jacaramuffin had been spouting earlier. I don't know what that means. But there was some truth to it. Already a peregrine wickrack scar felt like a person. Maybe this new combination had a chance. Uck. Well, yes. What should we do now? The spy looked nervously in all directions, but it is eyes on Peregrine and were the most worried of all. Now it was Wickrack wick Scar's turn to be pulled. What was he doing here? Killing the strange enemy? No. That's what the attack infantry was doing. He would have nothing to do with that, no matter what the scarred one's memories. He and Scriber had come here to rescue the alien, as much of it as possible. Peregrine grabbed hold of the memory and held it uncritically. It was something real, from the past identity he must pre preserve. He glanced towards where he had last seen the alien member. The white jackets at, and his travoy were no longer visible, but he'd been heading along an obvious path. We can still get ourselves the live one, he said to Jacaramuffin. Scriber stamped and sidled. He was not quite the enthusiast of before. After you, my friend. Wick Raxgar straightened his combat jackets and brushed some of the dried blood off. Then he strutted off across the meadow, passing just a hundred yards from the Flenser's servants around the enemy, around the flying house. He flipped them a sharp salute, which was ignored. Chikaramuthan followed, carrying two crossbows. Uh, the other was doing his best to imi imitate Peregrine's strut, but he really didn't have the right stuff. Then they were past the military crest of the hill and descending into shadows. The sounds of the wounded were muted. Wick Raxgar broke into double time, looping from switchback to switchback as he descended the rough, rough path. From here he could see the harbor. The boats were still at the piers, and there wasn't much activity. Behind him, Scriber was still talking nervous nonsense. Peregrine just ran faster, his confidence fueled by general newbie confusion. His new member, the scarred one, had been the muscle behind an infantry officer. The pack had known the layout of the harbors in the castle, and all the passwords of the day. Two more switchbacks, and they overran the Flenser servant and his travoy. Hallo! shouted Peregrine. We bring new instructions from Lord Steele. A chill went down his spines at the name, remembering Steele for the first time. The servant dropped the travoy and turned to face them. Wick Raxgar didn't know his name, but he remembered the guy. Fairly high-ranking. An arrogant get of bitches. It was a surprise to see him pulling the travoy himself. Peregrine stopped only twenty yards from the white jackets. Chikaramuffin was looking down from the switchback above. His bows were out of sight. The servant looked nervously at Peregrine and up at Scriber. What do you two want? D did he suspect them already? No matter. Wickraxgar braced himself for a killing charge, and suddenly he was seeing in fours, his mind blurred with newbie dizziness. Now that he needed to kill, the scarred one's horror of the act undid him. Damn. Wickraxgar cast widely, wildly about for something to say. And now that murder was out of his mind, he, his new memories came easily. Lord Steele's will that the creature be brought out with us to the harbor. You, uh, you are to return to the invader's flying thing. The white jackets licked his lips. His eyes swept sharply across Peregrine's uniforms and scribers. Impostors, he screamed, at the same instant lunging one of his members towards the travoy. Metal glinted in the member's forepaw. He's going to kill the alien. There was a bow snap from above, and the runner fell, a shaft through its eye. Wickraxgar charged the others, forcing his scar-backed member out front. There was an instant of dizziness, and then he was whole again, screaming death at the four. The two packs crashed together, Scar carrying a couple of the servants' members over the edge of the path. Arrows hummed around them. Wick quick rack twisted, slashing axes at whatever remained standing. Then things were quiet, and Peregrine had his thoughts again. Three of the servants' members twitched on the path, the earth around them slick with blood. He pushed them off the path, near where his scar had killed the others. Not one of the servants had survived. It was total death, and he was responsible. He sagged to the ground, seeing in fours again. The alien. It's still alive, said Scriber. He was standing around the travoy, sniffing at the mantis-like body. Not conscious, though. He grabbed the travoy poles in his jaws and looked at Peregrine. 
What now, Pilgrim? Peregrine lay in the dirt, trying to put his, mo put his mind back together. What now, indeed? How had he gotten into this mess? Newbie confusion was the only possibility. He'd simply lost track of all the reasons why rescuing the alien was impossible. And now he was stuck with it. Pack crap. Part of them crawled to the edge of the path and looked around. There was no sign that they had attracted attention. In the harbor, the boats were still empty. Most of the infantry was up then in the hills. No doubt the servants were holding the dead ones at the harbor fort. So when would they move them across the straits to Hidden Island? Were they waiting for this one's arrival? Maybe we could grab some boats, escape south, said Scriber. What an ingenious fellow. Didn't he know that there would be sentry lines around the harbor? Even knowing the passwords, they'd be reported as soon as they passed one. It would be a million to one shot. But it had been a flat impossibility before Scar made, became part of him. He studied the creature lying on the travoy, so strange, yet real. And it was more than just the creature, though that was the most spectacular strangeness. Its bloodied clothes were a finer fabric than the pilgrim had ever seen. Tucked in beside the, cre beside the creature's body was a pink pillow with elaborate stitchery. With a twist of perspective, he realized it was alien art, the face of a long-snouted animal embroidered on the pillow. So escape through the harbor was a million to one shot. Some prizes might be worth such odds. We'll go down a little farther, he said. Jacaramuffin pulled the travoy. Wick Scar strode ahead of him, trying to look important and officerly. With Scar along, it wasn't hard. The member was the picture of martial competence. Yet you had to be on the inside to know the softness. They were almost down to sea level. The path was wider now and roughly paved. He knew the harbor fort was above them, hidden by the trees. The sun was well out of the north, rising into the eastern sky. Flowers were everywhere, white and red and violet, their tufts floating thick on the breeze, the arctic plant life taking advantage of its long day of summer. Walking on sun-dappled cobblestones, you might almost forget the ambush on the hilltops. Very soon they'd hit a sentry line. Lines and rings are interesting people. Not great minds, but about the, effect the largest effective pack you'd find outside the tropics. There were stories of lines ten miles long with thousands of members. The largest peregrine had ever seen had less than one hundred. Take a group of ordinary people and train them to string out, not in packs but as individual members. If each member stayed just a few yards from its nearest neighbors, they could maintain something like the mentality of a trio. The group as a whole was scarcely brighter. You can't have much in the way of deep thoughts when it takes seconds for an idea to percolate across your mind. Yet the line had an excellent grasp of what was happening along itself, and if any members were attacked, the entire line would know about it with the speed of sound. Peregrine had, heard, had served on lines before. It was strung out existence. It was a strung out existence, but not nearly as dull as old ordinary sentry duty. It's hard to be bored when you're as stupid as the line. There, a lone member stuck its neck around a tree and challenged them. Wick Rackscar knew the passwords, of course, and they were past the outer line. But that passage and their description was known to the entire line now, and surely to normal soldiers at the harbor fort. Hell, there was no cure for it. He would go ahead with his crazy scheme. He and Scriber and the alien member passed through the two inner sentries. He could smell the sea now. They came out of the trees into the rock-walled harbor. Silver sparkled off the water into a million changing flecks. A large multi-boat bobbed between two piers. Its, ma its masts were like a forest of tilting, leafless trees. Just a mile across the water they could see Hidden Island. Part of him dismissed the sight as commonplace. Part of him stumbled in awe. This was the center of it, the worldwide Flenser movement. Up, those, up in those dour towers, the original Flenser had done his experiments, written his essays, and schemed to rule the world. There were a few people on the piers, most of them doing most were doing maintenance, sewing sails, release, release, relashing twin holes. They watched the travoy with sharp curiosity, but none approached. So all we have to do is amble down to the end of the pier, cut the lashings on an outside twin hole, and take off. There were probably enough packs on the pier alone to prevent that, and their cries would surely draw the troops he saw by the harbor fort. In fact, it was a little surprising that no one up there had taken serious notice of him yet. These boats were cruder than the South Seas version. Part of the difference was superficial. Flenser doctrine forbade idle decoration on boats. Part of it was functional. These crafts were designed for both winter and summer seasons. And for troop hauling. But he was sure he could sail them given the chance. He walked to the end of the pier. Hmm. 
a bit of luck, the bow starboard twin hull. The one right next to him by the pier looked fast and well-provisioned. It was probably a long-range scout. St, something's going on up there. Scriber jerked ahead toward the fort. The troops were closing ranks. A mass salute? Five servants swept by the infantry, and bugles sounded from the fort's towers. Scar had seen things like this, but Peregrine didn't trust the memory. How could... A banner of red and yellow rose over the fort. On the piers, soldiers and boat workers dropped to their bellies. Peregrine dropped and hissed to the other. Get down! What? That's Flenzer's flag. His personal presence banner. That's impossible. Flenzer had been assassinated by the Republic six, ten days earlier. The mob that, that tore him apart had killed dozens of his top supporters at the same time. But it was only the word of the Republican political police that all of Flenzer's bodies had been recovered. Up by the fort, a single pack pranced between the ranks of soldiers in white jackets. Silver and gold glinted on its shoulders. Scriber edged a member... <laughs> Scriber edged a member <laughs> behind a piling and surreptitiously brought out his eye tool. After a moment, Soul's end, its tire effect. She's no more the Flenzer than I am, said Peregrine. They had traveled together from Eastgate all the way across the Ice Fangs. She was obviously a newbie and not well integrated. She had seemed reserved and inner-looking, but there had been rages. Peregrine knew there was a deadly streak in Tyre Effect. Now he guessed whence it came. At least some of Flunzer's members had escaped assassination, and he and Scriber had spent three ten days in its presence. Peregrine shivered. At the fort's gate, the pact called Tyre Effect turned, turned to face the troops and servants. She gestured, and bugles sounded again. The new Peregrine understood that signal, and in calling, he suppressed the urge, the sudden urge to follow the others on the pier as they walked belly low toward the fort, all their eyes upon the master. Scriber looked back at him, and Peregrine nodded. They had needed a miracle, and here was one, provided by the enemy itself. Scriber moved slowly toward the end of the pier, pulling the travoy from shadow to shadow. Still no one looked back, for good reason. Wick Rackscar remembered what happened to those showing disrespect at an incalling. Pull the creature on the bow starboard boat, he said to Jokaramuffin. He leaped off the pier and scattered across the multi-boat. It was great to be back on swaying decks, each member drifting a different direction. He sniffed among the bow catapults, listened to the holes in the creak of lashings. But Scar was no sailor and had no recollection of what, made, what, might, what might be the most important thing. What are you looking for? came Scriber's high-talk hiss. Scuttle knockouts. If they were here, they looked nothing like the South Seas version. Oh, said Scriber, that's easy. These are northern, northern skimmers. There are swing-out panels and a thin hole behind. Two of him dropped from sight for a second, and there was a banging sound. The heads reappeared, shaking water off. He grinned surprised, taken aback by his own success. Why, it's just like in the books, his expression seemed to say. Wick Raxgar found them now. The panels had looked like crew rests, but they were easily pulled out, and the wood behind was easy to break with a battle axe. He kept the head out, looking to see if they were attracting attention, while at the same time he hacked at the knockouts. Peregrine and Scriber worked their way towards the bow ranks, across the bow ranks of the multi-boat. If those foundered, it would take a while to get the twin holes behind them free. Oops. One of the boat workers was looking back this way. Part of the fellow continued up the hillside, part strained to return to the pier. The bugle sounded their imperative once more, and the pack followed the call, but his whining alar alarums were causing other heads to turn. No time for stealth. Peregrine hot-footed it back to the bow starboard twin hole. Scriber was cutting the braid bone fasteners that held the twin hole to, re to the rest of the ship. You have any sailing experience? Peregrine said. Foolish question. Well, I've read about it. Fine, Peregrine shooed him all into the twin hole starboard pod. Keep the aliens safe, hunker down, and be as quiet as you can. He could sail the twin hole by himself, but he'd have to, he'd have to be all over to do it. The fewer confu confusing thought sounds, the better. Peregrine pulled their boat forward from the multi-boat. The scuttling wasn't obvious yet, but he could see the water in the bow holes. Uh, he reversed his pole and used its hook to draw the nearest boat it to into the gap created by their departure. Another five minutes and there'd just be a row of masts sticking out of the water. Five minutes. No way they could make it, if not for Flunzer's incalling. 
Up by the fort, troopers were turning and pointing at the harbor. Yet still they must attend attend on Flenser slash Tyrethect. How long would it be before someone important decided that even an incalling can be overridden? He hoisted canvas. The wind caught the twin hull's sail and they pulled out from the pier. Peregrine danced this way and that. The shrouds grasped tightly in his mouths. Even without rum. Uh, what memories the taste of salt and cordage brought back. He... He could feel where tautness and slack meant that the wind was giving it all it could. The twin holes were sleek and narrow, the mast of ironwood creaking as the wind pulled on the sail. The flenserists were streaming down the hillside now. The archers stopped and a haze of arrows rose. Peregrine jerked on the shrouds, tipping the boat into a left, into a left turn on one hole. Scriber leap, leaped to shield the alien. To starboard ahead of them, the water puckered, but only a couple of shafts struck the boat. Peregrine twisted the shrouds again, and they jigged back in the other direction. Another few seconds, they'd, they'd be out of bow shot. Soldiers raced down to the piers, shrieking as they saw what was left of their ship. The bow ranks were flooded. The whole front of the anchorage was a wreck of sunken boats, and the catapults were in the bow. Peregrine swept his boat back, racing straight south out of the harbor. To starboard, he could see that they were passing the southern tip of Hidden Island. The castle towers hung tall and ominous. He knew that there were heavy catapults there, and some fast boats in the island harbor. A few more minutes and even that wouldn't matter. He was gradually realizing just how nimble their boat was. He should have guessed that they'd put their best in a corner bow position. It was probably used for scouting and overtaking. Jacaramuffin <laughs> was piled up at the stern of his hull, staring across the water at the mainland harbor. Soldiers, workers, white jackets were crowded in a mind-numbing jumble at the ends of the piers. Even from here, you could see the place that was a madhouse of rage and frustration. A silly grin spread across Scriber as he realized they really were going to make it. He clambered onto a rail and jumped into the air to flip a member at their enemies. The obscene gesture nearly cast him overboard, but it was seen. The distant rage brightened for a moment. They were well south of Hidden Island. Even its catapults could not reach them now. The packs on the mainland shore were lost to view. Flenser's personal banner still whipped cheerfully in the morning breeze, a dwindling square of red and yellow against the forest screen. All Peregrine looked at the Narrows, where Whale Island kissed close to the mainland. His scar remembered that the choke point was heavily fortified. Normally that would have been the end of them, but its archers had been withdrawn to participate in the ambush, and its catapults were under repair. So the miracle had happened. They were alive and free, and had the greatest find of all his pilgrimage. He shouted joy so loud that Jacaramuffin Jik Jik cowered and the sound echoed back from the green and snow-patched hills. Chapter 5 Geoffrey Olson Dot had few clear memories of the ambush and saw none of the violence. There had been noises outside and Mom's terrified voice screaming for him to stay inside. There had been lots of smoke. He remembered choking, trying to crawl to the clean air. He blacked out. When he woke, he was strapped to some sort of first-aid cot, with the big dog creatures all around. They looked so funny with their white jackets and braid, he remembered wondering where their owners were. They made the strangest noises, gobbling, buzzing, hissing. Some of it was so high-pitched that he could barely hear it. For while he was on the boat, then on, while he was on a boat, then on a wheeled cart. Before this, he had only seen pictures of castles, but the place they took him was the real thing. Its towers dark and overhanging, its big stone walls sharply angled. They climbed through sh shadowed streets and then went scumpity scumpity beneath the cart's wheels. The long-necked dogs hadn't hurt him, but the straps were awfully tight. He couldn't sit up. He couldn't see to the sides. He asked about his mom and dad and Joanna, and he cried a little. A long snout appeared by his face, the soft noise pu pushing at his soft nose pushing at his cheek. There was a buzzing sound he felt all the way down to his bones. He couldn't tell if the gesture was comfort or threat, but he gasped and tried to stop the tears. It didn't befit a good strommer, anyway. More white-jacketed dogs, ones with silly shoulder patches of gold and silver. His cot was being dragged again, this time down a torch-lit tunnel. They stopped by a double door, two meters wide but scarcely one high. A pair of metal triangles was set in the blonde wood. Later Geoffrey learned that they signified a number, fifteen or thirty-three, depending on whether you counted by legs or four claws. Much, much later he learned that, this, that his keeper had counted by legs and the builder of the castle by four claws. Thus he ended up in the wrong room. 
It was a mistake that would change the history of worlds. Somehow the dogs opened the doors and dragged Jeffrey in. They clustered around the cot, their snouts tugging loose at his tugging loose his restraints. He had a glimpse of rows of needle-sharp teeth. The gobbling and buzzing was very loud. When Jeffrey sat up, they backed off. Two of them held the doors as the other four exited. The doors slammed shut and the circus act was gone. Jeffrey stared at the doors for a long moment. He knew it was no circus act. The dog things must be intelligent. Somehow they had surprised his parents and sister. Where are they? He almost started to cry again. He hadn't seen them by the spaceship. They must have been captured, too. They were all being held prisoner in this castle, but in separate dungeons. Somehow they must find each other. He climbed to his feet, swayed dizzily for a moment. Everything still smelled like smoke. It didn't matter. It was time to start working on getting out. He walked around the room. It was huge, and not like any dungeon he'd seen in stories. The ceiling was very high, an arching dome. It was cut by twelve vertical slots. Sunlight fell in a dust-moted stream from one of them, splashing off the padded wall. It was the room's only illumination, but more than enough on this sunny day. Low-railed balconies stuck out from the four corners of the room just below the dome. He could see doors in the walls behind them. Heavy scrolls hung by each side of the balcony. There was writing on them, really big print. He walked to the wall and felt the stiff fabric. The letters were painted on. The only way you could change the display was by rubbing it out. Wow just like the olden times on Neoria, before Stramuli realm. The baseboard below the scrolls was black stone, glossy. Someone had used scraps of chalk to draw on it. Stick figure dogs were crude. They reminded Geoffrey of pictures little kids draw in kinder school. He stopped, remembering all the children they had left aboard the boat and on the ground around it. Just a few days ago, he'd been playing with them at the high lab school. That last year had been so strange, boring and adventurous at the same time. The barracks had been fun with all the families together, but the grown-ups hardly ever had time to play. At night, the sky was so different from Strom's. We're beyond the beyond, Mom had said, making God. When she first had said it, she laughed. Later, when people said it, they seemed more and more scared. The last hours had been crazy, the cold sleep drills finally for real. All his friends were in those boxes. He wept into the awful silence. There was no one to hear, no one to help him. After a few moments, he was thinking again. If the dogs didn't try to open the boxes, his friends should be okay. If mom and dad could make the dogs understand. Strange furniture was scattered around the room. Low tables and cabinets, and racks like kids' jungle gyms, all made from the same blonde wood as the doors. Black pillows lay around the widest table. That one was littered with scrolls, all full of writing and, and still drawings. He walked the length of one wall, ten meters or so. The stone flooring ended. There was a two-by-two two bed of gravel where the walls met. Something smelled even stronger than smoke here. A bathroom smell. Jeffrey laughed. They really were like dogs. The padded walls soaked up his laughter, echoless. Something made Jeffrey look up and across the room. He just assumed he was alone there. In fact, there was lots of hiding of places in this dungeon. For a moment, he held his breath and listened. All was silent. Almost. At the top of his hearing, up where some machines weep, and Mom and Dad and Joanna couldn't hear. There was something. I know you're here, Jeffrey said sharply, his voice squeaking. He stepped sideways a few paces, trying to see around the furniture without approaching it. The sound continued, obvious now that he was listening to it. A small head with great dark eyes looked around the cabinet. It was much smaller than the creatures that had brought Jeffrey here, but the shape of the muzzle was the same. They stared at each other for a moment, and then Jeffrey edged slowly toward it. A puppy? The head withdrew, then came further out. From the corner of his eye, Jeffrey saw something move. An another of the black forms was peering at him from under the table. Jeffrey froze for a second, fighting panic. But there was no place to run, and maybe the creatures would help find Mom. Jeffrey dropped to one knee and slowly extended his hand. Here. Here, doggy. The puppy crawled from beneath the table, its eyes never leaving Jeffrey's hand. The fascination was mutual. The puppy was beautiful. Considering all the thousands of years that dogs had been bred by humans and others... This could have been some oddball breed, but only just. The hair was short and dense, a deep velour of black and white. The two tones lay in broad swaths with no intermediate grays. This one's entire head was black, its haunches split between white and black. The tail was a short, unimpressive flap covering its rear. There were hairless patches on its shoulder and head where Geoffrey could see black skin. But, that was the, but the strangest thing was the long, supple neck. It would look more la natural in a seamale... Seamal? Seamal than a dog. 
Jeffrey wriggled his fingers, and the puppy's eyes winded, widened, revealing an edge of white around the iris. Something bumped his elbow, and Jeffrey almost jumped to his feet. So many. Two more had crept up to look at his hand. And where he had seen the first one, there were now three, sitting all alertly, watching. Seen in the open, there was nothing unfriendly or scary about them. One of the puppies put a paw on Jeffrey's wrist and pressed gently downward, and at the same time another extended its muzzle and licked Je Jeffrey's fingers. The tongue was pink and raspy, a round, narrow thing. The high-pitched weeping got stronger. All three moved in, grabbing at his hand with their mouths. "'Be careful,' Jeffrey said, jerking back his hand. He remembered the grown-up's teeth. Suddenly the air was full of gobbling and buzzing. Humph! <laughs> they sounded more like goofy birds than dogs. One of the other pups came forward. It extended a sleek nose toward Jeffrey. "'Be careful,' it said, a perfect playback of the boy's voice. Yet its mouth was closed." It angled its neck back. To be petted? He reached out. The fur was so soft. The buzzing was very loud now. Jeffrey could feel it through the fur. But it wasn't just the one animal who was making it. The sound came from all directions. The puppy reversed direction, sliding its muzzle across the boy's hand. This time he let the mouth close on his fingers. He could see teeth all right, but the puppy carefully kept him from touching Jeffrey's skin. The tip of its snout felt like a pair of small fingers closing and opening around his. Three slipped under his other arm, like they wanted to be petted, too. He felt noses poking at his back, trying to pull his shirt out of his pants. The effort was remarkably coordinated, almost as if a two-handed human had grabbed his shirt. Just how many are there? For a moment he forgot where he was, forgot to be cautious. He rolled over and began petting the marauders. A surprised squeaking sound came from all directions. Two crawled beneath his elbows. At least three jumped on his back and lay with their noses touching his neck and ears. And Geoffrey had had what seemed a great insight. The adult aliens had recognized he was a child. They just didn't know how old. They had put him in one of their own kinder schools. Mom and Dad were probably talking to them right now. Things were going to turn out all right after all. Lord Steele had not taken his name casually. Steel, the most modern of metals. Steel, that takes the sharpest edge and never loses it. Steel, that can glow red hot and yet not fail. Steel, the blade that cuts for the flenser. Steel was a crafted person, Flenser's greatest success. In some sense, the crafting of souls was nothing new. Brood kenning was a limited form of it, although mainly concerned with gross physical characteristics. Even kenners agreed that a pack's mental abilities derived from its various members in different measures. One pair of triple was almost always responsible for eloquence, another for spatial intuition. The virtues and vices were even more complex. No single member was the principal source of courage or of conscience. Flenser's contribution to the field, as to most others, had been, an essential, had been an essential ruthlessness, a cutting away of all but the truly important. He experimented endlessly, discarding all but the most successful results. He depended on discipline and denial and partial death as much as on, a, on clever member selection. He already had seventy years of experience when he created Steel. Before he could take his name, Steele spent years in denial, determining just what parts of him combined to produce the being desired. That would have been impossible without Flenser's enforcement. Example, if you dismissed a part of yourself essential for, for tenacity, where, would you get, where could you get the will to continue the flensing? For the soul in creation, the process was mental chaos, a patchwork of horror and amnesia. In two years, he had experienced more change than most people do in two centuries, and all of it directed. The turning point came when he and Flenser identified the trio that weighted, weighted, weighed him down with both conscious and slow, slowness of intellect. One of the three bridged the others, sending it into silence, replacing it with just the right element, had made the difference. After that, the rest was easy. Steel was born. When Flenser had left to convert the Long Lakes Republic, it was only natural that his most brilliant creation should take over here. For five years, Steel had ruled Flenser's heartland. In that time, he had not only conserved what Flenser built, he extended it beyond the cautious beginnings. But today, in a single circling of the sun about Hidden Island, he could lose everything. Steele stepped into the meeting hall and looked around. Refreshments were properly set. Sunlight streamed from a ceiling slit onto just the place he wanted. Part of Shrek, his, his aide, stood on the far side of the room. He said to it, I will speak with the visitor alone. He did not use the name Flenser. The white jackets groveled back and its unseen members pushed open the far doors. A fivesome, three males and two females, 
walked through the doorway, into the splash of sunlight. The individual was unremarkable, but then Flenzer had never been had never had an imposing appearance. Two heads raised to shade the eyes of the others. The pack looked across the room, spotting Lord Steele twenty yards away. Ah, Steele. The voice was gentle, like a scalpel petting the short hairs of your throat. Steele had bowed when bowed when others entered, a formal gesture. Uh, the voice caused a sudden cramp in his guts, and he involuntarily brought bellies to the ground. That was his voice. There was at least a fragment of the original Flenzer in this pack. The gold and silver epaulets, the personal banner. Those could be faked by anyone with suicidal bravado, but Steele remembered the manner. He wasn't surprised to see the other's presence had destroyed discipline on the mainland this morning. The pack's heads, when they were in sunlight, were expressionless. Was a smile playing about the heads in shadow? Where are the others, Steele? What happened today is the greatest opportunity of our history. Steele got off his bellies and stood at the railing. Sir, there are more. So there are some questions first. Just between the two of us. Clearly, you are much of Flunzer, but how much? The other was clearly grinning now, the shadowed heads bobbing. Yes, I knew my best creation would see that question. This morning, I claimed to be the true Flunzer, improved with one or two replacements. The truth is harder. You know about the Republic. That had been Flenzer's greatest gamble, to flens an entire nation-state. Millions would die, yet even so there would be more molding than killing. In the end, there would exist the first collective outside the tropics. And the Flenzer state would not be a mindless agglomeration grubbing about in some jungle. The top would be as brilliant, as ruthless as any packs in history. No people in, this, in the world could stand against such a force. It was an awesome risk to take, for an even more awesome goal. But I took precautions. We had thousands of converts, many of them people with no understanding of our true ambition, but faithful and self-sacrificing, as they should be. I always kept a special group of them nearby. The political police were clever to use mob assassination against me, the last thing I had expected. I who made the mobs. No matter, my bodyguards were well trained. When we were trapped in the Parliament Bowl, they killed one or two members of each of those special packs, and I simply ceased to exist, dispersed among these three panicky, ordinary people trying to escape the blood swamp. But everyone around you was killed. The mob left no one. The Flenzer thing shrugged. That was partly Republican propaganda, and partly my own work. I ordered my guards to hack each other down, along with everyone who was not me. Steele almost voiced his awe. The plan was typical of Flenzer's brilliance and his strength of soul. In assassinations, there was always the chance that fragments would get away. There were famous stories of heroes reassembled. In real life, such events were rare, were rare, usually happening when the victim's forces could sustain their leader through reintegration. But Flenzer had planned this tactic from the beginning, had envisaged re reassembling himself more than a thousand miles from the Long Lakes. Still, Lord Steele looked at the other in calculation. Ignore voice and manner. Think for power, not for the desires of others, even Flenzer. Steele recognized only two in the other pack. The females and the male with the white-tipped tears, ears were, uh, were probably from the sacrificed follower. Very likely only two of Flenzer really faced him, scarcely a threat except in the very real sense of appearances. And the other four of you, sir? When, we may, when may we expect your entire presence? The Flenzer thing chuckled. Damaged as it was, it still understood balance of power. This is almost like the old days, when two people have a clear understanding of power and betrayal, and then betrayal itself becomes almost impossible. There is only the ordered flow of events, bringing good to those who deserve to rule. The others have equally good mounts. I made detailed plans, three different paths, three different sets of agents. I arrived on schedule. I have no doubt the others will too, in a few ten days at most. Until then, he turned all heads towards Steele. Until then, dear Steele, I do not claim the full role of Flenzer. I did so earlier to establish priorities, to protect this fragment till I am assembled. But this pack is deliberately weak-minded. I know it wouldn't survive as the ruler of my earlier creations. Steele wondered. Half-brained, the creature's schemes were perfect, nearly perfect. So you wish a background role for the next few ten days? Very well, but you announced yourself as Flenzer. How shall I, how shall I present you? The other didn't hesitate. Tyrathect, Flenzer in waiting. Crypto, zero. As received by Transceiver Relay 3 at Relay, Language Path, Sam Norsk, Trisquiline, SJK, 
relay units from Stramuli, Maine. Subject, archive opened in the low transcend. Summary, our links to the known net will be down temporarily. Key phrases, transcend, good news, business opportunities, new archive, communications problems, distribution. Where are they now, interest group? Homo sapiens interest group. Motley hatched administration group. Transceiver Relay 03 at Relay. Transceiver Windsong at Debly Down. Transceiver Not For Long at Shortstop. Date, 11.45.20, Docs Time, uh, 0109 of Org Year 52089. Text of Message. We are proud to announce that a human exploration company from Stramuli Realm has discovered an accessible archive in the low transcend. This is not an announcement of transcendence or the creation of a new power. We have in fact postponed this announcement until we were sure of our property rights and the safety of the archive. We have installed interfaces which should make the archive interoperable with standard syntax queries from the net. In a few days this access will be made commercially available. See discussion of scheduling problems below. Because of its safety, intelligibility, and age, this archive is remarkable. We believe that there is otherwise lost information here about arbitration management and inter-race coordination. We'll send details to the appropriate news groups. We're very excited about this. Note that no interaction with the powers was necessary. No part of the Stramuli realm has transcended. Now for the bad news. Arbitration and translation schemes have had unfortunate clenerations with the Ridgeway arm armiflage. The details should be amusing to the people in the communication threats news group, and we will report them there later. But for the next hundred hours, for at least the next hundred hours, all our links, main and minor, to the known net will be down. Incoming messages may be buffered, but no guarantees. No messages can be forwarded. We regret this inconvenience, and we will make up for it very soon. Physical commerce is in no way affected by these problems. Stramuli Realm continues to welcome tourists and trade. Chapter 6 Looking back, Ravna Bergunsdot saw that it was inevitable that she would become a librarian. As a child on Sjandra K, she had been in love with the stories from Age of Princesses. There was adventure, a time when a few brave ladies had dragged humankind to greatness. She and her sister had spent countless afternoons pretending to be the greater two and rescuing the Countess of the Lake. Later they understood that Nyorja and its princesses were lost in the dim past. Sister Lynn turned to more practical things, but Ravna still wanted adventure. Through her teens, she had dreamed of emigrating to the Stramuli realm. That was something very real. Imagine, a new and mostly human colony, right at the top of the beyond, and Strom welcome folk from the mother world. Their enterprise was less than 100 years old. They or their children would be the first humans anywhere in the galaxy to transcend their own humanity. She might end up a god, and richer than a million beyond her worlds. It was a dream real enough to provoke constant arguments with her parents. For where there is a heaven, there can also be hell. Stramuli realm kissed close to the transcend, and the people there played with the tigers that pace beyond the bars. Dad had actually used that tired image. The disagreement drove them apart for several years. Then, in her computer science and applied theology courses, Ravna began to read about some of the old horrors. Maybe, maybe, she could just be a little more cautious. Better to look around first. And there was a way to see into everything that humans in the beyond could possibly understand. Ravna became a librarian. The ultimate dial... D dial dilettante? <laughs> Lynn had teased. It's true, and so what? Ravna had grumped back, but the dream of far traveling was not quite dead in her. Life in Hertz University at Sandra K. Uh, should have been perfect for someone who had finally figured out what they wanted from life. Things that have gone on, that might have gone unhappily for a lifetime there. Especially that in her graduation year, there had been the v Vrinimi organization's faraway prentice contest. Three years' work study at the archive by Relay was the prize. Winning was the chance of a lifetime. She would come back with more experience than any local acad academ academician. Academician. So that, it was that Ravna Bergsdott ended up more than 20,000 light years from home uh, at the network hub of a million worlds. Sunset was an hour past when Ravna drifted across City Park toward Gronder. <laughs> fuck. Vrini McCaller. Vrini McCaller. Gronder Vinnie McCaller's residence. 
She'd been on the planet only a handful of times since arriving in the relay system. Most of her work was at the archives themselves, a thousand light hours out. This part of Groundside was in early autumn. Though twilight had faded, the three colors to bands of gray. From Ravna's altitude, one hundred meters up, the air had the nip of frosts to come. Between her feet she could see picnic fires and gaming fields. The Vernimi organization didn't spend much on the planet, but the world was beautiful. As long as she kept her eyes on the darkening ground, Ravna could almost imagine this was some place in her home terrain on Syandar Kai. Look into the sky, though, and you knew you were far from home. Twenty thousand light years away, the galactic whirlpool sp sprawled up toward the zenith. It was just a faint thing in the twilight, and it might not get much brighter this night. Low in the western sky, a cluster of in-system factories glowed brighter than any moon. The operation was a brilliant flickering of stars and rays, sometimes so intense that stark shadows were cast eastwards from the city park mountains. In another half hour, the docks would rise. The docks weren't as bright as the factories, but together they would outshine anything from the far stars. She shifted in her a grav harness, drifting lower. The scent of autumn and picnics came stronger. Suddenly, the click of Kalir laughter was all around her. She had blundered into an airball game. Ravna spread her arms in mock humiliation and dodged out of the player's way. Her stroll through the park was just about over. She could see her destination ahead. Grunder Kalir's residence was a rarity in the city park landscape, a recognizable building. It dated from when the org bought into the relay operation. Seen from just 80 meters up, the house was a blocky silhouette against the sky. When factory lights flashed, the smooth walls of the monolith glowed in oily tints. Grander was her boss's boss's boss. She had talked to him exactly three times in two years. No more delay. Nervous and very curious, Ravna floated lower and let the house electronics guide her across the tree decks toward an entrance. Grander Vrini McCaller treated her with standard organization cur courtesy, the common denominator that served uh, between the several races of the org. The meeting room had furniture suitable for human and vrindami use. There were refreshments and questions about her job at the archive. Mixed results, sir, Ravna replied honestly. I've learned a great deal. The apprenticeship is everything it's claimed to be. But I'm afraid the new division is going to require an added index layer. All this was in the reports the old fellow could have seen at the flick of a digit. Gronder rubbed a hand absently across his eye freckles. Yes, an expected disappointment. We're at the limits of information management with this expansion. Er Egravan and Dirch, those were Ravna's boss and boss's boss, are quite happy with your progress. You came well educated and learned fast. I think there's a place for humans in the organization. Thank you, sir, Ravna blushed. Uh, Grander's assessment was casually spoken, but very important to her. And it would probably mean the arrival of more humans, perhaps even before her apprenticeship was up. So was this the reason for the interview? She tried not to stare at the other. She was quite used to the Vrindami majority race by now. From a distance, the Kalir looked humanoid. Up close, the differences were substantial. The race was descended from something like an insect. In upsizing, evolution had necessarily moved reinforcing struts inside the body, till the outside was a combination of grub-like skin and sheets of pale chitin. At first glance, Grander was an unremarkable exemplar of the race. But when the fellow moved, even to adjust his jacket or scratch at his eye freckles, there was a strange precision to him. Egravan said that he was very, very old. Grander changed the subject with clickety abruptness. You are aware of the changes at Stramuli realm. You mean the fall of Strom? Yes. Um, though I'm surprised you are. I guess it's pronounced Stromly realm. <laughs> you are aware of the changes at Stromly realm. You mean the fall of Strom? Yes. Though I'm surprised you are. Stromly realm was a significant human civilization, but it accounted only for an infinitesimal fraction of realized human tr message traffic. <laughs> Please accept my sympathy. Despite the cheerful announcements from Strom, it was clear that the absolute disaster had fallen the Stromly realm. Almost every race eventually dabbled in the transcend, more often than not becoming a superintelligence, a power. But it was clear by now the Stromers had created or awakened a power of deadly inclination. Their fate was as terrible as anything Ravna's father had ever predicted, and their bad luck was now a disaster that stretched across all that had been the Strom Stromly realm. Grunder continued. Will this news affect your work? Curiouser and curiouser. 
she would have been she would have sworn the other was coming to the point maybe this was the point uh no sir the stromly realm affair is a terrible thing uh especially for humankind but my home is sandra kai stromly realm is our offspring but i have no relatives there though i might have been there if it hadn't been for mother and dad actually when stromly main dropped off the net sandra k had been unreachable for almost 40 hours that had bothered her, bothered her very much since any rerouting should have been immediate Communication was eventually established. The problem had been screwed up routing tables on an alternate path. Ravna had even shot half a year's savings for an over-and-back mailing. Lynn and her parents were fine. The Stromly debacle was the news of the century for folks at Sandra Kai, but it was still a disaster at great remove. Ravna wondered if parents had ever been given... wondered if parents had ever given better advice than hers. Good, good. His mouth parts moved in the analog of a human nod. His head tilted so only peripheral freckles were looking at her. The guy actually seemed hesitant. Ravna looked back silently. Grander Kallur might have been the strangest exec in the org. He was the only one whose principal residence was Groundside. Officially, he was in charge of a division of the archives. In fact, he ran for Minni Marketing, i.e. intelligence. There were stories that had visited the top of that he had visited the top of the beyond Egravan claimed that he had an artificial immune system you see the stromly disaster has incidentally made you one of the organization's most valuable employees i don't understand ravna the rumors in the threats news group are true the stromers had a laboratory in the low transcend they were playing with recipes from some lost archive and they need, created a new power it appears to be a class two perversion the known net recorded a class two perversion about once a century. Such powers had a normal lifespan, about ten years, but they were explicitly malevolent, and in ten years could do enormous damage. Poor Strom. So you can see there's enormous potential for profit or loss here. If the disaster spreads, we will lose our network we will lose network customers. On the other hand, everyone around Stromly Realm wants to track what is happening. This could increase our message traffic by several percent. Grounder put it more cold-bloodedly than she liked, but he had a point. In fact, the opportunity for profit was directly linked with mitigating the perversion. If she hadn't been so wrapped up in archive work, she'd have guessed all this. And now that she did think about it, there are even more spectacular opportunities. Historically, these perversions have been of interest to other powers. They'll want net feeds and information about the creating race. Her voice guttered into silence as she finally understood the reason for this meeting. Grounder's mouth parts clicked agreement. Indeed, we at Relay are well-placed to supply news to the Transcend, and we also have our own human. In the last three days, we've received several dozen queries from civilizations in the high beyond, some claiming to represent powers. This interest could mean a large, large increase in organization income through the next decade. All this you could read in the Threats News Group, but there is another item, something I ask you to keep secret for now. Five days ago, a ship from the Transcend entered our region, it claims to be directly controlled by a power. The wall behind him became a window upon the visitor. The craft was an irregular collection of spines and limps. A scale bar claimed the thing was only five meters across. Ravna felt the hair on her neck prickling. Here in the middle beyond, they should be relatively safe from the caprice of the powers. Still, the visit was an unnerving thing. What does it want? Information about the strongly perversion. In particular, it is very interested in your race. It would give a great deal to take back a living human. Ravna's response was abrupt. I'm not interested. Grunder spread his pale hands. The light glittered, glittered from the chitin on the back of his fingers. It would be an enormous, enormous opportunity. Apprenticeship with the gods. This one has promised to establish an oracle here in return. No, Ravna half rose from her chair. She was one human, more than 20,000 light years from home. That had been a frightening thing in the first days of her apprenticeship. Since then, she had made friends, had learned more of organization ethics, had come to trucks, trust these folks almost as much as people at Sandra Kai. But there was only one halfway trust trustable oracle on the net these days, and it was almost ten years old. This power was tempting for Nimi Org with fabulous treasure. Grander clicked embarrassment. He waved her back to her chair. It was only a suggestion. We do not abuse our employees. If you will simply serve as our local expert, Ravna nodded. Good. Frankly, I had not ex expected you to accept the offer. We have a much more likely volunteer, but one who needs coaching. A human, here. 
Ravna had a standing query in the local directory for other humans. During the last two years, she had been three. She had seen three, and they had just been passing through. How long has she, he, been here? Grander said something halfway between a smile and a laugh. A bit more than a century, although we didn't realize it until a few days ago. The pictures around him shifted. Ravner recognized Relay's attic, the junkyard of abandoned ships, and freight devices that floated just a thousand light seconds from the archives. We receive a lot of one-way freight, items shipped in the hope we'll buy or, buy or sell on consignment. The view closed on a decrepit vessel, perhaps 200 meters long, wasp-wasted to support a ram-scoop thrive. Its ultra-drive ultra spines were scarcely more than stubs. A bottom lugger? said Ravna. Grander clicked negation. A dredge. The ship is about 30,000 years old. Most of the, that time was spent in, deep pen, in a deep penetration of the slow zone, plus 10,000 years in the unthinking depths. Up close now, she could see that the hull was finely pitted, a result of millennia of relativistic erosion. Even unpiloted, such expeditions were rare. A deep penetration could not return to the beyond within the lifetime of its builders. Some would not return within the lifetime of the builder's race. People who launched such missions were a little weird. People who recovered them could make a solid profit. This one came from very far away, even if it's not quite a jackpot mission. It didn't see any in anything interesting in the unthinking depths. Not surprising, given that even simple automation fails there. We sold most of the cargo immediately. The rest we cataloged and forgot, till the Stromley affair. The starscape vanished. They were looking at a medical display, random limbs and body parts. They looked very human. In a solar system at the bottoms of the slowness, the dredge found a derelict. The wreck had no ultra-drive capability. It was truly a slow zone design. The solar system was uninhabited. We speculate the ship had a structural failure, or perhaps the crew was affected by the depths. Either way, they end up in a frozen mangle. Tragedy at the bottom of the slowness thousands of years ago. Ravna forced her eyes from the carnage. You figure on selling this to our visitor? Even better. Once we started poking around, we discovered a substantial error in the cataloging. One of the debtors is almost intact. We patched it up with parts from the others. It was expensive, but we ended up with a living human. The picture flickered again, and Ravna caught her breath. In the medical animation, the parts floated into an orderly arrangement. There was a complete body there, torn up a little in the belly. Pieces came together, and this was no she. He floated whole and naked, as if in sleep. Ravda had no doubt of his humanity, but all humankind, humankind in the beyond was descended from the Neorgian stock. This fellow had none of that heritage. The skin was smoky gray, not brown. The hair was bright reddish brown, a color she had only seen in pre neoran histories. The bones of the face were subtly different from modern humans. The small differences were more jarring than the outright alienness of her co-workers. Now the figure was closed, clothed. Under other circumstances, Ravna would have smiled. Grander Kaller had picked up an absurd costume, something from the Neorgian era. The figure bore a sword and a slug gun, a sleeping prince from the Age of Princesses. Behold, the Ur-Human, said Grander. Chapter 7 Relay is a common place name. It has meaning in almost any environment. Like Newtown and New Home, it occurs over and over when people move or colonize or participate in a communication net. You could travel a billion light years or a billion years and still find such names among folk of natural intelligence. But in the current era, there was one instance of relay known above all others. That instance appeared in the routing list of 2% of all traffic across the known net. 20,000 light years off the galactic plane, relay had, been an, had an unobstructed line of sight on 30% of the beyond, including many star systems right at the bottom, where starships could only, can make only one light year per day. A few metal-bearing solar systems were equally well-placed and there was competition. But where other civilizations lost interest or colonized into the transcend or died in the apocalypse, Vernimi organization lasted. After 50,000 years, there were several races of the original org and its membership. None of those were still leaders, yet the original viewpoint and policies remained. Position and durability. Relay was now the main intermediate to the Megalanix and one of the few sites with any sort of link to the beyond in Sculptor. At Sandra Kai, Relay's reputation had been fabulous. In her two years of apprenticeship, Ravna had come to realize that the truth exceeded the reputation. Relay was in Middle Beyond. The organization's only export was the Relay function and access to the local archive. 
yet they imported the finest biologicals and processing equipment from the high beyond. The relay docks were an extravagance that only the absolutely rich could indulge. They stretched a thousand kilometers, bays, repair holds, transshipment, sh transshipment centers, parks, and playgrounds. Even at Sandrakai, there were habitats far larger. But the, the docks were in no orbit. They floated a thousand kilometers above groundside on the largest agrav frame Ravna had ever seen. At Sandrakai, the annual income of an academic, academician might pay for a square meter of agrav fabric, junk that might not last a year. Here there were millions of hectares of the stuff, supporting billions of tons. Just replacements for dead fabric required more high beyond commerce than most star clusters could command. And now I have my own office here, working directly for Grand Calera has its perks. Ravna kicked back in her chair and stared across the central sea. At the dock's altitude, gravity was still about three quarters of a G. Air fountains hung a breathable atmosphere over the middle part of the platform. The day before, she had taken a sailboat across the clear bottom sea. There was a strange experience. That was a strange experience indeed. Planetary clouds below your keel, stars and indigo sky above. She had the surf cranked up this morning, an easy matter of flexing the agravs of, of the basin. It made a regular crashing against her beach. Even thirty meters from the water, there was a tang of salt in the air. Rows of white tops marched off into the distance. She eyed the figure that was trudging slowly up the beach toward her. Just a few weeks ago, she never would have dreamed about this situation. Just a few weeks ago, she would have been out at the archive, absorbed in the upgrade work, happy to be involved with one of the largest databases on the known net. Now, it was almost as if she had, be she had come full circle, back to her childhood dreams of adventure. The only problem was, sometimes she felt like one of the bad guys. Fom Nguyen was a living person, not something to be sold. She stood and walked out to meet her red-haired visitor. She wasn't carrying the sword and handgun of Grandeur's fanciful animation, yet his clothes... Uh, were the braided fabric of ancient adventure, and he carried himself with lazy confidence. Since her meeting with Grandeur, he she had looked up some anthropology from Old Earth. The red hair and the eye folds had been known there, though rarely in the same individual. Certainly his smoky skin would have been remarkable to an inhabitant of Earth. This fellow was, as much as herself, a product of post-terrestrial evolution. He stopped an arm's length away and gave her a lopsided grin. You look pretty human, Ravna Bergson's dot. Bergson dot. <laughs> she smiled and nodded up at him. Mr. Fom Nguyen? Yes, indeed. We both seem to be excellent guessers. He swept past her into the shade of the inner office. Cocky fellow. She followed him, unsure about protocol. You'd think with a fellow human there would be no problems. Actually, the interview went pretty smoothly. It has been more than 30 days since Fom Nguyen's resuscitation. Much of that time has been spent in cram language ses sessions. The fellow must be damned bright. He already sm spoke Trisquillen trade talk with a folksy slickness. He really was rather cute. Ravna had been away from Sandra Kai for two years and had another year of apprenticeship to go. She had been doing pretty well. She had many close friends here, Egrivan, Sarale. But just chatting with this fellow brought a lot of the loneliness back. In some ways, he was more alien than anything at Relay and in some ways she just wanted to grab him and kiss his confident grin away. Grander Verne uh had been telling the truth about Fom Nguyen. The guy was actually enthusiastic about the org's plans for him. In theory, that meant she could do her job with a clear conscience. In fact, Mr. Nguyen, my job is to orient you to your new world. I know you've been exposed to some intense instruction in the last few days, but there are limits to how fast such knowledge can sink in. The redhead smiled. Call me Fam. <laughs> fam. Uh, sure. I feel like an overstuffed bag. My sleep time is full of little voices. I've learned an awful lot about experience without experiencing anything. Worse, I've been a target for all this education. It's a perfect setup if Vrenimi wants to trick me. That's why I'm learning to use the local library. And that's why I insisted they find someone like you. He saw the surprise on her face. Ha! You didn't know that. See? Talking to a real person gives me a chance to see things that aren't all planned ahead. Also, I've been pretty a pretty good judge of human nature. I think I can read you pretty well. His grin showed he understood just how irritating he was being. Ravna looked up at the green petals of the beech trees. Maybe this boob deserved what he was getting into. So you have great experience dealing with people. 
Given the limitations of the slowness, I've been around, Bravna. I've been around. I don't know how to... how I, I know I don't look it, but I'm 67 years old subjective. I thank your organization for a fine job of thawing me out. He tipped a non-existent hat in her direction. My last voyage was more than a thousand years objective. I was a programmer at arms on uh, Keng Ho Longshot. <laughs> Cheng Ho Longshot. His eyes abruptly widened, and he said something unintelligible. For a moment, he almost looked vulnerable. Ravna reached a hand toward him. Memory? Fam Nguyen nodded. Damn, this is something I don't thank you people for. Fam Nguyen had been frozen in the aftermath of violent death, not as a planned suspension. It was a near miracle that Vrimnimihorg had been able to bring him back at all, at least with the middle beyond technology. But memory was the hardest thing. The chemical basis of memory does not survive chaotic freezing well. The problem was enough to shrink even Fam Nguyen's ego by a size or two. Ravna took pity on him. It's not likely that anything is completely lost. You just have to find a different angle on some things. Yes, I've been coached about that. Start with other memories. Work sideways toward uh, what you can't remember straight on. Well, it beats being dead. Some of his jauntiness returned, but subdued to a really quite charming level. They talked for a long while as the redhead worked around the points he couldn't remember straight on. And gradually Ravna came to feel something she had never expected in connection with a slow zoner. Awe. In one lifetime, Fam Nguyen had accomplished virtually everything that was possible for a being in the slowness. All her life she had pitied the civilizations trapped down there. They could never know the glory. They might never know the truth. Yet by luck and skill and sheer strength of will, this fellow had leaped barrier after barrier. Had Grandor known the truth when he pictured the redhead with a sword and slug gun? For Fam Nguyen really was a barbarian. He had been born on a fallen colony world. Kenbera, he called it. The place sounded much like medieval Nyorja, though not mat matriarchal. He's been the youngest child of a, kin, of, a, of a king. He'd grown up with swords and poison and intrigue, living in stone castles by a cold, cold sea. No doubt his littlest prince would have ended up murdered, or king of all, if life had continued in the medieval way. But when he was thirteen years old, everything changed. A world that had only legends of aircraft and radio were confronted by interstellar traders, and a year of trading, Canberra's feudal politics, were turned on its head. Cheng Ho had invested three ships in the expedition to Canberra. They were pissed, thought that there'd, we'd be at a higher level of technology. We couldn't resupply them, so two stayed behind, probably turned my poor world inside out. I left with the third, a crazy hostage deal my father thought he was putting over on them. I was lucky they didn't space me. Cheng Ho consisted of several hundred ramscoop ships operating in volume in a volume hundreds of light years across. Their vessels could reach almost a third the speed of light. They were mostly traders, occasionally rescuers, even more rarely conquerors. When Fam Nguyen last knew them, he had settled thirty world they had settled thirty worlds and were almost three thousand years old. It was as extravagant a civilization as can ever exist in the slowness, and of course until Fam Nguyen was revived, no one in the beyond had ever heard of it. Cheng Ho was like a million other doomed civilizations, buried thousands of light years in the slow slowness. Only by luck would they ever penetrate into the beyond, where faster than light travel was possible. But for a thirteen year old boy, born to swords and chain mail, the Cheng Ho was more changed than most living beings ever experience. In a matter of weeks he went from medieval lordling to starship cabin boy. At first they didn't know what to do with me, figured on popping me into cold storage and dumping me at the next stop. What can you make of a kid who thinks there's one world and it's flat, who has spent his whole life learning to whack about with a sword? He stopped abruptly, as he did every few minutes, when the stream of recollection ran into damaged territory. Then his glance flicked out at Ravna, and his smile was as cocky as ever. I was one mean animal. I don't think civilized people realize what it's like to grow up with your own aunts and uncles scheming to murder you, and you training to get them first. In civilization, I met bigger villains, guys who'd fry a whole planet and call it reconciliation. But for sheer up-close treachery, you can't beat my childhood. To hear Fan Nguyen tell it, only dumb luck saved the crew from his scheming. In the years that followed, he learned to fit in, learned civilized skills. Properly tamed, he could be an ideal shipmaster of the Cheng Ho. And for many years he was. The Cheng Ho volume contained a couple of other races, and a number of human colonized worlds. At 0.3 C, Fam spent decades in cold sleeps, getting from star to star. 
then a year or two at each port trying to make a profit with products and information that might be lethally out of date. The reputation of the Cheng Ho was some protection. Politics may come and go, but greed goes on forever, was the fleet's motto, and they had lasted longer than most of their customers. Even religious fanatics grew a little cautious when they thought about Cheng Ho retribution. But more often it was the skill and deviousness of the shipmaster that saved the day, and few were a match for the little boy in Pham Nguyen. I was almost the perfect skipper, almost. I always wanted to see what was beyond the space we had good records on. Every time I got really rich, so rich I could launch my own subfleet, I'd take some crazy chance and lose everything. I was the yo-yo of the fleet. One run I'd be a captain of five, the next I'd be pulling maintenance programming on some damn container ship. Given how time stretches out with sublight commerce, there were whole generations who thought I was a legendary genius, and others used my name as a synonym for goofball. <laughs> he paused and his eyes widened in pleased surprise. Ha! I remember what I was doing there at the end. I was in the goofball part of my cycle, but it didn't matter. There was this captain of twenty who was even crazier than I. Can't remember her name. Her? Couldn't have been. I'd never serve under a femme captain. <laughs> he was almost talking to himself. Anyway, this guy was willing to bet everything on the sort of thing normal folks would argue over about over beer. He called his ship the, um, it translates as something like wild witless bird that gives you the idea about him. He figured there must be some really high-tech civilization somewhere in the, in the universe. The problem was to find them. In a strange way, he had almost guessed about the zones. Only problem was, he wasn't crazy enough. He only got one little thing wrong. Can you guess what? Ravna nodded. Considering where Fam's wreck was found, it was obvious. Yeah, I'll bet it's an idea older than space flight. The elder races must be toward the galactic core, where stars are closer and there are black hole exotica for power. He was taking his entire fleet of twenty. They'd keep going until they found somebody or had to stop and colonize. This captain figured success was unlikely in our lifetime, but with proper planning, we could end up in a close-packed region where it would be easy to find a new, found a new Cheng Ho, and it would proceed even further. <laughs> anyway, I was lucky to get aboard even as a programmer. This captain knew all the wrong things about me. The expedition lasted a thousand years, penetrating two hundred and fifty light years. Uh, galactic inward. The Cheng Ho volume was closer to the bottom of the slowness than old Earth, and they were proceeding inwards from there. Even so, it was plain bad luck that they encountered the edge of the deeps after only 250 light years. One after another, the wild witless bird lost contact with the other ships. Sometimes it happened without warning, other times there was evidence of computer failure or gross incompetence. The survivors saw a pattern, guessed that common components were failing. Of course, no one connected the problems with the region of space they were entering. We backed down from ram speeds, found a solar system with a semi-habitable planet. We lost track of everybody else. Just what we did then wasn't, isn't real clear to me. He gave a dry laugh. We must have been right at the edge, staggering at, around at about IQ 60. I remember fooling with the life support system. That's probably what actually killed us. For a moment he looked sad and bewildered. He shrugged. And then I woke up in the tender clutches of Vernimi Org, here where faster than light travel is possible, and I can see the edge of heaven itself. Ravna didn't say anything for a moment. She looked across her beach into the surf. They'd been talking for a long time. The sun was peeking under the tree petals, its light shifting across her office. Did Gronder realize what he had here? Almost anything from the slow zone had collector's value. People fresh from the slowness were even more valuable. But Fam Nguyen might be unique. He had personally experienced more than had some whole civilizations, and ventured into the deeps to boot. She understood now uh, why he looked to transcend and called it heaven. It wasn't entirely... Uh, the uh, part's screwed up. I can't read that. Uh, nor a failure in the organization's education programs. Uh, Fan Nguyen had already been through two transforming experiences, from pre-tech pre to star traveler and star traveler to beyonder. Each was a jump almost beyond imagination. Now he saw another step was possible, <laughs> and was perfectly willing to sell himself to take it. So why should I risk my job to change his mind? But her mouth was living a life of its own. Why not postpone the transcend, fam? <laughs> take some time to understand what is here in the beyond. You'd be welcome in almost any civilization, and on human worlds you'd be the wonder of the age. A glimpse of non-Niorian humanity. The local news groups at Sandra Kai 
had thought Ravna radically ambitious to take apprenticeship 20,000 light years away. Coming back from it, she would have her pick of full academic, academician jobs of any of a dozen worlds. That was nothing compared to Pham Nguyen. There were folks so rich that he might give him a world if he, ju- if he would just stay. You could name your price. The redhead's lazy smile broadened. Ah, but you see, I've already named my price, and I think Vernimi can, can meet it. I really wish I could do something about that smile, thought Ravna. Pham Nguyen's ticket to the Transcend was based on a power's sudden interest in the Stromula, Stromly perversion. This innocent's ego might end up smeared across a million death cubes, running a million million simulations of human nature. Grunder called less, less than five minutes after Pham Nguyen's departure. Ram, Ravna knew the orc would be eavesdropping, and she'd already told Grunder her misgivings about the selling of a savant. Nevertheless, she was a bit nervous to see him. When is he actually going to leave for the transcend? Grunder rubbed at his freckles. He didn't seem angry. Not for ten or twenty days. The power that's negotiating for him is more interested in looking at our archives and watching what's passing through the relay. Also, despite the human's enthusiasm for going, he's really quite cautious. Oh? Yes. He's insisting on a library budget and permission to roam anywhere in the system. He's been chatting with random employees all over the docks. He was especially insistent about talking to you. Grunder's mouth parts clicked in a smile. Feel free to speak your mind to him. Basically, he's tasting around for hidden poison. Hearing the worst from you should make him trust us. She was coming to understand Grunder's confidence. Damn, but Pham knew and had a thick head. Yes, sir. He asked me to show him around the four and a quarter tonight, as you well know. Fine, I wish the rest of the deal were going as smoothly. Grunder turned so that only the peripheral freckles were looking in her direction. He was surrounded by status displays of the orc's communication and database operations. From what she could see, things were remarkably busy. Maybe I should not bring this up. But it's just possible you can help. Business is very brisk. Grunder did not seem pleased to report the good news. We have nine civilizations from the top of the beyond that are biting, bidding for wideband data feeds that we could handle. But this power is that sent a ship here. Ravna interrupted almost without thinking, a breach that would have horrified her a few days earlier. Just who is it, by the way? Any chance we're entertaining the Stromly perversion? The thought of that was taking the thought of that taking the redhead was a chill. Not unless all of the powers are fooled, too. Marketing calls Marketing calls our current visitor old one, he smiled. That's something of a joke, but true even so. We've known it for eleven years. No one really know, knew how long transcendent beings lived, but it was a rare power that stayed communicative for more than five or ten years. They lost interest or grew into something different, or really did die. There were a million explanations, thousands that were allegedly from the power's first hand. Ravna guessed that the true explanation was the simplest one. Intelligence is the handmaiden of flexibility and change. Dumb animals can change only as fast as natural evolution. Human equivalent races once on their technological run-up, hit the limits of their zone in a matter of a few thousand years. In the transcend, superhumanity can happen so fast that its creators are destroyed. It wasn't surprising then that the old power, or that the powers themselves were evanescent. So calling an eleven-year power Old One was almost reasonable. We believe that Old One is a variant of the Type 73 pattern. Such are rarely malicious, and we know from whom it transcended. Just now it's causing us major discomfort, though. For twenty days, it has been monopolizing an enormous and increasing percentage of relay bandwidth. Since its ship arrived, it's been all over the archive in our local nets. We've asked the old one to send non-critical data by starship, but it refuses. This afternoon was the worst yet. Almost five percent of the relay's capacity was bound up in its service, and the creature is sending almost as much downlink as it is receiving uplink. That was weird, but it's still paying for business, isn't it? If Old One can pay top price, why do you care? Why, Ravna, we hope our organization will be around for many years after the Old One is gone. There is nothing it could offer us that would be good through all that time. Ravna nodded. Actually, there were certain magic automations that might work down here, but their long-term effectiveness would be dubious. This was a commercial situation, not some exercise in applied theology course. Old One can easily top any bid from the middle beyond. But if we give it all the services it demands, we'll be effectively non-functional to the rest of our customers, and they are the people we must depend on in the future. His image was replaced by an archive access report. 
Ravna was very familiar with the format, and Grandr's complaint really hit home. The known net was a vast thing, a hierarchical anarchy that listed linked hundreds of millions of worlds. Yet even the main trunks had bandwidths like something out of Earth's dawn age. A risk dataset could do better on a local net. That's why bulk access to the archive was mostly local, to media freighters visiting the relay system. But now, during the last hundred hours, remote access to the archive, both by volume and by count, had been higher than local. And 90% of those accesses were from a single account. Old ones. Grander's voice continued from behind the graphics. We've got one backbone transceiver dedicated to this power right now. Frankly, we can't tolerate this for more than a few days. The ultimate expense is just too great. Grander's face was back on the display. Anyway, I think you can see that the deal for the Barbarian is really the least of our problems. The last 20 days have brought more income than the last two years, far more than we can verify and absorb. We're endangered by our own success. He made an ironic smile frown. They talked a few minutes about Fam Nguyen, and then Grander rang off. Afterwards, Ravna took a walk along her beach. The sun was well down towards the aft horizon, and the sand was just pleasantly warm against her feet. The docks went round the planet, once every twenty hours, circling the pole at about forty degrees north latitude. She walked close to the surf, where the sand was flat and wet. The mist off the sea was moist against her skin. The blue sky was just above the white to- just above the white tops shaded quickly to indigo and black. Specks of silver moved up there, agrav floaters bringing starships into the docks. The whole thing was so fabulously, unnecessarily expensive. Ravna was by turns grossed out and bedazzled. Yet after two years at Relay, she was beginning to see the point. Vrindimiorg wanted the Beyond to know that it had the resources to handle whatever communication and archive demands might be made on it. And they wanted the Beyond to suspect that there were hidden gifts from the Transcend here, things that might make it more than a little dangerous to invaders. She stared into the spray, feeling it bead on her lashes. So Grander had the big problem right now. How do you tell a power to take a walk? All Ravna Bergsendot had to worry about was one overconfident twit who seemed hell-bent on destroying himself. She turned and paralleled the water. Every third wave it surged over her ankles. She sighed. Fam Nguyen was, du- with, was beyond doubt a twit, but what an awesome one. Intellectually, she had always known that there was no difference in the possible intelligence of beyonders and the primitives of the slowness. But most, automa- but most automation worked better in the beyond. Ultralight communication was possible. But you had to go to the Transcend to build truly superhuman minds. So it wouldn't, shouldn't be surprising that Fam Nguyen was capable. Very capable. He had picked up the Triscoline line with incredible ease. She had little doubt that there was, he was a master skipper. He, he was the master skipper, he claimed. And to be a traitor in the slowness, to risk centuries between the stars for a destination that might have fallen from civilization or become deadly hostile to outsiders. That took courage that was hard to imagine. She could understand how he might think that going to the Transcend was just another challenge. He'd had less than twenty days to absorb a whole new universe. It simply wasn't enough time to understand that the rules change when players are more than human. Well, he still had a few days of grace. She would change his mind. And after talking to Grander just now, she wouldn't feel especially guilty about doing it. Chapter 8 The foreign quarter was actually about a third of the docks. It abutted the no-atmosphere periphery, where ships usually actually docked, and extended inwards to a section of the Central Sea. Vrnimi Org had convinced a significant number of races that this was a wonder of the middle beyond. In addition to freight traffic, there were tourists, some of the wealthiest beings in the beyond. Fam Nguyen had carte blanche to these amusements. Uh, Ravna took him through, through the more spectacular ones, including an agrav hop over the, to the docks. The barbarian was more impressed by their pocket spacesuits than by the docks. I've seen structures bigger than that down in the slowness. Not hovering in a planetary gravity well, you haven't. Fam Nguyen seemed to mellow as the evening progressed. At least his comments became more perceptive, less edged. He wanted to see how real tra- traders lived in the beyond, and Ravna showed him the bourses and the traders local. They ended up in the Wandering Company just after the docks midnight. Uh, this was not organization territory, but it was one of Raz- Ravna's favorite places, a private dive that attracted traders from the top to the bottom. She wondered how the decor would appeal to Fam Nguyen. The place was modeled as a meeting lodge on some world of the slow zone. A three-meter model ram scoop hung in the air over the main service floor. Blue-green drive fields glow, 
fields glowed from the ship's every corner in flange, and spread faintly among patrons sitting below. To Ravna, the walls and floors were heavy timber, rough cut. People like Agravan saw stone walls and narrow tunnels, the sort of brutery his race had maintained on new conquests of long ago. The trickery was optical, not some mental smudging, and about the best that could be done in the middle beyond. Ravna and Pham walked between widely spaced tables. The owners weren't as successful with sound as with vision. The music was faint and changed from table to table. Smells changed, too, and they were a little bit hard to take. Air management was working hard to keep everyone healthy, if not completely comfortable. Tonight the place was crowded. At the far end of the, far end of the service floor, the special atmosphere nooks were occupied. Low pressure, high pressure, high NOx, aquaria. Uh, some customers were vague blurs with, within turbid atmospheres. In some ways it might have been a port bar at Sandrakai, yet this was relay. It attracted high beyonders who would never who, who would never come to backwaters like Sandra Kai. Most of the high ones didn't look very strange. Civilizations at the top were most often just colonies from below. But the headbands she saw were not jewelry. Mind computer links aren't efficient in the middle beyond, but most of the high beyonders would not give them up. Ravna started toward a group of banded tripods and their machines. Let Fam Nguyen walk with the with creatures who teetered on the edge of Transapience. Surprisingly, he touched her arm, drawing her back. Let's walk around a little more. He was looking all around the hall, as if searching for a familiar face. Let's find some other humans first. When holes showed in Pham Nguyen's cram education, they were gapingly wide. Ravna tried to keep her face serious. Other humans? We're all there at, we're all there is at Relay, Pham. But the friends you've been telling me about. Egravan, Sarale. Ravna just shook her head. For a moment, the barbarian looked vulnerable. Pham Nguyen had spent his life crawling at sublight between human colonized star systems. She knew that in all that life he had only seen he, he had seen only three non human races. Now he was lost in a sea of alienness. She kept her sympathy to herself. This one insight might affect the guy more than all her arguing. But the instant passed and he was smiling again. Even more an adventure. They left the main floor and walked past the special atmosphere nooks. Lord, but Cheng Ho would love this. No humans anywhere, and the wandering company was the homiest meeting place she knew. Many org customers met only on the net. She felt her own homesickness welling up. On the second floor, a signet flag caught her eye. She'd known something like it back at Sandra Kai. She drew Pham Nguyen across the floor and started up the timbered stairs. Out of the background murmur, she heard a high-pitched twittering. It wasn't Triskbalan, but the words make sense. By the powers, it was Sam Norsk. I do believe it is a, it's a homo sap. Over here, my lady. She followed the sound to the table with a signet flag. May we sit with you? She asked, savoring the familiar language. Please do. The twitterer looked like a small ornamental tree sitting in a six-wheeled cart. The cart was marked with cosmetic stripes and tassels. Its 100 by 150 by 120 centimeter topside was covered with a cargo scarf in the same pattern as the signet flag. The creature was a greater scro... Scrodr <laughs> Scrod Rider. Its race traded through much of the middle beyond, including Sandra Kai. The Sc Scrod Rider's high pitched voice came from its voder, but speaking Sam Norsk, it sounded homier than anything she'd heard in a long time. Even granting the mental peculiarities of Scrod Riders, she felt a surge of affection affectionate nostalgia as if she had run into an old classmate in a far city. My name is. The sound was a rustling of fronds. But you can easier call me Blue Shell. It's nice to see a familiar face. Ha ha ha. Blue Shell spoke the laughter as words. Pham Nguyen had sat down with Ravna, but he understood not a word of Sam Norsk, and so the great re reunion was lost on him. The writer switched to, tr to Trisquillen and introduced his four companions, another scrode writer, and three humanoids who seemed to like the shadows. None of the humanoids spoke Sam Norsk, but... No one was more than one translator hop from Trisquiline. The Scrode Riders were owners slash operators of a small interstellar freighter, the Out of Band 2. The humanoids were certificants for part of the starship's current cargo. My mate and I have been in the business for almost 200 years. We have happy feelings for your race, my lady. Our first runs were between Sandra Kai and Forced Utgrip. 
Your people are good customers, and we scarcely ever have a shipment rot. He wheeled his scrode back from the table and then drove forward. The equivalent of a small bow. Oh, bow. The equivalent of a small bow. All was not sweetness and light, however. One of the humanoids spoke. The sounds could o almost have come from a human throat, though they made no sense. A moment passed as the house translator proceeded his, processed his words. Then the brooch on his jacket spoke in clear Trisquillin. Blue Shell states that you are homo sapiens. Know that you have our animosity. We are bankrupt, near stranded here by your race's evil creation. The Stromly perversion. The words sounded emotionless, but Ravna could see the creature's tense posture, its fingers twisting at a drink bulb. Considering his attitude, it probably wouldn't help to point out that though she was human, Sendrakai was thousands of light years from Strom. You came here from the realm? She asked the Scrode Rider. Blue Shell didn't answer immediately. That's the way it was with his race. He was probably trying to remember who she was and what they all were talking about. And then, yes, yes, please do excuse my certificate's hostility. Our main cargo is a one-time cryptographic pad. The source is commercial security at Sandra Kai. The destination is the certificate's high colony. It was the usual, usual arrangement. We're carrying a one-third Zor of the pad. Independent shippers are carrying the others. At the destination, the three parts would be Zord together, x -ord. The result could supply a dozen world's crypto needs on the net, for... Downstairs there was a commotion. Someone was smoking something a bit too strong for the air scrubbers. Ravna caught a whiff, enough to shimmer her vision. It had knocked out several patient patrons on the main level. Management was counseling the offending customer. Blue Shell made an abrupt noise. He backed his scrode from the table and rolled to the railing. Don't want to be caught unawares. Some people can be so abrupt. When nothing more came of the incident, he returned. Uh, where was I? He was silent for a moment, consulting the short-term memory built into his scrode. <laughs> yes, yes. We would become relatively rich if our plans work out. Unfortunately, we stopped on Strom to drop off some bulk data. He pivoted on his rear, rear four wheels. Surely that was safe. Strom is more than a hundred light years from their lab in the Transcend, yet one of the certificates interrupted with a loud gabble. The house translator kicked in a moment later. Yes, it should have been safe. We saw no violence. Ships recorders show that our safeness was not breached. Yet now there are rumors. Net groups claim that the Str Stromly realm is owned by perversion. Absurdity. Yet these rumors have crossed the net to our destination. Our cargo is not trusted, so our cargo is ruined. Now it is only a few grams of data medium carrying random. In the middle of the flat voice translation, the humanoid lunged out of the shadows. Revna had a glimpse of a jaw ed edged with razor-sharp gums. He threw his drink bulb at the table in front of her. Fam Nguyen's hand flashed out, snatching the drink before it hit, before she had quite realized what was happening. The redhead came slowly to his feet. From the shadows, the two other humanoids came to their feet and moved toward their friend. Fam Nguyen didn't say a word. He set the bulb carefully down and leaned just slightly towards the other, his hand relaxed yet blade-like. Cheap fiction talks about looks of deadly menace. Ravna had never expected to see the real thing, but the humanoids saw it too. They tugged their friend gently back from the table. The loudmouth did not resist, but once beyond the fam's reach, he erupted in a barrage of squeals and hisses that left the house translator speechless. He made a sharp gesture with three fingers and shut up. The three swept, silent, sli swept silently down the stairs and away. Fam Nguyen sat down, his gray eyes calm and untroubled. Maybe he did have something to be arrogant about. Ravna looked across at the two sco scrode riders. I'm sorry your cargo lost value. Most of Ravna's past contacts had been with lesser scrode riders whose reflexes were only slightly augmented beyond their sessile heritage. Had these two ev even noticed the interruption? But Blue Shell answered immediately. Do not apologize. Ever since our arrival, these three have been complaining. Contract partners or not, I'm very tired of them. He lapsed into potted plant mode. After a moment, the other rider, Greenstock, was it? Spoke. Besides, our commercial situation may not be a complete failure. I am sure the other thirds of the shipment went nowhere near Stromly Realm. That was the usual, proce usual procedure, anyway. Each part of the shipment was carried by a different company, each taking a very different path. 
If the other thirds could be certified, the crew of the out of band might not come away empty handed. In in fact, there may be a way we can get full certification. True, we were at Stromley, Maine, but how long ago did you leave? Six hundred and fifty hours ago, about two hundred hours after they dropped off the net. It suddenly dawned on Ravna that she was talking to something like eyewitnesses. After thirty days, the threats, news, was still dominated by events at Strom. The consensus was that a Class II perversion had been created. Even Vernimiorg believed that. Yet it was still mainly guesswork, and she was talking to beings who had actually been there. You don't think the Stromers created a perversion? It was Blue Shell who replied. Sigh, he said. Our cert certificates deny it, but I see a problem of conscience here. We did witness strangeness on Strom. Have you ever encountered artificial immune systems? The ones that work in the middle beyond are more trouble than they're worth, so perhaps not. I noticed a real change in certain officers of the Crypto Authority right after Stromly victory. It was as if they were suddenly a part of a poorly, poorly calibrated automation. As if they were somebody's, um, fingers. No one can doubt that they were playing in the transcend. They found something up there. A lost archive. But that is not the point. He stopped talking for a long moment. Revna almost thought he was finished. You see, just before leaving Stromly, Maine, we... But now Fam knew and was talking too. That's something I've been wondering about. Everyone talks as though this Stromly realm was doomed the moment they began research in the Transcend. Look, I've played with this bugged software and strange weapons. I know you can get killed that way. But it looks like the Stromers were careful to put their lab far away. They were building something that could go very wrong, but apparently it was a previously tried experiment. Like just about everything up here. They could stop the work at any time and deviated from the records, right up to the end. So how could they screw up so bad? The question stopped the scrode writer in his tracks. You didn't need a doctorate in applied theology to know the answer. Even the damn Stromers should have known the answer. But given Fom Nguyen's background, it was a reasonable question. Ravna kept her mouth shut. The scrode writer's very alienness might be more convincing to Fam than another lecture from her. Blue Shell dithered for a moment, no doubt using his scroll to help assemble his arguments. When he finally spoke, he didn't seem irritated by the interruption. I hear several misconceptions, Miss La my lady fam. He seemed to use the old Njorin honorific pretty indiscriminately. Have you ever been into the archive at Relay? Fam said yes. Ravna guessed he'd never been past the beginner's front end. Then you know that an archive is fundamentally vaster th is a fundamentally vaster thing than the database on a c conventional local net. For practical purposes, the big ones can't even be duplicated. The major archives go back millions of years, have been maintained by hundreds of different races, most now extinct or transcended into powers. Even the archive at Relay is a jumble so huge that the indexing systems are laid on top of indexing systems. Only in the transcend could such a mass be well organized, and even then, only the powers could understand it. So, there are thousands of archives in the beyond, tens of thousands if you count the ones that have fallen into disrepair or dropped off the net. Along with unending trivia, they contain important secrets and important lies. They are traps and snares. Millions of races have played with the advice that filtered unsolicited across the net. Tens of thousands have been burned thereby. Sometimes the damage was relatively minor, good inventions that weren't quite right for the target environment. Sometimes it was malicious viruses that would jam a local net so thoroughly that a civilization must restart from scratch. Where are they now? And threats. Carried stories of worse tragedies. Planets knee-deep in replicant goo. Races turned brainless by badly programmed immune systems. Fem Nguyen was wearing his skeptical expression. Just test the stuff at a safe remove. Be prepared for local disasters. That would have brought most explanations to a stop. Ravna had to admire the scrode writer. He paused, retreated to still more elementary terms. True, simple caution can prevent many disasters, and if your lab is in the middle or low beyond, such caution is all that is really needed, no matter how sophisticated the threat. But we all understand the nature of the zones. Ravna had virtually no feel for rider body language, but she could have sworn that Blue Shell was watching the barbarian expectantly, trying to gauge the depth of Fam's ignorance. The human nodded impatiently. Blue Shell continued. In the Transcend, truly sophisticated equipment can operate, devices substantially smarter than anyone down here. Of course, almost any economic or military competition can be won by the side with superior computing resources. Such can be had at the top of the beyond and in the Transcend. 
Races are always migrating there, hoping to build their utopias. But what do you do when your new creations may be smarter than you are? It happens that there are limitless possibilities for disaster, even if an existing power does not cause harm. So there are unnumbered recipes for safely taking advantage of the transcend. Of course, they can't be effectively examined except in the transcend. And run on devices of their own description, the recipes themselves become sentient. Understanding was beginning to glimmer across Pham Nguyen's face. Ravna leaned forward, caught the redhead's attention. There are complex things in the archives. None of them is sentient, but we have, but some have the potential. If only some naive young race will believe their promises. We think that's what happened to Stromly Realm. They were tricked by documentation that claimed miracles, tricked into building a transcendent being, a power, but one that victimizes Safants and the beyond. She didn't mention how rare such perversion was. The powers were variously malevolent, playful, indifferent, but virtually all of them had better uses for their time than exterminating cockroaches in the wild. Fam Nguyen rubbed his jaw thoughtfully. Okay, I guess I see, but I get the feeling this is common knowledge. If it's this deadly, how did the Stromly bunch get taken in? Bad luck and criminal incompetence. The words popped out of her with surprising force. She hadn't realized she was so bent by the Stromly thing. Somewhere inside, her old feelings for the Stromly realm were, realm were still alive. Look, operations in the high beyond and in the transcend are dangerous. Civilizations up there don't last long, but there will always be people who try. Very few of the threats are actively evil. What happened to the Stromers? They ran across this recipe advertising wondrous treasure. Quite possibly it had been lying around for millions of years, a little too risky for other folks to try. You're right, the Stromers knew the dangers but it was a classic situation of balancing risks and choosing wrong. Perhaps a third of applied theology was about how to dance near the flame without getting incinerated. No one knew the details of the Stromly debacle, but she could guess them from a hundred similar cases. So they set up a base in the Transcend in at this lost archive, if that's what it was. They began implementing the schemes they found. You can be sure they spent most of their time watching it for signs of deception. No doubt the recipe was a series of more or less intelligible steps with a clear takeoff point. The early stages would involve computers and programs more effective than anything in the beyond, but apparently well behaved. Yeah, even in the slowness, a big problem can program can be full of surprises. Ravna nodded. And some of these would be near or beyond human complexity. Of course, the Stromers would know this and try to isolate their creations, but given a malign and clever design, it should be no surprise that if the devices leaked onto the lab's local net and distorted the information there. From then on, the Stromers wouldn't have a chance. The most cautious staffers would be framed as incompetent. Phantom threats would be detected. Emergency responses demanded. More sophisticated devices would be built with fewer safeguards. Conceivably, the humans were killed or rewritten before the perversion even achieved transapience. There was a long silence. Fam Nguyen looked almost chastened. Yeah, there's a lot you don't know, buddy. Think on what the old one might have planned for you. Blue Shell bent a tendril to taste a brown concoction that smelled like seaweed. Well told, my lady Ravna, but there is one difference in this present situation. It may be good fortune and very important. You see, just before leaving Stromley, Maine, we attended a beach party among the lesser riders. They had been little affected by events to that point. Many hadn't even noticed the destruction of independence at Strom. With luck, they may be the last enslaved. His squeaky voice lowered an octave, trailing into silence. Where was I? Yes, the party. There was one fellow there, a bit more lively than the average. Some more years past, he had bonded with a traveler in Stromly News Service. Now he was acting as a clandestine data drop, so humble that he wasn't even listed in the service's own net. Anyway, the researchers at the Stromly lab, a few of them at least, were not so incautious as you say. They suspected a perverse runaway, and were determined to sabotage it. This was news, but doesn't look like they had much success, does it? I am at nodding agreement. They did not prevent it, but they did plan to escape the laboratory planet with two sh starships. And they did get word of their attempt into channels that ended with my acquaintance at the beach party. And here is the important part. At least one of these ships was to carry away some final elements of the perversion's recipe before they were incorporated into the design. Surely they were backups, began Fam Nguyen. Ravna waved him silent. There had been enough grade school explanations for one night. This was incredible. She'd been following the news about Stromly Realm as much as anyone. 
The realm was the first high daughter colony of Sandra Kai. It was horrifying to see it destroyed. But nowhere in threats had there even been a rumor of this. The perversion not whole? If this is true, then the Stromers may have a chance. It all depends on the missing parts of the, de of the design document. Just so. And of course the humans realize this too. They plan to head straight for the bottom of the beyond, rendezvous there with the accomplices from Strom. Which, considering the ultimate magnitude of the disaster, would never happen. Ravna leaned back, ob oblivious of Fam Nguyen for the first time in many hours. Most likely both ships had been destroyed by now. If not, well, the Stromers had been at least half smart, heading for the bottom. If they had what Blue Shell thought, the perversion c would be very interested in finding them. It was no wonder Blue Shell and Greenstock hadn't announced this on news groups. So you know where they were going to rendezvous, she said softly. Approximately. Greenstock burred something at him. Not in ourselves, he said. The coordinates are in the safeness at our ship. But there is more. The Stromers had a backup plan if the rendezvous failed. They intended to signal relay with their ship's ultrawave. Now wait, just how big is this ship? Ravna was no physical layer engineer, but she knew that the relay's backbone transceivers were actually swarms of antenna elements scattered across several light years, each element 10,000 kilometers across. Blue Shell rolled forward and back, a quick gesture of agitation. We don't know, but it's nothing exceptional. Unless you're looking precisely at it with a large antenna, you'd never detect it from here. Greenstock added, We think that this was part of their plan. Though it's desperation on top of desperation. Oh, yeah. Though it is desperation on top of desperation. Since we came to Relay, we've been talking to the Org. Discreetly, quietly, Blue Shell put in abruptly. Yes. We've asked the organization to listen for this ship. I'm afraid we haven't talked to the right people. No one seems to put much credence in us. After all, the story is ultimately from a lesser writer. Yeah. What could they know that was under a hundred years old? What we're asking would normally be a great expense, and apparently prices are especially high right now. Ravna tried to curb her enthusiasm. If she had read this in a news group, it would have been just one more interesting rumor. Why would she boggle just because she was getting it face to face? By the powers, what irony. Hundreds of customers from the top and the transcend, even the old one, were saturating Relay's networks with their curiosity about the Stromley debacle. What if the answer had been sitting right in front of them? suppressed by the very eagerness of their investigation. Just who have you been talking to? Never mind, never mind. Maybe she should just go to Grunder Kaller with the story. I think you should know that I am a very minor employee of the Vermini organization. I may be able to help. She had expected some surprise at, with, at this sudden good luck. Instead, there was a pause. Apparently, Blue Shell had lost his place in the conversation. Finally, Greenstock spoke. I am blushing. You see, we knew that. Blue Shell looked you up in the employee's directory. You are the only human in the org. You're not in customer contact, but we thought that if we chanced upon you, so to speak, you might give us a kindly hearing. Blue Shell's tendrils rustled together sharply. Irritation? Or had he finally caught up to the conversation? Yes. Well, since we are all being so frank, I suppose we should confess that this might even benefit us. If the refugee ship can prove that the perversion is not a full class two, then perhaps we can convince our buyers that our cargo has not been compromised. If they only knew, my certificate friends would be groveling at your feet, my Lady Ravna. They stayed at the Wandering Company until well past midnight. Businesses picked up at the circadian peak of some of the new arrivals. Floor and table shows were rosh raucous all around. Fam's eyes flickered this way and that, taking all it all in. But above all, he seemed fascinated by Blue Shell and Greenstock. The two were starkly non-human, in some ways even strange as aliens go. Scrod riders were one of the very few races that had achieved long-term st stability in the beyond. Speciation had long ago occurred, varieties heading outward or becoming extinct. And still there were some who matched their ancient Scrods, a unique balance of outlook and machine interface that was more than a billion years old. But Blue Shell and Greenstock were also traders which much, with much of the outlook that Fam Nguyen had known in the slowness. And though Fam acted as ignorant as ever, there was a new diplomacy in him. Or maybe the awesomeness of the beyond was finally getting through his thick skull. He couldn't have asked for better drinking buddies. As a race, the Scrode Riders preferred lazy reminiscence to almost any activity. Once delivered of their critical message, the two were quite content to talk of their life in the beyond, to explain things in whatever detail the barbarian could wish. The razor-jawed certificates stayed well lost. 
Ravna got a mild buzz on and watched the three talk shop. She smiled to herself. In a way, she was the outsider now, the person who had never done. Blue Shell and Greenstalk had been all over, and some of their stories sounded wild even to her. Ravna had a theory, not that widely accepted, actually, that where beings have a common fluency, little else matters. Two of these three might be mistaken for potted trees on hot, hot carts, and the third was unlike any human in her life. Their fluency was in an artificial language, and two of the voices were squawky raspings. Yet after a few minutes listening, their personality seemed to float in her mind's eye, more interesting than many of her school chums, but not that different. The two Scrode riders were mates. She hadn't thought that that could count for much. Among riders, sex amounted to scarcely more than being next-door neighbors at the right time of year. Yet there was deep affection here. Greenstock especially seemed a loving personality. She, he, was shy yet stubborn, with a kind of honesty that might be a major handicap in a traitor. Blue Shell made up for that failing. He, she, could be a glib and could be glib and talkative, quite capable of maneuvering things his way. Underneath, Ravna glimpsed a compulsive personality, uncomfortable with his own sneakiness, ultimately grateful when Greenstock re reined him in. And what of Fan Nguyen? Yes, what's the inner being you see there? In an odd way, he was more of a mystery. The arrogant boob of this afternoon seemed to be mostly invisible tonight. Maybe it had been a cover for his insecurity. The fellow had been born in a male-dominated culture, virtually the opposite of the matriarchy that all beyonder humanity descended from. Underneath the arrogance, a very nice person might be living. And then there was the way that he had faced... He had a faced-down razor jaw, and the way he was drawing out the scrode riders. It occurred to Ravna that after a lifetime of reading romantic fiction, she had run into her first hero. It was after 2.30 when they left the wandering company. The sun would be rising across the bow horizon in less than five hours. The two scrode riders came outside to see them off. Blue Shell had switched back to Samnorsk to regale Ravna with a story of his last visit to Sandra Kai and remind her to ask about the refugee ship. The scrode riders dwindled beneath them as Ravna and Fam rose into the thinning air and headed towards the residential towers. The two humans didn't say anything for a couple of minutes. It was even possible that Fam Nguyen was impressed by the view. They were passing over gaps in the brightly lit docks, places where they could see through the parks and concourses to the surface of groundside and a thousand kilometers below. The clouds were whirls of dark on dark. Revna's residence was at the outer edge of the docks. Here, are, here the air fountains were of no use. Her apartment tower rose into frank vacuum. They glided down to her balcony, trading their suit's atmosphere fear for the apartment. Ravna's mouth was leading a life of its own, explaining how the residence was what she'd been assigned when she worked at the archive, that it was nothing compared to her new office. Fam Nguyen nodded, quiet-faced. There were none of the smart remarks of the earlier tours. She babbled on, and then they were inside, and she shut up, and they just looked at each other. In a way, she'd wanted this clown ever since Grandeur's silly animation, but it wasn't until this evening at the Wandering Company that she'd felt right about bringing him home with her. Well, I, uh... So, Ravna, the ravening princess, where is your glib tongue now? She settled for reaching out, putting her hand on his. Fam Nguyen smiled back, shy too. By the powers. I think you have a nice place, he said. I've decorated it techno-primitive. Being stuck at the edge of the docks has its points. Then The natural view isn't messed up by city lights. Here, I'll show you. She doused the lights and pulled the curtains aside. The window was a natural transparency, looking out from the edge of the docks. The view tonight should be terrific. On the ride from the company, the sky had been awfully dark. The in-system factories must be offline or hidden behind groundside. Even ship traffic seemed sparse. She went back to stand by fam. The window was a vague rectangle across her vision. You have to wait a minute for your eyes to adjust. There's no amplification at all. The curve of groundside was clear now, clouds with occasional pricks of light. She slipped her arm across his back, and after a moment felt his across her shoulders. She'd guessed right. Tonight, the galaxy owned the sky. It was a sight that vermini old hands happily ignored. For Ravna, it was the most beautiful thing about Relay. Without enhancement, enchant, yeah, enhancement, the light was faint. 20,000 light years is a long, long way. At first, there was just a suggestion of mist and an occasional star. As her eyes adapted, the mist took shape, curving arcs, some places brighter, some dimmer. A minute more and there were knots in the mist. There were streaks of utter black that separated the curving arms, complexity on complexity, twisting toward the pale hub that was the core. Maelstrom, whirlpool, 
frozen still across half the sky. She heard Pham's breath catch in his throat. He said something, sing-song syllables that could not have been Trisk, and certainly not Sandlorsk. All my life I lived in a tiny clump of that, and I thought I was a master of space. I never dreamed to stand and see the whole blessed thing at once. His hand tightened on her shoulder, then gentled, stroking her neck. And no matter how long we watch, will we see any sign of the zones? She shook her head slowly, but they're easily imagined. She gestured with her free hand. In the large, the zones of thoughts followed the mass distribution of the galaxy, the mindless depths extending down to the soft glow of the galactic core. Farther out, the great slowness, where humankind had been born, where ultralight could not exist and civilizations lived and died unknowing and unknown. And the beyond, the stars about four-fifths out from the center, extending well off, well off plane to include places like the relay. The known net had existed in some form for billions of years in the beyond. It was not a civilization. Few civilizations uh, lasted longer than a million years. But the records of the past were quite complete. Sometimes they were intelligible. More often, reading them involved translations of translations of translations, passed down from one defunct race to another, with no one to corroborate. Worse than any multi-hop net message could ever be. Yet some things were quite clear. There had always been the zones of thought, though perhaps they were slightly inward moved now. There had always been wars and peace, and races upwelling from the great slowness, and thousands of little empires. There had always been races moving into the transcend to become the powers, or their prey. And the transcend, Pham said, is that just the far dark, the dark between the galaxies? Ravna laughed softly. It includes all that, but see the outer reaches of the spirals, there in the transcend. Most everything farther than 40,000 light years from the galactic center was. Pham Nguyen was silent for a long moment. She felt a tiny shiver pass through him. After talking to the wheelies, I, I think I understand more of what you were warning me about. There's a lot of things I don't know, things that could kill me, or worse. Common sense triumphs at last. True, she said quietly. But it's not just you or the brief time you've been here. You could study your whole life and not know. How long must a fish study to understand human motivation? It's not a good analogy, but it's the only safe one. We're like dumb animals to the powers of the transcend. Think of all the different things people do to animals. Ingenious, sadistic, charitable, genocidal. Each has a million elaborations in the transcend. The zones are a natural protection. Without them, human equivalent intelligence would probably not exist. She waved at the misty star swarms. The beyond and below are like a deep of ocean, and we are the creatures that swim in the abyss. We're so far down that the being on we're so far down that the beings on the surface, superior though they are, can't effectively reach us. Oh, they fish, and they sometimes blight the upper levels with poisons that we don't understand. But the abyss remains a relatively safe place. She paused. There was more to the analogy. And just as with an ocean, there is a constant drift of flotsam on the top. There are things that can only be made uh, only be made at the top, that need close to sentient factories, but which can still work down here. Blue Shell mentioned some of those when he was talking to you. The agrav fabrics, the sapient devices, such things are the greatest physical wealth of the beyond, since we can't make them. And getting them is a deadly, risky endeavor. Fam turned toward her, away from the window in the stars. So there are always fish edging close to the surface. For an instant she thought she had lost him, that he was caught by the romance of the transcendent death wish. Little fish risking everything for a piece of godhood, and not knowing heaven from hell, even when they find it. She felt him shiver and then his arms were around her. She tilted her head up and found his lips waiting. It had been two years since Ravna Bergen's dot left Sandra Kai. In some ways, the time had gone fast. Just now her body was telling her what a long, long time it had really been. Every touch was so vivid, waking desires carefully suppressed. Suddenly her skin was tingling all over. It took marvelous restraint to undress without tearing anything. Ravna was out of practice, and of course she had nothing recent to compare to. But Fan Nguyen was very, very good. Crypto, zero, as received by Transceiver Relay 01 at Relay, Language Path, Achilleron, Trisquiline, SJK, Relay Units. From Net Administrator for Transceiver Windsong at Debley Down. Subject. Complaints about Relay. A Suggestion. Summary. It's getting worse. Try us instead. Key Phrases. Communications Problems. Relay Unreliability. Transcend. Distribution. 
Communication Costs, Special Interest Group, Motley Hatch Administration Group, Transceiver Relay 01 at Relay, Transceiver Not for Long at Shortstop, Follow-Ups to Windsong Expansion Interest Group, Date, 07-21-21 Docs Time, 3609 of Org Year 52089, Text of Message. During the last 500 hours, Comcast shows 9,834 transceiver layer congestion complaints against the Vermini operation at Relay. Each of these complaints involve services to tens of thousands of planets. Vermini has promised again and again that congestion is purely a temporary increase of t transcendent usage. As Relay's chief com competitor in this region, we of Winsong have benefited modestly from the overflow. However, until now we thought it inappropriate to pose a coordinated response to the problem. The events of the last seven hours compel us to change this policy. Those reading this item already know about the incident. Most of you are victims of it. Beginning at 000027 docs time, Vernimi Org began taking transceivers offline, an unscheduled outage. R01 went out at 000027R02 at 025032R03 and R04 at 31201. Vernimi stated that a transcendent customer was urgently requesting bandwidth. R00 had previously had been previously dedicated to that power's use. The customer required use of both up and down link bandwidth. By the org's own admission, the unscheduled usage exceed, exceeded 60% of their entire capacity. Note that the excesses of the preceding 500 hours, excesses which cause, caused entirely justified complaint, were never more than 5% of org capacity. Friends, we of Winsong are in the long-haul communication business. We know how difficult it is to maintain transceiver elements that mass as much as a planet. We know that hard contract commitments simply cannot be made by suppliers in our line of work. But at the same time, the behavior of Vermini Org is unacceptable. It's true that in the last three hours, the Org has returned R01 through R04 to general service and promised to pass on the power's surpayment to all those who were inconvenienced. But only Vernimi knows how large these surpayments really are. And no one, not even Vermini, knows whether this is the end of the outages. What is to Vermini a sudden, incredible cash glut is to the rest of you an unaccountable disaster. Therefore, Winsong at Debley Down is considering a major and permanent expansion of our service, the construction of five additional backbone transceivers. Obviously, this will be immensely expensive. Transceivers are never cheap, and Debley Down does not have quite the geometry enjoyed by Relay. We expect the cost must be amortized over many decades of good business. We can't undertake it without clear customer commitment in order to determine this demand, and to ensure that we build what is really needed. We are creating a temporary news group, Winsong Expansion Interest Group, moderated and archived at Winsong. Send slash receive charges to transceiver layer customers on this group will only be 10% of our usual. We urge you, our transceiver layer customers, to use this service to talk to each other, to decide what you can safely expect from Vermini Org in the future and how you feel about our proposals. We are waiting to hear from you. Chapter 9 Afterwards, Ravnus slept well. It was halfway through the morning when she drifted back toward wakefulness. The ringer of her phone was monotonously insistent, loud enough to reach through the most pleasant dreams. She opened her eyes, disoriented and happy. She was lying with her arms wrapped tightly around a large pillow. Damn, he'd already left. She lay back for a second, remembering. These last two years she had been lonely, till last night she hadn't realized how lonely. Happiness so unexpected, so intense. What a strange thing. The phone just kept ringing. Finally, she rolled out of bed and walked unsteadily across the room. There should be limits to this techno-primitive nonsense. Yes? It was a scrode writer. Greenstock? I'm sorry to bother you, Ravna, but are you all right? The writer interrupted herself. Ravna suddenly realized that she might be looking a little strange. Sappy smile spread from ear to ear, hair sticking out in all directions. She rubbed her hand across her mouth, cutting back laughter. Yes, I'm fine. Fine. What's up? We want to thank you for your help. We had never dreamed that you were so highly placed. We'd been trying for hundreds of hours to persuade the org to listen for the refugees, but less than an hour after talking to you, we were told the survey is being undertaken immediately. Um, say what? That's wonderful, but I'm not sure I... who's paying for it anyway? I don't know, but it is expensive. We were told they're dedicating a backbone transceiver to the search. If there's anyone transmitting, we should know in a matter of hours. 
They chatted for a few more minutes, Ravna gradually becoming more coherent as she parceled the various aspects of the last ten hours into business and pleasure. She had half expected the org to bug her at the wandering company. Maybe Gronder just heard the story there and gave it full credit. But just yesterday, he'd been wimping about uh, transceiver saturation. Either way, this was good news, perhaps extraordinarily good. If the rider's wild story were true, the Stromly perversion might be less than transcendent, and if the refugee ships had some clues on how to bring it down, Stromly realm might even be saved. After Greenstock rang off, Ravna wandered around about her apartment, getting herself in shape, playing the various possibilities against each other. Her actions became more purposeful, almost up to their usual speed. There were a lot of things she wanted to check into. Then the phone was ringing again. This time she previewed the caller. Oops, it was Grander Vrinna McCaller. She combed her hand back through her hair. It still looked like crap, and this phone was not up to deception. Suddenly she noticed that Grander didn't look so hot either. His facial chitin was smudged, even across some of his freckles. She accepted the call. Ah, his voice actually squeaked, then returned to its normal level. Thank you for answering. I would have called earlier, except things have been very chaotic. Just where had this cool had his cool distance gone? I just want you to know that the org had nothing to do with this. We were totally taken in until just a couple hours ago. He launched into a disjointed description of massive demand swamping the org's resources. As he rambled, Ravna punched up a summary of recent relay business. By the powers that be, 60% diversion? Excerpts from Comcasts. She scanned quickly down the item from Windsong. The gas bags were as pompous as ever, but their offer to replace relay was probably for real. It was just the sort of thing Grander had been afraid might happen. Old One just kept asking for more and more. When we finally figured things out and confronted him, well, he came close to threatening violence. We have the resources to destroy his emissary vessel. No telling what his revenge might be, but we told Old One his demands were already destroying us. Thank the powers, he just seemed amused. He backed off. He's restricted to a single transceiver now, and that's on a signal search that has nothing to do with us. Hmm, one mystery solved. Old One must have been snooping around the Wandering Company and overheard the Scrode Rider's story. Maybe things will be okay then, but it's just, it's important to be just as tough if Old One tries to abuse us again. The words were already out of her mouth before she considered who she was giving advice to. Grander didn't seem to notice. If anything, he was the one scrambling to agree. Yes, yes. I'll tell you, if Old One were any ordinary customer, we'd blacklist him forever for this deception. But then, if he were ordinary, he could never have fooled us. Grander wiped pudgy white fingers across his face. No, more, no mere beyonder could have altered our record of the dredge ex expedition. Not even one from the top could have broken into the junkyard and manipulated the remains without even our suspecting. Dredge? Remains? Ravna began to see what she and Grander were... That she and Grander were not talking about the same thing. Just what did the old one do? The details? We're pretty sure of them now. Since the fall of Strom, old one has been very interested in humans. Unfortunately, there were no willing ones available here. It began manipulating us, rewriting our junkyard records. We've recovered a clean backup from a branch office. The dredge really did encounter the wreck of a human ship. There were human body parts in it, but nothing that could, we could have revived. Old One must have mixed and matched what it found there. Perhaps it fabricated memories by extrapolating from human cultural data in the archives. With hindsight, we can match its early res res requests with the invasion of our junkyard. Grander rattled on, but Ravna wasn't listening. Her eyes stared blindly through the phone's display. We are little fish in the abyss, protected by the deep from the fishers above. Even if they can't live down here, the clever fisher folk would still have their lures and deadly tricks. And so Fam... Fam Nguyen is just a robot, then, she said softly. Not precisely. He is human, and with his fake memories he can operate autonomously. But when the old one buys full bandwidth, the creature is fully an emissary device. The hand and eye of a power. Grander's mouthparts clattered in abject embarrassment. Ravna, we don't know all that happened last night. There was no reason to have you under close surveillance, but Old One assures us that its need for direct investigation is over. In any case, we'll never give him the bandwidth to try, to try again. Ravna barely nodded. Her face felt suddenly felt cold. She had never felt such anger and such fright at the same time. She stood in a wave of dizziness and walked away from the phone, ignoring Grander's worried cries. The stories from grad school came tumbling through her mind, and the myths of a dozen human religions— Consequences, consequences. Some of them she could defend against, others were past repair. 
and from somewhere in the back of her mind an incredibly silly thought crawled out from under the horror and rage. For eight hours she had been face to face with a power. It was the sort of experience that made a chapter in textbooks, the sort of thing that was always far away and misreported. And it was the sort of thing that n no one I in all of Sandra Kai could ever come near to claiming, until now. Chapter 10 Joanna was in the boat for a long time. The sun never set, though now it was low behind her. Now it was high in front. Now all was cloudy and rain plinked off the tarp covering her blankets. She spent the hours in an agonized haze. Things happened that could only have been dreams. These were There were creatures pulling at her clothes, blood sticking everywhere. Gentle hands and rat snouts dressed her wounds and forced chill water down her throat. When she thrashed around, Mom rearranged her blankets and comforted her with the strangest sounds. For hours, someone warm lay beside her. Sometimes it was Geoffrey. More often it was a large dog, a dog that purred. The rain passed. The sun was on the left side of the boat, but hidden behind a cold, snapping shadow. More and more, the pain became divisible. Part of it was in her chest and shoulder, that stabbed through her whenever the boat wobbled. Part of it was in her gut, an emptiness that was not quite nausea. She was so hungry, so thirsty. More and more, she was remembering, not dreaming. There were nightmares that would never go away. They had really happened. They were happening now. The sun peeked in and out of the tumble of clouds. It slid slowly lower o across the sky till it was almost behind the boat. She tried to remember what Daddy had been saying just before. Everything went bad. They were in this planet's Arctic in the summer, so the sun's low point must be north, and their twin-hold boat was sailing roughly southwards. Wherever they were going, it was minute by minute farther from the spacecraft and any hope of finding Jeffrey. Sometimes the water was like open sea, the hills distant and or hidden by low clouds. Sometimes they passed through narrows and swept close to walls of naked rock. She would had no idea a sailboat could move so fast or be so dangerous. Four of the rat creatures worked desperately to keep them off the rocks. They bounded nimbly from mast platform to railing, sometimes standing on each other's shoulders to extend their reach. The twin-hold boat tilted and groaned in water that was suddenly rough. Then they'd be through, the, through and the hills would be at a peaceful distance, sliding slowly past. For a long while she pretended delirium. She moaned, she twisted, she watched. The boat holes were long and narrow, almost like canoes. The sail was mounted between them. The shadow in her dreams had been that sail, snapping in the cold, clean wind. The sky was an avalanche of greys, light and dark. There were birds up there. They dipped past the mast, circled again and again. There was twittering and hissing all around her, but the sound did not come from the birds. It was the monsters. She watched them through lowered lashes. These were the same that kind that killed Mom and Dad. They even wore the same funny clothes, gray-green jackets studded with stirrups and pockets. Dogs or wolves she had thought before. That didn't really describe them. Sure, they had four slender legs and pointy little ears, but with their long necks and occasionally pinkish eyes, they might as well be huge rats. And the longer she watched them, the more horrible they seemed. A still image could never convey that horror. You had to see them in action. She watched four of them, the ones on the side of her boat, play with her data set. The pink oliphant was tied in a net bag near the rear of the boat. Now the beasts wanted to look it over. At first it looked like a circus act, the creature's heads darting this way and that, but every move was so precise, so coordinated with all the others. They had no hands, but they could untie knots, each holding a piece of twine in its mouth and maneuvering its necks around others. At the same time, one's claws held the loose netting tight against the railing. It was like watching puppets run off the same control. In seconds they had it out of the bag. Dogs would have let it slide to the bottom of the hole, then pushed it around with their noses. Not these things. Two put it on a cross bench, while a third steadied it with its paw. They poked around the edges, concentrating on the plush flanges and floppy ears. They pushed and nuzzled, but with clear purpose. They were trying to open it. Two heads showed over the railing on, a other hole, on the other hole. They made the gobbling, hissing sounds that were a cross between a bird call and someone throwing up. On one of... One of those on her side glanced back and made similar sounds. The other three continued to play with the data set's latches. Finally, they, they pulled the big floppy ears simultaneously. The data set popped open, and the top window went into Joanna's startup routine, an anim of herself saying, Shame on you, Jeffrey. Stay out of my things. The four creatures went rigid, their eyes suddenly wide. Joanna's four turned the set so the others could see. One held it down while another peered at the top window, and a third fumbled with the key window. The guys in the other hole went nuts, but none of them tried to get any closer. 
The random prodding of the four abruptly cut off her startup greeting. One of them glanced at the guys in the other hall. Another two watched Joanna. She continued to lie with her eyes almost closed. Shame on you, Jeffrey. Stay out of my things, Joanna's voice came again, but from one of the animals. It was a perfect playback. Then a girl's voice was moaning, crying. Mom, Daddy. It was her own voice again, but more frightened and childish than she ever wanted it to sound. They seemed to be waiting for the data set to respond. When nothing happened, one of them went back to pushing its nose against the windows. Everything valuable and all the dangerous programs were passworded. Insults and squawking emerged from the box, all the little surprises she had planted for her snooping little brother. Oh, Jeffrey, will I ever see you again? The sounds and vids kept the monsters amused for several minutes. Eventually, their random fiddlings convinced the data set that somebody really young had opened up the box, and it shifted into kinder mode. The creatures knew she was watching. Of the four fooling her with the w fooling with her oliphant, one, not always the same one, was always watching her. They were playing games with her, pretending they didn't know she was pretending. Joanna opened her eyes wide and glared at the creature. Damn you! She looked in the other direction and screamed. The mob in the other hole were clumped together. Their heads rose on sinuous necks from the pile. In the low sunlight, their, lies, their eyes glinted red. A pack of rats or snakes silently staring at her, and for heaven knew how long. The heads leaned forward at her cry, and she heard the scream again. Behind her, her own voice shouted, Damn you! Somewhere else she was calling for Mom and Daddy. Joanna screamed again, and they just echoed it back. She swallowed her terror and kept silent. The monsters kept it up for a half minute, the mimicking, the mixing of things she must have said in her sleep. When they, saw, when they saw they couldn't terrorize her that way anymore, the voices stopped being human. The gobbling went back and forth, as if the two groups were negotiating or something. Finally, the four on her side closed her data set and tied it to the net bag. The six unwrapped themselves from each other. Three jumped to the outboard side of the hull. They gripped the edge tight with their claws and leaned into the wind. For once, they almost did look like dogs, big ones sitting at a car window, sniffing at the airstream. The long necks swept forward and back. Every few seconds, one of them would dip its head out of sight, into the water. Drinking? Fishing? Fishing. A head flipped up, tossing something small and green and into the boat. The other three animals nosed about, grabbing it. She had a glimpse of tiny legs and a shiny carapace. One of the rats held it at the tip of its mouth, while the other two pulled it apart. It was all done with their uncanny pre precision. The pack seemed like a single creature, and each neck a heavy tentacle that ended in a pair of jaws. Her gut twisted at the thought, but there was nothing to barf up. The fishing expedition went on another quarter hour. They got at least seven of the green things, but they weren't eating them, not all of them anyway. The dismembered leavings collected in a small wooden bowl. More gobbling between the two sides. One of the six grabbed the bowl's edge in its mouth and crawled across the mast platform. The four on Joanna's side huddled together as if frightened of the visitor. Only after the bull was set down and the intruder had returned to its side did the four in Joanna's hole poke their heads up again. One of the rats picked up the bull. It and another walked toward her. Joanna swallowed. What torture was this? Her stomach twisted again. She was so hungry. She looked at the bull again and realized they were trying to feed her. The sun had just come out from under the northern clouds. The low light was like some bright fall afternoon just after rain. Dark sky above, yet everything close by bright and glistening. The creature's fur was deep and plush. One held the bowl towards her, while the other stuck its snout in and withdrew something slick and green. It held the tidbit del delicately, with just the tips of its long mouth. It turned and thrust the green thing toward her. Joanna shrank back. No. The creature paused. For a moment, she thought it was going to echo her. Then it dropped the lump back into the bowl, and the first animal set it on the bench beside her. It looked up at her for an instant, then released the jaw-wide flange at the end of the bowl, she had a glimpse of fine, pointy teeth. Joanna stared into the bowl, nausea fighting with hunger. Finally, she worked a hand out of her blanket and reached into it. Heads perked up around her, and there was an exchange of gobble comments between the two sides of the boat. Her fingers closed on something soft and cold. She lifted it into the sunlight. The body was gray-green, with its sides glistening in the light. The guys in the other hole had torn off the little legs and chopped away the head. What remind remained was only two or three centimeters long. It looked like a filleted shellfish. She, once she had liked such food, but that had, that had been cooked. She almost dropped the thing when she felt it quiver in her hand. She brought it close to her mouth, touched it with her tongue. Salty. On Strom, most shellfish would make you very sick if you ate them raw. How could she know, all alone without parents or a local comment, comnet? 
She felt tears coming. She said a bad word, stuffed the green thing into her mouth, and tried to chew. Blandness, with the texture of sweat and gl gristle. She gagged, spat it out, and tried to eat another. Altogether, she got parts of two down. Maybe this was for the best. She'd wait and see how much she barfed up. She lay back and saw several pairs of eyes watching. The gobbling with the other side of the boat picked up. Then one of them sidled towards her, carrying a leather bag with a spigot, a canteen. This creature was the biggest of all. The leader? It moved its head close to hers, putting the spout of the canteen near her mouth. The big one seemed sly, more cautious about approaching her than the others. Joanna's eyes traveled back along its flanks. Beyond the edge of its jacket, the pelt on its rear was mostly white, and scored deep with a Y-shaped scar. This is the one that killed Dad. Joanna's attack was not planned. Perhaps that's why it worked so well. She lunged past the canteen and swung her free arm around the thing's neck. She rolled over the animal, pinning it against the hole. By itself, it was smaller than she, and not strong enough to push her off. She felt its claws raking through the blankets, but somehow never quite cutting her. She put all her weight on the creature's spine, grabbed it where the throat met the jaw, and began slamming, slamming its head against the wood. Then the others were on her, muzzles poking under her, jaws grabbing at her sleeve. She felt rows of needle teeth just poking through the fabric. Their bodies buzzed with a sound from her dreams, a sound that went straight through her clothes and rattled her bones. They pulled her hand from the other's throat, twisting her. She felt the arrowhead tearing her inside. But there was still one thing she could do. Joanna pushed off with her feet, butting her head against the base of the other's jaw, smashing the top of its head into the hole. The bodies around her convulsed, and she was flipped onto her back. Pain was the only thing she could feel now. Neither rage nor fear could move her. Yet part of her was still aware of the four. She had hurt them. She had hurt them all. Three wandered drunkenly, making whistling sounds for that that for once seemed to come from their mouths. The one that was scarred butt, the one with the scarred butt, lay on its side, twitching. She had punched a star-shaped wound in the top of its head. Blood dripped down past its eyes, red tears. Minutes passed and the whistling stopped. The four creatures huddled together and the familiar hissing resumed. The bleeding from her chest had started again. They stared at each other for a while. She smiled at her enemies. They could be hurt. She could hurt them. She felt better than she had since the landing. Chapter 11 Before the Flenser movement, Woodcarvers had been the most famous city-state west of the Ice Fangs. Its founder went back six centuries. In those days, things had been harder in the north. Snow covered even the lowlands through most of the year. The woodcarver had started alone, a single pack in a little cabin on an inland bay. The pack was a hunter and a thinker as much as an artist. There had been no settlements for a hundred miles around. Only a dozen of the carver's early statues ever left his cabin, yet those statues had been his first fame. These three were still in existence. There was a city by the Long Lakes named for one of them in its museum. With fame had come apprentices. One cabin became ten, scattered across Woodcarver's fjord. A century or two passed, and of course the Woodcarver slowly changed. He feared the change, the feeling that his soul was slipping away. He tried to keep hold of himself. Almost everyone does to one extent or another. In the worst case, the pack falls into perversion, perhaps becomes soul hollow. For Woodcarver, the quest was itself the change. He studied how each member fits within the soul. He studied pups and their raising, and how you might guess the contributions of a new one. He learned to shape their soul by training the members. Of course, little of this was new. It was the base of most religions, and every town had romance advisors and brood keener, kenners. Such knowledge, whether valid or not, is important to any culture. What Woodcarver did was to look at it all again, without traditional bias. He gently experimented on himself and on the other artists in his little colony. He watched the results, using them to design new experiments. He was guided by what he saw rather than by what he wanted to believe. By the various standards of his age, what he did was heresy or perversion or simple insanity. In the early years, King Woodcarver was hated almost as much as Flenser was, was three centuries earlier. But the far north was still going through its time of heavy winters. The nations of the south could not easily send armies as far as Woodcarver's. Once when they did, they were thoroughly defeated. And wisely, Woodcarver never attempted to subvert the South, not directly, but his settlement grew and grew, and its fame for art and furniture was small beside its other reputations. Old of heart traveled to the town, and came back not just younger, but smarter and happier. Ideas radiated from the town, weaving machines, gearboxes and windmills, factory postures. Something new had happened in this place. It wasn't the inventions. 
It was the people that Woodcarver had midwifed, and the outlook he had created. Wickraxgar and Jokaramuthan arrived at Woodcarver's late in the afternoon. It had rained most of the day, but now the clouds had blown away and the sky was that bright cloudless blue that was all the more beautiful after a stretch of cloudy days. Woodcarver's domain was a paradise to Peregrine's eyes. He was tired of the packless wilderness. He was tired of worrying about the alien. Twinholes paced them suspiciously for the last few miles. The boats were armed, and Peregrine and Scriber were coming from very much the wrong direction. But they were all alone, clearly harmless. Long collars hooted, relaying their story ahead. By the time they'd reached the harbor, they were heroes, two packs who had stolen unspecified treasure from the villains of the north. They sailed around a breakwater that hadn't existed on Peregrine's last trip, and tied it in the moorage. The pier was crowded with soldiers and wagons. Townspeople were all over the road leading up to the city walls. This was as close to a mob scene as you could get and still have room for sober thought. Scriber bounced out of the boat and pranced about in obvious delight at the cheers of from the hillside. Quickly, we must speak with the woodcarver. Wick Raxgar picked up the canvas bag that held the alien's picture box and climbed carefully out of the boat. He was dizzy from the beating the alien had given him. Scar's four tympanum had been cut in the attack. For a moment he lost track of himself. The pier was very strange. Stone at first glance, but walled with a spongy black material he hadn't seen since the South Seas. It should be brittle here. Where am I? I should be happy about something, some victory. He paused to regroup. After a moment, both the pain and the thoughts sharpened. He would be like this for days yet, at least. Get help for the alien. Get it ashore. King Woodcarver's Lord Chamberlain was mostly was a mostly overweight dandy. Peregrine had not expected to see such at Woodcarver's, but the fellow became instantly cooperative when he saw the alien. He brought a doctor down to look at the two legs and, incidentally, at Peregrine. The alien had gained strength in the last two days, but there had been no more violence. They got it ashore without much trouble. It stared at Peregrine out of its flat face, a look he knew was impotent rage. rage. He touched Scar's head thoughtfully. The two legs was just waiting for the best opportunity to do more damage. Minutes later, the travelers were in curhog drawn carriages, rolling up the cobblestone street toward the city walls. Soldiers cleared the way through the road. Scriber Jacaramuthan waved this way and that, the handsome hero. By now, Peregrine knew the shy insecurity that lurked within Scriber. This might be the high point of his whole life till now. Even if he wanted it, Wick Raxgar could not be so expansive. With one of Scar's tympana hurt, wild gestures made him lose track of his thoughts. He hunkered down on the carriage seats and looked out in all directions. But for the shape of the outer harbor, the place was not at all what he remembered from fifty years ago. In most parts of the world, not much changed in fifty years. A pilgrim returning after such an interval might even be bored by the sameness. But this, it was almost scary. The huge breakwater was new. There were twice as many piers and multi-boats with flags he had never seen on this side of the world. The road had been there before, but narrow, with only a third as many turnoffs. Before, the town walls had been more had been more to keep the curhogs and frog hens in than any invader, invaders out. Now they were ten feet high, the black stone extending as far as Peregrine could see, and there had been scarcely any soldiers last time. Now they were everywhere. That was not a good change. He felt a sinking in the pit of Scar's stomach. Soldiers and fighting were not good. They rode through the city gates and passed a market maze that spread across acres. The alleys were only fifty feet wide, narrow where bolts of cloth, furniture displays, and crates of fresh fruit encroached. Smells of fruit and spice and varnish hung in the air. The place was so crowded that the haggling was almost an orgy, and dizzy peregrine almost blacked out. Then they were on a narrower street that zigzagged through ranks of half-timbered buildings. Beyond the roofs loomed heavy fortifications. Ten minutes later they were in the castle yard. They dismounted and the Lord Chamberlain had the two legs moved to a litter. Woodcarver, he'll see us now, said Scriber. The bureaucrat laughed. She, Woodcarver, changed gender more than ten years ago. Peregrine's heads twisted about in surprise. Precisely what would that mean? Most packs changed with time, but he had never heard of Woodcarver being anything but he. He almost missed that what the Lord Chamberlain said next. Even better, her whole council must see what you've brought. Come inside. He waved the guards away. They walked down a hall almost wide enough for two packs to pass abreast. The chamberlain led, followed by the travelers and the doctor with the alien's litter. The walls were high, padded with silver-crusted quilting. It was far grander than before, and again unsettling. There was scarcely any statuary, 
and what there was dated from centuries before. But there were pictures. He stumbled when he saw the first, and behind him he heard Scriber gasp. Peregrine had seen art all around the world. The mobs of the tropics preferred abstract murals, smudges of psychotic color. The South Sea's islanders had never invented perspective. In their watercolors, distant objects simply floated in the upper half of the picture. In the Long Lakes Republic, representationism was currently favored, especially multi-pitches multi that gave a whole pack view. But Peregrine had never seen the likes of these. The pictures were mosaics, each tile a ceramic square about a quarter inch on a, on a side. There was no color, just four shades of gray. From a few feet away, the graininess was lost, and they were the most perfect landscapes Peregrine had ever seen. All were views from hilltops around woodcarvers. Except for the lack of color, they might have been windows. The bottom of each picture was bounded by a rectangular frame, but the tops were irregular. The mosaics simply broke off at the horizon. The hull's quilted wall stood where the pictures should have shown sky. Here now, fellow, I thought you wanted to see woodcarver. The remark was directed at Scriber. Jacaramuffin was strung out along the landscapes, one of him sitting in front of a different picture all down the hall. He turned ahead to look at the Chamberlain. His voice sounded dazed. Soul's end. It's like being a god, as if I have one member on each hilltop and I can see everything at once. But he scrambled to his feet and trotted to catch up. The halls opened on one of the largest indoor meeting rooms Peregrine had ever seen. This is as big as anything in the Republic, Scriber said with apparent admiration, looking up at three levels of balconies. They stood alone with an alien at the bottom. Hmph. <laughs> Besides the Chamberlain and the Doctor, there were already five other packs in the room. More showed up as they watched. Most were dressed like nobles of the Republic, all jewels and furs. A few wore the plain jackets he remembered from his last trip. Sigh. Woodcarver's little set settlement had grown into a city and now a nation-state. Peregrine wondered if he, she, had any real power now. He trained one head precisely on Scriber and high-talked at him. Don't say anything about the picture box just yet. Jacaramuffin looked puzzled and conspiratorial all at once. He high-talked back. Yes, yes. A bargaining card? Something like that. Peregrine's eyes swept back and forth across the balconies. Most packs entered with an air of harried self-importance. He smiled to himself. One glance into the pit was enough to shatter their smugness. The air above them was filled with buzzing talk. None of the packs looked like Woodcarver, but then she'd have few of her members from before. He could only recognize her by manner and bearing. It shouldn't matter. He carried some friendships far longer than any member's lifespan. But with others, the friend had changed in a decade, its viewpoints altering, affection turning to animosity. He'd been counting on Woodcarver being the same. Now. There was a brief sound of trumpets, almost like a call to order. The pubic doors of a lower balcony slid open and, five, and a five-some entered. Peregrine felt a twitchy thrill of horror. This was Woodcarver, but so misarranged. One member was so old that it had to be helped by the rest. Two were scarcely more than puppies, and one of those a constant drooler. The largest member was white-eyed blind. It was the sort of thing you might see in a waterfront slum, or in the last generation of incest. She looked down at Peregrine and smiled almost as if she recognized him. When she spoke, it was with the blind one. The voice was clear and firm. Please carry on, vendacious. The Chamberlain nodded. As you wish, your majesty. He pointed into the pit at the alien. This is the reason for this hasty meeting. We can see monsters at the circus, Vendacious. The voice came from an overdressed pack on the top balcony. To judge from the shouting that came from all sides, this was a minority view. One pack on the lower balcony jumped over the railing and tried to shoo the doctor away from the alien's litter. The chamberlain raised a head for silence and glared down at the fellow who had jumped into the pit. If you please, Scrupulo, Scrupilo, be patient. Everyone will get a chance to look. Scrupilo made some grumbling hisses, but backed off. Good. Vendacious turned all his attention on Peregrine and Scriber. Your boat has outrun any news from the north, my friends. No one but I knows anything of your story, and what I have is, gu is guard codes hooted across the bay. You say this creature flew down from the sky? An invitation to speechify. Peregrine let Scriber Jacaramuffin do the talking. Scriber loved it. He told the story of the flying house, of the ambush and the murders, and the rescue. He showed them his eye tools and announced himself as a secret agent of the Long Lakes Republic. Now what real spy would do that? Every pack on the council had eyes on the alien, some fearful, some, like Scrupilo, crazily curious. Woodcarver watched with only a couple of heads. 
The rest might have been asleep. She looked tired as Peregrine felt. She looked as tired as Peregrine felt. He rested his own heads on his paws. The pain and scar was a pulsing beat. It would be easy enough to set the member asleep, but then he'd understand very little of what was being said. Hey, maybe that wasn't such a bad idea. Scar drifted off and the pain receded. The talk went on for some minutes more, not making a whole lot of sense to the threesome that was Rick Rack. He understood the tones of voice, though. Scrupilo, the pack on the floor, complained several times impatiently. Fendacious said something, agreeing with him. The doctor retreated, and Scrupilo advanced on Rick Rack's alien. Peregrine pulled himself to full wakefulness. Be careful, the creature is not friendly. Scrupilo snapped back. Your friend has already warned me once. He circled the litter, staring at the alien's brown, furless face. The alien stared back, impassive. Scrupilo reached forward cautiously and drew back the alien's quilt. Still no response. See, said Scrupilo, it knows I mean no harm. Peregrine had not said nothing to correct him. It really walks on those rear paws alone, said one of the other advisors. Can you imagine it, towering over us? One little bump would knock it down. Laughter. Peregrine remembered how mantis-like the alien had seemed when upright. These fellows hadn't seen it move. Scrupilo wrinkled the nose. The thing is filthy. He was all around her, a posture that Peregrine knew upset the two legs. That arrow shaft must be removed, you know. Most of the bleeding is stopped, but if we expect the creature to live for long, it needs medical attention. He looked disdainfully at Scriber and Peregrine, as if they were to blame for not performing surgery aboard the twin hole. Something caught his eye, and his tone abruptly changed. By the pack of packs, look at its forepaws. He loosened the ropes about the creature's front legs. Two paws like that would be as good as five pairs of lips. Think of what a pack of these creatures could do. He moved close to the five-tentacled paw. Be careful, Peregrine started to say. The alien abruptly bunched its tentacles into a club. Its foreleg flicked out at an impossible angle, ramming its paw into Scrupilo's head. The blow couldn't have been too strong, but it was precisely placed on the tympanum. Ow! Yow! Yow! Wow! Wow! Scrupilo danced back. The alien was shouting, too. It was all mouth noise, thin and low-pitched. The eldritch sound brought up every head, even woodcarvers. Peregrine had heard it many times by now. There was no doubt in his mind. This was the alien's interpack speech. After a few seconds, the sound changed to make a regular, to a regular hacking that gradually faded. For a long moment, no one spoke. Then part of woodcarver got to her feet. She looked at Scrupilo. Are you all right? It was the first time she had put, spoken since the beginning of the meeting. Scrupilo was licking his forehead. Yes, it smarts is all. Your curiosity will kill you some day. The other huffed indignantly, but also seemed flattered by the prediction. Queen Woodcarver looked at her counselors. I see an important question here. Scrupilo thinks one alien member could, would be as agile as an entire pack of us. Is that so? She pointed the question at Peregrine rather than Scriber. Yes, your majesty. If those ropes had been tied within its reach, it could easily have unknotted them. He knew where this was going. He'd had three days to get there himself. And the noises it makes sound like coordinated speech to me. There was a swell of talk as the others caught on. An articulate member can often make semi-sensible speech, but usually at the expense of dexterity. Yes, a creature like nothing on our world, whose boat flew down from the top of heaven. I wonder at the mind of such a pack, if a single member is almost as smart as all of one of us. Her blind one looked around as it made the words, almost as if it could see. Two others wiped at her drooler's muzzle. She was not an inspiring sight. Scrupilo poked a head up. I hear not a hint of thought sound from this one. There is no four tympanum. He pointed at the torn clothing around the creature's wound. And I see no sign of shoulder tympana. Perhaps it is a pack, it is pack smart, even as a singleton. And perhaps that's all aliens ever are. Peregrine smiled to himself. This Scrupilo was a prickly twit but not one who held with tradition. For centuries, academics had debated the difference between people and animals. Some animals had larger brains. Some had paws or lips more agile than a member's. In the savannas of Easterly, there were creatures that even looked like people and ran in groups, but without much depth of thought. Leaving aside wolf nests and whales, only people were packs. It was the coordination of thought between members that made them superior. Scrupulo's theory was a heresy. Jacarifaman said, but we did hear thought sounds, loud ones, during the ambush. Perhaps this one is like our unweaned, unable to think. And yet still almost as smart as a pack. Woodcover finished somberly. If these people are not smarter than we, then we might learn their devices. 
No matter how magnificent they are, we could eventually be their equals. But if this member is just one of a super pack, for a moment there was no talk, just the muted under edge of her counselor's thoughts. If the aliens were super packs, and if their envoy had been murdered, then there might not be anything they could do to save themselves. So our first priority should be to save this creature, to befriend it and learn its true nature. Her head's lowered, and she seemed lost within herself, or perhaps just tired. Abruptly, she turned several heads toward her chamberlain. Move the creature to the lodge by mine. Vendacia Vendacious started with surprise. Surely not, your majesty. We've seen that it is hostile, and it needs medical attention. Woodcarver smiled, and her voice turned silky. Peregrine remembered that tone from before. Do you forget that I know surgery? Do you forget that I am the woodcarver? Vendacious licked his lips and looked at the other advisors. After a second, he said, No, your majesty, it will be as you wish. And Peregrine felt like cheering. Perhaps Woodcarver still did run things. Chapter 12 Peregrine was sitting back to back on the steps of his quarters when Woodcarver came to see him the next day. She came alone and wearing the simple green jackets he remembered from his last visit. He didn't bow or go out to meet her. She looked at him coolly for a moment and sat down just a few yards away. How is the two legs? She, he asked. I took out the arrow and sewed the wound shut. I think it will survive. My advisors were pleased. The creature didn't act like a reasoning being. It fought even after it was tied down, as though it had no concept of surgery. How is your head? All right, as long as I don't move around. The rest of him, Scar, lay behind the doorway in the dark interior of the lodge. The tympanum is healing straight, I think. I'll be fine in a few days. Good. A wrecked tympanum could mean continuing mental problems, or the need for a new member, and the pain of finding a use for the singleton that was sent into silence. I remember you, Pilgrim. All the members are different. But you really are the peregrine of, of before. You had some great stories. I enjoyed your visit. And I enjoyed meeting the great woodcarver. That is the reason I returned. She cocked ahead wryly. The great woodcarver of before, not the wreck of now? He shrugged. What happened? She didn't answer immediately. For a moment, they sat and looked across the city. It was cloudy this afternoon, with rain coming. The breeze off the channel was a cool stinging on his lips and eyes. Woodcarver shivered and puffed her fur out a bit. Finally, she said, I held my soul six hundred years, and that's counting by four claws. I should think it's obvious what has become of me. Can you hear an ice cream truck outside? The perversion never heard you before. Peregrine was not normally so blunt. Something about her brought out the frankness in him. Yes, the average incest degrades to my state in a few centuries, and is an idiot long before then. My, method, my methods were much cleverer. I knew who to breed with whom, which, which puppies to keep and which to put on others. So it was always my flesh bearing my memories, and my soul remained pure. But I didn't understand enough, or perhaps I tried the impossible. The choices got harder and harder, till I was left with choosing between brains and physical defect. She wiped away the drool, and all but the blind one looked out across her city. These are the best days of summer, you know. Life is a green madness just now, trying to squeeze the last bit of warmth from the season. And the green did seem to be everywhere it could be, featherleaf down the hillside and in the town, ferns all over the near hill hillsides, and heather struggling towards the gray crowns of the mountain across the channel. I love this place. He never expected to be comforting the woodcarver of woodcarvers. You made a miracle here. I've heard it. I've heard of it all the way on the other side of the world, and I'll bet that half the packs around here are related to you. Y yes, I've been successful beyond a rake's wildest de dreams. I've had no shortage of lovers, even if I couldn't use the pups myself. Sometimes I think my get has been my greatest experiment. Scrupilo and Vendacious are mostly my offspring, but so is Flenzer. Huh, Peregrine hadn't known that last. The last few decades, I'd more or less accepted my fate. I couldn't outwit eternity. Sometime soon I would let my soul sip, slip free. I let the council take over more and more. How I could claim the domain after... How could I claim the domain after I was no longer me? I went back to art. You saw those monochrome mosaics. Yes, they're beautiful. I'll show you my picture loom sometime. The procedure is tedious, but almost automatic. It was a nice project for the last years of my soul. But now, you and your alien have changed everything. Damn it. If only this had happened a hundred years ago. What I could have done with it. We've been playing with your picture box, you know. The pictures are finer than any in our world. 
They're a bit like my mosaics, the way the sun is like a glow bug. Millions of colored dots go to make each picture. The tile's so small you can't see them without one of the scriber's eye tools. I've worked for years to make a few dozen mosaics. The picture box can make an unnumbered thousands. So fast they seem to move. Your aliens make my life... Uh, you, your aliens make my life less than an unweaned pup scratching in its cradle. The queen of the woodcarvers was softly cry crying, but her voice was angry. And now the whole world is going to change, but too late for such wreckage as I. Almost without conscious thought, Peregrine extended one of his members toward the woodcarver. He walked unseemly close. Eight yards. Five. Their thoughts were suddenly fuzzy with interference, but he could feel her calming. She laughed blearily. Thank you. Strange that you should be sympathetic. The greatest problem of, of my life is nothing to a pilgrim. You were hurting. It was all he could think to say. But you pilgrims change and change and change. She eased one of herself close to him. They were almost touching, and it was even harder to think. Peregrine spoke slowly, concentrating on every word, hoping he wouldn't forget his point. But I do keep something of a soul. The parts that remain a pilgrim must have a certain outlook. Sometimes great insight comes in the noise of battle or intimacy. This was such a time. And, and I think the world itself is due for a change of soul now that we have two legs dropping from the sky. What better time for Woodcarver to give up the old? She smiled and the confusion became louder, but a pleasant thing. I hadn't thought of it that way. Now is the time to change. Peregrine walked into her midst. The two packs stood for a moment, necking, thoughts blending into sweet chaos. Their last clear recollection was of stumbling up the steps and into his lodge. Late that afternoon, Woodcarver brought the picture box to Scrupilo's laboratory. When she arrived, Scrupilo and Vendacious were already present. Scriber Jacaramuffin was there too, but standing farther from the others than courtesy might demand. She had interrupted some kind of argument. A few days before, such squabbling would have just depressed her. Now she dragged her limper into the room and looked at the others through her drooler's eyes and smiled. Woodcarver felt the best she had in years. She had made her decision and acted on it, and now there were new adventures to be had. Scriber brightened at her entrance. Did you check on Peregrine? How is he? He's fine, fine, just fine. Oops, no need to show them how fine he really is. I mean, there will be a full recovery. Your Majesty, I'm very grateful to you and your doctors. Wickraxgar is a good pack, and I... I mean, even a pilgrim can't change members every day, like suits of clothes. Woodcarver waved an offhand acknowledgement. She walked to the middle of the room and set the alien's picture box on the table there. It looked like nothing so much as a big pink pillow, with floppy ears and weird animal design sewed on its cover. After playing with it for a day and a half, she was getting pretty good at opening the thing up. As always, two legs, uh, the two legs' face appeared, making mouth noises. As always, Woodcarver felt an instant of awe at seeing the moving mosaic. A million colored tiles had to flip and shift in absolute syn synchrony to create the illusion. Yet it happened exactly the same each time. She turned the screen so, so Scrupilo and Vend Vendacious could see. Jacarabuffin edged towards the others, and craned a pair of heads to look. "'You still think the box is an animal?' he said to Vendacious. "'Perhaps you could feed it sweets and it would tell us secrets, eh?' Woodcarver smiled to herself. Scriber was no pilgrim. Pilgrims depend on goodwill too much to go around giving the needle to the powerful. Vendacious just ignored him. All his eyes were on her. "'Your Majesty, please do not take offense. I, we of the Council, must ask you again.' This picture box is too important to be left in the mouths of a single pack, even one so great as you. Please, leave it to the rest of us, at least when you sleep. No offense taken. If you insist, you may participate in my investigations. Beyond that, I will not go. She gave him an innocent look. Vendacious was a superb spy master, a mediocre administrator, and an incompetent scientist. A century ago, she would have been... She... A century ago, she would have the likes of him out tending the crops, if she chose to stay at all. A century ago, there had been no need for spy masters, and one administrator had been enough. How things had changed. She absent-mindedly nuzzled the picture box. Perhaps things would change again. Scrupilo took Scriber's question seriously. I see three possibilities, sir. First, that it is magic. Vendacious winced away from him. Indeed, the box may be so far beyond our understanding that it is magic. But that is one the one heresy the woodcarver has never accepted, and so I courteously omit it. He flicked a sardonic smile at woodcarver. 
Second, that it is an animal. A few on the council thought so when Scriber first made it talk. But it looks like a stuffed pillow, even down to the amusing figure stitched on its side. More importantly, it responds to stimuli with perfect repeatability. That is something I do recognize. That is a behavior of a machine. That's your third possibility, said Scriber. But to be a machine means to have nothing moving parts and except for... Woodcarver shrugged the tail at them. Scrupilo could go on like this for hours, and she saw that Scriber was the same type. I say, let's learn more, and sp then speculate. She tapped the corner of the box, just as Scriber had in his original demonstration. The alien's face vanished from the picture, replaced by a dizzying pattern of color. There was a splatter of sound, then nothing but the mid-pitch hum of the box always made. The mid-pitch the hum, or the mid-pitch hum the box always made when the top was open. They knew the box could hear low-pitched sounds, and it could feel through the square pad on its base. But that pad was itself a kind of picture screen. Certain commands transformed the grid of touch, touch spots into entirely new shapes. The first time they did that, the box refused any further commands. Vendacious had been sure that they had killed the little alien. But they had closed the box and reopened it, and, they, and it was back to its original behavior. Woodcarver was almost certain that nothing they could do by teaching it, or by talking to it or touching it, would hurt the thing. Woodcarver retried the known signals in the usual order. The results were spectacular and identical to before. But change that order in any way and the effects would be different. She wasn't sure if she agreed with Scrupilo. The box behaved with the repeatability of a machine, yet the variety of its responses was much more like an animal's. Behind her, Scriber and Scrupilo edged members across the floor. Their heads were stuck high in the air as they strained for a clear look at the screen. The buzz of their thoughts came louder and louder. Woodcarver tried to remember what she'd been planning next. Finally, the noise was just too much. Will you two please back off? I can't hear myself think. This isn't a choir, you know. Sorry. This okay? They moved back about 15 feet. Woodcarver nodded. The two members were less than 20 feet from each other. Scrupilo and Scriber must be really eager to see the screen. Vendacious had kept a proper distance, and a look of alert enthusiasm. I have a suggestion, said Scriber. His voice was slurred from the effort of concentrating over Scrupilo's thoughts. When you touch the four slash three square and say, he made the alien sounds. Uh, they were all very easy to do. The screen shows a collection of pictures. They seem to match the squares. I think we, we are being given choices. Hmm. The box could end up training us. If this is a machine, we need some new definitions. Very well. Let's play with it. Three hours passed. Toward the end, even Vendacious had moved a member nearer the screen. The noise in the room verged on mindless chaos and everybody had suggestions. Say that, press this, last time it said that, we did thus and so. They were intricate colored designs, sprinkled with things that must have been written language. Tiny, two-legged figures scampered across the screen, shifting the symbols, opening little windows. Scriber Jacarifamon's idea was quite right. The first pictures were choices, but some of those led to further pictures of choices. The options spread out, tree-like, Scriber said. He wasn't quite right. Sometimes they came back to an earlier point. It was a metaphorical network of streets. Four times they ended up in cul-de-sacs and had to shut the box and begin again. Vendacious was madly drawing maps of the paths. That would help. There were places they would want to see again. But even he realized that there were unnumbered other paths, places that blind exploration would never find. And Woodcarver would have given a good part of her soul for the pictures she had already seen. There were starscapes. There were moons that had shown blue and green. Or banded orange. The removing pictures of alien cities, of thousands of aliens so close that they were actually touching. If they ran in packs, those packs were bigger than anything in the world, even in the tropics. And maybe the question was irrelevant. The cities were beyond anything she ever imagined. Finally, Jacarifamon backed off. He huddled, he huddled together. There was a shiver in his voice. Th there's a whole universe in there. We could follow it forever and never know. She looked at the other two. For once, Vendacious had lost his smugness. There were ink stains on all his lips. The writing benches around him were littered with dozens of sketches, some clearer than others. He dropped the pen and gasped. I say we take what we have and study it. He began gathering the sketches, piling them into a neat stack. Tomorrow, after a good sleep, our heads will be clear and... Scrupilo dropped back and stretched. His eyes had excited red rims. Fine, but leave the sketches, friend Vendacious. He jabbed at the drawings. See that one and that? 
It's clear that our blundering gets us plenty of empty results. Sometimes the picture box just locks us out, but much more often, we get that picture. No options, just a couple of aliens dancing in a forest and making rhythm sounds. Then if we say, and he repeated part of the sequence, we get that picture of piles of sticks. The first with one, the second with two, and so on. Woodcarver saw it too. Yes, and a figure comes out and points to each of the piles and says a short noise by each. She and Scrupillo stared at each other, seeing the same gleam in each other's eyes, the excitement of learning, of finding order where there had seemed only chaos. It had been a hundred years since he, she last felt this way. Whatever this thing is, it's trying to teach us the two legs language. In the days that followed, Joanna Olsen Dot had lots of time to think. The pain in her chest and shoulder gradually eased. If she moved carefully, it was only a pulsing soreness. They had taken the arrow out and sewed the wound closed. She had feared the worst when they had tied her down, when she saw the knives in their mouths and the steel on their claws. Then they began cutting. She had not known there could be such pain. She still shuddered with remembered agony, but she didn't have nightmares about it, the way she did about... Mom and Dad were dead. She had seen them die with her own eyes, and Jeffrey? Jeffrey might still be alive. Sometimes Joanna could go a whole afternoon full of hope. She had seen the cold sleepers burning on the ground below the ship, but those inside might have survived. Then she would remember the indiscriminate way the attackers had flamed and slashed, killing everything around the ship. She was a prisoner, but for now the murderers wanted her well. The guards were not armed, beyond their teeth and tines. They kept well away from her when they could. They knew she could hurt them. They kept her inside a big dark cabin. When she was alone, she paced the floor. The dog things were barbarians. The surgery without anesthetics was probably not even intended as torture. She hadn't seen any aircraft or any sign of electricity. The toilet was a slot carved in a marble slab. The hole went so deep that you could scarcely hear the plop hit bottom. But it smelled, it still smelled bad. These creatures were as backward as people in the darkest ages on Yoria. They had never had technology, or they had thoroughly forgotten it. Joanna almost smiled. Mom had liked novels about shipwrecks and heroines marooned on lost colonies. The big deal was usually to reinvent technology and repair the space spacecraft. Mom was, had been, so into the history of science, she loved the details of those stories. Well, Johanna was living it now, but with important differences. She wanted rescue, but she also wanted revenge. These creatures were nothing like human. In fact, she couldn't remember reading of anything quite like them. She'd have looked for them in her data set, especially ha they had taken that. Ha, let them play with it. They'd quickly run into the, her booby traps and find themselves totally locked out. At first there were only blankets to keep warm. Then they'd given her clothes cut like her jumpsuit, but made of puffy quilting. They were warm and sturdy, the stitching neater than anything she imagined a non-machine could do. Now she could comfortably walk around outside. The garden beyond her cabin was the best thing about the place. It was about a hundred meters square, and followed the slope of a hillside. There were lots of flowers and trees with long feathery leaves. Flagstoned walks curved back and forth through mossy turf. It was a peaceful place if she let it be, a little like their backyard on Strom. There were walls, but from the high end of the garden she could see over them. The, angle, the walls angled this way and that, and in places she could see their other side. The window's slits were like something out of her history lessons. They let you shoot arrows or bullets without making a target out of yourself. When the sun was out, Joanna liked to sit where the smell of the feather leaves was the strongest and look over the lower walls at the bay. She still wasn't sure just what she was seeing. There was a harbor. A forest of spars was almost like the marinas on Strom. The town had wide streets, but they zigged and zagged and the buildings along them were all askew. In places there were open-roofed mazes of stone. From up here, she could see the pattern. And there was another wall, a rambling thing that ran on as far as she could see. The hills beyond were crowned with gray rock and patches of snow. She could see the dog things down in the town. Individually, you could almost mistake them for dogs, snake-necked, rat-headed ones. But watch them from a distance and you saw their true nature. They always moved in small groups, never more than six. Within the, pa within the pack they touched, cooperated with clever grace, but she never saw one group come closer than about ten meters to another. From her distant viewpoint, the members of the pack seemed to merge, and she could imagine she was seeing one, one multi-limbed beast ambling cautiously along, careful not to come too close to a similar monster. By now, the conclusion was inescapable. One pack, one mind. 
minds so evil they could not bear to be close to one another. Her fifth time in the garden was the prettiest yet, a coercion towards joy. The flowers had sprayed downy sheets and seeds into the air. The lowering sunlight sparkled off them as they floated by the thousands on the slow breeze, clots in an invisible syrup. She imagined what Geoffrey would do here, first pretend to grown-up dignity, then bounce from one foot to the other. Finally, he would race down the hillside, trying to capture as many of the flying tufts as he could, laughing and laughing. One, two, how do you do? It was a child's voice behind her. Joanna jumped so fast she almost tore her stitches. Sure enough, there was a pack behind her. They, it, was the one who had cut the arrow out of her. A mangy lot. The five were crouched, ready to run away. They looked almost as surprised as Joanna felt. One, two, how do you do? The voice came again, exactly as before. It might as well have been a recording, except that one of the animals was somehow synthesizing that sound with the buzzing patches of skin on his shoulders, haunches, and head. The parrot act was nothing new to her, but this time the words were almost appropriate. The voice was not hers, but she had heard that chant before. She put hands on hips and stared at the pack. Two of the animals stared back. The others seemed to be admiring the scenery. One licked nervously at its paw. The two rear ones were carrying her data set. Suddenly she knew where they'd gotten that sing-song question, and she knew what they expected in response. I am fine, and how do you do? she said. The pack's eyes widened almost comically. I am fine, so then we are, are we all? It completed the game, then emitted a burst of gobbling. Someone replied from down the hill. There was another pack there, lurking in the bushes. She knew that if she stayed near this one, the other wouldn't approach. So the tines, she always thought of them by those claws on their front feet, those she would never forget, had been playing with the pink olif oliphant and hadn't been stopped by the booby, booby traps. That was better than Geoffrey ever imagined. It was clear they had fallen into the kinder mode language programs. She, sh she should have thought of that. When the data set noticed, noted sufficiently asinine responses, it would adapt its behavior, first for young children, and, if that didn't work, for youngsters who didn't even speak Sam Norsk. With just a little cooperation from Joanna, they could learn her language. Did she want that? The pack walked a little nearer, at least two of them watching her all the time. They didn't seem quite so ready to bolt as before. The nearest one dropped to its belly and looked up at her. Very cute and helpless, if you didn't see the claws. My name is... Joanna heard a short burst of gobble with an overtone that seemed to buzz right through her head. What is your name? Joanna knew it was all part of the language script. There was no way the creature could understand the individual words it was saying. That my name, your name pair was repeated over and over again until the, between the children in the language program. A vegetable would get the point eventually. Still, the Tyne's pronunciation was so perfect. My name is Joanna, she said. Joanna said the pack with Joanna's voice and splitting the word stream incorrectly. Joanna corrected Joanna. She wasn't even going to try to say the Tyne's name. Hello, Joanna. Let's play the naming game. And that was from the script, too, complete with the silly enthusiasm. Joanna sat down. Sure, learning Sam Norsk would give the Tyne's power over her, but it was the only way she could learn about them, the only way she could learn about Jeffrey. And if they had murdered Jeffrey, too, well, then she could learn to hurt them as much as they deserved. Chapter 13 At Woodcarver's and then, a few days later, at Flenser's Hidden Island, the long daylight of Arctic summer ended. At first there was a little twilight just around midnight, when even the highest hill stood in shadow, and then the hours of dark grew quickly. Day fought night, and night, night was winning. The feather leaf in the low valleys changed to autumn colors. Looking up a fjord in daylight was to see orange-red <coughs> on the lower hills, and then the green of heather merging imperceptibly to the grays of lichen and the darker grays of naked rock. The snow patches waited for their time. It would come soon. At every sunset, each day a few minutes earlier, Tyrethecht toured the ramparts of Flenser's outer wall. It was a three-mile walk. The lower levels were guarded by linear packs, but up here there were only a few lookouts. When she approached, they stepped aside with military precision, more than military precision. She saw the fear in their look. It was hard to get used to that. For almost as far back as she had clear memories, twenty years, Tyrethecht had lived in fear of others, in shame and guilt, in search of someone to follow. Now all that was all that was turned on its head. It was not an improvement. She knew now, from the inside, the evil that she had given herself to. She knew why the sentries feared her. To them, she was Flenser. Of course, she never gave any hint of these thoughts. 
Her life was only as safe as the success of her fraud. Tyrethex had work hard, worked hard to suppress her natural, shy mannerisms. Not once since coming to Hidden Island had she caught herself in the old bashful habit of heads lowering, eyes closing. Instead, Tyrethecht had the Flenser stare, and she used it. Her passage around the top wall was as stark and ominous as Flenser's had ever been. She looked out over her, his, domain, with the same hard gaze as before, all heads front, as if seeing visions beyond, the petty minds of the disciples. They must never guess her real reason for these sunset sweeps. For a time, the days and nights were like the re in the Republic. She could almost imagine she was still back there, before the movement and the massacre at Parliament Bowl, before they cut their throats and wet pieces of flenser to the stumps of her soul. In the golden russet fields beyond the stone curtains, she could see peasants trimming the fields and the herds. Flenser ruled lands far beyond her view, but he had never imported food. The grain and meat that filled the storehouses were all produced within a two-day march of the straits. The strategic intent was clear. It made for a peaceful evening's view and brought back memories of her home and school. The sun slid sideways into the mountains. Long shadows swept the farmlands. Flenser's castle was left an island in a sea of shadow. Tyrethecht could smell the cold. There would be frost again tonight. Tomorrow the fields would be covered with false snow that would last an hour past sunrise. She pulled the long jackets close around her and walked to the eastern lookout. Across the straits, one of the near hilltops was still in the sun. The alien ship had landed there. It was still there, but now behind wood and stone. Steel began building there right after the landing. The quarries at the north end of Hidden Island were busier now than ever in Flenser's time. The barges hauling stone to the mainland made a steady traffic across the straits. Even now that the light was not day round, Steel's construction went on non-stop. His incallings and lesser inspections were harsher than Flenser's had used to be. Lord Steel was a killer, worse, a manipulator. But since the alien landing, Tyrethecht knew that he was something else, deathly afraid. He had good reason, and even though the folk he feared might ultimately kill them all, in her secret soul she wished them well. Steel and his flunzerists had attacked the star people without warning, more out of greed than fear. They had killed dozens of beings. In a way, the murders were worse than what, than what the movement had done to her. Tyrethecht had followed the flunzer of her own free will. She had had friends who had warned, about, warned her about the movement. But there had been dark stories about the Flenser, and not all had been government propaganda. But she had so wanted to follow, to give herself to something greater. They had used her, literally, as their tool. Yet she could have avoided it. The Star People had no such option. Steel simply butchered them. So now Steel labored out of fear. In the first three days he had covered the flying ship with a roof. A sudden, silly farmhouse had appeared on the hilltop. Before long the alien craft would be hidden behind stone walls. Ultimately, the new fortress would be, might be bigger than the one on Hidden Island. Steel knew that if his villainy did not destroy him, it would make him the most powerful pack in the world. And that was Tyrethect's reason for staying, for continuing her masquerade. She couldn't go on forever. Sooner or later, the other fragments could, would, would reach Hidden Island. Tyrethect would be destroyed, and all of Flenser could, would live again. Perhaps she wouldn't survive even that long. Two of Tyrethect were of Flenser. The master had miscalculated in thinking they could dominate the other three. Instead, the conscience of the three had come to their own brilliance of the two. Come to own the brilliance of the two. She remembered almost everything the great Flenser had known, all the tricks and all the betrayals. The two had given her an intensity she had never had before. Tyrethect laughed to herself. In a sense, she had gained what she had been so naively seeking in the movement, and the great Flenser had made exactly the mistake that in his arrogance he thought impossible. As long as she could keep the two under control, she had a chance. When she was all awake, there wasn't much problem. She still felt herself a she, still remembered her life in the Republic more clearly than the Flenser memories. It was different when she slept. There were nightmares. The memories of torment inflicted suddenly seemed sweet. Sleep time sex would soothe. With her, it was a battle. She awoke sore and cut, as if she had been fighting a rapist. If the two ever broke free, if she ever awoke a he, it would take only a few seconds for the two to denounce the masquerade, only a little longer to kill the three and put the Flenser members aboard a more manageable pack. Yet she stayed. Steel meant to use the aliens and their ship to spread Flenser's nightmare worldwide, but his plan was fragile, with risks on every side. If there was anything she could do to destroy it in the Flenser movement, she would. Across the castle, 
Only the western tower still hung in sunlight. No faces showed at the window slits, but the eyes looked out. Steel watched the Flenser fragment, the Flenser in waiting as it styled itself, on the ramparts below. The fragment was accepted by all the commanders. In fact, they accorded it almost the awe they had given to the full Flenser. In a sense, Flenser had made them all, so it wasn't surprising they felt a chill in the master's presence. Even Steel felt it. In his shaping, Flenser had forced the aborning Steel to try to kill him. Each time, Steel had been caught and his weakest members tortured. Steel knew the conditioning was there, that was there, and that helped him fight it. If anything, he told himself, the Flenser frag was in greater danger because of it. In trying to counter the fear, Steel might just miscalculate and act more violently than was appropriate. Sooner or later, Steel had to decide if he didn't kill it before the other fragments reached Hidden Island, then all of Flenser would be here again. If two members could dominate Steel's regime, then six would totally erase it. Did he want the Master dead? And if he did, was there any surely safe way? Steele's mind flickered lightly all around the issue as he walked, watched the black, frocked path. Steele was used to playing for high stakes. He had been born playing for them. Fear and death and winning were his whole life. But never had the stakes been as high as now. Flinzer had come close to subverting the largest nation on the continent and had had dreamings of, dreams of ruling the world. Lord Steele looked to the hillside across the straits at the new castle he was building. In his present game, world conquest would follow easily on victory, and the destru destruction of the world was a conceivable consequence of failure. Steele Steel had visited the flying ship shortly after the ambush. The ground was still steaming. Every hour it seemed to grow hotter. The mainland peasants talked of demons weaken wakened in the earth. Steele's advisors could not do much better. The white jackets needed padded boots to get close. Steel had ignored the steam, donned the boots, and walked beneath the curving hull. The bottom was vaguely like a boat's hull, if you ignored the stilts. Near the center was a teat-like projection, the ground directly underneath burbled with molten rock. The burned-out coffins were on the uphill side of the ship. Several of the corpses had been removed for dissection. In the first hours his advisors had been full of fanciful theories. The mantis folk were warriors fleeing a battle, come to bury their dead. So far, no one had been able to take a careful look inside the craft. The gray stairs were made of something as strong as steel yet feather light, but they were recognizably stairs, e even if the risers were high for the average member. Steel scrambled up the steps, leaving Shrek and his other advisors outside. He stuck a head through the hatch and winced back abruptly. The acoustics were deadly. He understood that the white jackets, what the white jackets were complaining about. How could the aliens bear it? One by one, he forced himself through the opening. Echoes screamed at him, worse than from an unpadded quartz. He quieted himself, as he had so often done in the master's presence. The echoes diminished, but they were still a horde raging in the walls all around. Not even his best white jackets could tolerate more than five minutes here. The thought made Steel stand straighter. Discipline. Quiet does not always mean submission. It can mean hunting. He looked around, ignoring the howling murmurs. Light came from bluish strips in the ceiling. As his eyes adjusted, he could see what his people had described to him. The interior was just two rooms. He was standing in the larger one. A cargo hold? There was a hatch in the far wall and, in, and, then, and then the second room. The walls were seamless. They met in angles that did not match the outer hull. There would be dead spaces. A breeze moved fitfully around the room, but the air was much warmer than outside. He had never been in a place that felt more of power and evil. Surely it was only a trick of acoustics. They would bring in some absorbent quilts, some side reflectors, and the feeling would go away. Still. The room was filled with coffins, these unburned. The place stank with the alien's body odor. Mold grew in the darker corners, in a way that was comforting. The aliens breathed and sweat, sweated as other living things, and for all their marvelous invention, they could not keep their own clean den clean. Steel wandered among the coffins. The boxes were mounted on railed racks. When the ones outside had been there, the rooms, the room must have been crammed full. Undamaged, the coffins were marvels of fine workmanship. Warm air exited slots along the sides. He sniffed at it, complex, faintly nauseating, but not the smell of death, and not the source of the overpowering stench of mantis sweat that hung everywhere. Each coffin had a window mounted on its top side. What effort to honor the remains of single members? Steele hopped onto one and looked down. The corpse was perfectly preserved. In fact, the blue light made everything look frozen. He cocked a second head over the edge of the box, got a double view on the creature within. 
It was far smaller than the two they had killed under the ship. It was even smaller than the one they had captured. Some of Steele's advisors thought that the small ones were pups, perhaps unweaned. It made sense. Their prisoner never made thought sounds. Partly as an act of discipline, he stared for a long while at the alien's queer, flat face. The echo of his mind was a continuing pain, eating at his attention, demanding that he leave. Let the pain continue. He had withstood worse before, and the packs outside must know that Steele was stronger than any of them. He could master the pain and have the greater insight, and then he could work their butts off, quilting these rooms and studying the contents. So Steele stared, almost thoughtless, into the face. The screaming in the walls seemed to fade a little. The face was so ugly. How could this creature eat? He had looked at the charred corpses outside, noticed their small jaws and randomly misshapen teeth. A few minutes passed, the noise and ugliness mixed together, dreamlike, and out of his trance, Steele knew, knew a nightmare horror. The face moved. The change was small, and it happened very, very slowly, but over a period of minutes, the face had changed. Steele's fell from the coffin. The walls screamed back in terror. For a few seconds, he thought the noise would kill him. Then he regained himself with a quiet thought. He crawled back and onto the box. All his eyes stared through the crystal, waiting like a pack on hunt. The change was regular. The alien in the box was breathing, but fifty times more slowly than any normal member. He moved to another box, watched the creature in it. Somehow they were all alive. Inside those boxes, their lives were simply slowed. He looked up from the boxes, almost in a daze. That the room reeked of evil was an illusion of sound, and also the absolute truth. The mantis alien had landed far from far from the tropics, away from the collectives. Perhaps it thought the Arctic Northwest a backward wilderness. It had come in a ship jammed with hundreds of mantis pups. These boxes were like larval casings. The pack would land, raise the small ones to adulthood, out of sight of civilization. Steel felt his pelts puff up as he thought about it. If the mantis pack had not been surprised, if Steel's troops had been any less aggressive, it would have been the end of the world. Steele staggered to the outer hatch, his fears coming out louder and louder off the walls. Even so, he paused a moment in the shadows and the screams. When his members trooped down the stairs, he moved calmly, every jacket neatly in place. Soon enough, his advisors would know the danger, but they would never see fear in him. He walked lightly across the steaming turf, out from under the hole. But even he could not resist a quick look across the sky. This was one ship, one pack of aliens. If it, it had had the misfortune of running into the movement. Even so, its defeat had been partly luck. How many other ships would land, had already landed? Was there time for him to learn from his, this victory? Steele's mind returned to the present, to his eerie lookout above the castle. That first encounter with the ship was many ten days past. There was still a threat, but now he understood it better, and, as was true of all great threats, it held great promise. On the rampart, Flenzer in waiting slid through the deepening twilight. Steele's eyes followed the pack as it walked through, walked beneath the torches, and one by one disappeared downstairs. There was an awful lot to the master in that fragment. It had understood many things about the alien landing before anyone else. Steele took one last look across the darkening hills as he turned and started down the spiral stair. It was a long, cramped climb. The lookout sat atop the, a forty-foot tower. The stair was barely fifteen inches wide, the ceiling less than less than and thirty inches above the steps. Cold stone pressed in from all around, so close that there were no echoes to confuse thought, yet also so close that the mind was squeezed into a long thread. Climbing the spiral required a twisting, strung-out posture that left any attacker easy prey for a defender in the eerie. Such was military architecture. For steel, crawling in the cramped dark was a pleasant exercise. The stairs opened onto a public hallway, ten feet across with back-off nooks every fifty feet. Shrek and a bodyguard were waiting for him. "'I have the latest from woodcarvers,' said Shrek. He was holding silk sheets of silk paper. Losing the other alien to woodcarvers had once seemed a major blow. Only gradually had he realized how well it could work out. He and woodcarvers infiltrated. He had woodcarvers infiltrated. At first he'd intended to have the other alien killed. It would have been easy to do. But the information that trickled north was interesting. There were some bright people at Woodcarver's. They were coming up with insights that had slipped past Steel and the Master, the fragment of the Master. So, in effect, the Woodcarver's had become Steel's second alien laboratory, and the movement's enemies were serving him like any other tool. The irony was irresistible. Very good, Shrek. Take it to my den. I'll be there shortly. 
Steele waved the white jackets into a backup nook and swept past him. Reading the report over brandy would be a pleasant reward for the day's work. In the meantime, there were other duties and other pleasures. The master had begun building the hidden castle, hidden island castle, more than a century earlier. It was growing yet. In the oldest foundations, where an ordinary ruler might put dungeons, were the, were the Flenser's first laboratories. Many could be mistaken for dungeons, and were by, and were by their inhabitants. Steele res reviewed all the labs at least once a ten day. Now he swept through the lowest levels. Crickers fled below the light of the guards' torches. There was a smell of rotting meat. Steele's paws skidded where the slickness lay upon the stone. Holes were dug to in the floor at regular intervals. Each could hold a single member, its legs jammed tight into its body. Each was covered by a lid with tiny air holes. It took the average member about three days to go mad in such isolation. The resulting raw material could be used to build blank packs. Generally, they weren't much more than vegetables. But then that was all the movement asked of some. And sometimes remarkable things came from these pits. Shrek, for instance. Shrek the colorless, some called him. Shrek the solid. A pack who was beyond pain, beyond desire. Shrek's was the loyalty of clockwork, but built from flesh and blood. He was no genius, but Steele would have, would have given an eastern province for five more of them. And the promise of, of more such successes made Steele use the isolation pits again and again. He had recycled most of the wrecks from the ambush that way. Steele climbed back to higher levels, where the really interesting experiments were undertaken. The world regarded Hidden Island with fascinated horror. They had heard of the lower levels, but most didn't realize what a small part those dark spaces played in the movement's science. To properly dissect a soul, you need more than benches with blood gutters. The results from the lower levels were simply the first steps in Flenser's intellectual quest. There were great questions in the world, things that had bothered Pax for thousands of years. How do we think? Why do we believe? Why is one Pax a genius and another an oaf? Before Flenser, philosophers argued them endlessly and never got closer to the truth. Even Woodcarver had pranced around the issues, unwilling to give up her traditional ethics. Flenser was prepared to get the answers. In these labs, nature itself was under interrogation. Steele walked across the chamber 100 yards wide, with a roof supported by dozens of stone pillars. On every side there were dark partitions, slate walls mounted on tiny wheels. The cavern could be blocked off, maze-like, into any pattern. Flenser had experimented with all the postures of thought. In the centuries before him, there had been only a few effective postures. The indistinctive, the instinctive heads together, the ring sentry, various work postures. Flenser had tried dozens more, stars, double rings, grids. Most were useless and confusing. In the star, only a single member could hear all the others, and each of those could only hear the one. In effect, all thought had to pass through the hub member. The hub could contribute nothing rational, yet all its misconceptions passed uncorrected to the rest. Drunken foolishness resulted. Of course, that experiment was reported to the outside world. But at least one of the others, still secret, worked strangely well. Flinzer posted eight packs around the floor and on temporary platforms, blocked them from each other, each another with the slate partitions, and then put members from each pack in connection with their counterparts and three others. In a sense, he created a pack of eight packs. Steele was still experimenting with that. If the connectors were sufficiently compatible, and that was the hard part, the resulting creature was far smarter than a ring sentry. In most ways, it was not as bright as a single heads together pack, yet sometimes it had striking insights. Before he left for the Long Lakes, the master had developed a plan to rebuild the castle's main hall so council sessions could be conducted in this posture. Steele hadn't pursued that idea. It seemed just a bit too risky. Steele's domination of others was not quite as complete as Flenser's had been. No matters. The others were far more... S there were other, far more significant projects. The rooms ahead were the true heart of the movement. Steele's soul had been born in these rooms. All of Flenser's greatest creations had begun there. During the last five years, Steele had continued the tradition and improved upon it. He walked down the hall that linked the separate suites. Each bore its number in inlaid gold. At each he opened the door and stepped partway through. His staff left their report on the previous ten day just inside. Steele quickly read each one, then poked a nose over the balcony to look at the experiment within. The balconies were well padded and screened. It was easy to observe without being seen. Flinzer's one weakness, in Steele's opinion, was his desire to create the superior being. 
The master's confidence was so immense, he believed that any such success could be applied to his own soul. Steele had no such illusions. It was a commonplace that teachers are surpassed by their creations. Pupils, fission children, adoptions, whatever. He, Steele, was the perfect illustration of this, though the master didn't know it yet. Steele had determined to create beings that would each be superior in some single way, while flawed and malleable in others. In the master's absence, he had begun a number of experiments. Steele worked from scratch, identifying inheritance lines independent of pack membership. His agents purchased or stole pups that might have potential. Unlike Flenzer, who usually melted pups into existing packs in an approximation of nature, Steele made his totally newborn. His puppy packs had no memories of fragment or fragments of soul. Steele had total control from the beginning. Of course, most such, most such constructions quickly died. The pups had to be parted from their wet nurses before they began to participate in the adult's consciousness. The resulting pack was taught entirely in speech and written language. All inputs could be controlled. Steele stopped before door number 33, experiment Amidriani Fani, mathematical excellence. It was not the only attempt in this direction, but it was by far the most successful. Steele's agents had searched the movement for packs with ability to, for abstraction. They had gone further. The world's most famous mathematician lived in the Long Lakes Republic. The pack had been preparing to fission. She had several puppies by herself and a mathematically talented lover. Steele had, the, Steele had had the pups taken. They matched his other acquisitions so well that he decided to make an eightsome. If things worked out, it might be beyond all nature in its intelligence. Steele motioned his guard to shield the torches. He opened door 33 and soft-toed one member to the edge of the balcony. He looked down, carefully silencing that member's four tympanum. The skylight was dim, but he could see the pups huddled together with its new friend, the mantis. Serendipity, that was all he could he could call this, the reward that comes to a researcher who labors long enough, carefully enough. He had to, he had, had two problems. The first had been growing for a year. Amidriani Fani was slowly fading, its members falling into the usual autism of holy newborn packs. The second was the captured alien. That was an enormous threat, an enormous mystery, an enormous opportunity. How to communicate with it? Without communication, the possibilities for manipulation were very limited. Yet in a single blind stroke, an incompetent servant had shown the way to solve both problems. Now that his eyes were adjusted to the dimness, Steele could see the alien beneath the pile of puppies. When first he'd heard that the creature had been put in with an experiment, Steele had been enraged beyond thought. The servant who made the mistake had been recycled. But the days passed. Experiment Amidriani Fani began showing more liveliness than at any time since the, its pups were weaned. It quickly became obvious, from dissecting the other aliens and observing this one, that mantis folk did not live in packs. Steele had a complete alien. The alien moved in its sleep and made a low-pitched mouth noise. It was totally incapable of any other kind of sound. The pups shifted to fit the new position. They were sleeping too, vaguely thinking among themselves. The low end of their sounds was a perfect imitation of the alien, and that was the greatest coup of all. Experiment Amidriani Fani was learning the alien's speech. To the pack of newborns, this was simply another form of interpack talk, and apparently its mantis friend was more interesting than the tutors who appeared on these balconies. The Flenzer fragment claimed it was the physical contact that the pups were reacting to the alien as a surrogate parent, thoughtless though, thoughtless though the alien was. It really didn't matter. Steele brought another head to the edge of the balcony. He stood quietly, neither member thinking directly at the other. The air smelled faintly of puppies and mantis sweat. These two were the movement's greatest treasure, the key to survival and more. By now, Steele knew the flying ship was not part of an invasion fleet. Their visitors were more like ill-prepared refugees. There had been no word of other landings, and the movement's spies were spread far. It had been a close thing, winning against the aliens. Their single weapon had killed most of a regiment. In the proper jaws, such weapons could defeat armies. He had no doubt the ship contained more powerful killing machines, ones that still functioned. Wait and watch, Steele counseled himself. Let Amidriani Fani show the levers that could control this alien. The entire world would be the prize. Chapter 14 Sometimes Mom used to say that something was more fun than a barrel full of puppies. Jeffrey Olsendot had never had more than one pet at a time, and only once had that been a dog. But now he understood what she meant. From the very first day, even when he had been so tired and scared, he had been entranced by the eight puppies. 
and they, they by him. They were all over him, pulling at his clothes, unfastening his shoes, sitting on his lap, or just running around him. Three or four were always staring at him. Their eyes were completely brown or pink, and seemed large for their heads. From the beginning, the puppies had mimicked him. They were better than the Stromly songbirds. Anything he said, they could echo, or play back later. And when he cried, often the puppies would cry too, and cuddle around him. There were other dogs, big ones that wore clothes and entered the room through doorways high up on the walls. They lowered food into the room, sometimes making strange noises. But the food tasted awful, and they didn't respond to Jeffrey's screaming, even by mimicking him. Two days had passed, then a week. Jeffrey had investigated everything in the room. It wasn't really a dungeon. It was too big. And besides, prisoners don't get pets. He understood that this world was uncivilized, not part of the realm, perhaps not even on the net. If Mom or Dad or Joanna weren't nearby, it was possible that there was no one here to teach the dogs to speak Sam Norsk. Then it would be up to Jeffrey Olsendot to teach the dogs and find his family. Now when the white-jacketed dogs came to, onto the corner balconies, Jeffrey shouted questions at them. It didn't help very much. Even the one with red stripes didn't respond. But the puppies did. They shouted right along with Jeffrey, sometimes echoing his words, sometimes making nonsense sounds. It didn't take Jeffrey long to realize that the puppies were driven by a single mind. When they ran around him, some would always stay, sit a little way off, with their graceful necks arching this way and that, and the runners seemed to know exactly what the others saw. He couldn't hide things behind his back if there was even one of them to alert the others. For a while he thought that they were somehow talking to each other, but it was more than that. When he watched them unfashion, unfasten his shoes or draw a picture, the heads and mouths and paws cooperated so perfectly, like the fingers on a person's hands. Jeffrey didn't reason things out so explicitly, but over a period of days he came to think of all the puppies together as a single friend. At the same time he noticed that the puppies was mixing up his words, and sometimes making new meanings. You, me, play. The words came out like a cheap voice splice, but they generally proceeded... They generally preceded a mad game of tag all around the furniture. You, me, picture. The slate board covered the lowest meter of the wall all around the room. It was a display device like Jeffrey had never seen in his life. Dirty, imprecise, imperfectly deletable, unstorable. Jeffrey loved it. His face and hands and most of Puppy's lips got covered with chalk stains. They drew each other and themselves. Puppies didn't draw neat pictures like Jeffrey's. Puppy's dog figures had big heads and paws, with the bodies all smudged together. When he drew Jeffrey, the hands were always big, each finger carefully drawn. Jeffrey drew his family and tried to make the puppies understand. Day by day, the sunlight circled higher on the walls. Sometimes the room was dark now. At least once a day, Pax came to talk to puppies. This was one of the few things which could pull all the little ones away from Jeffrey. Puppies would sit below the balconies, screeching and croaking at the adults. It was a school class. They'd lower scrolls for him to look at and retrieve ones he had marked. Jeffrey sat quietly and watched the lessons. He fidgeted, but he didn't shout at the teachers anymore. Just a little longer, and he and the puppies would really be talking. Just a little longer, and puppies could find out for him, for him, where Mom and Dad and Joanna were. Sometimes terror and pain are not the best levers. Deception, when it works, is the most elegant and least expensive manipulation of all. Once Amidriani Fani was fluent in the Mantis language, Steele had him explain about the tragic death of Jeffrey's parents and brood sibling. The Flenser fragment had argued against it, but Steele wanted quick and unquestioned control. Now it seemed that the fragment might have been right. At least he should have held out the hope that the brood sibling lived. Steele looked solemnly at the Amidriani Fani experiment. How can we help? The young pack looked up trustingly. Jeffrey is so terribly upset about his parents and sister. Amidriani Fani was using mantis words a lot, often unnecessarily. Sister, instead of brood sibling. He hasn't eaten, he hasn't been eating much. He doesn't want to play. It makes me very sad. Steele kept watch over the far balcony. The Flenser fragment was there. It was not hiding, though most of its faces were out of the candlelight. So far, its insights had been extraordinary. But the fragment's stare was like old times when a mistake could mean mutilation or worse. So be it. The stakes were higher now than ever before. If fear at Steele's throats could help him succeed, he welcomed it. He looked away from the balcony and brought all his faces to an expression of tender sympathy for poor Jeffrey's plight. You just have to make it, him, understand. No one can bring his parents or sister back to life, but we know who the murderers are. We're doing everything we can to defend against them. Tell him how hard this is. Woodcarvers is an empire that has lasted hundreds of years. In a fight, we are no match for them. That's why we need all the help he can give us. We need him to teach us to use his parents' ship. 
The puppy pack lowered a hand. Yes, I'll try, but... The three members by Jeffrey made low-pitched grunting noises at it. The mantis head sat bowed. Uh, it held its tentacle paws across its eyes. The creature had been like this for several days, and the withdrawal was getting worse. Now it shook its head violently, made sharp noises a little higher pitched than its normal register. Jeffrey says he doesn't understand how things work in the ship. He's just a little... This pack searched for a translation. He is really very young, you know, like me. Steele nodded understandingly. It was an obvious consequence of the alien singleton nature, but weird even so. Every single one of them started out a... Uh, uh, every one of them started out all a puppy. Every one of them was like Steele's puppy pack experiments. Parental knowledge was transmitted by the equivalent of interpack speech. That made the creature easy to dupe, but it was a damned inconvenience now. Still, if there's anything he can help explain. More grunting from the mantis. Steele should learn that language. The sounds were easy. Those pitiful creatures used their mouths to talk, like a bird or a forest slug. For now, he, demanded, he depended on a Midriani Fani. For now, that was okay. The puppy pack trusted him. Another piece of serendipity. With a few of his recent experiments, Steele had tried to love had tried love in place of Flenser's original terror-slash-love combination. There had been a slim chance that it might be superior. By great good luck, a Midriani Fani fell into the love group. Even his instructors had avoided negative reinforcement. The pack would believe anything he said, and so, Steele hoped, would the mantis. A Midriani Fani translated. There is something else. He has asked me about it before. Geoffrey knows how to wake the other children. The word literally meant pack of puppies. On the ship. You look surprised, my lord Steele. Even though he no longer dreamed in terror of monster minds, Steele would just as soon not have a hundred more aliens running around. I hadn't realized they could be wakened so easily, but we shouldn't do it right now. We're having trouble finding food that Jeffrey can eat. That was true. The creature was an incredibly finicky eater. I don't think we could feed any more right now. More grunting. More sharp cries from Jeffrey. Finally, there is one other thing, my lord. Jeffrey thinks it may be possible to use the ship's ultrawave to call for help from others like his parents. The Flenser fragment jerked out of the shadows. A pair of head heads looked down at the mantis, while another stared meaningfully at Steel. Steel didn't react. He could be cooler than any loose pack. That's something to think about. Perhaps you and Jeffrey could talk more about it. I don't want to try it, till we're sure we won't hurt the ship. That was weak, and he saw the fragment twitch a muzzle in amusement. As he spoke, a Midriani Fani was translating. Jeffrey responded almost immediately. Oh, that's okay. He meant a special call. Jeffrey says the ship has been signaling, all by itself, ever since it landed. And Steele wondered if he had ever heard uh if he had ever heard a deadly threat uttered in such a sweet innocence. They began letting Amdi and Jeffrey outside to play. Beforehand Amdi was nervous about going out. He was unused to wearing clothes. His whole life, all four years of it, had been spent in that one big room. He read about the outside and was curious about it, yet he was also a little afraid. But the human boy seemed to want it. Every day he'd been more withdrawn, his crying softer. Mostly he was crying for his parents or sister, but sometimes he cried about being locked up so deep away. So Amdi had talked to Mr. Steele, and now they got out almost every day, at least to an inner courtyard. At first, Geoffrey just sat, not really looking around. But Amdi discovered that he loved the outdoors, and every time he got his friend to play a little more. Packs of teachers and guards stood at the corners of the yellowing moss and watched. Amdi, and eventually Geoffrey, got a big kick out of harassing them. They hadn't realized it down in the room where visitors came at the balconies, but most adults were nervous around Geoffrey. The boy was half again as tall as, uh, half again as tall as a normally standing pack member. When he came close, the average pack would clump together and edge away. They didn't like having to look up at him. It was silly, Amdi thought. Jeffrey was so tall and skinny, he looked like he might topple over at any moment. And when he ran, it was like he was wildly trying to recover from a fall and never quite succeeding. So Amdi's favorite game on those first days was tag. Whenever he was the chaser, he contrived to run Jeffrey right through the most prim-looking white jackets. If he and Jeffrey did it right, they could turn their tag into a three-way event, Amdi chasing Jeffrey in a white jackets racing to stay away from both of them. Sometimes he felt sorry for the guards in white jackets. They were so stiff and grown up. Didn't they understand how much fun it was to have a friend that you walk right next to that you could actually touch? It was mostly night now. Daylight hovered for a few hours around noon. The twilight before and after was bright enough to dim the stars and aurora, but it was too, but still too faint to show colors. 
although Amdi had spent his life indoors. He understood the geometry of the situation and liked to watch the change of light. Jeffrey didn't much like the dark of winter until the first snow fell. Amdi got his first set of jackets, and Mr. Steele had special clothes made for the human. Boy, big puffy things that covered his whole body and kept him warmer than a good pelt would have done. On one side of the courtyard, the snow was just six inches deep, but elsewhere it piled into drifts higher than Amdi's head. Torches were mounted in windshields on the walls. Their light glittered golden off the snow. Amdi knew about snow, but he'd never seen it before. He loved to splash it on one of his jackets. He would stare and stare, trying to see the snowflakes without his breath melting them. The hexagonal pattern was tantalizing, just at the limit of his vision. But tag was no fun anymore. The human could run through drifts that le left Amdi swimming in the white stuff. There were other things the human could do, wonderful things. He could make balls of snow and throw them. The guards were very upset by this, especially when Jeffrey plinked a few members. It was the first time he ever saw them get angry. Amdi raced around the windswept side of the courtyard, dodging snowballs and keening frustration. Human hands were such wicked, wicked things. How he would love to have a pair, four pairs. He circled around from three sides and sprinted right at the human. Jeffrey backed quickly into deeper snow, but too late. Amdi hit him high and low, tipping the two legs over into a snowdrift. There was a mock battle, sl slashing lips and paws against Jeffrey's hands and feet. But now Amdi was on top. The human got paid back for his snowballs with plenty of snow sniffed, stuffed down the back of his jacket. Sometimes they just sat and watched the sky for so long that rumps and paws went numb. Sitting behind the largest snowdrift, they were shaded from the castle torches and had a clear view of the lights in the sky. At first, Amdi had been entranced by the aurora. Even some of his teachers were. They said that this part of the world was one of the best places to see the sky glow. Sometimes it was so faint that the torchlight glimmering off of the snow was enough to blot it out. Other times it ran from horizon to horizon, green light trimmed with hints of pink, twisting as, as though ruffled by a slow wind. He and Jeffrey could talk very easily now, though always in Jeffrey's language. The human couldn't make many of the sounds of interpack speech. Even his pronunciation of Amdi's name was scarcely recognizable. But Amdi understood Sam Norsk pretty well. It was fun, their own secret language. Jeffrey was not especially impressed by the aurora. We have that lots at home. It's just light from... He said a new word and glanced at Amdi. It was funny how the human couldn't look in more than one place at a time. His eyes and head were always moving. You know, places where people make things. I think the gas and waste leaks out, and then the sun lights it up or it gets unintelligible. Places where people make things? In the sky? Amdi had a globe. He knew the size of the world and its orientation. If the aurora were reflecting sunlight, it must be hundreds of miles above the ground. Amdi leaned aback against Jeffrey's jacket and made a very human whistling sound. His knowledge of geography was not up to his geometry, but... The packs don't work in the sky, Jeffrey. We don't even have flying boats. Uh, that's right, you don't. I don't know what that stuff is, then. But I don't like it. It gets in the way of the stars. Amdi knew all about the stars. Jeffrey had told him. Somewhere out there were the friends of Jeffrey's parents. Jeffrey was silent for several minutes. He wasn't looking at the sky anymore. Amdi wriggled a little closer, watching the shifting light in the sky. Behind them, the wind-sharpened crest of the drift was edged with yellow light from the torches. Amdi could imagine what the other was thinking. The commsets from the boat. They really aren't good enough to call for help? Jeffrey slapped the ground. No, I told you. They're just radio. I think I can make them work, but what's the use? The ultrawave stuff is still on the boat, and that's too big to move. I just don't understand why Mr. Steele won't let me go aboard. I'm eight years old, you know. I could figure it out. Mom had it all set up before. Before. His words guttered into the familiar, despairing silence. Amdi rubbed a head against Jeffrey's shoulder. He had a theory about Mr. Steele's reluctance. It was an explanation he hadn't told Jeffrey before. Maybe he's afraid he'll just fly away and leave us. That's stupid. I'd never leave you. Besides, that boat is real hard to fly. It was never meant to land on a world. Jeffrey said the strangest things. Sometimes Andy was just misunderstanding, but sometimes they were the literal truth. Did the humans really have ships that never came to ground? Where did they go then? Andy could almost feel the new scales of reference clicking together in his mind. Mr. Steele's geography globe represented not the world, but something very, very small in the true scheme of things. I know you wouldn't leave us, but you can see how Mr. Steele might be afraid. He can't even talk to you except through me. We have to show him that we can be trusted. I guess. If you and I could get the radios working, that might help. I know my teachers haven't figured them out. 
Mr. Steele has one, but I don't think he understands it either. Yeah, if we could get the other one to work. That afternoon's the guards got a break. Their two charges charges came in from the cold early. The guards didn't question their good fortune. Steele's den had originally been the master's. It was very different from the castle's meeting halls, except for choirs, only a single pack would fit in any room. It was not exactly that the suite was small. There were five rooms, not counting the bath, but except for the library, none was more than fifteen feet across. The ceilings were low, less than five feet. There was no space for visitor balconies. Servants were always on call in the two hallways that shared a wall with the quarters. The dining room, bedroom, and bath had servant hatches, just big enough to give orders and receive and to receive food and drink, or preening oils. The main entrance was guarded on the outside by three trooper packs. Of course, the master would never live in a den with only one exit. Steele had found eight secret hatches, three in the sleeping quarters. These could only be opened from within. They led to the maze that Flunzer had built within the solid rock of the castle's walls. No one knew the extent of that maze, not even the master. Steele had rearranged parts of it, in particular the passages leading from his den, in the years since Flenzer's departure. The quarters were nearly impregnable. Even if the castle fell, the room's larder was stocked for half a year. Ventilation was provided by a network of channels almost as extensive as the master's secret passages. All in all, Steele felt tolerably safe here. There was always the possibility that there were more than eight secret entrances, perhaps one that could be opened from the other side. And of course choirs were out of the question, here or anywhere. The only extra pack sex that Steele indulged with was with singletons, and that was as part of his experiments. It was just too dangerous to mix oneself with others. After dinner, Steele drifted into the library. He relaxed around his reading desk. Two of him slipped, sipped brandy while the other smoked southern herbs. This was pleasure, but also calculation. Steele knew just what vices applied just what vices applied to just which members would raise his imagination to its keenest pitch. And more and more he was coming to see that the imagination was at least as important as raw intelligence in the present game. The desk between him was covered with maps, reports from the South, internal security memos. But lying in all but lying in all the silk paper, like an ivory slug in its nest, was the alien radio. They had recovered two from the ship. Steele picked the thing up, ran a nose along the smooth, curved sides. Only the finest stressed wood could match its grace, and that in musical instruments or statuary. Yet the mantis claimed that this could be used to talk across dozens of miles, as fast as a ray of sunlight. If true, Steele wondered how many lost battles might have been won with these, and how many new conquests might be safely undertaken. And if they could learn to make far talkers, the movement's subordinates, scattered across the continent, would be as near as the guards by Steele's den. No force in the world could stand against them. Steele picked up the latest report from woodcarvers. In many ways, they were having more success with their mantis than Steele with his. Apparently theirs was almost an adult. More important, it had a miraculous library that could be interrogated almost like a living being. There had been three other data sets. Steele's white jackets had found what was left of them in the burnt-out wreckage around the ship. Jeffrey thought that the ship's processors were like a little data set. Only stupider, MD's best translation. But so far, the processors had been useless. But with their data set, several on Woodcarver's staff had already learned Mantis talk. Each day they discovered more about aliens about the alien civilization than Steele's people could intend. He smiled. They didn't know that all the important stuff was being faithfully reported to <coughs> Hidden Island. For now, he could let them keep their toy and their mantis. They had noticed several things that would have slipped by him. Still, he damned the luck. Steele paged through the report. Good. The alien at Woodcarver's was still uncooperative. He felt his smile spreading into laughter. It was a small thing, the creature's word for the packs. The report tied, tried to spell out the word. It didn't matter. The translation was claws or tines. The mantis had a special horror for the tine attachments that soldiers wore on their forepaws. Steele licked pensively at the black enamel of his manicured claws. Interesting. Claws could be threatening things, but they were also part of being a person. Tines were their mechanical extension, and potentially more frightening. It was the sort of name you might imagine for an elite killer force. But never for all the packs. After all, the races of packs included the weak, the poor, the kindly, the naive, as well as persons like Steele and Flenzer. It said something very interesting about Mantis psychology that the creature, creature picked Tynes as the characterizing feature of the packs. 
Steele eased back from his desk and gazed at the landscape painted around the library's walls. It was a view from the castle towers. Behind the paint, the walls were lined with patterns of mica and quartz and fiber. The echoes gave a vague sense of what you might hear looking out across the stone and emptiness. Combination audiovisuals were rare in the castle, and this one was especially well done. Steele could feel himself relaxing as he stared at it. He drifted for a moment, letting his imagination roam. Tynes, I like it. If that was the alien's image, then it was the right name for his race. His pitiful, his pitiful advisors, and sometimes even the Flenser Fragment, were still intimidated by the ship from the stars. No question, there was power in that ship beyond anything in the world. But after the first panic, Steele understood that the aliens were not supernaturally gifted. They had simply progressed, in the sense that Woodcarver made so much of. Beyond the current state of the world's, his world's science. Certainly the alien civilization was a deadly unknown right now. Indeed, it might be capable of burning his world to cinder. Yet the more Steele saw, the more he realized the intrinsic inferiority of the aliens. What a bizarre abortion they were, a race of intelligent singletons. Every one of them must be raised from nothing, like a wholly newborn pack. Memories could only be passed by voice and writing. Each creature grew and aged and, aged and even died as a whole. Despite himself, Steele shivered. He had come a long way from the first misconceptions, for the first fears. For more than thirty days now, he'd been scheming to use the starship to rule the world. The Mantis said that the ship was signaling others. That had reduced some of his servants to incontinence. So, sooner or later, more ships would arrive. Ruling the world was no longer a practical goal. It was time to aim higher, at goals even the Master had never imagined. Take away their technical advantages and the Mantis folk were such finite, fragile be beings. They should be easy to conquer. Even they seemed to realize this. Tynes, the creature calls us. So it will be. Someday Tynes would pace between the stars and rule there. But in the years till then, life would be very dangerous. Like a newborn pup, all their potential could be destroyed by one small blow. The movement's survival, the world's survival, would depend upon superior intelligence, imagination, discipline, and treachery. Fortunately, those had always been Steele's great strengths. Steele dreamed in the candlelight and haze. Intelligence, imagination, discipline, treachery. Done right? Could the aliens be persuaded to eliminate all of Steele's enemies, and then bare their throats to him? It was daring, almost beyond reason, but there might be a way. Jeffrey claimed he could operate the ship's signaler. By himself? Steele doubted it. The alien was thoroughly duped, but not especially competent. Uh, Amdriani, F uh, Amdriani Fani was a different story. He was showing all the genius of his bloodlines, and the principles of loyalty and sacrifice his teachers drilled into him had taken hold, though he was a bit playful. His obedience didn't have the sharp edge that fear could bring. No matter. As a tool, he was a useful beyond all others. Amdriani Fani understood Geoffrey, and seemed to understand the alien artifacts even better than the Mantis did. The risk must be taken. He would let the two aboard the ship. They would send his message in place of the automatic distress signal. And what should that first message be? Word for word, it would be the most important, most dangerous thing any pack had ever said. Three hundred yards away, deep in the experiment wing, a boy and a pack of puppies came across an unexpected piece of good luck an unlocked door, and a chance to play with Jeffrey's comm set. The phone was more complex than some. It was intended for hospital and field work, for the remote control of devices as well as for voice talk. By trial and error, the two gradually narrowed the options. Jeffrey Olson dot pointed to numbers that had appeared on the side of the device. I think that means we're matched with some receiver. He glanced nervously at the doorway. Something told him they really shouldn't be here. That's the same pattern as on the radio Mr. Steele took, said AMD. Not even one of his heads was watching the door. I bet if we press this here, press it here, what we say will come out on his radio. Now he'll know we can help. What should we do? Three of AMD raced around the room, like dogs that couldn't keep their attention on the conversation. By now, Jeffrey knew this was the equivalent of a human looking away and humming as he thought. The angle of his gaze was another gesture, in this case a spreading and mischievous smile. I think we should surprise him. He's always so serious. Yeah, Mr. Seal Steele was pretty solemn, but then all the adults were. They reminded him of the older scientists at the high lab. Amdi grabbed the radio and gave him a just-watch-this look. He nosed on the talk switch and sang a long ululation, ululation uh, onto, into the mic. It sounded only vaguely like pack speech. One of Amdi translated, next to Jeffrey's ear. 
The human boy felt giggles stealing up his throat. In his den, Lord Steele was lost in scheming. His imagination, loosed by herbs and brandy, floated free, playing with the possibilities. He was settled deep in velvet cushions, comfortable in the den's safety. The remaining candles shone faintly on the landscape mural, glinting from the polished furniture. The story he would tell the aliens, he almost had it now. The noise on his de desk began as a small thing, submerged beneath his dreaming. It was mostly low-pitched, but there were overtones in the range of thought, like slices of another mind. It was a presence, growing. Someone is in my den. The thought tore like Flenzer's killing blade. Steel's members sp spasmed panic, disoriented by smoke and drink. There was a voice in the middle of the insanity. It was distorted, missing tones that any normal speech should have. It howled and quavered at them. Lord Steel, greetings from the pack of packs, the Lord God Almighty. Part of Steel was already out of the main hatch, staring wide-eyed at his guards in the hallway beyond. The trooper's presence brought a, brought a bit of calm and icy embarrassment. This is nonsense. He tipped ahead to the alien device on his desk. The echoes were everywhere, but the sound or sounds originated in the far talker. There was no pack speech now, just the high-pitched slices of sound, mindless warbling in the middle range of thought. Wait, behind it all, faint and low, there were the coughing grunts he recognized as mantis laughter. Steel rarely gave way to rage. It should be his tool, not his master. But listening to the laughter and remembering the words, Steel felt that black bloodiness rising in the first in first one member and then another. Almost without thought, he reached back and smashed the comm set. It fell instantly silent. He glared at the guards he glared at the guards ranged at attention in the hallway. Their mind noise was quiet with stifled fear. Someone would die for this. Mr. Steele met with Amdi and Jeffrey the day after their success with the radio. They had convinced him. They were moving to the mainland. Jeffrey would have his chance to call for rescue. Steele was even more solemn than usual. He made a big thing about how important it was to get help to defend against another attack from the woodcarvers, but he didn't seem angry about Amdi's little prank. Jeffrey breathed a quiet sigh of relief. Back home, Daddy would have his have tanned his hide for something like that. I guess Amdi is right. Mr. Steele was serious because of all his responsibilities and the dangers they faced, but underneath he was a very nice person. Crypto, zero. As received by transceiver relay 03 at relay. Language path, fire tongue, cloud mark, trisquil trisquilin, SJK units. Fire tongue and cloud mark are high beyond trade languages. Only core meaning is rendered by this translation. From Arbitration Arts Corporation at Firecloud Nebula, a high beyond military organization. Known age, less than 100 years. Subject, reason for concern. Summary. Three single system civilizations are apparently destroyed. Key phrases, scale interstellar disasters, scale interstellar warfare, stromly realm perversion. Distribution, war trackers interest group, threats interest group, homo sapiens interest group. Date, 53.57 days since the fall of stromly realm. Text of message. Recently an obscure civilization announced it had created a new power in the transcend. It then dropped temporarily off the known net. Since that time, there have been about a million messages and threats about the incident, plenty of speculations that a Class II perversion had been born, but no evidence of effects beyond the boundaries of the former Stromley realm. Arbitration Arts specializes in treckle lancing disputes. As such, we have, a few, we have few common business interests with natural races or threats group. They may have to change. 65 hours ago, we noticed the apparent extinction of three isolated civilizations in the high beyond near Stromley realm. Two of these were I in the U religious probes, and the third was a Pentragian Pentrag factory. Previously, their main net link had been the Stromley realm. As such, they have been off the net since Stromley dropped, except for occasional pinging from us. We diverted three missions to perform fly-throughs. Signal reconnaissance revealed wideband communication that was more like neural control than local net traffic. Several new large structures were noted. All of our vessels were destroyed before detailed information could be returned. Given the background of these settlements, we conclude that this is not the normal aftermath of a transcending. These observations are consistent with a Class II attack from the transcend, albeit a secretive one. The most obvious source would be the new power constructed by Stromley Realm. We urge special vigilance to all high beyond civilizations in this part of the beyond. We larger ones have little to fear, but the threat is very clear. 
Crypto, zero, as received by Transceiver Relay 03 at Relay, Language Path, Firetongue, Cloudmark, Trisquil, and SJK units. Firetongue and Cloudmark are high beyond trade languages. Only core meaning is rendered by this translation. From Arbitration Arts Corporation at Firecloud Nebula, a high beyond military organization, known age about 100 years. Subject, new service available. Summary, Arbitration Arts to provide net relay service. Key phrases, special rates, sentient translator programs, ideal for civilizations in the high beyond. Distribution, communication costs interest group, Motley Hatch administration group. Date, 61.00 days since the fall of Stromley Realm. Text of message. Arbitration Arts is proud to announce a transceiver layer service especially designed for sites in the high beyond. Rates tabulated after the text of this message. State of the zone programs will provide uh, high quality translation and routing. It has been nearly 100 years since any high beyond civilization and this part of the galaxy has been interested in providing such a communication service. We realize the job is dull and the uh, armiflage not in keeping with the effort, but we all stand to benefit from protocols that are consistent with the zone we live in. Details follow under Syntax 8139. Cloudmark, Triskel and Translator program bulks at handling Syntax 8139. Crypto, zero, as received by Transceiver Re Relay 03 at Relay, Language Path, Cloudmark, Triskulin, SJK Units. Cloudmark is a high beyond trade language. Despite colloquial rendering, only core meaning is guaranteed. From Transcendent Bafflements Trading Union at Cloud Center. Subject, matter of life and death. Summary, arbitration arts has fallen to strongly perversion via a net attack. Use middle beyond relays till emergency passes. Key phrases, net attack, scale interstellar warfare, strongly perversion, distribution, war trackers interest group, threats interest group, homo sapiens interest group, date 61.12 days since the fall of strongly realm. Text of message, warning, the site identifying itself as arbitration arts is now controlled by the strongly perversion. The arts recent advertisement of communication services is a deadly trick. In fact, we have good evidence that the perversion used sapient net packets to invade and disable the arts defenses. Large portions of the arts now appear to be under direct control of the Stromly power. Parts of the arts that were not infected with the initial invasion have been destroyed by the converted pro portions. Fly-throughs show st several stellifications. What can be done? If during the last thousand seconds you have received any high beyond protocol packets from arbitration arts, discard them at once. If they have been processed, then chances are it is the perversion who is reading this message and with a broad smile. Then the processing site and all locally netted sites must be physically destroyed at once. We realize that this means the destruction of solar systems, but, that, but consider the alternative. You are under transcendent attack. If you survive the initial peril in the next 30 hours or so, then there are obvious procedures that can give relative safety. Do not accept high beyond protocol packets. At the very least, route all communications through Middle Beyond sites, with translation down to, and then up from, local trade languages. For the longer term, it's obvious that an extraordinarily powerful Class II perversion has bloomed in our region of the galaxy. For the next 13 years or so, all advanced civilizations near us will be in great danger. If we can identify the background of the current perversion, we may discover its weaknesses in a feasible defense. Class II perversions all involve a deformed power that creates symbiotic structures in the high beyond, but there is enormous variety of origins. Some are poorly formed jokes told by powers no longer on the scene. Others are weapons built by the newly transcendent and never properly disarmed. The immediate source of this danger is well documented. A species recently up from the middle beyond, Homo sapiens, founded the Stromly realm. We are inclined to believe the theory proposed in the messages, namely that Stromly researchers experimented with something in shortcuts, and that the recipe was a self-booting evil from an earlier time. One possibility, some loser from long ago planted how-tos on the net or in some lost archive for the use of its own descendants. Thus, we are interested in any information related to Homo sapiens. The next day, Andy went on the largest trip of his young life. Bundled in windbreakers, they traveled down wide, cobbled streets to the straits below the castle. Mr. Steele led the way on his chariot cart drawn by three carhogs. He looked marvelous in his red-striped jackets. Guards dressed in white fur rolled along on either side, and the dour tire effect brought up the rear. The aurora was as brilliant as M.D. Jeffrey had ever seen, brighter in some than the full moon above the northern horizon. 
Icicles grew down from the building's cave eaves, sometimes all the way to the ground, glittering, green-silver pillars in the light. Then they were on the boats, rowing across the straits. The water swept like chill black stone around the holes. When they reached the other side, Starship Hill towered over them, higher than any castle could ever be. Every minute brought new visions, new worlds. It took half an hour to reach the top of that hill, even though their carts were pulled by curhogs, and nobody walked. Amity looked in all directions, awed by the landscape that spread, aurora lit below them. At first, Jeffrey seemed just as excited, but as they reached the hilltop, he stopped looking around and hugged painfully hard at his friend. Mr. Steele had built a shelter around the starship. Inside, the air was still and a little warmer. Jeffrey stood at the base of the spidery stairs, looking up at the light that spilled from the ship's open doorway. Amdi felt him shivering. Is he frightened of his own flyer? asked Tyrothecht. By now, Amdi knew most of Jeffrey's fears, and understood most of the despair. How would I feel if Mr. Steele were killed? No, not scared. It's the memories of what happened here. Steele said gently, Tell him we could come again. He doesn't have to go inside the day. Jeffrey shook his head at the suggestion, but couldn't answer right away. I've got to go on. I've got to be brave. He started slowly up the stairs, stopping at each step to make sure that Amdi was still all with him. The puppies were split between concern for Jeffrey and the desire to rush madly into this wonderful mystery. Then they were through the hatch and into the two legs' strangeness. Bright bluish light, air as warm as in the castle, and dozens of mysterious shapes. They walked to the far side of the big room, and Mr. Steele stuck some heads into the entrance. His mind sounds echoed loudly around them. I've quilted the walls, Andy, but even so, there isn't room for more than one of us in here. Yes, there were echoes, and Steele's mind sounded strangely fierce. It's up to you to protect your friend here, and let me know about everything you see. He moved back so that just one head still looked in upon them. Yes, yes, I will. It was the first time anybody except Jeffrey had really needed him. Jeffrey wandered silently about the room full of his sleeping friends. He wasn't crying anymore, and he wasn't in the silent funk that often held him. It was as if he couldn't quite believe where he was. He passed his hands lightly across the caskets, looked at the faces within. So many friends, thought Amdi, waiting to be wakened. What will they be like? The walls? I don't remember this, said Jeffrey. He touched the heavy quilting that Steele had hung. It's to make the place sound better, said Amdi. He pulled at the flaps, wondering what was behind. Green wall, like stone and steel all at once, and covered with tiny bumps and fingers of gray. What's this? Jeffrey was looking over his shoulders. Ugh. Mold. It's spread. I'm glad Mr. Steele has covered it up. The human boy drifted away. Amdi stayed a second longer, poked several heads up to close, close to the stuff. Mold and fungus were a constant problem in the castle. People were always cleaning it up, and perversely so, in Amdi's opinion. He thought fungus was neat, something that could grow on hardest rock. And this stuff was especially strange. Some of the clumps were almost half an inch high, but wispy, like solid smoke. The back-looking part of him saw that Geoffrey had drifted off toward the inner cabin. Reluctantly, Amdi followed. They stayed in the ship only an hour that first time. The, in the inner cabin, Geoffrey turned on magic windows that looked out in all directions. Amdi sat, goggle-eyed. This was a trip to heaven. For Geoffrey, it was something else. He hunched down in a hammock and stared at the controls. The tension slowly left his face. I, I like it here, said Amdi, tentatively, softly. Jeffrey rocked gently in the hammock. Yes, he sighed. I was so afraid, but being here makes me feel closer too. His hands reached out to caress the panel that hung close to the hammock. My dad landed this thing. He was sitting right here. He twisted around, looking at a glimmering panel of light above him. And Mom got the ultra ultra wave all set. They did it all. And now it's only you and me, Amdi. Even Joanna is gone. It's all up to us. Vrindamy classification. Organizational secret. Not for distribution beyond ring one of the local net. Transceiver relay zero zero search log. Beginning nineteen forty forty docs time seventeen slash oh one of org year five two oh nine zero. One two eight point one three days since the fall of Stromley Realm. Link layer syntax fourteen message loop detected on assigned surveillance bearing. Signal strength and SN compatible with previously detected beacon signal. Language path Samnork Samnorsk SJK relay units. From Jeffrey Olson dot, and I don't know where this is. Subject, hello, my name's Jeffrey Olson dot. Our ship's hurt, and we need help. P please answer. Summary, sorry if I get some of this wrong. This keyboard is stupid. Key phrases, I don't know. Two, 
Relay anybody. Text of message. Empty. Chapter 15 Two scrode riders played in the surf. Do you think his life is in danger? Asked the one with the slender green stalk. Whose life? Said the other, a large rider with a bluish basil shell. Jeffrey Olson dot, the human child. Blue Shell sighed to himself and consulted the scrode. You come to the beach to forget the cares of the everyday, but Greenstock would not let them go. He scanned for danger to Geoffrey. Of course he's in danger, you twit. Look up the latest messages from him. Oh, Greenstock's tone was embarrassed. Sorry for the partial remembering. Remembering enough to worry and nothing more. She went silent. After a moment he heard her pleasured humming. The surf crashed endlessly past them. Blue Shell opened to the water, tasting the life that swirled in the power of the waves. It was a beautiful beach. It was probably unique. And that was an extreme thing to say about anything in the beyond. When the foam swept back from their bodies, they could see indigo sky spread from one side of the docks to the other, in the glint of starships. When the surf came forward, the two riders were submerged in the turbid chill, surrounded by the coralesques and intertidal creatures that built their little homes there. And at high tide, the flexure of the sea floor held steady for an hour or so. Then the water cleared, as, and if in daylight, they could see the patches of glassy sea bottom, and through them, a thousand kilometers below, the surface of ground side. Blue Shell tried to clear his mind of care. For every hour of peaceful contemplation, a few more natural memories would accumulate. No good. Just now, he could no more banish the memories than could Greenstock. After a moment, he said, sometimes I wish I were a lesser writer, to stand a lifetime in one place, just with just a minimum scrode. Yes, said Greenstock, but we decided to roam. That means giving up certain things. Sometimes we must remember things that happen only once or twice. Sometimes we have great adventures. I'm glad we took the rescue contract, Blue Shell. So neither of them were really in the mood for the sea today. Blue Shell lowered the scrode's wheel wheels and rolled a little closer to Greenstock. He looked deep into his Scrode's mechanical memory, scanning the general databases. There was a lot there about catastrophes. Whoever created the original Scrode databases had considered wars and blights and perversion very important. They were exciting things, and they could kill you. But Blue Shell could also see that in relative terms, such disasters were a small part of the civilized experience. Only about once in a millennium was there a massive blight. It was their bad luck to be caught near such a thing. In the last ten weeks, a dozen civilizations in the high beyond had dropped from the net, absorbed into the symbiotic amalgam that was that now was called the Stromly Blight. High trade was crippled. Since their ship was refinanced, he and Greenstock had flown several jobs, but all to the middle beyond. The two of them had been very cautious, but now, as Greenstock said, greatness must be thrust upon them. Vernimi Org wanted to commission a secret flight to the bottom of the beyond. Since he and Greenstock were already in on the secret, they were the natural choice for the job. Right now, the out-of-band two was in ver the Vermini Yards, getting bottom lugger enhancements and a huge stock of antenna drones. In one stroke, the OOB's value was increased ten thousandfold. There had been no need even to bargain, and that was the scariest thing of all. Every addition was a clear essential for the trip. They would be descending right to the edge of the slowness. Under the best of circumstances, this, this would be a slow and tedious exercise, but the latest surveys reported movement in the zone boundaries. With bad luck, they might actually end up on the wrong side, where light had the ultimate speed. If that should happen, the new ram scoop would be their only hope. All that was within Blue Shell's range was of all of that was it within Blue Shell's range of acceptable business. Before he met Greenstock, he had shipped on bottom luggers, even been stranded once or twice. But I like. Adventure as much as you, said Blue Shell, a grumpy edge creeping into his voice. Traveling to the bottom, rescuing savants from the claws of wild things. Given enough money, it's all perhaps reasonable. But what if the Stromer ship is really as important as Ravna thinks? After all this time, it seems absurd, but she's convinced of Renimiorg of the possibility. If there's something down there that could harm the Stromly Blight, if the Blight ever suspected the same, it would have it could have a fleet of ten thousand warships descending on their goal. Down at the bottom, they might be little better than conventional vessels, but he and Greenstock would be no less dead for that. Except for a faint, daydreamy hum, Greenstock was silent. Had she lost track of the conversation? Then her voice came through, came to him through the water with a reassuring caress. I know, Blue Shell. It could be the end of us, but I still want to venture it. If it's safe, we make enormous profit. If our going could harm the blight, 
Well, then it's terribly important. Our help might save dozens of civilizations, a million beaches of riders just in passing. Humph. <laughs> You're following stock and not scrowed. Probably. They had just watched they had watched the progress of the blight since its beginning. The feelings of horror and sympathy had been reinforced every day till they percolated into their natural minds. So Greenstock, and Blue Shell too, he couldn't deny it, felt stronger about the blight than about about the danger in their new contract. Probably. My fears of making the rescue rescue are still analytical, still confided to her scrode. Yet, I think if we could stand here a year, if we could wait till we truly felt all the issues, I think we would still choose to go. Blue Shell rolled irritably back and forth. The grit swirled up and through his fronds. She was right, and she was right. But she, he couldn't say it aloud. The mission still terrified him. And think, mate, if it is this important, then perhaps we can get help. You know the org is negotiating with the emissary device. With any luck, we'll end up with an escort designed by a transcendental power. The image almost made Blue Shell laugh. Two little scrode riders journeying to the bottom of the beyond, surrounded by help from the transcend. I will hope for it. The scrode riders were not the only ones with that wish. Further up the beach, Ravna Bergen's dot prowled her office. What gruesome irony that even the greatest disasters can create opportunities for decent people. Her transfer to marketing had been made permanent with the fall of arbitration arts. As the blight spread and high beyond markets collapsed, the org became ever more interested in providing information services about the Stromly perversion. Her special expertise in things human suddenly became extraordinarily valuable, never mind that Stromly realm itself was only a small part of what was now the Blight. What little the Blight said of itself was often in Sam Norsk. Gronder and company continued to be vitally interested in her analysis. Well, she had done some good. They had picked up the refugees' ships. I am here. And then, ninety days later, a message from a human survivor, Jeffrey Olson got. Barely forty messages had they exchanged but enough to learn about the Tynes and Mr. Steel and the evil woodcarvers, enough to know that a small human life would be ended if she could not help. Ironic but natural, most times that single life weighed more on her than all the horror of the perversion, even the fall of the Stromly realm. Thank the powers that Gronder had endorsed the rescue mission. It was a chance to learn something important about the Stromly perversion. And the tinnish packs seemed to interest him, too. Group minds were a fleeting thing in the beyond. Gronder had kept the whole affair secret and persuaded his bosses to support the mission, but all his help might not be enough. If the refugee ship was as important as Ravna thought, there could be enormous perils awaiting any rescuers. Ravna looked across the surf. When the waves backed down the sand, she could see the scrode rider's fronds peeping out of the spray. How she envied them. If tensions annoyed them, they could simply turn them off. The scrode riders were one of the most common siphons in the beyond. There were many varieties, but analysis agreed with legend. Very long ago, they had been one species. Somewhere in the offnet past, they had been sessile dwellers of seashores. Left to themselves, they had developed a form of intelligence almost devoid of short-term memory. They sat in the turf, thinking thoughts that left no imprints on their minds. Only repetition of a stimulus, over a period of time, could do that. But the intelligence and memory that they had was of survival value. It made it possible for them to select the best possible place to cast their pupil seeds, locations that would mean safety and food for the next generation. Then some unknown race had chanced upon the dreamers and decided to help them out. Someone had put, on, put them on mobile platforms, the scrodes. With wheels they could move along the seashores, could reach and manipulate with their fronds and tendrils. With the scrodes mechanical short-term memory, they could learn fast enough that their new mobility would not kill them. Ravna glanced away from the scrode riders. Someone was floating in over the trees. The emissary device. Maybe she could call Greenstock and Blue Shell out of the water. No, let him bliss out a little longer. If she couldn't get the special equipment, things would be tough enough for them later. Besides, I can do without witnesses. She folded her arms across her chest and glared into the sky. The Vernimi Org had tried to talk to the old one about this, but nowadays the power would only work through its emissary device and he had insisted on a face-to-face -face meeting. The emissary touched down a few meters away and bowed. His lopsided grin spoiled the effect. Fam Nguyen, at your service. Ravna gave a little bow in return, and led him, led him to the shade of her inner office. If he thought that face-to-face -face would unnerve her, he was right. Thanks for the meeting, sir. The Vrimanimi organization is an important request of your principal. Owner? Master? Operator? Fam Nguyen plunked himself down, stretching indolently. He'd stayed out of her way since that night at the Wandering Company. Gronder said Old One had kept him at Relay, though, rummaging through the archives for information about humanity and its origins. 
It made sense now that Old One had been persuaded to restrict net use. The emissary could do local processing, i.e. use human intelligence to search and summarize, and then upload only the stuff that the Old One really needed. Ravna watched him out of the corner of her eye as she pretended to study her data set. Fam had this old, lazy smile. She wondered if he, she would ever have the courage to ask him how much of their affair had been a human thing. Had Fam Nguyen felt anything for her? Hell, did he even have a good time? From a transcendent point of view, he might be a simple data concentrator and Waldo, but from her viewpoint, he was still too human. Um, yes, well, the org has continued to monitor the strong, strongly refugee ship, even though your principal has lost interest. Fam's eyebrows raised in polite interest. Oh? Ten days ago, the simple I am here signal was interrupted by a new message, apparently from a surviving crew member. Congratulations. You managed to keep it a secret, even from me. Ravna didn't rise to the bait. We're doing our best to keep it secret from everyone, sir, for reasons that you must know. She put the messages to date on the air between them. A handful of calls and responses scattered across ten days. Translated into Trisquil and for Fan, the original spelling and grammar errors were gone, yet the tone remained. Ravna was responsible for the org side of the conversation. It was like talking to someone in a dark room, someone you've never seen. Much was easy to imagine. A strident, piping voice behind the capitalized words and exclamation marks. She had no video of the child, but through the humankind archive at Sandra Kai, marketing had dug up pictures of the boy's parents. They looked like typical Stromers, but with the brown eyes of the Linden clans. Little Jeffrey would be slim and dark. Fam Nguyen's gaze flicked down through the text, then seemed to hang on the last few lines. Org, 17. How old are you, Jeffrey? Target. I am eight. I am eight years old. I am old enough, but I need help. Org. We will help. We are coming as fast as we can, Jeffrey. Target. Sorry I couldn't talk yesterday. The bad people were on the hill again yesterday. It wasn't safe to go to the ship. Org. Are the bad ones that close by? Target. Yes, yes. I could see them from the island. I'm with Amdi on shipboard now, but walking up there were dead soldiers all around. Um, Woodcarver raids here often. Mother is dead. Father is dead. Joanna is dead. Mr. Steele will protect me as much as he can. He says that I must be brave. For a moment, his smile was gone. Poor kid, he said softly. Then he shrugged and jabbed his hand at one of the messages. Well, I'm glad Vernimi is sending a rescue mission. That is generous of you. Not really, sir. Look at items 6 through 14. The boy is complaining about the ship's automation. Yeah, he makes it sound like something out of a dawn age. Keyboards and video, no voice recognition. A completely unfriendly interface. Looks like the crash scragged almost everything, huh? He was being deliberately obtuse, but Ravna resolved to be infinitely patient. Perhaps not, considering the vessel's origin. Fam just smiled, so Ravna continued to spell things out. The processors are likely high beyond or transcendent, snuffed down to near brainlessness by the current environment. Fam knew inside. All consistent with the Scrode Rider's theory, right? You're still hoping this crate is carrying some tremendous secret that will blow the blight away. Yes, look. At one time, the old one was very curious about all this. Why the total disinterest now? Is there some reason why the ship can't be the key to fighting the perversion? That was Grander's explanation for the old one's recent lack of interest. All her life, Rav Ravna Bergensdott had heard tales of the powers, and always from a great remove. Here, she was awfully close to questioning one directly. It was a very strange feeling. After a moment, Fan said, No, it's unlikely, but you could be right. Ravna let out a breath she hadn't realized she'd been holding. Good. Then what we're asking is reasonable. Suppose the downed ship contains something the perversion needs, or something it fears. Then it's likely the perversion knows of its existence, and may even be monitoring ultra-drive traffic in that part of the bottom. A rescue expedition could lead the perversion right to it. In that case, the mission will be suicide for its crew, and could increase the Blight's overall power. So? Ravna slapped her dataset, resolutions of patients dissolving. So Vernimi Org is asking Old One's help to build an expedition the Blight can't knock over. Fan Nguyen just shook his head. Ravna, Ravna, you're talking about an expedition to the bottom of the beyond. There's no way a power can hold your hand down there. Even an emissary device would be mostly on its own there. Don't act like more of a jerk than you are, Fam Nguyen. Down there, the perversion will be just as much as be at just as much of a disadvantage. What we're asking for is equipment of transcendent manufacture, designed for those depths, and provided in substantial quantities. Jerk? Fam Nguyen drew himself up, but there was still the ghost of smile on his face. Is that how you normally address a power? 
Before this year, I would have died rather than address a power in any manner. She leaned back, giving him her own vi version of an indolent smile. You have a pipeline to God, mister, but let me tell you a little secret. I can tell whether it's open or closed. Polite curiosity. Oh, how is that? Pham Nguyen, left on his own, is a bright, egotistical guy and about as subtle as a kick in the head. She thought back to their time together. I don't really start worrying until the arrogance and smart remarks go away. Um, your logic is a little weak. If the old one were running me direct, he could just as easily play a jerk as, he cocked his head, as the man of your dreams. Ravna gritted her teeth. That's true, but I've got a little help from my boss. He's cleared me to monitor transceiver usage. She looked at her data set. Right now, your old one is getting less than 10 kilobits per second from all, the re all of Relay, which means, my friend, that you are not being tele-operated. Any crass behavior I see today is the true Fan Nguyen. The redhead chuckled, faint embarrassment evident. You got me. I'm on detached duty. Have been ever since the org persuaded old one to back off. But I want you to know that all those 10 kilobits per second are dedicated to this charming conversation. He paused as if listening, then waved his hand. Old one says hi. Ravna laughed despite herself. There was something absurd about the gesture, and the notion that a power would indulge such trivial humor. Okay, I'm glad he can, um, sit in. Look, fam, we're not asking for much by transcendent standards, and it could save whole civilizations. Give us a few thousand ships. Robot one-shots would be fine. Old one could make that many, but they wouldn't be much better than what's built down here. Tricking. He paused, looking surprised by his own choice of words. Tricking the zones is subtle work. Fine. Quality or quantity. We'll settle for whichever one the old one thinks. No. Fam. We're talking about a few days' work for the old one. It's already paid more to study the blight. Their single wild evening might have cost as much, but she didn't say that. Yes, and the Vermini has spent most of it. Paying off the customers you stepped on. Fam, can't you at least tell us why? The lazy smile faded from his face. She took a quick glance at her data set. No, Fam Nguyen was not possessed. She remembered the look on his face when he read the mail from Jeffrey Olson. Dot. There was a decent human lurking beneath all the arrogance. I'll give it a try. Keep in mind, even though I've been part of Old One, I'm remembering and explaining with human limitations. You're right, the perversion is chewing up the top of the beyond. Maybe fifty civilizations will die before this power gets tired of screwing around, and for a couple of thousand years after that, there'll be echoes of the disaster, poisoned star systems, artificial races with bloody-minded ideas. But, I hate to say it this way, so what? Old One has been thinking about this problem, off and on, for more than a hundred days. That's a long time for a power, especially Old One. He's existed for more than ten years now. His minds are drifting fast toward changes that will put him beyond all communication. But why should he give a damn about this? It was a standard topic in school, but Ravna couldn't help herself. This time it was for real. But history is full of incidents where the powers helped Beyonder races, sometimes even individuals. She had already looked up the Beyonder race that created Old One. They were gas bag creatures. Their net mail was mostly jabberwocky, even after Relay's best interpretation. Apparently they had no special leverage with Old One. The direct appeal was about all she had. Look, turn the thing around. Even ordinary humans don't need special explanation to help animals that are hurting. Fam's smile was beginning to come back. You're so big on analogies. Remember that no analogy is perfect. And the more complex the automation, the more complex the possible motivations. But, okay, how about this for an analogy? Old One is a basically decent guy, with a nice home in a good part of town. One day he notices he has a new neighbor, a scruffy fellow whose homestead is a whiff with toxic sludge. If you were Old One, you'd be concerned, right? You might probe around beneath your properties. You'd also chat with the new fellow and check on where he came from, try to figure out what's going on. The Vernimi Org saw part of that investigation. So you discover a new neighbor is unwholesome. Basically, his lifestyle involves poisoning swampland and eating the sludge produced. That's an annoyance. It smells and it hurts a lot of small, harmless animals. But after investigating, it's clear the damage will not affect your own property, and you get the neighbor to take measures to reduce the stink. In any case, eating toxic sludge is a self-defeating lifestyle. He paused. As analogies go, I think this one's pretty good. After some initial mystery, Old One has determined that this pre perversion is one of the most common patterns so petty and banal that even creatures like you and I can see it's evil. In one form or another, it's been drifting up from beyond our archives for a hundred million years. Damn it, I'd get my neighbors together and run the pervert out of town. 
That's been talked about, but it would be expensive, and real people might get hurt. Pham Nguyen came smoothly to his feet and smiled dismissingly at her. Well, that's about all we had to say to you. We walk out. He walk out from under the trees. Ravna hopped up to pursue. My personal advice. Don't take this so hard, Ravna. I've seen it all, you know. From the bottom of the slow, slowness to the inside of a transcendent power, each zone has its own special unpleasantness. The whole basis of the perversion, thermodynamic, economic, however you want to picture it, is the high quality of thought and communication at the top of the beyond. The perversion hasn't touched a single civilization in the middle beyond. Down here, the calm lags and expense are too great, and even the best equipment is mindless. To run things here, you'd need standing navies, secret police, clumsy transceivers. It would be almost as awkward as any other beyonder empire, and no profit to a power. He turned and saw her dark expression. Hey, I'm saying your pretty ass is safe. He reached down to pat her rear. <laughs> okay. Ravna brushed the hand away and stepped back. She'd been working on some clever argument that might set the guy to thinking. There were cases where emissary devices had changed their principal's decision. Now the half-formed ideas were blown away, and all she could think to say was, How safe is your own tale, hmm? You say old one is about ready to pack it in, go wherever overage powers wander off to. Is he going to take you along, or maybe just put you away, a pet that's now inconvenient? It was a silly shot, and Pham Nguyen just laughed. More analogies? No. Most likely he'll just leave me behind. You know, like a robot probe, flying free after its last use. Another analogy, but one to his liking. In fact, if it happens soon enough, I might even be willing to take on this rescue ex expedition. It looks like Jeffrey Olsendot is in a medieval civilization. I'll wager there's no one in the org who understands such a place better than I. And down at the bottom, your crew could scarcely ask for a better mate than an old Keng Cheng Ho type. He spoke breezily, as though courage and experience were givens for him, even if other people were cowardly scuts. Oh yeah? Ravna's arms went to Kimbo, and she cocked her head to one side. It was just a bit too much, and his, when his whole existence was a fraud. You're the little prince who grew up with intrigue and assassination, and then flew away to the stars with the Cheng Ho. Do you ever really think about that past, Fam Nguyen, or is that something Old One tactfully blocks you from doing? After our charming evening at the Wandering Company, I did think about it. You know what? There's only a few things you can know for sure. You really were a slow zone spacer, probably two or three spacers, since none of the corpses was complete. Somehow you and your buddies got yourselves killed down the, at the nether end of the slowness. What else? Well, your ship had no recoverable memory. The only hard copy we found seemed to be written in some Earth Asian language. That's all, all that the old one had to go on when he put together the fraud. Fam's smile seemed a little frozen. Ravna went on before he could speak. But don't blame old one. He was a little rushed, right? We had to convince Vermini and me. He had to convince Vermini and me that he, you were real. He rummaged around in the archives, slapped together a mishmash reality for you. Maybe it took him an afternoon. Are you grateful for the effort? A snip from here and a snip from there. There really was a Chang Ho, you know. On Earth, a thousand years before space flight. And there must have been Asia-descended colonies, though that's an obvious extrapolation on his part. Old One really has a nice sense of humor. He made your whole life a fantastic romance, right down to the last tragic expedition. That should have tipped me off, by the way. It's a combination of several pre-Nijoran legends. She caught her breath and rushed on. I feel sorry for you, Fam Nguyen. As long as you don't think about yourself too hard, you can be the most confident fellow in space. But all the skill, all the achievement, do you ever look at it up close? I'll bet not. Being a great warrior or an expert pilot, those involve a million sub-skills all the way down to kinesthetic things below the level of conscious thought. The old one's fraud needed just the top-level recollections and a brash personality. Look under the surface, fam. I think you'll find a whole lot of nothing. A dream of competence too closely confronted. The redhead had crossed his arms and was tra tapping his sleeve with a finger. When she finally ran out of words, his smile grew broad and patronizing. Ah, silly Ravna, even now you don't understand how far superior the powers are. Old one is not some middle beyond tyranny, brainwashing its victims with superficial memories. Even a transcendent fraud has more depth than the image of reality in a human mind. And how can you know this really is a fraud? So you looked through the relay archives and you didn't find my Cheng Ho. My Cheng Ho, he paused, remembering? Trying to remember? For an instant, Ravna saw a gleam of panic on his face. Then it was gone, and there was just the lazy smile. Can any of us imagine the archives of the Transcend, all the things Old One must know about humanity? 
Vernimi Org should be grateful to Old One for explaining my origins. They could never have learned that by themselves. Look, I'm truly sorry I can't help, even if it's otherwise a fool's errand. I'd like to see those kids rescued, but don't worry about the blight. It's near maximum expansion now. Even if you could destroy it, you wouldn't make things better for the poor whites who've been absorbed. He laughed a little too loudly. Well, I have to go. The old one has some other errands for me this afternoon. He wasn't happy about this being face to face, but I insisted. The perks of detached duty, you know. You and I, you and I had some good times, and I thought it would be nice to chat. I didn't mean to make you mad. Fam cut in his agrav and floated off the sand. He waved a laconic salute. Staring up, Ravna lifted her hand to wave back. His figure dwindled, acquired a faint nimbus as he left the dock's breathable atmosphere, and his spacesuit cut in. Ravna watched a few moments more, till the figure became one more commuter in the indigo sky. Damn. 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 Behind her there was the sound of wheels crunching across sand. Blue shell and green stalk had rolled out of the water. Wetness glistened on the sides of their scrodes, transforming their cosmetic stripes into jagged rainbows. Ravna walked down to meet them. How do I tell them there's no help coming? With someone like Fam Nguyen fronting for it, Old One had seemed so different from what she imagined in her classes back at Sandra Kai. She'd almost thought she could make a difference just by talking. What a joke. She had caught a glimpse just now, behind the front, of a being who could play with souls the way a programmer plays with a clever graphic, a being so far beyond her that only its indifference could protect her. Be happy, little Ravlin Moth. You were only dazzled by the flame. Chapter 16 The next few weeks went surprisingly well. Despite the Fam Nguyen debacle, Blue Shell and Greenstock were still flying, willing to fly to the rescue. Vermini Org even kicked in some extra resources. Every day, Ravna took a tele-excursion out to the repair yards. The out-of-band two might not be getting any transcendent enhancements, but when the refitting was complete, the ship would be something extraordinary. Now it floated in a golden haze of structures, billions of tiny robots regrowing sections of the hull into the characteristic form of a bottom lugger. Sometimes the ship seemed to Ravna like a fragile moth, and sometimes an abyssal fish. The rebuilt ship could survive across a range of environments. It had the spines of an ultra-drive ultra craft, but the hull was streamlined and wasp waste, the classic form of a ramscoop ship. Bottom luggers must troll dangerously near the slow zone. The zone surface was hard to detect from a distance, even harder to map, and there were short-term position changes. It was not impossible for a lugger to be trapped a light year or two from the, within the slowness. It was then you'd thank goodness for the ram scoop and the cult sleep facilities. Of course, by the time you returned to civilization, you might be completely out of date, but at least you could get back. Ravna floated her viewpoint through the drive spines that spread out from the hull. They were broader than most on the ships that came to the relay. They weren't optimal for the middle or high beyond, but with appropriate, i.e. low beyond, computers, the ship would fl fly as fast as anything when it reached the bottom. Grandor let her spend half time on the project, and after a few days Ravna realized this was not just a favor. She was the best person for this job. She knew humans, and she knew archive management. Jeffrey Olsendot needed reassurance every day, and the things Jeffrey was telling her were immediately important. Even if everything went according to plan, even if the perversion stayed completely out of it, this rescue was going to be tricky. The kid and his ship seemed to be in the middle of a bloody war. Extracting them would, may, would mean making instantly correct decisions and acting on them. They would need an effective onboard database and strategy program, but not much could be expected to work at the bottom, and memory capacity would be limited. It was up to Ravna to decide what library materials to move into the ship, to balance the ease of local availability against the greater resources that would be accessible over the ultrawave from Relay. Grondor was available on the local net, and often in real time. He wanted this to work. Don't worry, Ravna. We'll dedicate part of R00 to this mission. If their antenna swarm works properly, the riders should have at least 30, uh, should have a 30 kilobit per second link to relay. You'll be their prime contact here, <coughs> and you'll have access to our best strategists. If nothing interferes, you should have no trouble managing this rescue. Even four weeks ago, Ravna wouldn't have dared to ask for more. Now, sir, I have a better idea. Send me with the scrod riders. All of Grander's mouth parts clapped together at once. She'd seen that much surprise in people like Egravan, but not in the staid, staid Grander. He was silent for a moment. No, we need you here. You are our best sanity check when it comes to questions about humankind. 
the news groups interested in the Strom, Stromly perversion carried more than 100,000 messages a day, about a tenth of that human-related. Thousands of messages were old ideas rehashed or patent absurdities and probable lies. Marketing's automation was fairly good at filtering out the redundancy and some of the absurdity, but when it came to questions on human nature, Ravna was without equal. About half her time was spent guiding that analysis and handling queries about humankind at the archives. All that would be next to impossible if she left with the scrolled writers. Over the next few days, Ravna kept pushing her boss on the question. Whoever flew the rescue would need instant rapport with the humans. Human children, in fact. Very likely, Jeffrey Olsendot had never even met a scrolled writer. The point was a good one, and it was gradually driving her to desperation. By itself, it would not have changed old Grander's mind. It just took some outside events to do that. As the weeks passed, the Blight's expansion slowed. Just as conventional wisdom, and old one via Fam Nguyen, claimed, there seemed to be natural limits to how far the perversion could extend its inter interests. The abject panic slowly disappeared from high beyond communication traffic. Rumors and refugees from the absorbed volumes dribbled toward zero. The people in the blighted spaces were gone, but now it was more like death in a graveyard than death from contagious rot. Blight-related news groups continued to babble about the catastrophe, but the level of non-productive rehashing was steadily increasing. There simply was very little new going on. Over the next ten years, physical death would spread through the blighted region. Colonization would begin again, cautiously probing through the ruins and informational traps and residue races. But all of that was a ways off, and for the moment, Relay's blight windfall was a shrinking affair. And marketing was even more interested in the Stromly refugee ship. None of the safety programs, much less Grander, believes that the ship's secret could hurt the blight. But there was a good chance it might bring commercial advantage when the perversion finally got tired of its transcendent game and the Tyne's pack mines had caught their interest. It was very appropriate that a maximum effort be made, that Ravna give up her docks job and go to the field. So, for a wonder, her childhood fantasy of rescue and questing adventure would actually come true, and even more surprising, I'm only half terrified by the prospect. Target. I'm sorry I didn't answer for a while. I don't feel good a lot. Mr. Steele says I should talk to you. He says I need more friends to make me feel better. Amdi says so too, and he's my best friend of all like packs of dogs, but smart and fun. I wish I could send pictures. Mr. Steele will try to get answers for all your questions. He's doing everything he can to help, but the bad packs will be back. Andy and I tried this stuff you said with the ship. I'm sorry, it still doesn't work. I hate this dumb keyboard. Org. Hi, Jeffrey. Andy and Misty Ste Mr. Steele are right. I always like to talk, and it will make you feel better. There are inventions that might help Mr. Steele. We've thought of some improvements for his bows and flamethrowers. I'm also sending down some fortress design information. Please tell Mr. Steele that we can't tell him how to fly the ship. It would be dangerous even for an expert pilot to try. Target. Yeah, even Daddy had a hard time landing it. Ikok Kslzirsk 89 EOU 43 E5. I think Mr. Steele just doesn't understand, and he's getting sort of disparate. Isn't there a, another stuff, though? That, like they had in the olden days, you know, bombs and airplanes that we could make. Org. There are other inventions, but it would take time for Mr. Steele to make them. Our starship is leaving Relay soon, Jeffrey. We'll be there long before other inventions will help. Target. You're coming? You're finally coming. When do you leave? When will you get here? Ordinarily, Ravna composed her messages to Jeffrey on a keyboard. It gave her some feeling for the kid's situation. He seemed to be holding up, though there were still days when he didn't write. It was strange to think of mental depression having any connection with an eight-year-old. Other times he seemed to have a tantrum at the keyboard, and across 21,000 light-years she saw evidence of small fists slamming into keys. Ravna grinned at the display. Today she finally had something more than nebulous promises for him. She had a positive departure time. Jeffrey was going to like message 59. She typed, We're scheduled to leave in seven more days, Jeffrey. Travel time will be about 30 days. Should she qualify that? Latest postings on the Zone Boundary newsgroup said that the bottom was unusually active. The Tynes world was so close to the slow zone. If the storm worsened, travel time would suffer. There was about a 1% chance the voyage would take more than 60 days. She leaned back from the keyboard. Did she really want to say that? Damn, better be frank. These dates could affect the locals who were helping Jeffrey. She explains the ifs and buts, but went on to describe the ship and the wonderful things they would bring. The boy usually didn't write at great length, except for when he was relaying information from Steele, but he seemed to like long letters from her. 
The Out of Band 2 was undergoing final consistency checks. Its ultra drive was rebuilt and tested. The Scrode riders had taken it out a couple thousand light years to check the antenna swarm. The swarm worked great, too. She and Jeffrey would be able to talk through most of the voyage. As of yesterday, the ship was stocked with consumables. That sounded like something out of medieval adventure, but you had to take some supplies when you were headed so far down that reality graphics couldn't be trusted. Sometime tomorrow, Gronder's people would be loading the ship hold with gadgets that might be real handy for a rescue. Should she mention those? Some of those might sound a bit intimidating to Jeffrey's local friends. That evening, she and the Scrode Riders had a beach party. That's what they called it, though it was much more like the human version of an auth than an authentic rider one. Blue Shell and Greenstock had rolled well back from the water, to where the sand lay dry and warm. Ravna laid out refreshments on Blue Shell's cargo scarf. They sat on the sand and admired the sunset. It was mostly a celebration, that Ravna had gotten permission to go with the OOB, that the ship was almost ready to depart. But, are you really happy to be going, my lady? asked Blue Shell. We two will make very good money, but you? Ravna laughed. I'll get a travel bonus. She had argued and argued for permission to go. There wasn't much room left to haggle about the pay. And yes, this is what I really want. I am glad, said Greenstock. I am laughing, said Blue Shell. My mate is especially pleased that our passenger will not be surly. We almost lost our love for bipeds after shipping with the certificates. But there is nothing to be frightened of now. Have you read the threats group in the last fifteen hours? The blight has stopped growing, and its edges have become sharply defined. The perversion is settling into middle age. I'm ready to leave right now. Blue Shell was full of speculations about the tinnish packs, and possible schemes for extracting Jeffrey and any other survivors. Greenstock interjected a thought here and there. She was less shy than before, but still seemed softer, more diffident than her mate. And her confidence was a bit more realistic. She was glad they weren't leaving for another week. There were still some final consistency checks to run on the OOB, and Gronder had gotten org financing for a small fleet of decoy ships. Fifty were complete so far. A hundred would be ready by the end of the week. The docks drifted into night. With its shallow atmosphere, twilight was short, but the colors were spectacular. The beach and trees glistened in the horizontal rays. The scent of evening flowers mixed with the tang of sea salt. On the far side of the sea, all was stark, bright, and dark. Silhouettes that might have been vermini fa fancies or functional dock equipage. Ravna had never learned which. The sun slid behind the sea. Orange and red spread along the aft horizon, topped by a wider band of green, po probably ionized oxygen. The riders didn't turn their scrodes for a better view. For all she knew, they had been looking that way all along, but they had stopped talking. As the sun set, the breakers shattered it into a thousand images, glints of green and yellow through the foam. She guessed the two would have preferred to be out there just now. She had seen them often enough around sunset, deliberately sitting where surf was hardest. When the water drew back, their stalks and fronds were like supplicants' arms, upstretched. At times like these, she could almost understand the lesser scrode riders. They spent their whole lives memorizing such repeated moments. She smiled in the greenish twilight. There would always be time enough later to worry and plan. They must have sat like that for twenty minutes. Along the curving line of beach, she saw tiny fires in the gathering dark, office parties. Somewhere very nearby, there was a crunch crunch of feet on the sand. She turned and saw that it was Fam Nguyen. Over here, she called. Fam ambled toward them. He'd been very scarce since their last confrontation. Ravna guessed that some of her jibes had struck deep. This once, I hope Old One made him forget. Fam Nguyen had the potential to be a real person. It hadn't been right to hurt him because his principle was beyond reach. Have a seat. Galaxy rise in half an hour. The scrolled riders rustled so deep into the sunset that they were only now noticing the visitor. Fam Nguyen walked a pace or two beyond Ravna and stood arms akimbo, staring across the sea. He glanced back at her, and the green twilight gave his face an eerie fierceness. He flashed his old lopsided smile. I think I owe you an apology. Old one's going to let you join the human race after all? But Ravna was touched. She dropped her eyes from his. I guess I owe you one too. If old one won't help, he won't help. I shouldn't have lost my temper. Fam Nguyen laughed softly. Yours was certainly the lesser error. I'm still trying to figure out where I went wrong, and I don't think I have time now to learn. He looked back at the sea. After a moment, Ravna stood and stepped towards him. Up close, his stare looked glassy. What's wrong? Damn you, old one. 
if you're going to abandon him, don't do it in pieces. You're the great expert on the transcendent powers, huh? More sarcasm. Well, do the big boys have wars? Ravna shrugged. You can find rumors of everything, but we think there's conflict, but something too subtle to call a war. You're pretty much right. There is struggle, but it has more angles than anything down here. The benefits of cooperation are normally so great that... That's part of the reason I didn't take the perversion seriously. Besides, the creature is pitiful. A wimpy cur that fouls its own den. Even if it wanted to kill other powers, something like that never could. Not in a billion years. Blue Shell rolled up beside them. Who is this, my lady? It was the sort of writerish conversation stopper that she was only just getting used to. If Blue Shell would only would just get in sync with his scrode memory, he'd know. Then the question truly hit her. Who is this? She glanced at her data set. It was showing transceiver status. Had ever been had been ever since uh Fam Nguyen arrived. And by the powers, three transceivers had been grabbed by a single customer. She took a quick step backwards. You Me, face to face once more, Ravna. The leer was a parody of Fam's self assured smile. Sorry I can't be charming tonight. He slapped his chest awkwardly. I'm using this thing's underlying instincts. I'm too busy trying to stay alive. There was drool coming down his chin. Fam's eyes would focus on her and then drift. What are you doing to Fam? The emissary device stepped toward her, stumbled. Making room, came Fam Nguyen's voice. Ravna spoke Grander's phone code. There was no response. The emissary device shook its head. Vernimiorg is very busy right now, trying to convince me to get off their equipment, trying to screw up their courage and force me off. They don't believe what I'm telling them. He laughed, a quick choking sound. Doesn't matter. I see now that the attack here was just a deadly diversion. How about that, little Ravna? See, the Blight is not a Class Two perversion. In the time I have left, I can only guess what it is. Something very old, very big. Whatever it is, I'm being eaten alive. Blue Shell and Greenstock had rolled close to Ravna. Their fronds made faint scritching noises. Some thousands of light years away, well into the transcend, a power was fighting for its life, and all they saw of it was one man turned into a slobbering lunatic. So that's my apology, little Ravna. Helping you probably wouldn't have saved me. His voice strangled on itself, and he took a gasping breath. But helping you now will be a measure of vengeance, is a motive I could you would understand. I've called your ship down. If you move fast and don't use a grav, you may survive the next hour. Blue Shell's voice was timid and blustery at the same time. Survive? Only a conventional attack would work down here, and there's no sign of one. A maniac surrounded by the soft, quiet night. Ravna's data set showed nothing strange except for the diversion of bandwidth to old one. Fam Nguyen made a coughing laugh. Oh, it's conventional enough, but very clever. A few grams of replicant disorder, wafted in over weeks. It's blossoming now, timed with the attack, you see. The growth will die in a matter of hours, after it kills all of Relay's precious high automation. Ravna, take the ship, or die in the next thousand seconds. Take the ship. If you survive, go to the bottom. Get the... The emissary device pulled itself straighter and smiled its greenish smile a last time. And here is my gift to you, the best help I have left to give. The smile disappeared. The glassy look was replaced by a wonder, and then mounting terror. Fam Nguyen dragged in a great breath, and had time for bar one barking scream before he collapsed. He landed face down, twitching and choking in the sand. Ravna shouted Grander's coat again and ran to Fam Nguyen. She pulled him over on his back and tried to clear his mouth. The fit lasted several seconds, Fam's limbs flailing randomly about. Ravna collected several solid hits as she tried to steady him. Then Fam went limp, and she could barely feel his breath. Blue Shell was saying, somehow he grabbed the OOB. It's 4,000 kilometers out, coming straight for the docks. Whale, we're ruined. Unauthorized flight close to the docks was cause for confiscation. Somehow Ravna didn't think it mattered anymore. Is there any sign of attack, she said over her shoulder. She eased Fam's head back, made sure he, was a, he had a clear breathing passage. Random rustling between the scrode riders. Greenstock, something is strange. We have service suspension on the main transceivers. So old one is still transmitting? The local net is very clogged. Much automation, many employees being called to special duty. Ravna rocked back. The sky was night dark, punctuated by a dozen bright points of light. Ships guiding for the docks. All very normal. But her own data set was showing what Greenstock reported. Ravna, I can't talk right now. Grander's clickety voice sounded out of the air bes beside her. This would be his associate program. Old One has taken most of Relay. Watch out for the emissary device. A little late, that. 
We've lost contact with the surveillance fence beyond the transceivers. We are having program and hardware failures. Old One claims we are being attacked. A five-second pause. We see evidence of fleet action at the domestic defense boundary that was just half light year out. <laughs> Brap from Blue Shell. <laughs> at, the, at the domestic defense boundary. How could you miss them coming in? He rolled back and forth, pivoted. <laughs> Gronder's associate ignored the question. Minimum 3,000 ships. Destruction of transceiver, transceivers imminent. Ravna, are the Scrode Riders with you? It was still Gronder's voice, but more staccato, more involved. This was the real guy. Y yes. The local network is failing. Life support failing. The docks will fall. We would be stronger than the attacking fleet, but we're rotting from the inside. Relay is dying. His voice sharpened, clattering. But Vermini will not die, and a contract is a contract. Tell the Riders we will pay them, somehow, someday. We require, plead, they fly the mission we contracted. Ravna? Yes, they hear. Then go, and the voice was gone. Blue Shell said, OOB will be here in 200 seconds. Fam Nguyen had calmed and his breathing was easier. As the two riders chittered back and forth, Ravna looked around, and suddenly realized that all the death and destruction had, reports, had been reports from afar. The beach and the sky were almost as placid as ever. The last of the sun, sun's rays had left the waves. The foam was a dim band in the low green light. Here and there, yellow lights glowed in the trees in the farther towers. Yet the alarm had clearly spread. She could hear data sets coming in. Some of the beach fires guttered out, and the figures around them ran into trees or drifted upwards, headed for farther offices. Now starships floated up from their berths across the sea, falling higher and higher till they glittered in the departed sunlight. It was the relay's last moment of peace. A patch of glowing dark spread across the sky. She gasped at a, she gasped at a light so twisted it should have gone unseen. It shone more in the back of her head than in her eyes. Afterwards, she couldn't think what made it objectively different from blackness. There's another, said Blue Shell. This was one of the decks, one near the deck's horizon, a blot of darkness perhaps a degree across. The edges were an indistinct bleeding of black into black. What is it? Ravna was no war freak, but she'd read her share of adventure stories. She knew about antimatter bombs and relativistic, relativistic K.E. slugs. From a distance, such weapons were bright spots of light, sometimes an orchestrated flickering. Or closer, a world wrecker would glow incandescent across a curve of a planet, splashing the globe itself like a drop of water, but slow, slow. Those were the images her reading had prepared her for. What she saw now was more like a defect in her eyesight than a vision of war. Powers only knew what the Scrode Riders saw, but... Your main transceivers, vaping out, I think, <laughs> said Blue Shell. Those are light years out. There's no way we could see... Another splotch appeared, not even in her field of view. The color floated, placeless. Fam Nguyen spasmed again, but weakly. She had no trouble holding him still, but blood dribbled from his mouth. The back of his shirt was wet with something that stank of decay. OOB will be here in 100 seconds. Pl plenty of time. There's plenty of time. Blue Shell rolled back and forth around them, talking reassurance that just showed, that showed how nervous he was. Yes, my lady, light years out. And years from now, the flash of their going will light the sky for anyone still alive here. But only a fraction of the vape-out is making light. The rest is an ultra-wave surge so great that ordinary matter is affected, optic nerves tickled by the overflow, so much that your own nervous system becomes a receiver. He spun around. But don't worry, we're tough and quick. We've squeezed through close spots before. There was something absurd about a creature with no short-term memory bragging up its lightning reflexes. She hoped his scrode was up to, up to this. Greenstock's voice buzzed painfully loud. Look. The surf line was drawing back, further than she had ever seen it. The sea is falling, shouted Greenstock. Water's edge had puked, pulled back a hundred meters. Two hundred. The green-limed horizon was dipping. Ship's still fifty seconds out. We'll, we'll fly to meet it. Come, Ravna. Ravna's own courage died cold that second. Grunder had said the docks would fall. The near sky was crowded now as dozens of people raced for safety. A hundred meters away, the sand itself was shifting, an avalanche tilting towards the abyss. She remembered something old one had said, and suddenly knew that the flyers were making a terrible mistake. The thought cut out through terror. The, the, the thought cut through her terror. No, just head for higher ground. The night was silent no more. A bell-like moaning came from the sea. 
The sound spread. The sunset breeze grew to a gale that twisted the trees toward the water, sending branches and sand sweeping past them. Ravna was still on her knees, her hands pressing down on Fan's limp arms. No breath, no pulse. The eyes stared sightlessly. Old One's gift to her. Damn all the powers. She grabbed Fam Nguyen under the shoulders and rolled him onto her back. She gagged, almost lost her grip. Underneath his shirt, she felt cavities where there should be solid flesh. Something wet and rank dripped around her sides. She struggled up from her knees, half carrying and half dragging the body. Blue Shell was shouting, Take hours to roll anywhere. He drifted off the ground, driving his agrav against the wind. Scrode and Ryder twisted drunkenly for an instant. And then he, then he was slammed back to the ground, tumbled willy-nilly around toward the wind's destination, the moaning hole that had been the sea. Greenstock raced to his steward's side, blocking his progress toward destruction. Blue Shell righted himself, and the two rolled back towards Ravna. The writer's voice was faint in the wind, Agrav failing, and with it the very structure of the docks. They walked and wheeled their way back from the sucking sea, find a place to land the OOB. The tree line was a jagged range of hills now. The landscape changed before their eyes and under her feet. The groaning sound was everywhere, some places so loud it buzzed through Ravna's shoes. They avoided sagging terrain, the sinkholes that opened up on all sides. The night was dark no more. Whether it was an emergency lighting, lightning, lighting? Whether it was emergency lighting, or a side effect of the agrav failure, blue glowed along the holes. Though those holes they saw the, through those holes they saw the cloud-decked night of groundside a thousand kilometers below. The space between was not empty. They were shimmering phantoms, billions of tons of water and earth, and hundreds of dying flyers. Vrindamy Org was paying the price for building their docks on Agrav instead of inertial orbit. Somehow these three were making progress. Fam Nguyen was almost too heavy to carry slash drag. She staggered left and right almost as much as she moved forward. Yet he was, uh, lighter than she would have guessed, and that was terrifying in its own way. Was even the high ground failing? Most of the agravs died by failure, but some suffered destructive runaway. Clumps of trees and earth ripped free from the tops of hillocks and accelerated upwards. The wind shifted back and forth, up and down, but it was thinner now, the noise remote. The artificial atmosphere that clothed the, clothed the docks would soon be gone. Ravna's pocket pressure suit worked for a few minutes, but it, now it was fading. In a few minutes it would be as dead as her agravs, as dead as she would be. She wondered vaguely how the Blight had managed this. Like the old one, she would likely die without ever knowing. She saw torch flares. There were ships. Most had boosted for inertial orbits or gone directly into ultra-drive, but a few hung over the disintegrating landscape. Blue Shell and Greenstock led the way. The two used their third axles in ways Ravna had never guessed at, lifting and pushing to clamber up slopes that she could scarcely negotiate with Fam's weight dragging from her back. They were on a hilltop, but not for long. This had been part of the office forest. Now the trees stuck out in different directions, like hair on a mangy dog. She felt the ground throbbing beneath her feet. What next? The scrode riders rolled from one side of the peak to another. They would be rescued here or nowhere. She went to her knees, resting most of Fam's weight on the ground. From here you could see a long ways. The docks looked like a slowly flapping flag, and every immense whip of the fabric broke fragments loose. As long as some consensus remained about among the agrav units, it still had plainer aspect. That was disappearing. There were sinkholes all around their little knob of forest. On the horizon, Ravna saw the far edge of the docks detach itself and turn slowly sideways, a hundred kilometers long, ten, ten wide. It swept down on would-be rescue ships. Blue Shell brushed against her left side, Greenstock against her right. Ravna twisted, laying some of Fam's weight on the scrode holes. If all four merged their pressure suits, there would be a few more moments of consciousness. The OOB, I'm flying it down, he said. Something was coming down. A ship's torch lit the ground blue-white, with shadows stark and shifting. It's not a healthy thing to be around a rocket drive hovering in a near 1G field. An hour earlier the maneuver would have been impossible, or a capital offensive accomplished. Now it didn't matter if the torch punched through the docks or fried a cargo from halfway across the galaxy. Still, where could Blue Shell land the thing? They were surrounded by sinkholes and moving cliffs. She closed her eyes as the burning light drifted down before them, and then dimmed. Blue Shell's shout was thin as in their shared atmosphere. Let's go together. 
She held tight to the riders, and they crawled slash wheeled down from their little hill. The out-of-band, too, was hovering in the middle of a sinkhole. Its torch was hidden from view, but the glare off the sides of the hull put the ship in sharp silhouette, turned its ultra-drive spines into feathery white arcs, a giant moth with glowing wings, and just out of reach. If their suits held, they could make it to the edge of the hole. Then what? The spines kept the ships from getting closer than a hundred meters. An able-bodied and crazy human might try to grab a spine and crawl down it, but Scrode Riders had their own brand of insanity. Just as the light, the reflected light, became too much to bear, the torch winked out. The OOB fell through the hole. This didn't stop the riders' advance. Faster, said Blue Shell, and now she guessed what they planned. Quickly, for such an awkward jumble of limbs and wheels, they moved up to the edge of the darkened hole. Ravna felt the dirt giving way beneath her feet, and then they were falling. The decks were hundreds, in places thousands of meters thick. They fell past them now, past dim, eerie flickers of internal destruction. Then they were through, still falling. For a moment, the feeling of wild panic was gone. After all this was simply freefall, a commonplace, and a damn sight more peaceful than the disintegrating docks. Now it was easy to hold on to the riders and Fam Nguyen, and even their commensal atmosphere seemed a little thicker than before. There was something to be said for hard vacuum and freefall. Except for an occasional rogue agrav, everything was coming down at the same acceleration, ruins peacefully settling. And four or five minutes from now, they would hit the groundside's atmosphere, still falling almost straight downwards, entry velocity only three or four kilometers per second. Would they burn up? Maybe. Flashes pricked bright above the cloud decks. The junk around them was mostly dark, just shadows against the sky show above. But the wreckage directly below was large and regular. The OOB, bow on. The ship was falling with them. Every few seconds a trim jet fired, a faint reddish glow. The ship was closing with them. If it had a nose hatch, they would land right on it. Its docking lights flicked on, bright upon them. Ten meters separation. Five. There was a hatch, and open. She could see a very ordinary airlock within. Whatever hit them was big. Ravna saw a vague expanse of plastic rising over her shoulder. The rogue was slowly turning, and it scarcely brushed them. But that was enough. Fam Nguyen was jarred from her grasp. His body was lost in shadow, then suddenly bright lit as the ship's spotlight tracked after him. Simultaneously, the air gusted out of Ravna's lungs. They were down to three pocket pressure fields now, falling, failing fields. It was not enough. Ravna could feel consciousness slipping away, her vision tunneling, so close. The riders unlatched from each other. She grabbed at the scrowed holes and they drifted, strung out over the ship's lock. Blue Shell's scrowed jerked against her as he made fast to the hatch. The jolt twisted her around, whipping green stock upwards. Things were getting dreamy now. Where was panic when you needed it? Hold tight, hold tight, hold tight, sang the little voice, all that was left of consciousness. Bump, jerk. The riders pushed and pulled at her, or maybe it was the ship jerking all of them around. They were puppets, dancing off a, a single, single string. Deep in the tunnel of her vision, a rider grabbed at the tumbling figure of Fam Nguyen. Ravna wasn't aware of losing consciousness, but the next she knew, she was breathing air and choking on vomit, and it was inside the airlock. Solid green walls closed in comfortingly on all sides. Fam Nguyen lay on the far wall, strapped into a first aid canister. His face, face had a bluish cast. She pushed awkwardly across the lock toward Fam Nguyen's wall. The place was a confused jumble, unlike the passenger and sporting ships she'd seen on before. Besides, this was a rider design. Stickum patches were scattered around the walls. Greenstock had mounted her scrode on one cluster. They were accelerating, maybe a twentieth of a G. We're still going down? Yes. If we hover or rise, we'll crash. Into all the junk that still rains from above. Blue Shell is trying to fly us out. They were falling with the rest, but trying to drift out from under, before they hit ground side. There was an occasional rattle slash ping against the hull. Sometimes the acceleration ceased or shifted in a new direction. Blue Shell was actively avoiding the big pieces. Not with complete success. There was a long rasping sound that ended with a bang, and the room turned slowly around her. Brap! <laughs> it just lost an ultra drive spine, came Blue Shell's voice. Two others already damaged. Please strap down, my lady. They touched atmosphere a hundred seconds later. The sound was a barely perceptible humming beyond the hull. It was the sound of death for a ship like this. It could no more aero break than a dog could jump over the moon. The noise came louder, 
Shell was actually diving, trying to get deep enough to shed the junk that surrounded the ship. Two more spines broke, then came a long surge of main axis acceleration. Out of band two, arced out of the dock's death shadow, drove out and out into inertial orbit. Ravna looked over Blue Shell's fronds at the outside windows. They had just passed Groundside's Terminator and were flying in an inertial orbit. They were in free fall again, but this trajectory curved back on itself without whacking into big hard things like Groundside. Ravna didn't know much more about space travel than he'd expect of a frequent passenger and an adventure fan, but it was obvious that Blue Shell had pulled off a near miracle. When she tried to thank him, the rider rolled back and forth across the stick patches, buzzing faintly to himself. Embarrassed, or just riderly inattentive? Greenstock spoke, sounding a little shy, a little proud. Far trading is our life, you know. If we are cautious, life will be mostly safe and placid. But there are thing but there will be close passages. Blue Shell practices all the time, programming his scrode with every wit he can imagine. He is a master. In everyday life, indecision seemed to dominate the riders, but in a crunch, they didn't hesitate to bet everything. She wondered how of that was scrode how of that was the scrode overriding its rider. Grump, said Blue Shell. I have simply postponed the close passage. I have broke several of our drive spines. What if they do not self-repair? What do we do then? Everything around Groundside is destroyed. There is junk everywhere, out to a hundred radii. Not dense like around the docks, but of a much higher velocity. You can't inject billions of tons of wreckage into buckshot orbits and expect safe navigation. And any second, the perversion's creatures will be here, eating whoever survives. Irk. Greenstock's tendrils froze in comical disarray. She chittered to herself for a second. You're right, I forgot. I thought we had found an open space, but... Open space, all right, but in a shooting gallery. Ravna looked back at the command deck windows. They were on the day side now, perhaps 500 kilometers above ground side's principal ocean. The space above the hazy blue horizon was free of flash and glow. I don't see any fighting, Ravna said hopefully. Sorry, Blue Shell switched the windows to a more significant view. Most of it was navigation and ultra trace information, meaningless to Ravna. Her eye caught on a medstat. Fam Nguyen was breathing again. The ship's surgeon thought it could save him. But there was also a communication status window. On it, the attack was dreadfully clear. The local net had broken into hundreds of screaming fragments. There were only automatic voices from the planetary surface, and they were calling for medical aid. Grander had been down there. Somehow she suspected that not even his marketing ops people had survived. Whatever hit Groundside was even deadlier than the failures at the docks. In near-planetary space, there were a few survivors in the ships and fragments of habitats, most on doomed trajectories. Without massive and coordinated help, they would be dead in minutes. Hours at the outside. The directors of Verminiorg were gone, destroyed before they ever figured out quite what had happened. Go, Grounder had said. Go. Out system, there was fighting. Ravna saw message traffic from Vermini defense units. Even without control or coordination, some, some still opposed the Perversion's fleet. The light from their battles would arrive well after the defeat, well after the enemy arrived here in person. How long do we have? Minutes? Brap? Look at those traces, said Blue Shell. The Perversion has almost 4,000 vessels. They are pa bypassing the defenders. But now there is scarcely anyone left out there, said Greenstock. I hope they're not all dead. Not all. I see several thousand ships departing, everyone with the means in any sense. Blue Shell rolled back and forth. Alas, we have the good sense. But look at this repair report. One window spread large, filled with colored patterns that meant less than zip to Ravna. Two spines still broken, unrepairable. Three partially repaired. If they don't heal, we'll be stuck here. This is unacceptable. His voter voice buzzed up shrilly. Greenstock drove close to him, and they rattled their fronds at each other. Several minutes passed, when Blue Shell spoke Sam Norsk again. His voice was quieter. One spine repaired. Maybe, maybe, maybe. He opened a natural view. The OOB was coasting across Groundside South Pole, back into night. Their orbit should take them over the worst of the dock's junk, but the ride was a constant jigging as the ship avoided other debris. The cries of battle horror from out-system dwindled. The Vermini organization was one vast, twitching corpse, and very soon its killer would come snuffling. Too repaired, Blue Shell became very quiet, 
Three. Three are repaired. Fifteen seconds to recalibrate and we can jump. It seemed longer, but then all the windows were changed to a natural view. Groundside and its sun were gone. Stars and dark stretched all around. Three hours later and Relay was a hundred and fifty light years behind them. The OOB had caught up with the main body of fle fleeing ships. With what the archives and the tourism... What with the archives and the tourism... There had been an extraordinary number of interstellar ships at Relay. Ten thousand vehicles were spread across the light years around them. But stars were rare this far off of the galactic plane, and they were at least a hundred hours of flying time from the nearest refuge. For Ravna, it was the start of a new battle. She glared across the deck at Blue Shell. The scrode rider dithered, its fronds twisting on themselves in a way she had not seen before. See here, my, later, my lady Bergeson Dot. High Point is a lovely civilization, with some bipedal participants. It is safe. It is nearby. You could adapt. He paused. Reading my expression, is he? But, but if that is not acceptable, we will take you further. Give us a chance to contract the proper cargo, and we'll take you all the way back to Sandra Kai. How about that? No, you already have a, contact, a contract, Blue Shell, with the Vermini organization. Three of us, and whatever has become of Fam Nguyen, are going to the bottom of the beyond. I am shaking my head in disbelief. We received a preliminary retainer, true, but now that Verminiorg is dead, there is no one to make good on the rest of the agreement, hence we are free of it also. Vermini is not dead. You heard Grander Kaller. The org had, has, branch offices all across the beyond. The obligation stands. On a technicality, we both know that those branches could never make the final payment. Ravna didn't have a good answer to that. You have an obligation, she said, but without the proper forcefulness. She had never been good at bluster. My lady, are you truly speaking from org ethics or from simple humanity? I, in fact, Ravna had never completely understood org ethics. That was one reason why she had intended to return to Sandrikai after her apprenticeship, and one reason the org had dealt cautiously with the human race. It doesn't matter which I speak from. There is a contract. You were happy to honor it when things looked safe. Well, things turned death deadly, but that possibility was part of the deal. Ravna glanced at Greenstock. She had been silent so far, not even rustling at her mate. Her fronds were tightly held against her central stock. Maybe. Listen, there are other reasons besides contact ob contract obligation. The perversion is more powerful than anyone thought. It killed a power today, and it's operating in the middle beyond. The writers have a long history, Blue Shell, longer than the most race's entire existence. The perversion may be strong enough to put an end to all that. Greenstock rolled toward her and opened slightly. You you really think we might find something on that ship at the bottom? Something that could harm a power among powers? Ravna paused. Yes. An old one himself thought so, thought so just before he died. Blue Shell wrapped even tighter around himself, twisting. In anguish? My lady, we are traitors. We have lived long and traveled far and survived by minding our own business. No matter what romantics may think, traitors do not go on quests. What you ask is impossible, mere beyonders seeking to subvert a power. Yet that was a risk you signed for, but Ravna didn't say it aloud. Perhaps Greenstock did. Her fronds rustled, and Blue Shell scrunched even more. Greenstock was silent for a second. Then she did something funny with her axles, bumping free of the stickum. Her wheels spun on nothing as she floated through a slow arc till she was upside down her fronds reaching down to brush blue shells. They rattled back and forth for almost five minutes. Blue shell slowly untwisted, the fronds relaxing and patting back at his mate. Finally, he said, very well, one quest, but mark you, never another. Part Two, Chapter 17 Spring came wet and cold and excruciatingly slow. It had been raining the last eight days. How Joanna wished for something else, even the dark of winter, to be, be back again. She slogged across mud that had been moss. It was midday, the gloomy light would last another three hours. Scar Butt claimed that, without the overcast, they would be seeing a bit of direct sunlight nowadays. Sometimes she wondered if she would ever see the sun again. The castle's great yard was on a hillside. Mud and sullen snow spread down the hill, piled against the wooden buildings. Last summer, there had been a glorious view from here, and in the winter, the aurora, the aurora had spilled green and blue across the snow, glinted on the frozen harbor, and outlined the far hills against the sky. Now, the rain was a close mist. She couldn't even see the city beyond the walls. 
The clouds were a low and ragged ceiling above her head. She knew there were guards on the stone walls of the castle curtain, but today they must be huddled behind watch slits. Not a single animal, not a single pack was visible. The Tyne's world was an empty place compared to Strom, but not like the High Lab either. High Lab was an airless rock, uh, orbiting a red dwarf. The Tyne's world was alive, moving. Sometimes it looked as beautiful and as friendly as a holiday resort on Strom. Indeed, Joanna realized that it was kindlier than most worlds the human race had settled. Certainly a gentle, gentler world than Neora, and perhaps as nice as Old Earth. Joanna had reached her bungalow. She paused for a second under its outcurving walls and looked across the courtyard. Yes, it looked a little like medieval Nijora. But the stories from the Age of Princesses hadn't conveyed the implacable power in such a world. The rain went on for as far as she could see. Without decent technology, even a cold rain could be a deadly thing. So could the wind. And the sea was not something for an afternoon's fun sailing. She thought of surging hillocks of coldness, puckered with rain, going on and on. Even the forests around the town were threatening. It was easy to wander into them, but there were no radio finders, no refresh stalls disguised as tree trunks. Once lost, you could you would simply die. Njorn family ta fairy tales had a special meaning for her now. No great imagination was needed to invent the elementals of wind and rain and sea. This was the pre-tech experience, that even if you had no enemies, the world itself could kill you. And she did have plenty of enemies. Joanna pulled open the tiny door and went inside. A pack of tines was sitting around the fire. It scrambled to its feet and helped Joanna out of her rain jacket. She didn't shrink from the fine-toothed muzzles anymore. This was one of her usual helpers. She could almost think of the jaws as hands, deftly pulling the oilskin jacket down her arms and hanging it near the fire. Joanna chuckled, chucked her boots and pants and accepted the quilted wrap of the, that the pack handed her. Dinner, now, she said to the pack. Okay. Joanna settled on a pillow by the fire pit. <clears throat> In fact, the tines were more primitive than the humans on Neora. The Tynes world was not a fallen colony. They didn't even have a legend to guide them. Sanitation was a sometime thing. Before Woodcarver, Tinnish doctors bled their patients slash victims. She knew now that she was living in the Tynes equivalent of a luxury apartment. Deep polished wood was not a normal thing. The designs painted on the pillars and walls were the result of many hours' labor. Joanna rested her chin on her hands and star stared into the flames. She was vaguely aware of the pack prancing around the pit, hanging pots over the fire. This one spoke very little Sandlorsk. It wasn't in on Woodcarver's dataset project. Many weeks ago, Scarbutt had asked to move in here. What better way than to speed the learning process? Joanna shivered at the memory. She knew the scarred one was just a single member, that the pack that had killed Dad had itself died. Joanna understood, but every time she saw Peregrine, she saw her father's murderer sitting fat and happy thinking to hide itself behind its three smaller fellows. Joanna smiled into the flames, remembering the whack that she had landed on Scarbutt when she made the suggestion. She'd lost control, but it had been worth it. No one else suggested that friends should share this house with her. Most evenings they left her alone, and some nights Dad and Mom seemed so near, maybe just outside, waiting for her to notice. Even though she had seen them die, something inside her refused to let them go. Cooking smells slipped past the familiar daydream. Tonight it was meat and beans, with something like onions. Surprise. The stuff smelled good. If there had been any variety, she would have enjoyed it. But Joanna hadn't seen fresh fruit in sixty days. Salted meat and veggies were the only winter fare. If Geoffrey were here, he'd throw a fit. It was months past since the word came from Woodcarver's spies up north. Geoffrey had died in the ambush. Joanna was getting over it. She really was and in some ways, being all alone made things simpler. The pack put a plate of meat and beans before her, along with a kind of knife. Oh well. Joanna grabbed the crooked hilt, bent sideways to be held by tinnish jaws, and dug in. She was almost finished when there was a polite scratching at the door. Her servant gobbled something. The visitor replied, then said it rather good San Norsk, and a voice that was eerily like her own. Hello there, my name is Scriber. I would like a small talk, okay? One of the servants turned to look at her. The rest were watching the door. Scriber was the one she thought of as pompous clown. 
He'd been with Scarbutt at the ambush, but he was such a fool that he scarcely felt she scarcely felt threatened by him. Okay, she said, starting towards the door. Her servant, guard, grabbed crossbow, crossbows in its jaws, and all five members snaked up the staircase to the loft. There wasn't space for more than one pack down here. The cold and wet blew into the room along with her visitor. Joanna retreated to the other side of the fire while Scriber took off his rain slickers. The pack members shook themselves the way dogs do, a noisy, amusing sight, and you didn't want to be near when it happened. Finally, Scriber sauntered over to the fire pit. Under the slickers he wore jackets with the usual stirrups and the open spaces behind the shoulders at the haunches. But Scriber's appeared to be padded above the shoulders to make his members look heavier <laughs> than they really were. One of him sniffed at her plate, while the other heads looked at this way and that, but never directly at her. Joanna looked down at the pack. She still had trouble walking to more than one face. Talking to more than one face. Usually she picked on whichever one was looking back at her. Well, what did you come to talk about? One of the heads finally looked at her. It licked its lips. Okay, yes, I thought to see how do you do. I mean, gobble. Her servant answered from upstairs, probably reporting what kind of mood she was in. Scriber straightened up. Four of its six heads looked at Joanna. His other two members paced back and forth, as if contemplating something important. Look here. You are the only human I know, but I've always been a big student of character. I know you are not happy here. Pompous Clown was also a master of the obvious. And I understand, but we do the best to help you. We are not the bad people who killed your parents and brother. Joanna put a hand on the low ceiling and leaned forward. You're all thugs. You just happen to have the same enemies I do. I know that, and I am cooperating. You'd still be playing the data set's kinder mode if it weren't for me. I've shown you the reading courses. If you guys have any brains, you'll have gunpowder by summer. The Oliphant was an heirloom toy, a huggable favorite thing that she should have outgrown years ago. But there was history in it, stories of the queens and princesses of the Dark Ages, and how they had struggled to triumph over the jungles, to rebuild the cities and then the spaceships. Half hidden on obscure reference paths there were also hard numbers, the history of technology. Gunpowder was one of the easiest things. When the weather cleared up, there would be some prospecting expeditions. Woodcarver had known about sulfur, but it didn't have quantities in town. Making cannon would be harder, but then... Then your enemies will be killed. Your people are getting what they want from me. So what's your complaint? Complaint? Pompous clown's heads bobbed up and down in alternation. Such distributed gestures seemed to be the equivalent of facial expressions, though Joanna hadn't figured any of them out. This one might mean embarrassment. I have no complaint. You are helping us, I know. But, but... Three of his members were pacing around now. It's just that I see more than most people, perhaps a little like Woodcarver did in olden days. I am a... I've seen your word for it. A uh, dilettante. You know, a person who studies all things and who is talented at everything. I am only thirty years old, but I've read almost every book in the world, and... The heads bowed, perhaps in shyness? I'm even planning to write one, perhaps the true story of your adventure. Joanna found herself smiling. Most often she saw the Tynes as barbarian strangers, inhuman in spirit as well as form. But if she closed her eyes, she could almost imagine that Scriber was a fellow Stromer. Mom had a few friends just as brainless and innocently self-convinced as this one. Men and women with a hundred grandiose projects that would never amount to, everything, to anything. Back on Strom, they had been boring perils that she avoided. Now, well, Scriber's foolishness was almost like being back home again. You're here to study me for your book? More alternating nods. Well, yes, and also I wanted to talk to you about my other plans. I've always been something of an inventor, you see. I know that doesn't mean much now. It means it seems that everything can be invented is already in the data set. I've seen many of the, my best ideas there. He sighed, or made the sound of a sigh. Now he was imitating one of the pop science voices in the data set. Sound was the easiest thing for Tynes. It could be so darn confusing. In any case, I was just wondering how to improve some of those ideas. Four of Scriber's members bellied down on the bench by the fire pit. It looked like he was settling in for a long conversation. His other two walked around the pit to give her a stack of paper threaded with brass hoops. While one on the other side of the fire continued to talk, the two carefully turned the pages and pointed at where she should look. Well, he did have plenty of ideas. Tethered birds to hoist flying boats. Giant lenses that would concentrate the sun's light on enemies and set them afire. 
From some of the pictures, it appeared that he thought the atmosphere extended beyond the moon. Scriber explains each idea in numbing detail, pointing at the drawings and patting her hands enthusiastically. So you see the possibilities, my unique slant combined with the proven inventions and data set. Who knows where it could lead? Joanna giggled, overcome by the vision of Scriber's giant birds hauling kilometer-wide lenses to the moon. He seemed to take the sound for approval. Yes, it's brilliant, okay? My latest idea, I never would have thought of it except for data set. This radio, it projects sound very far and fast, okay? Why not combine it with the power of our tinnish thoughts? A pack could think as one, even spread across hundreds of, um, kilometers. Now that almost made sense. But if gunpowder took months to make, even given the exact formula, how many decades would it be before the packs had radio? Scriber was an immense fountain of half-baked ideas. She let his words wash over her for more than an hour. It was insanity, but less alien than most of what she had endured this past year. Finally, he seemed to run down. There were longer pauses, and he asked her opinion more often. Finally, he said, Well, that was certainly fun, okay? Um, yes, fascinating. I knew you would like it. You're just like my people, I really think. You're not all angry, not all the time. Just what do you mean by that? Joanna pushed a soft muzzle away and stood. The dog thing rocked back on its haunches and looked to look up to her. I, well, you have much to hate, I know, but you seem so angry at us all the time, and we're the ones who are trying to help you. After the day work, you stay here. You don't want to talk with people, though now I see that was our fault. You wanted us to come here, but we were too proud to say it. I have these insights into character, you see. My friend, the one you call Scarbutt, he is a truly nice fellow. I know I can tell you that honestly, and that as my new friend you will believe. He would very much like to come visit you, too, Irk. Joanna walked slowly around the fire pit, forcing the two members to back away from her. All of Scriber was looking up at her now, the necks arching around one another, the eyes wide. I'm not like you. I don't need your talk or your stupid ideas. She threw Scriber's notebook into the pit. Scriber leaped to the fire's edge, desperately reached for the burning notes. He pulled most of them back and clutched them to his chests. Joanna kept walking toward him, kicking at his legs. Scriber retreated, backing and sprawling. Stupid, dirty butchers. I'm not like you. She slapped her hand on a ceiling beam. Humans don't like to live like animals. We don't adopt killers. You tell Scarbutt, you tell him. If he ever comes by for a friendly chat, I, I'll i smash his head. I'll smash in all of them. Scriber was backed into the wall now. His heads turned wildly this way and that. He was making plenty of noise. Some of it was Samnorsk, but too high-pitched to understand. One of his mouths found a door pole. He pushed open the door, and all six members raced into the twilight, their rain slickers forgotten. Joanna knelt and stuck her head through the doorway. The air was a wind-driven mist. In an instant, her face was so cold and wet that she couldn't feel the tears. Scriber was six shadows in darkening grayness, shadows that raced down the hillside, sometimes tumbling in their haste. In a second, he was gone. There was nothing but the vague forms of nearby cabins and the yellow light that spilled out around her from the fire. Strange. Right after the ambush, she had felt terror. The tines had been unstoppable killers. Then, on the boat, when she smashed Scarbutt, it had been so wonderful. The whole pack collapsed, and suddenly she knew she could fight back, that she could break their bones. She didn't have to be at their mercy. Tonight she had learned something more. Even without touching them, she could hurt them. Some of them, anyway. Her dislike alone had undone Pompous Clown. Joanna backed into the smoky warmth and shut the door. She could feel triumph. Chapter 18 Scriber Jakarovmuthan didn't tell anyone about his meeting with the two legs. Of course, Vendacious's guard had overheard everything. The fellow might not speak much Samnorsk, but he had surely gotten the drift of the argument. People would hear about it eventually. He moped around the castle for a few days, spent a number of hours hunched over the remains of his notebook, trying to recreate the diagrams. It would be a while before he attended any more sessions with Dataset, especially when Joanna was around. Scriber knew he seemed brash to the outside world, but in fact it had taken a lot of courage to walk in on Joanna like that. He knew his ideas had genius, but all his life unimaginative people had been telling him otherwise. In most ways, Scriber was a very fortunate person. He had been born a fission pack in Rang Rangathir, at the eastern edge of the Republic. His parents had been a wealthy merchant, or his parent had been a wealthy merchant. Jakaramuthan had some of his parents' traits but the dull patience necessary for day-to-day -day business work had been lost to him. 
His sibling pack was more than restrained, retained, more than retained that faculty. The family business grew, and in the first years, his sib didn't di begrudge Scriber for his share of the wealth. From his earliest days, Scriber had been an intellectual. He read everything, natural history, bi biography, brood kenning. In the end, he had the largest library in Rangathir, more than 200 books. Even then, Scriber had tremendous ideas, insights which, if properly executed, would have made him the, the wealthiest merchants in all the eastern provinces. Alas, bad luck and his sib's lack of imagination had doomed his early ideas. In the end, his sib bought out the business, and Jakaramuthan moved to the capital. It was all for the best. By this time, Scriber had fleshed himself out to six members. He needed to see more of the world. Besides, there were five thousand books in the library there, the experience of all history and all the world. His own notebooks became a library in themselves. Yet still, the packs at the university had no time for him. His outline for a summation of natural history was rejected by all the stationers, though he paid to have small parts of it published. It was clear that success in the world of action was necessary before his ideas could get the attention they deserved, hence his spy mission. Parliament itself would thank him when he returned with secrets of Flenser's hidden island. That was almost a year ago. What had happened since, with the flying house and Joanna and data set, went beyond his wildest dreams, and Scriber granted that those dreams were already pretty extreme. The library in Dataset contained millions of books. With Joanna to help him polish his ideas, they would sweep Flenderism from the face of the world. They would regain her flying house. Not even the sky would be a limit. So to have her throw it all back at him, it made him wonder about himself. Maybe she was just mad at him for trying to explain Peregrine. Maybe she would like Peregrine if she let herself. He was sure of it. But then again, maybe his ideas just weren't that good, at least by comparison with humans. That thought left him pretty low. But he finished redrawing the diagrams, and even got some new ideas. Maybe he should get some more silk paper. Peregrine stopped by and persuaded him to go into town. Jakaramuthan had made a dozen explanations why he wasn't participating in the sessions with Joanna anymore. He tried out two or three as he and Peregrine descended Castle Street toward the harbor. After a minute or two, his friend turned a head back. It's okay, Scriber. When you feel like it, we'd like to have you back. Scriber had always been a very good judge of attitude. In particular, he could tell when he was being patronized. He must have scowled a little, because Peregrine went on. I mean it. Even Woodcarver has been asking about you. She likes your ideas. Comforting lies or not, Scriber brightened. Really? The Woodcarver of today was a sad case but the woodcarver of the history books was one of Jacaramuffin's great heroes. No one's mad at me? Well, Vendacious is a bit peeved. Being responsible for the two-leg safety makes him very nervous. But you only tried something we've all wanted to do. Yeah. Even if there had been no data set, even if Johanna Olsendot had not come from the stars, she would still be the most fascinating creature in the world. A pack-equivalent mind in a single body. You could walk right up to her. You could touch her, without the least confusion. It was frightening at first, but all of them quickly felt the attraction. For Pax, closeness had always meant mindlessness, whether for sex or battle. Imagine being able to sit by the fire with a friend and carry on an intelligent conversation. Woodcover had a theory that the two-leg civilization might be innately more effective than any Packish one, that collaboration was so easy for humans that they learned and built much faster than Pax could. The only problem with the theory was Joanna Olsen thought. If Joanna was a normal human, it is, was a surprise that the race could cooperate on anything. Sometimes she was friendly, usually in the sessions with Woodcarver. She seemed to realize that Woodcarver was frail and failing. More often she was patronizing, sarcastic, and seemed to think that the best thing they could do for her, uh, think the best thing they could do for her insulting. And sometimes she was like last night. How goes it with data set? He asked for a moment. Peregrine shrugged. About like before. Both Woodcarver and I can read Sam Norsk pretty well now. Joanna has taught us, me via Woodcarver, I should say, how to use most of Dataset's powers. There's so much there that will change the world. But for now, we have to concentrate on making gunpowder and cannons. It's that, the actual doing, that's going slow. Scriber nodded knowingly. That had been the central problem in his life, too. Anyway, if we can do all that by midsummer, maybe we can face Flenser's army and recapture the flying house before next winter. 
Peregrine made a grin that, grin that stretched from face to face. And then my friend Joanna can call her people for rescue, and we'll have all our lives to study the outsiders. I may pilgrimage to worlds around other stars. It was an idea they had talked of before. Peregrine had thought of it even before Scriber. They turned off Castle Street onto Edrow. Scriber was feeling more enthusiastic about visiting the stationers. There must have been some way he could help. He looked around with an interest that had been lacking the few days, the last few days. Woodcarver's was a fair-sized city, almost as big as Rangathir. Maybe twenty thousand packs lived within its walls, and in the homes immediately around. This day was a bit colder than the last few, but it wasn't raining. A cold, clean wind swept the market street, carrying faint smells of mildew and sewage, of spices and fresh-sawn wood. Dark clouds hung low, misting at the hills around the harbor. Spring was definitely in the air. Scriber kicked playfully at the slush along the curb. Peregrine led them to a side street. The place was jammed, strangers getting as close as seven or eight yards. The stalls at the stationers were even worse. The felt dividers weren't that thick, and there seemed to be more interest in literature at woodcarvers than at any place Scriber had ever been. He could hardly hear himself think as he haggled with the stationer. The merchant sat on a raised platform with thick padding. He wasn't much bothered by the racket. Scriber kept his heads close together, concentrating on the prices and the product. From his past life, he was pretty good at this sort of thing. Eventually, he got his paper, and at a decent price. Let's go back on pack wheel, he said. That was a long way. That was the long way, through the center of the market. When he was in a good mood, Scri Scriber rather liked crowds. He was a great student of people. Woodcarver's was not as cosmopolitan as some cities by the Long Lakes, but there were traders from all over. He saw several packs wearing the bonnets of a tropic collective. At one intersection, a red jackets from East Home was chatting cozily with a labor master. When packs came this close, and in these numbers, the world seemed to teeter on the edge of a choir. Every person hung near to himself, trying to keep his own thoughts intact. It was hard to walk without stumbling over your own feet, and sometimes the background thought sounds would, background thought sounds would surge. A moment where several packs would somehow synchronize. Your consciousness wavered, and for an instant you were one with many, a super pack that might be a god. <laughs> Jacaramphamon shivered. That was the essential attraction of the tropics. The crowds there were mobs, vast group minds as stupid as they were ecstatic. If the stories were true, some of the southern cities were non-stop orgies. They had roamed the marketplace almost an hour when it hit them. Scriber shook his heads abruptly. He turned and walked in lockstep off pack wheel and up a side street. Peregrine followed. Is the crowd too much? He asked. I just had an idea, said Scriber. That wasn't unusual in a close crowd, but this was a very interesting idea. He said nothing more for several minutes. The side street climbed steeply, then jinked back and forth across Castle Hill. The upslope side was lined with burghers' homes. On the harbor side, they were looking out over the steep tile roofs of houses on the next switch back down. These were large homes, elegant with rose mailing. Only a few had shops on the street. Scriber slowed down and spread out enough that he wasn't stepping on himself. He saw now that he'd been quite wrong in trying to contribute creative expertise to Joanna. There was simply too much invention in data set, but they still needed him, Joanna most of all. The problem was, they didn't know it yet. Finally, he said to Peregrine, Haven't you wondered that the Flunzerists haven't attacked the city? You and I embarrassed the lords of Hidden Island more than ever in their history. We hold the keys to their total defeat. Joanna and Data said. <clears throat> Peregrine hesitated. Hmm, I assumed their army wasn't up to it. I should think if they were, they'd have knocked over woodcarvers long before. Perhaps, but at great cost. Now the cost is worth it. He gave Peregrine a serious look. No, I think there's another reason. They have the flying house, but they have no idea how to use it. They want Joanna back alive, almost as much as they want to kill all of us. Peregrine made a bitter sound. If Steele hadn't been so eager to massacre everything on two legs, he could have had all sorts of help. True, and the Flenserists must know that. I'll bet they've always had spies among the townspeople here, but now more than ever. Did you see all the East Home packs? East Home was a hotbed for Flenser sentiment. Even before the movement, they had been a hard folk, routinely sacrificing pups that didn't meet their brood standards.
One anyway. Talking to a labor master. Right. Who knows what's coming in disguised as special purpose packs. I'd bet my life they're planning to kidnap Joanna. If they guess what we're planning with her, they may just try to kill her. Don't you see? You must alert Woodcarver and Vendacious. Organize the people to watch for spies. You noticed all this on one walk through Packwheel? There was another wonder, there was wonder or disbelief in his voice. Scriber couldn't tell which. Um, no. The inspiration wasn't anything so direct. But it stands to reason, don't you think? They walked in silence for several minutes. Up here the wind was stronger, and the view more spectacular. When there wasn't the sea, the forest spread an endless gray and green. Everything was very peaceful, because this was a game of stealth. Fortunately, Scriber had a talent for such games. After all, hadn't it been the very political police of the Republic who commissioned him to survey Hidden Island? It had taken him several ten days of patient persuasion, but in the end they had been enthusiastic. Anything you can discover, we would be most happy to review. Those were their exact words. Peregrine waffled around the road, seemingly taken very aback by Scriber's suggestion. Finally, he said, I think there is something you should know, something... Uh, that must remain an absolute secret. Upon my soul, Peregrine, I do not blab secrets. Scriber was a little hurt at the lack of trust, and also that the other might have discovered something he had not. The second should not bother him. He had guessed that Peregrine and Woodcarver were into each other. No telling what she might have confided, or what might have leaked across. Okay, you've tripped onto something that should not be noised about. You know Vendacious is in charge of Woodcarver's security. Of course. That was implicit in the office of Lord Chamberlain. And considering the number of outsiders wandering around, I can't say he's doing a very good job. In fact, he's doing a marvelous, marvelously effective job. Vendacious has agents right at the top of Hidden Island, one step removed from Lord Steele himself. Scriber felt his eyes widening. Yes, you understand what that means. Through Vendacious, Woodcarver knows for certainty everything their High Council plans. With clever misinformation, we can lead the Flenserists around like frog hens at a thinning. Next to Joanna herself, this may be Woodcarver's greatest advantage. I... I had no idea. So the incompetent local security is just a cover. Not exactly. It's supposed to look solid and intelligent, but with just enough exploitable weakness so the movement will postpone a frontal attack in favor of espionage. He smiled. I think Vendacious will be very taken aback to hear your critique. Scriber gave a weak laugh. He was flattered, flattered and boggled at the same time. Vendacious must count as this greatest spymaster of the age. Yet he, Scriber Jacaramuffin, had almost seen through him. Scriber was mostly quiet the rest of the way back to the castle, but his mind was racing. Peregrine was more right than he knew. Secrecy was vital. Unnecessary discussion, even between old friends, must be avoided. Yes, he would offer his services to Vendacious. His new role might keep him in the background, but it was where he could make the greatest contribution. And eventually, even Joanna would be see how helpful he could be. Down in the well of the night, even when Ravna wasn't looking out the windows, that was the image in her mind. Relay was far off the galactic disk. The OOB was descending towards that disk, and even deeper into slowness. But they had escaped. The OOB was crippled, but they had left Relay at almost fifty light-years per hour. Each hour they were lower in the beyond and the computation time for the micro-jumps increased, and their pseudo-velocity declined. Nevertheless, they were making progress. They were deep into the middle of the beyond now, and there was no sign of pursuit, thank goodness. Whatever had brought the blight to Relay, it had no, not been specific knowledge of the OOB. Hope. Ravna felt it growing in her. The ship's medical automation claimed that Pham Nguyen could be saved, and that there was brain activity. The terrible wounds in his back had been Old One's implants, organic machinery that had made Pham close linked to Relay's local network, and thence to the power above. And when that power died somehow, the gear in Pham became a putrescent ruin. So Pham, the person, should still exist. Pray he still exists. The surgeon thought it would be three days before his back was healed enough to attempt resuscitation. In the meantime, Ravna was learning more about the apocalypse that had swept over her. 
Every 20 hours, green stock and blue shell jigged the ship sideways a few light years into some major trunk line of the known net to soak up the news. It was a common practice on any voyage for more than a few days, an easy way for merchants and travelers to keep track of events that might affect their success at voyage's end. According to the news, that is, according to the vast majority of the opinions expressed, the fall of the relay was complete. Oh, Grander, oh, Egravan and Sarale, are you dead or owned now? Parts of the known net were temporarily out of contact. Some of the extragalactic links might not be replaced for years. For the first time in millennia, a power was known to have been murdered. There were tens of thousands of claims about the motive for the attack, and tens of thousands of predictions about what would happen next. Ravna had the ship filter the avalanche, trying to distill the essence of the speculations. The one coming from Stramuli realm, itself Stromly realm, uh, made as much sense as any. The perversion's thralls gloated solemnly about the new era, the marriage of a transcendent being with races of the beyond. If Relay could be destroyed, if power could be murdered, then nothing could stop the spread of victory. Some senders thought the Relay was an ancestral target of whatever had perverted Stram Stromly realm. Maybe the attack was just the tail end of some long-ago war, a misbegotten tragedy for the descendants of forgotten races. If so, then the thralls at Stromly Realm might just wither away and the original human culture there reappear. A number of items suggested that the attack had been aimed at stealing Relay's archives, but only one or two claimed that the Blight sought to recover an artifact, or prevent the Relayers from recovering one. The resurgence came from chronic theorizers, the sort of civilizations that get surcharged by newsgroup automation. Nevertheless, Ravna looked through these messages carefully. None of them suggested an artifact in the low beyond. If anything, they claimed the Blight was searching for something in the high beyond or low transcend. There was network traffic coming out of the Blight. The high protocol messages were ignored by all but the suicidal, and no one was getting paid to forward any of it. Yet horror and curiosity spread some of the messages far. There was the blighter video, almost 400 seconds of pan-sensual data with no compression. That incredibly insp expensive message might be the most forwarded hog in all net history. Blue Shell held the OOB on the trunk path for nearly two days to receive the whole thing. The perversion's thralls all appeared to be human. About half the news items coming out of the realm were video evocations, though none this long. All showed human speakers. Ravna watched the big one again and again. She even recognized the speaker. O slash Vnilzen dot had been Stromly's realm, Stromly, Stromly realm's champion trail runner. She had no title now and probably no name. Nilzen dot spoke from an office that might have been a garden. If Ravna stepped to the side of the image, she could see over his shoulder to the ground level. The city there looked like Stromly Main on, of record. Years ago, Ra <coughs> Ravna and her sister had dreamed about that city. <clears throat> the heart of mankind's adventure into the transcend. The central square had been a replica of the Field of Princesses on Neorgia. <coughs> and the immigration advertising claimed that no matter how far the Stromers went, the fountain in the field would always flow would always show their loyalty to humankind's beginnings. There was no fountain now, and Ravna felt deadness behind Nilzendot's gaze. This one speaks as the power that helps, said the erstwhile hero. I want all to see what I can do for even a third-rate civilization. Look upon my helping. The viewpoint swung skywards. It was sunset, and the ranked agraf structures hung against the light, megameter upon megameter. It was a more grandiose use of the agrav material than Ravna had ever seen, even on the docks. <laughs> Certainly no world in the middle beyond could ever afford to import the material in such quantities. What you see above me is just the work barracks for the construction that I will soon begin in the Stromly system. When complete, five star systems will be a single habitat, their planets an excess stellar mass distributed to support life and technology as never before seen at these depths, and as rarely seen in the transcend itself. The view returned to Nilzendot, a single human, mouthpiece for a god. Some of you may rebel against the idea of dedicating yourselves to me. In the long run, it does not matter. The symbiosis of my power with the hands of races in the beyond is more than any can resist. But I speak now to diminish your fear. What you see in Stromly Realm is as much a joy as a wonder. Never again will races in the beyond be left behind by transcendence. Those who join me, 
and all who will join eventually, will be part of the power. You will have access to imports from across the top and lower transcend. You will reproduce beyond limits your own technology can sustain. You will absorb all that oppose me. You will bring the new stability. The third or fourth time she watched the item, Ravna tried to ignore the words, concentrate on Nilsendot's expression, comparing it to speeches she had had in her personal data set. There was a difference. It wasn't her imagination. The creature she watched was soul dead. Somehow, the Blight didn't care that it was obvious. Maybe it wasn't obvious except to human viewers, and they were a vanishingly small fr fraction of the audience. The viewpoint closed in on Nilsendot's ordinary dark face, his ordinary violet eyes. Some of you may wonder how the, all this is possible, and why billions of years of anarchy have passed without such help from a power. The answer is complex. Like many sensible developments, this one has a th high threshold. On one side of that threshold, the development appears impossibly unlikely, on the other, inevitable. The symbiosis of the helping depends on efficient, high bandwidth communication between myself and the beings I help. Creatures such as the one now speaking my words must respond as quickly and faithfully as a hand or a mouth. Their eyes and ears must report across light years. This has been hard to achieve, especially since the system must essentially be in place before it can function. But now that the symbiosis exists, prog progress will come much faster. Almost any race can be modified to receive help. Almost any race can be modified. The words came from a familiar face, and in Ravna's birth language, but the origin was monstrously far away. There was plenty of analysis. A whole news group had been formed. Threat of the Blight was spawned from Threats Group, Homo Sapiens Interest Group, and Closed Coupled Automation. These days it was busier than any five other groups. In this part of the galaxy, a significant fraction of all message traffic belonged to the new group. More bits were sent analyzing poor old slash and mills and dots, mouthing, than had been in the original. Judging from flames and the contradictions, the signal-to-noise ratio was very low. Crypto, zero, as received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc, Language Path, Acalaron, Trisquiline, SJK Units, from Kuvark University, claimed to be habitat-based university in the middle beyond. Subject, Blighter Video. Summary, the message shows fraud. Distribution. War Tracker's Interest Group. Where are they now, Interest Group? F threat of the Blight. Date, 7.06 days since fall of Relay. Text of message. It's obvious that this helper is a fraud. We've researched the matter carefully. Though he is not named, the speaker is a high official in the former Stromley regime. Now why, if the helper simply runs the humans as teleoperated robots, why is the earlier social structure preserved? The answer should be clear to any idiot. The helper does not have the power to teleoperate large numbers of sentients. Evidently, the fall of Stromley Realm consisted of taking over key elements in that civilization's power structure. It's business as usual for the rest of the race. Our conclusion. This helper symbiosis is just another messianic religion, another screwball empire excusing its excesses and attempting to trick those it cannot directly coerce. Don't be fooled. Crypto, zero, as received by OOB Shipboard Ab Ad Hoc. Language Path, Optima, Acalaron, Trisquiline, SJK Units. From Society for Rational Investigation probably a single system in middle beyond, 5,700 light-years anti-spinward of Sandra Kai. Subject, Blighter Video Thread, Curvark University, 1. Key phrases, probable obscenity, waste of our valuable time. Distribution, Society for Rational Network Management, Threat of the Blight. Date, 7.91 days since fall of relay. Text of message, Who is a fool? Probable obscenity, probable obscenity. Idiots who don't follow all the threads in developing news should not waste my precious ears with their clear obscenity, garbage. So you think the helper symbiosis is a fraud of Stromley Realm? And what do you think caused the fall of a relay? In case your head is totally stuck up your rear, probable insult, there was a power ally allied with relay. That power is now dead. You think maybe it just committed suicide? Look it up, flathead, probable insult. No power has ever fallen to anything from the beyond. 
The blight is something new and interesting. I think it's time that obscenity jerks like Curvark University stick to the noise groups and let the rest of us have some intelligent discussion. And some messages were patent nonsense. One thing about the net, the multiple automatic translations often disguised as the fundamental alienness of a participant. Behind the chatty colloquial postings, there were faraway realms so misted by distance and difference that communication was impossible even though it might take a while to realize the fact. For instance, Crypto, zero. As received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc, Language Path, Arbwith, Trade, Chergulin, Trisquiline, SJK Units. From Twirlip of the Mists, perhaps an organization of cloud flyers in a single Jovian system, very sparse priors. Subject, Blighter Video Thread, Key Phrases, Hexapodia as the Key Insight. Distribution. Threat of the Blight. Date. 8.68 days since fall of Relay. Text message. I haven't had a chance to see the famous video from Stromly Realm, except as an ev evocation. My only gateway onto the net is very expensive. Is it true that humans have six legs? I wasn't sure from the evocation. If these humans have three pairs of legs, then I think there is an easy explanation for... Hexapodia? Six legs? Three pairs of legs? Probably none of these translations was close to what the be bewildered creature of Twirlip had in its mind. Ravna didn't read any more of that posting. Crypto, zero, as received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc. Language Path, Trisquiline, SJK Units. From Hands. No references prior to the fall of Relay. No probable source. This is someone being very cautious. Subject, Blighter Video Thread, Curvark University 1. Distribution. War Tracker's Interest Group. Threat of the bright Blight. Date. 8.68 days since fall of Relay. Text of message. Kervark University thinks the Blight is a fraud because elements of the former regime have survived on Strom. There is another explanation. Suppose the Blight is indeed a power, and that it claims its claims of effective symbiosis are generally true. That means that the creature being helped is no more than a remotely controlled device, his brain simply a local processor supporting the communication. Would you want to be helped like that? My question isn't completely rhetorical. The readership is wide enough that there may be some of you who would answer yes. However, the vast majority of naturally evolved sentient beings would be revolted by the notion. Surely the Blight knows this. My guess is that the Blight is not a fraud, but that the notion of surviving culture in Stromly Realm is. Subtly, the Blight wanted to convey the impression that only some are directly enslaved, that cultures are, as a whole will survive. Combine that with the Blight's claim that not all races can be teleoperated. We're left with the subtext that immense riches are available to ra races that associate themselves with this power, yet the biological and intellectual imperatives of these races will be satisfied. So the question remains, just how complete is the Blight's control over conquered races? I don't know. There may not be any self-aware minds left in the Blights beyond, only billions of teleoperated devices. One thing is clear, the Blight needs something from us that it cannot yet take. And so it went. Tens of thousands of messages, hundreds of points of view. It was not called the net of a million lies for nothing. Ravna talked with Blue Shell and Greenstalk about it every day, trying to put it together, trying to decide which interpretation to believe. The writers knew humans well, but they weren't sure of the decades in... O slash and Nilshin Dot's face. And Greenstock knew humans well enough to see that there was no answer that could comfort Ravna. She rolled back and forth in front of the news window, finally reached a frond out to touch the human. Perhaps Sir Fam can say, once he is well. Blue Shell was bustling, cynic clinical. If you're right, that means that somehow the Blight doesn't care what humans and those close to humans know. In a way that makes sense, but... His voter buzzed absent-mindedly for a moment. I mistrust this message. Four hundred seconds of broadband, so rich it gives us full sense, gives full sense imagery for many different races. That's an enormous amount of information, and no compression whatsoever. Maybe it's sweetened bait, forwarded to us by beyond, by, forwarded by us poor beyonders back to our every nest. That suspicion had been in the news too, but there was no obvious patterns in the message and nothing that talked to the network automation. Such subtle poison might work at the top of the beyond, but not down here. And that left a simpler explanation, one that would make perfect sense even on Neorgia or Old Earth. The video masked a message to agents already in place.
Vendacious was well known to the people of woodcarvers, but mostly, but for mostly the wrong reasons. He was about a century old, the fusion offspring of woodcarver, on two of his strategists. In his early decades, Vendacious had managed the city's wood mills. Along the way, he devised some clever improvements on the water wheel. Vendacious had had his own romantic entanglements, mostly with politicians and speak speech makers. More and more, his replacement members inclined him towards public life. For the last thirty years, he had been one of the strongest voices on Woodcarver's council. For the last ten, Lord Chamberlain. In both roles, he had stood for the guilds and for fair trade. There were rumors that if Woodcarver should ever abdicate or wholly die, Vendacious would be the next lord of the council. Many thought that might be best for that. Many thought that might be the best that could be made of such a disaster. Though Vendacious's pompous speeches were already the bane of the council, that was the public's view of Vendacious. Anyone who understood the ways of security would also guess that the Chamberlain managed Woodcarver's spies. No doubt he had dozens of informants in the mills and on the docks, but now Scriber knew that even that was just a cover. Imagine having agents in the Flenser inner circle knowing the Flenser plans, their fears, their weaknesses, and being able to manipulate them. Vendacious was simply incredible. Ruefully, Scriber must acknowledge the other's stark genius. And yet, this knowledge did not guarantee victory. Not all of the Flenser schemes could be directly managed from the top. Some of the enemy's low-level operations might proceed unknown and quite successfully, and it would only take a single arrow to totally kill Joanna Olsendot. Here was where Scriber Jacaramuffin could prove his value. He asked to move to, into the castle curtain, on the third floor. No problem getting permission. His new quarters were smaller, and the walls were quite rudely quilted. A single arrow loop gave an uninspired view across the castle grounds. For Scriber's new purpose, the room was perfect. Over the next few days, he looked he took to lurking in the promenades. The main walls were laced with tunnels, fifteen inches wide by thirty tall. Scriper could get almost anywhere in the curtain without being seen from outside. He padded single fire, file from one tunnel to the next, emerging for a few moments on a rampart to flit from Merlin to embrasure to Merlin, a head poking out there, a head poking out there. Of course he ran into guards, but Jacaramuffin was cleared to be in the walls, and he had studied the guards' routine. They knew he was around, but Scriber was confident they had no idea of the extent of his effort. It was hard, cold work, but worth the effort. Scriber's great goal in life was to do something spectacular and valuable. The problem was, most of his ideas were so deep that other packs, even people he respected immensely, didn't understand. That had been the problem with Joanna. Well, after a few more days, he could go to Venta Vendacious, and then... As he peeked around the corners and through arrow slots, two of Scriber's members huddled down, taking notes. After ten days, he had enough to impress even Vendacious. Vendacious's official residence was surrounded by rooms for assistants and guards. It was not the place to make a secret offer. Besides, Scriber had had bad luck with the direct approach before. You could wait days for an appointment. And the more patient you were, the more you followed the rules, the more the bureaucrats considered you a non-entity. But Vendacious was sometimes alone. There was his turret on the old wall, on the forest side of the castle. Late on the eleventh day of his investigation, Scriber stationed himself on that turret and waited. An hour passed. The wind eased. Heavy fog washed in from the harbor. It oozed up the old wall like slow-moving sea foam. Everything became very, very quiet the way it always does in a thick fog. Scriber nosed moodily around the turret platform. It really was decrepit. The mortar crumbled under his claws. It felt like you could pull some of the stone stones right out of the wall. Damn, maybe Vendacious was going to break the pattern and not come up here today. But Scriber waited another half hour, and his patience paid off. He heard the click of steel on the spiral stairs. There was no sound of thought. It was just too foggy for that. A minute passed. The trap door popped up and a head stuck through. Even in the fog, Vendacious's surprise was a fierce hiss. Peace, sir. It is only I, loyal Jacaramuffin. The head came further out. What would a loyal citizen be doing up here? Why, I am here to see you, Scriber said, laughing. At this, your secret office. Come on up, sir. With this fog, there is enough room for both of us. One after another, Vendacious's members hoisted themselves through the trap door. Some barely made it, their knives and jewelry catching on the door frame. 
Ventatius was not the slimmest of packs. The security chief ranged himself along the far side of the turret, a posture that bespoke suspicion. He was nothing like the pompous, patronizing pack of their public encounters. Scriber grinned to himself. He certainly had the other's attention. Well, Vendacious said in a flat voice, Sir, I wish to offer my services. I believe that my very presence here shows that I can be of value to Woodcarver's security. Who but a talented professional, professional could have determined that you use this place as your secret den? Vendacious seemed to untense a little. He smiled wryly. Who indeed? I come here precisely because this part of the old wall can't be seen from anywhere in the castle. Here I can commune with the hills and be free of bureaucratic trivia. Jacaramathan nodded. I understand, sir, but you are wrong in one detail. He pointed past the security chief. You, can, you can't see it through all this fog, but on the harbor side of the castle there is a single spot that has a line of sight on your turret. So, who could see much from, ah, the eye tools you brought from the Republic? Exactly. Scriber reached into a pocket and brought out a telescope. Even from across the yard I could recognize you. The eye tools could have made Scriber famous. Woodcarver and Scrupilo had been enchanted by them. Unfortunately, honesty had required him to admit that he brought the devices from an inventor in Rengathir. Never mind that it was he who recognized the value of the invention, that it was he who used it to help rescue Joanna. When they discovered that he did not know quite how the lenses worked, they had accepted his gift of one, and turned on turned to their own glassmakers. Oh well, he was still the best eye tool user in this part of the world. It's not just you I've been watching, my lord. That's been the smallest part of my investigation. Over the last ten days, I've spent many hours on the castle walks. Vendacious's lips quirked, indeed. I dare say not many noticed me, and I was very careful that no one saw me using the eye tool. In any case, he pulled his book from another pocket. I've compiled extensive notes. I know who goes where and when during almost all hours of the light. You can imagine the power of my technique during the summer. He set the book on the floor and slid it towards Vendacious. After a moment, the other reached a member forward and dragged it toward himself. He didn't seem very enthusiastic. Please understand, sir. I know that you tell wood Woodcarver what goes on in the highest Flenser councils. Without your sources, we would be helpless against those lords, but... Who told you such things? Scriber gulped, brazen it out. He grinned weakly. No one had to tell me. I'm a prof professional, like yourself, and I know how to keep a secret. But think... There may be others of my ability within the castle, and some might be traitors. You might never hear of them from your high-placed sources. Think of the damage they could do. You need my help. With my approach, we can keep track of everyone. I would be happy to train a corps of investigators. We could even operate in the city, watching from the market towers. The security chief sidled around the parapet. He kicked idly at stones in the rotted mortar. The idea has its attractions. Mind you, I think we all have we we have all Flenser's agents identified. We feed them well, with lies. It's interesting to hear the lies come back from our sources up there. He laughed shortly and glanced over the parapet, thinking, But you're right. If we are missing anyone with access to the two legs or data set, it could be disastrous. He turned more heads at Scriber. You've got a deal. I can get you four or five people to uh train in your methods. Scriber couldn't control his expression. He almost bounced in enthusiasm, all eyes on Vendacious. You won't regret this, sir. Vendacious shrugged. Probably not. Now, how many others have you told about your investigation? We'll want to bring them in, swear them to secrecy. Scriber drew himself up. My lord, I told you that I am a professional. I have kept this completely to myself, waiting for this conversation. Vendacious smiled and relaxed to an almost genial posture. Excellent. Then we can begin. Maybe it was Vendacious's voice, a trifle too loud, or maybe it was some small sound behind him. Whatever the reason, Scriber turned ahead from the other and saw swift shadows coming from uh, over the forest side of the parapet. Too late, he heard the attacker's mind noise. Arrows hissed and fire burned through, the fan through his fan's throat. He gagged, but kept himself together and raced around the turret towards Vendacious. Help me! The scream was a waste of speech. Scriber knew, even before the other drew his knives and backed away. Vendacious stood clear as his assassin jumped into Scriber's midst. Rational thought dimmed in a frenzy of noise and slashing pain. Tell Peregrine, tell Joanna, the butchering continued for timeless instants, and then... Part of him was drowning in sticky red. Part of him was blinded. 
Jacarima's thought uh, came in ragged fragments. At least one of him was dead. Fan lay beheaded in a spreading pool of blood. It steamed in the cold air. Pain and cold and drowning, choking, tell Joanna. The assassin and his boss had retreated from him. Vendacious, security chief, traitor in chief, tell Joanna. They stood quietly, watching him bleed to death. Too prissy to mess their thoughts with his. They'd wait, they'd wait, till his mind noise dimmed, then finish the job. Quiet, so quiet, the killer's distant thoughts, sounds of gagging, moaning. No one would ever know. Almost all gone. Ja stared dumbly at the two strange packs. One came toward him, steel claws on its feet, blades in its mouth. No. Ja jumped up, slipping and skidding on the wet. The pack lunged, but Ja was already standing on the parapet. He leaped backwards and fell and fell, and shattered on rocks far below. Ja pulled himself away from the wall. There was pain across his back, then numbness. Where am I? Where am I? Fog everywhere. High above him there were muttering voices. Memories of knives and tines floated in his small mind, all jumbled. Tell Joanna, he remembered, something from before. A hidden trail, trail through deep brush. If he went that way far enough, he would find Joanna. Ja dragged himself slowly up the path. Something was wrong with his rear legs. He couldn't feel them. Tell Joanna. Chapter 19 Joanna coughed. Things just seemed to go from bad to worse around here. She'd had a sore throat and sniffles the last three days. She didn't know whether to be frightened or not. Diseases were an everyday thing in medieval times. Yeah, and lots of people died of them, too. She wiped her nose and tried to concentrate on what Woodcarver was saying. Scrupilo has already made some gunpowder. Works just as the data set predicted. Unfortunately, he nearly lost a member trying to use it in a wooden cannon. If we can't make cannon, I'm afraid. A week ago, Woodcarver wouldn't have been welcome here. All their meetings had been down in the castle halls, but then Joanna got sick. It was a cold, she was sure, and hadn't felt like running around out of doors. Besides, Scriber's visit had kind of shamed her. Some of the packs were decent enough. She had decided to try and get along with Woodcarver, and Pompous Clown, too, if he'd ever come around again, as long as creatures like Scarbutt stayed out of her way. Joanna leaned a little closer to the fire and waved away Woodcarver's objections. Sometimes this pack seemed like her eldest grandmother. Assume we can make them. We have lots of time till summer. Tell Scrupilo to study the data set more carefully and quit trying shortcuts. The question is how to use them to rescue my starship. Woodcarver brightened. The drooler broke off, wiping its muzzle to join the others in a head bob. I've talked about this with Peregr with several people especially vendacious. Ordinarily, getting an army to Hidden Island would be a terrible problem. Going by sea is fast, but there are some deadly choke points along the way. Going through the forest is slow, and the other side would have plenty of warning. But great good luck. Vendacious has found some safe trails. We may be able to sneak. Someone was scratching at the door. Woodcarver cocked a pair of heads. That's strange, she said. Why? Joanna asked absently. She hiked the quilt around her shoulders and stood. Two of Woodcarver went with her to the door. Joanna opened the door and looked into the fog. Suddenly, Woodcarver was talking loudly, all gobble. Their visitor had retreated. Something was strange, and for an instant she couldn't figure out what it was. This was the first time she had seen a dog thing all by itself. The point barely registered when most of Woodcarver spilled past her, out the doorway. Then Joanna's servant, up in the loft, began screaming. The sound jabbed pain through Joanna's ears. The lone tine twisted awkwardly on its reel and tr rear and tried to drag itself away, but Woodcarver had it surrounded. She shouted something, at, and the screeching in the loft stopped. There was the thump of paws on wooden stairs, and the servant bounded into the open, its crossbows cocked. From down the hill, she heard the rattle of weapons as guards raced towards them. Joanna ran to Woodcarver, ready to add her fists to any defense, but the pack was nuzzling the stranger, licking its neck. After a moment, Woodcarver caught the tine by its jacket. Help me carry him inside, Joanna, please. The girl lifted the tine's flanks. The fur was damp with mist and sticky with blood. Then they were through the doorway and laying the member on a pillow by the fire. The creature was making that breathy whistling, the sound of ultimate pain. It looked up at her, its eyes so wide that she could see the white all around. For an instant, she thought it was terrified of her, but when she stepped back, 
It just made the sound louder and stretched its neck towards her. She knelt beside the pillow. It lay its muzzle on her hand. W what is it? She looked back along its body, past the padded jacket. The tine's haunches were twisted at an odd angle, one legged dangling near the fire. Don't you know, began Woodcarver, this is part of Jacaramuffin. She pushed a nose under the dan dangling leg and raised it onto the pillow. There was a loud talk between the guards and Joanna's servant. Through the door, she saw members holding torches. They rested their forepaws on their fellows' shoulders and held the lights high. No one tried to come in. There'd be no room. Joanna looked back at the injured Tyne. Scriber? Then she recognized the jacket. The creature looked back at her, still wheezing in pain. Can't, get, can't you get a doctor? Woodcarver was all around her. She answered, I am a doctor, Joanna. She nodded at the data set and continued softly. At least, what passes for one here? Joanna wiped the blood from the creature's neck. More kept oozing. Well, can you save him? This fragment, maybe, but... One of Woodcarver went to the door and talked to the packs beyond. My people are searching for the rest of him. I think he is mostly murdered, Joanna. If there are others, well, even fragments stick together. Has he said anything? It was another voice, speaking Sam Norsk. Scarbutt. His big, ugly snout was snuck, stuck through the doorway. No, said Woodcarver, and his mind noise is a complete jumble. Let me listen to him, said Scarbutt. You stay back, you! Joanna's voice was a scream. The creature in her arms twitched. Joanna, this is Scriber's friend. Let him help. As the Scarbutt pack sidled into the room, Woodcarver climbed onto the loft, giving him room. Joanna eased her arm from the injured Tyne and moved aside, ending up at the doorway herself. There were lots more packs outside than she had imagined, and they were standing closer than she had ever seen. Their torches glowed like soft fluorescence in the foggy dark. Her gaze snapped back out to the fire pit. I'm watching you. Scarbutt's members clustered around the pillow. The big one lay its head next to the injured Tynes. For a moment, the Tyne continued its breathy, breathy whistling. Scarbutt gobbled at it. The reply was a steady warbling, almost beautiful. From up in the loft, Woodcarver said something. She and Scarbutt talked back and forth. Well, said Joanna. Ja, the fragment, is not a talker, came Woodcarver's voice. Worse, said Scarbutt. For now, at least, I can't match his mind sounds. I'm not getting sense or image from him. I can't tell who murdered Scriber. Joanna stepped back into the room and sl walked slowly back to the pillow. Scarbutt moved aside, but did not leave the wounded Tyne. She knelt between two of him and petted the long, bloodied neck. Will Ja? She spoke the sound as best she could. Live. Scarbutt ran three noses down the length of his body. They pressed gently at the wounds. Ja twisted and whistled, except when Scarbutt pressed his haunches. I don't know. Most of his blood is just splatter, probably from the other members. But his spine is broken. Even if the fragment lives, he'll only have two usable legs. Joanna thought for a moment, trying to see things from a tinish perspective. She didn't like the view. It might not make sense, but to her, this jaw was still Scriber, at least in potential. To Scarbutt, the creature was a fragment, an organ from a fresh corpse, a damaged one at that. She looked at Scarbutt, at the big, killer member. So what does your kind do with such garbage? Three of his heads turned toward her and she could see his hackles rise. His synthetic voice became high-pitched and staccato. Scriber was a good friend. We could build a two-wheel cart for Jaw's rear. He'd be able to move around some. The hard part will be finding a pack for him. You know we're looking for other fragments. We may be able to patch something up. If not, well, I only have four members. I will try to adopt him. As he spoke, one head patted the wounded member. I'm not sure it will work. Scriber was not a loose-souled person, not in any way a pilgrim, and right now, I don't match him at all. Joanna slumped back. Scarbutt wasn't responsible for everything that went wrong in the universe. Woodcarver has excellent broodkinners. Maybe some other match can be found. But understand, it's hard for adult members to re-merge, especially non-talkers. Single fragments like Jaw often die of their own accord. They just stop eating. Or sometimes, go down to the harbor sometime, look at the workers. You'll see some big packs there, but with the minds of idiots. They can't hold together. The smallest problem and they run in all directions. That's how the unlucky repacks end. Scarbutt's voice tra 
traded back and forth between two of his members and dribbled into silence. All his heads turned to jaw. The members had closed eyes, closed his eyes. Sleeping? He was still breathing, but it sounded kind of burbly. Joanna looked across the room at a trap door to the loft. Woodcarver had stuck a single head down the, through the hole. The upside-down face looked back at Joanna. Another time, her appearance would have been comical. Unless a miracle happens, Scriber died today. Understand that, Joanna. But if the fragment lives, even a short time, we'll f likely find the murderer. How, if he can't communicate? Yes, but he can still show us. I've ordered Vendacious's men to confine the staff to quarters. When Jaw is calmer, we'll march every pack in the castle past him. The fragment certainly remembers what happened to Scriber and wants to tell us. If any of the killers are our own people, he'll see them. And he'll make a fuss, just like a dog. Right, so the main thing is to provide him with security right now, and hope our doctors can save him. They found the rest of Scriber a couple hours later, on a turret of the old wall. Mendacious said it looked like one or two packs had come out of the forest and climbed the turret, perhaps in an attempt to see onto the grounds. It had all the markings of an incompetent first-time probe. Nothing of value could be seen from that turret, even on a clear day. But for Scriber it had just been fatally bad luck. Apparently he had surprised the intruders. Five of his members had been variously arrowed, hacked, decapitated. The sixth, Ja, had broken his back on the sloping stonework at the base of the wall. Joanna walked out to the turret the next day. Even from the ground she could see brownish stains on the parapet. She was glad she couldn't go to the top. Ja died during the night, though not from any further enemy action. He was under Vendacious's protection the whole time. Joanna went the next few days without saying much. At night she cried a little. God damn their doctoring. A broken back they could diagnose, but hidden injuries, internal bleeding, of such they were completely ignorant. Apparently, Woodcarver was famous for her theory that the heart pumped blood around the body. Give her another thousand years and maybe she could do better than a butcher. For a while she hated them all. Scarbutt for all the old reasons. Woodcarver for her ignorance. Vendacious for letting Flenserists get so close to the castle. And Joanna Olsendot for rejecting Scriber when he had tried to be a friend. What would Scriber say now? He had wanted her to trust him. He said that Scarbutt and the others were good people. One night... About a week later, she came close to making peace with herself. She was lying on her pallet, the quilt heavy and warm upon her. The designs painted on the walls glimmered dim in the ember light. All right, Scriber, for you, I will trust them. Chapter 20 Pham knew and remembered almost nothing of the first days after dying, after the pain of the old one's ending. Ghostly figures, anonymous worlds. Someone said he'd been kept alive in the ship's surgeon. He remembered none of it. Why they kept the body breathing was a mystery and an affront. Eventually, the animal reflexes had revived. The body began breathing of its own accord. The eyes opened. No brain damage. Greenstock said. A full recovery. The husk that had been a living being spoke no contradiction. What was left of Fam Nguyen spent a lot of time in the OOB's bridge. From before, the ship reminded him of a fat sow bug. The bugs had been common in the straw laid across the floor of the great hall of his father's castle on Canberra. The little kids had played with them. The critters didn't have real legs, just a dozen feathery spines sticking out from a chitinous thorax. No matter how you tumbled them, those spines slash antennas would twitch the, the bug around, and it would scuttle on its way, unmindful that it might be upside down from before. Yes, the OOB's ultra-drive spines looked a lot like a sow bug's, though not as articulate, and the body itself was fat and sleek, slightly narrowed in the middle. So Pham Nguyen had ended inside of a snow bu sow bug. How fitting for a dead man. And now he sat on the bridge. The woman brought him here often. She seemed to know it should fascinate him. The walls were displays, better than he had ever seen in merchantman days. When the windows looked out of the ship's exterior cameras, the view was as good as from any crystal canopy bridge in the Cheng Ho fleet. It was like something out of the crudest fantasy, or a graphic simulation. If he sat long enough, he could actually see the stars move in the sky. The ship was doing about ten hyperjumps per second. Jump, recompute, and jump again. In this part of the beyond, they could go a thousandth of a light year on each jump. Farther. But then the recompute time would be substantially worse. At ten per second, that added up to more than thirty light years per hour. 
The jumps themselves were imperceptible to human senses, and between the jumps were the the were between the jumps they were in free fall, carrying the same intrinsic velocity they'd have on the departing relay. So there was none of the Doppler shifting of rev- relativistic flight. The stars were as pure as seen from some desert sky or in low speed transit. Without any fuss, they simply slid across the sky, the closer ones the faster. In half an hour, he went farther than he had in half a century with the Cheng Ho. Greenstock drifted onto the bridge one day, began changing the windows. As usual, she spoke to Pham as she did so, chatting almost as if there was a real person here to listen. See, the center window is an ultra-drive map, ultra-wave map of the region directly behind us. Greenstock waved a tendril over the controls. The multicolored pictures appeared on the other walls similarly for the other five points of direction. The words were noise in Pham's ears, understood but of no interest. The writer paused, then continued with something like the futile persistence of the Ravna woman. When ships make a jump, when they re-enter, there's kind of an ultra-wave splash. I'm checking if we're being followed. Colors on the windows all around, even in front of Pham's eyes. There were smooth gradations, no bright spots, no linear features. I know, I know, she said, making up both sides of the conversation. The ship's analyzers are still massaging the data, but if anyone's pacing us closer than 100 light years, we'll see them. And if they're farther than that, well, then they probably can't detect us. It doesn't matter. Pham almost shut the question out of his mind, but there were no stars to look at. He stared at the glowing colors and actually thought about the problem. Thought. A joke. No one down here ever really thought about anything. Perhaps 10,000 starships had escaped the fall of Relay. Most likely, the enemy had not cataloged those departures. The attack on Relay had been a minor adjunct to the murder of Old One. Most likely, the OOB had escaped unnoticed. Why should the enemy care where the last of the Old One's memories might be hiding? Why should it care about where their little ship might be bound? A tremor passed through his body. Animal reflex, surely. Panic was slowly rising in Ravna Bergen's dot, every day a little stronger. It was not any particular disaster, just the slow dying of hope. She tried to be near Pham Nguyen part of every day to talk to him, to hold his hand. He never responded, not even, except perhaps by accident, to look at her. Greenstock tried, too. Alien through Greenstock, though Greenstock was, the fam of before had seemed truly attracted to the riders. He was off all medical support now, but he might as well have been a vegetable. And while all and all the while their descent was slowing, always a little worse than what Blue Shell had predicted. And when she turned to the news, in some ways that was most horrifying of all. The death race theory was getting popular. More and more there were folk who seemed to think that the human race was spreading the blight. Crypto, zero as received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc, Language Path, Baylor-esque, Trisquiline, SJK Units, from Alliance for the Defense, claimed cooperative of five polyspecific empires in the beyond below Stramuli realm, Stromly realm. No record of existence before the fall of the realm. Subject, Blighter Video Thread. Distribution, Thread of the Blight. War Tracker's Interest Group, Homo Sapiens Interest Group. Date, 17.95 days since fall of Relay. Text message. So far, we've processed half a million messages about this creature's video and read a goodly fraction of them. Most of you are missing the point. The principle of the helper's operation is clear. This is a transcendent power using ultralight communication to operate through a race in the beyond. It would be fairly easy to do in the transcend. There are a number of stories about thralls of powers there, but for such communication to be effective within the beyond, truly extensive design changes must be made in the minds of the controlled race. It would not have happened naturally, and it cannot be done, be quickly done to new races, no matter what the Blight says. We've watched the Homo sapiens interest group since the first appearance of the Blight. Where is this earth the humans claim to be from? Halfway around the galaxy, they say, and deep in the slow zone. Even their proximate origin, Neorgia, is conveniently in the slowness. We see an alternative theory. Sometime, maybe further back than the last consistent archives, there was a battle between powers. The the blueprint for this human race was written, complete with communication interfaces. Long after the original contestants and their stories had vanished, this race happened to get in position where it could transcend, 
and that transcending was tailor-made to re-establishing the power that we had set the trap to begin with. We're not sure of the details, but a scenario such as this is inevitable. What we must do is also clear. Stromly Realm is at the heart of the Blight, obviously beyond all attack. But there are other human colonies. We ask the Net to help in identifying all of them. We ourselves are not a large civilization, but we would be happy to coordinate the information gathering and the military action that is required to prevent the Blight spread in the middle beyond. For nearly seventeen weeks we've been calling for action. Have you listened in the beginning? A concerted strike might have been sufficient to destroy the Stromly Realm. Isn't the fall of Relay enough to wake you up? Friends, if we act together, we still have a chance. Death to vermin. The bastards even played on humanity's foundling nature. Foundling races were rare, but scarcely unknown. Now to these, now these death to vermin creatures were turning the miracle of Neorja into something deadly evil. Death to vermin were the only ones to call for pogroms, but even respected posters were saying th things that indirectly might support such action. Crypto, zero, as received by OOB shipboard ad hoc. Language path, Trisquiline, SJK units. From Sandor Arbitration Intelligence at the Zoo, a known military corporation of the high beyond. If this is a masquerade, somebody is living dangerously. Subject, Blighter Video Thread, Hands Subthread. Key phrases, limits on the blight, the blight is searching something. Distribution, threat of the blight, close coupled automation interest group, war trackers interest group. Date, 11.94 days since fall of Relay. Text of message. The Blight admits that it is a power that teleoperates Saphants in the beyond, but consider how difficult it is to have a close coupled automation with time lags of more than a few milliseconds. The known net is a perfect illustration of this. Lags range between 5 milliseconds for systems that are a couple of light years apart to at least several hundred seconds when messages must pass through intermediate nodes. This, combined with the low bandwidth available across interstellar distances, makes the known net a loose forum for the exchange of information and lies. And these restrictions are inherent in the nature of the beyond, part of the same restrictions that make it impossible for the powers to exist down here. We conclude that even the Blight can't attain close coupled control except in the high beyond. At the top, the Blight's savant agents are literally its limbs. In the middle beyond, we believe mental possession is possible, but that considerable pre-processing must be done in the controlled mind. Furthermore, considerable external equipment, the bulky items characteristics of those depths, is needed to support the communication. Direct, millisecond by millisecond control is normally impractical in the middle beyond. Combat at this level would involve hierarchical control. Long-term operations would also use intimidation, fraud, and traitors. These are the threats that you of the middle and low beyond should recognize. These are the Blight's tools in the middle and low beyond, and what you should guard against in, for the immediate future. We don't see Imperial takeovers. There's no profit, sustenance, in it. Even the destruction of Relay was probably just a by-play to the murder it was simultaneously committing in the Transcend. The greatest tragedies will continue to be at the top and in the low transcend, but we know that the Blight is searching for something. It is attacked at great distances where major archives were the target. Beware of traitors and spies. Even some of humanity's supporters sent a chill through Ravna. Crypto, zero, as received by OOB shipboard ad hoc, language path, Trisquiline, SJK units, from, hands, subject, Blighter video thread, Alliance for the Defense subthread, key phrases, death race theory, distribution, threat of the blight, war trackers interest group, homo sapiens interest group, date, 18.29 days since fall of relay, text of message, I have obtained specimens from the human worlds in our volume, detailed analysis is available in the homo sapiens interest group archive. My conclusions, previous but less intensive analysis of human phys slash psych is correct. The race has no built-in structures to support remote control. Experiments with living subjects showed no special inclination towards submission. I found little or no evidence of artificial optimization. There was evidence of DNA surgery to improve disease resistance, drift timing data 
the hack work at 2,000 years before present. The blood of Stromly Realm subjects carried in optogens. Thyralt, a cheap medical recipe that can be tailored across a wide mammalian range. This race, as represented by our specimens, looks like something that arrived from the slow zone quite recently, probably from a single origin world. Has anyone done such retesting on more distant human worlds? Crypto, zero, as received by OOB shipboard ad hoc. Language path, Baylor-esque, Trisquiline, SJK units. From, Alliance for the Defense, claimed cooperative of five polyspecific empires in the beyond below Stromly realm, no record of existence before the fall of the realm. Subject, Blighter video thread, hands one. Distribution, Thread of the Blight, War Tracker's Interest Group, Homo Sapiens Interest Group. Date, 19.43 days since fall of Relay. Text of Message, Who is this Hands? It makes objective, tough-sounding noises about testing human specimens, but it keeps its own nature secret. Don't be fooled by humans telling you about themselves. In fact, we have no way of testing the creatures that dwell in Stromly Realm. The Protector will see to that. Death to Vermin. And there was a little boy trapped at the bottom of the well. Some days no communication was possible. Other days, when the OOB antenna swarm was tuned in exactly the right direction, and when the vagaries of the zone favored it, vagaries of the zone favored it, then Ravna could hear his ship. Even then the signal was so faint, so distorted, that the effective transmission rate was just a few bits per second. Jeffrey and his problems might be the only small only the smallest footnote to the story of the blight, less than that, since no one knew of him. But to Ravna, Ravna Bergensdot, these conversations were the only bright thing in her life just now. The kid was very lonely, but less so now, she thought. She learned about his friend Amdi, about the stern Tyrethect, and the heroic Mr. Steel and the proud Tynes. Ravna smiled to herself, at herself. The walls of her cabin displayed a flat mural of jungle. Deep in the drippy murk lay regular shadows, a castle built in the roots of a giant mangrove tree. The mural was a famous one. The original had been an analog work from 3,000 years ago. It showed life at an even further remove during the dark ages of Nijora. She and Lynn had spent much of their childhood imagining that they were transported to such a time. Little Geoffrey was trapped in the real thing. Woodcarvers' butchers were no interstellar threat, but they were a deadly horror to those around them. Thank goodness Geoffrey had not seen the killing. This was a real medieval world, a tough and unforgiving place, even if Geoffrey had fallen in with fair-minded people. And the Nijoran comparison was only vaguely appropriate. These tines were pack mines. Even old Grander Caller had been surprised at that. Although Geoffrey's mail... All through Jeffrey's mail, Ravna could see the panics among Steele's people. Mr. Steele asked me again if there's any way we can uh, make our ship to fly even a little. I don't know. We almost crashed, I think. We need guns. That would save us, at least till you get here. They have bows and arrows just like in Nijoran days, but no guns. He's asking me, can you teach us to make guns? Woodcarver's raiders would return, and this time in enough force to overrun Steele's little kingdom. Back when they thought OOB's flight would be only thirty or forty days, that had not seemed a great risk. But now, Ravna might arrive to, arrive to find Woodcarver's murdering complete. Oh, fam, dear fam, if you ever really were, please come back now. Fam Nguyen of medieval Canberra. Fam Nguyen, traitor from the slowness. What would someone such as you make of this? Hmm... Chapter 21 Ravna knew that, under his bluster, Blue Shell was at least as much a warrior as she. Worse, he was a nitpicker. The next time Ravna asked him about their progress, he retreated into technicalities. Finally, Ravna broke in. Look, the kid is sitting on something that might just blow the blight sky high, and all he has are bows and arrows. How long will it be till we get there, down there, Blue Shell? Blue Shell rolled nervously back and forth across the ceiling. The Scrode Riders had reaction jets. They could maneuver in freefall more adroitly than most humans. Instead, they used stick patches and rolled around on the walls. In a way, it was kind of cute. Just now, it was irritating. At least they could talk. 
She glanced across the bridge where, to where Fem Nguyen sat facing the bridge's main display. As usual, all his attention was fixed on the slowly moving stars. He was unshaven, his reddish beard bright on his skin. His long hair floated snarled and uncombed. Physically, he was cured of his injuries. Ship's surgeon had even replaced the muscle mass of that, that old one's communication had usurped. Fam could dress and feed himself now, but he still lived in a private dream world. The true writers, the two writers twittered at each other. It was Greenstock who finally answered her question. Truly, we're not sure how long. The quality of the beyond changes as we descend. Each jump is taking us a fraction longer than the one before. I know that. We're moving towards the slow zone. But the ship is designed for that. It should be an easy matter to extrapolate the slowing. Blue Shell extended a tendril from ceiling to floor. He diddled with the matte corrugations for a second, and then his voter made a sound of human embarrassment. Ordinarily, you would be correct, my lady Ravna, but this is a special case. For one thing, it appears that the zones themselves are in flux. What? It's not that unheard of. Small shifts are going on all the time. That's a major purpose for bottom lugger ships, to track the changes. We're having the bad luck to run through the middle of the uncertainty. Actually, Ravna had known that interface turbulence was high at the bottom below here. She just didn't think of it in grandiose terms like zone shifting. She also hadn't realized it was serious enough to affect them yet. Okay, how bad can it get then? How much can it slow us? Oh my, Blue Shell rolled to the far wall. He was standing on starry sky now. It would be nice to be a low scrode rider. So many problems my high calling brings me. I wish I could be in deep in surf right now, thinking on olden memories. Of other days in the surf. Greenstock carried on for him. Tis, it's not the tide. How high can it rise? It's this storm. How bad can it get? Right now, it is worse than anything in this region during the last thousand years. However, we have been following the local news. Most agree that the storm has peaked. If our other problem gets no worse, we should arrive in about 120 days. Our other problem. Ravna drifted to the center of the bridge and strapped onto a saddle. You're talking about the damage we took getting out of relay. The ultra drive spines, right? How are they holding up? Quite well, apparently. We have not tried to jump faster than 80% of design max. On the other hand, we lack good diagnostics. It's conceivable that serious degradation might have happen rather suddenly. Conceivable, but unlikely, put in Greenstock. Ravna nodded. Considering all their other problems, there was no point in contemplating possibilities beyond their control. Back on Relay, this had looked like a 30 or 40 day trip. Now, the boy in the well might have to be brave for a long time yet, no matter how much she wished otherwise. Hmm. Time for plan B, then. Time for what someone like Fam Nguyen might suggest. She pushed off the floor and settled by Greenstock. Okay, so the best we can plan on is 120 days. If the zone surge gets worse or if we have to get repairs. Get repairs where? That might be only a delay, not an impossibility. The rebuilt OOB was supposed to be repairable even in the low beyond. Maybe even two hundred days. She glanced at Blue Shell, but he didn't interrupt with his usual am amendments and qualifications. You've both read the messages we're getting from the boy. He says the locals are going to be overrun, probably in less than one hundred days. Somehow, we have to help him, before we actually arrive there. Greenstock rattled her fronds in a way that Ravna took for puzzlement. She looked across the deck at Fan, and raised her voice a trifle. Hey you, you should be an expert on this. You scrode writers may not recognize it, but this is a problem that's been seen a million times in the slow zone. Civilizations are separated by years, centuries, of travel time. They fall into dark ages. They become just as primitive of the, as the pack creatures, these tines. Then they get visited from the outside. In a short time, they have technology back again. Fam's head did not turn. He just looked out across the starscape. The scrode writers rattled at each other then. But how can that help us? Doesn't rebuilding a civilization take dozens of years? And besides, there's nothing to rebuild on the Tyne's world. According to the child, this is a race without antecedents. How long does it take to found a civilization? Ravna waved a hand at the objections. Don't stop me. I'm on a roll. That's not the point. We are in communication with them. We have a good general library on board. Original inventors don't know where they're going. They're groping in the dark. 
Even the archaeologist slash engineers of Neorgia had to reinvent much. But we know everything about making airplanes and such. We know hundreds of ways of going at it. Now faced with necessity, Ravna was suddenly sure they could do it. We can study all the development paths, eliminate the dead ends. Even more, we can find the quickest way to go from medieval to specific inventions, things that can beat whatever barbarians are attacking Jeffrey's friends. Ravna's speech tumbled to a stop. She started, she stared, grinning, first at the green stalk and then at blue shell. But a silent scrode writer is one of the universe's more impassive audiences. It was hard to, even to tell if they were looking at her. After a moment, Greenstock said, Yes, I see. And rediscovery being so common in the slow zone, most of this may already be worked out in the ship's library. That's when it happened. Fam turned from the window. He looked across the deck at Ravna and the Rivers. Riders. For the first time since Relay, he spoke. Even more, the words weren't nonsense, though it took her a moment to understand. Guns and radios, he said. Ah, yes. She looked back at him. Think of something to say to him make so think of something to make him say more. Why those in particular? Fem Nguyen shrugged. It worked on Canberra. Then damn blue shell started talking, something about doing a library search. Fam stared at them for a moment, his face expressionless. He turned back to watch the stars, and the moment was lost. Chapter twenty two. Fam? He heard Ravna's voice just behind him. She had stayed on the bridge after the riders left, departing on whatever meaningless preparations their meeting had ordained. He didn't reply, and after a moment she drifted around and blocked his view of the stars. Almost automatically, he found himself focusing on her face. Thank you for talking to us. We need you more than ever. He could still see lots of stars. They were all around her, slowly moving. Ravna cocked her head, the way she did when she meant friendly puzzlement. We can help. He didn't answer. What had made him speak just now? Then, you can't help the dead, he said, vaguely surprised at his own speaking. Like I focusing, the speech must be a reflex. You're not dead. You're as alive as I am. Then words tumbled from him, more than in all the days since Relay. True, the illusion of self-awareness. Happy automatons, running on trivial programs. I'll bet you never guess. From the inside, how can you? from the outside, from Old One's view. He looked away from her, dizzy, with a doubled vision. Ravna drifted closer till her face was just centimeters from his. She floated free, except for one foot tucked into the floor. Dear fam, you are wrong. You've been at the bottom and at the top, but never in between. The illusion of self-awareness? That's a commonplace of any practical philosophy in the beyond. It has some beautiful consequences and some scary ones. All you know are the scary ones. Think. The illusion must apply just as surely to the powers. No. He could make devices like you and I. Being dead is a choice, fam. She reached out to pass her hand down his shoulder and arm. She had a typical zero-g change of perspective. Down seemed to rotate sideways, and he was looking up at her. Suddenly he was aware of his splotchy beard, his tangled hair floating all about. He looked up at Ravna, remembering everything he'd thought about her. Back on Relay, she'd seemed bright, maybe not smarter than he, but as smart as most of the competitors on the Cheng Ho. But there were other memories, how Old One had seen her. As usual, his memories were overwhelming. About this one woman, there was more insight than from all of Fam's life experience. As usual, it was mostly unintelligible. Even his emotions were hard to interpret. But... He had thought of Ravna a little like a favored dog. Old One could see right through her. Ravna Bergson's dot was a little manipulative. He had been pleased slash amused by that fact. But behind her talk and argument, he'd seen a great deal of goodness, might be the human word. Old One had wished her well. In the end, he had even tried to help. Insight flitted past him, too fast to catch. Ravna was talking again. What happened to you is terrible enough, fam, but it's happened to others. I've read of cases. Even the powers are not immortal. Sometimes they fight among themselves, and sometimes someone gets killed. Sometimes one commits suicide. There's a star system. Gods. Doom, it's called in the story. A million years ago, it was in the Transcend. It was visited by a party of the powers. There was a zone surge. Suddenly the system was twenty light-years deep in the beyond. 
That's about the biggest surge there is a firm record of. The powers at God's doom did not have a chance. They all died, some to rot and rusted ruin, others to the level of mere human minds. W what became of those? She hesitated, took one of his hands between hers. You can look it up. The point is, it happens. To the victims, it's the end of the world. But from our side, the human side, well, the human fam Nguyen was lucky. Greenstock says the failure of Old One's connection didn't do gross organic damage. Maybe there's subtle damage. Sometimes the remnants just destroy themselves, whatever is left. Fam felt tears leaking from his eyes, and knew that part of the deadness inside had been grief for his own death. Subtle damage. He shook his head and the tears drifted into the air. My head is stuffed with him, with his memories. Memories? They towered over everything else. Yet he could not understand them. He could not understand the details. He could not even understand the emotions, except as inane simplifications. Joy, laughter, wonder, fear, and icy steel determination. Now he was lost in those memories, wandering like an idiot in a cathedral. Not understanding, cowering before icons. She pivoted around their clasped hands. After a moment, her knee bumped gently against his. You're still human. You still have your own... Her voice broke as she saw the look in his eyes. My own memories? Scattered amid the unintelligible, he would stumble on them. Himself at five years, sitting on the straw in the great hall, alert for the appearance of any adult. Royals were not supposed to play in the filth. Ten years later, making love to Cindy for the first time. A year after that, seeing his first flying machine, the orbital ferry that land landed on his father's parade field. The decades of space. Yes, the Chang Ho. Pham Nguyen, the great traitor of the slowness. All the memories are still there, and for all I know, it's all the old ones lie, an afternoon's fraud to fool the relayers. Ravna bit her lip, but didn't say anything. She was too honest to lie, even now. He reached with his free hand to brush her hair away from her face. I know you said that too, Rav. Don't feel bad. I would have caught on by now anyway. Yeah, she said softly. Then she was looking him straight in the eye. But know this, one human to another, you are a human now, and there could have been a Cheng Ho, and you could have been exactly what you remember, and whatever the past, you could be great in the future. Ghostly echoes, more than memory and less than reason. For an instant, he saw her with wiser eyes. She loves you, foolish one. Almost laughter, kindly laughter. He slid his arms around her, drawing her tight against him. She was so real. He felt her slip her legs between his to laugh, like heart massage, unthinking reflex bringing a mind back to life. So foolish, so trivial, but I, I want to come back. The words came out and strangled in sobs. There's so much inside me now, so much I can't understand. I'm lost inside my own head. She didn't say anything, probably couldn't even understand his speech. For a moment, all he knew was the feel of her in his arms, hugging back. Oh, please, I do want to come back. Making it on the bridge of a starship was something Ravna had never done before. But then she'd never had her own starship before, either. They don't call this a bottom lugger for nothing. In the excitement, Pham lost his tie-down. They floated free, occasionally bumping into walls in discarded clothing, or drifting through tears. After many minutes, they ended up with their heads just a few centimeters off the floor, the rest of them angled off towards the ceiling. She was vaguely aware that her pants were flying like a banner from where they had once caught on her ankle. The affair wasn't quite the stuff of romance fiction. For one thing, floating free, you just couldn't get any leverage. For another, Pham leaned back on her, relaxing his grip on her back. She brushed aside his red hair and looked into his bloodshot eyes. You know, he said shakily, I never guessed I could cry so hard my face hurt. She smiled back. You've led a charmed life then. She arched her back against his hands and then drew him gently close. They floated in silence for several minutes, their bodies relaxing into each other's curves, sensing nothing but each other. Then, thank you, Ravna. My pleasure. Her voice came dreamy serious, and she hugged him tighter. Strange, all the things that he had been to her, some frightening, some endearing, some enraging, and some she couldn't have admitted, even to herself, till now. For the first time since the fall of Relay, she felt real hope. A silly physical reaction, maybe. But maybe not. Here in her arms was a guy who might be the equal of any storybook adventurer, and more. Someone who had been a part of a power. 
Fam, what do you think really happened back on Relay? Why was Old One murdered? Fam's chuckle seemed unforced, but his arms stiffened around her. You're asking me? I was dying at the time, remember? No, that's wrong. Old One, he was dying at the time. He was silent for a minute. The bridge turned slowly around them, silent views on the stars beyond. My god self was in pain, I know that. He was desperate, panicked, but he was also trying to do something to me before he died. His voice went soft, wondering. Yes, it was like I was some cheap piece of luggage, and he was stuffing me with every piece of crap that he could move. You know, ten kilos in a nine kilo stack. He knew he was hurting me. I was part of him, after all. But that didn't matter. He twisted back from her, his face getting a little wild again. I'm not a sadist. I don't believe he was, either. I... Ravna shook her head. I... think he was downloading. Fam was silent an instant, trying to fit the idea into his situation. That doesn't make sense. There's not room in me to be superhuman. Fear chased hope in tight circles. No, wait, you're right. Even if the dying power figure's reincarnation is possible, there's not enough space in a normal brain to store much. But Old One was trying for something else. Remember how I begged him to help with our trip to the bottom? Yes, I, he was sympathetic, the way you might be with animals that are comforting some new, confronting some new predator. He never considered that the perversion might be a threat to him, not until, right, not until he was under attack. That was a complete surprise to the powers. Suddenly the perversion was more than a curious problem for underminds. Then Old One really did try to help. He jammed plans and automation down into you. He jammed so much you nearly died, so much you can't make sense of it. I've read about things like that in applied theology. As much legend as fact. God shatter, it's called. God shatter. He seemed to play with the word, wondering. What a strange name. I remember his panic. But if he was doing what you say, why didn't he just tell me? And if I'm filled with good advice, how come all I see inside is... His gaze became a little like days past. Darkness. Dark statues with sharp edges crowding. Again a long silence. But now she could almost feel Fan thinking. His arms twitched tight, and an occasional shudder swept his body. Yes, yes. Lots of things fit. Most of it I still don't understand. Never will. Old One discovered something right there at the end. His arms tightened again, and he buried his face against her neck. It was a very personal sort of murder the perversion committed on him. Even dying, the Old One learned. More silence. The perversion is something very old, Ravna, probably billions of years, a threat Old One could only theorize before it actually killed him. But... One minute. Two. Yet Fam did not continue. Don't worry, Fam. Give it time. Yeah. He backed off far enough to look her square in the face. But I know this much now. Old One did this for a reason. We aren't on a fool's chase. There's something on the bottom, in that Stromer ship, that Old One thought could make a difference. He ran his hand lightly across her face, and his smile was sad where there should have been joy. But don't you see, Ravna? If you're right, today will be the most human I'll ever be. I'm full of the old one's download, the, this god shatter. Most of it I'll never consciously understand, but if things work properly, it will eventually come exploding out. His remote device, his robot at the bottom of the beyond. No, but he made herself shrug. Maybe, but you're human and we're working for the same things, and I'm not letting you go. Revna had known that jump-starting technology must be a topic in the ship's library. It turned out the subject was a major academic specialty. Besides 10,000 case studies, there were customizing programs and lots of very dull-looking theory. Though the rediscovery problem was trivial in the beyond, down in the slow zone almost every conceivable combination of events had happened. Civilizations in the slowness could not last more than a few thousand years. Their collapse was sometimes uh, a short eclipse, a few decades spent recovering from war or atmosphere bashing. Others drove themselves back to medievalism. And of course, most races eventually exterminated themselves, at least within their single solar system. Those that didn't exterminate themselves, and even a few of those that did, eventually struggled back to their original heights. The study of these variations was called the Applied History of Technology. Unfortunately for both academicians and civilizations in the slow zone, 
true applications were a bit rare. The events of the case studies were centuries old before news of them reached the beyond, and few researchers were willing to do field work in the slow zone. Were finding and conducting a single experiment could cost them much of their lives. In any case, it was a nice hobby for millions of university departments. One of the favorite games was to devise minimal paths from a given level of technology back to the highest level that could be supported in the slowness. The details depended on many things, including the initial level of primitiveness, the amount of residual scientific awareness or tolerance, and the physical nature of the race. The historian's theories were captured in programs whose inputs were facts about the civilization's plight and the desired results, whose outputs were the steps that would most quickly produce those results. Two days later, the four of them were back on the OOB's bridge, and this time we're all talking. So we must decide what inventions to shoot for, something that will defend the Hidden Island Kingdom. And something Mr. Steele can make in less than 100 days, said Blue Shell. He had spent most of the last two days fiddling with the development programs in OOB's library. I still say guns and radios, said Fam. Firepower and communications. Ravna grinned at him. Fam's human memories alone would be enough to save the kids on Tyne's world. He hadn't talked any more of Old One's plans. Old One's plans. In Ravna's mind, those were something like fate. Perhaps good, perhaps terrible, but unknown for now. And even fate can be we weaseled. How about it, Blue Shell? she said. Is radio something they can produce quickly, from a standing start? On Neorgia, radio had come almost contemporary with orbital flight, a good century into the Renaissance. Indeed, my Lady Ravna, there are simple tricks that are almost never noticed till a very high technology is attained. For instance, quantum torsion antennas can be built from silver and cobalt steel arrays, if the geometry is correct. Unfortunately, finding the proper geometry involves lots of theory and the ability to solve some large partial differential equations. There are many slow zoners who never discover the principle. Okay, said Fan, but there's still a translation problem. Jeffrey has probably heard the word cobalt before, but how can he describe it to the people who don't have the referent? Without knowing a lot more about their world, we couldn't even describe how to find cobalt-bearing ore. That will slow things down, Blue Shell admitted, but the program accounts for it. Mr. Steele seems to understand the concept of experimentation. For Cobalt, we can provide him with a tree of experiments based on descriptions of likely ores and appropriate chemical tests. It's not quite that simple, said Greenstock. Some of the chemical tests themselves involve search-slash-test trees, and there are other experiments which needs to needed to check toxicity. We, need, we know far less about the pack creatures than is usual with this program. Fam smiled. I hope these creatures are properly grateful. I never heard of quantum torsional antennas. The Tynes are ending up with comm gear that Cheng Ho never had. But the gift could be made. The question was, could it be done in time to save Jeffrey and, have, and his ship from the woodcarvers? The four of them ran the program again and again. They knew so little about the pack creatures themselves. The Hidden Island Kingdom appeared fairly flexible. If they were willing to go all out to follow the directions, and if they had good luck in finding nearby sources for critical materials, then it looked like they might have limited supplies of firearms and radios inside of 100 days. On the other hand, if the packs of Hidden Island ended up chasing down some worst-case branches of the search trees, things might stretch out to a few years. Ravna found it hard to accept that no matter what the four of them did, saving Jeffrey from the woodcarvers would be partly a matter of luck. Sigh. In the end, she took the best scheme the writers could produce, translated it into simple Sam Norsk, and sent it down. Chapter 23 Steele had always admired military architecture. Now he was adding a new chapter to the book, building a castle that protected against the sky as well as the land around. By now the boxy ship on stilts was known across the continent. Before another summer passed, there would be enemy armies here, trying to take, or at least destroy, the prize that had come to him. Far more deadly, the star people would be here. He must be ready. Steele inspected the work almost every day now. The stone replacement for the palisade was in place all across the south perimeter. On the cliffside, overlooking Hidden Island, his new den was almost complete. Had been complete for some time, a part of him grumbled. He really should move over here. 
The safety of Hidden Island was fast becoming illusion. Starship Hill was already the center of the movement, and that wasn't just propaganda. What the Flenser embassies abroad called the Oracle on Starship Hill was more than a glib liar could dream. Whoever stood nearest the Oracle would ultimately rule, no matter how clever Steele might be over otherwise. He had already transferred or executed several attendants. Pax, who seemed just a little too friendly with Amdi, Amdi, Jeffrey, Amdi Jeffrey. Starship Hill. When the aliens landed, it had been heather and rock. Through the winter, there'd been a palisade and a wooden shelter. But now construction had resumed on the castle, the crown whose jewel was the starship. Soon this hill would be the capital of the continent and the world. And after that, Steel looked into the blue depths of the sky. How much farther, farther his rule extended would depend on saying just the right thing, on building this castle in a very special way. Enough dreaming. Lord Steele pulled himself together and descended from the new wall along fresh-cut stone stairs. The yard within was twelve acres, mostly mud. The muck was cold on his paws, but the snow and slush were confined to dwindling piles away from the work routes. Spring was well advanced, and the sun was warm in the chill air. He could see for miles, out over Hidden Island all the way to the ocean, and down the coast along the fjord country. Steele walked the last hundred yards up the hill to the starship. His guards paced him on either side, with Shrek bringing up the rear. There was enough room that the workers didn't have to back away, and he had given orders that no one was to stop because of his presence. That was partly to maintain the fraud with M. D. Jeffrey, and partly because the movement needed this fortress soon. Just how soon was a question that gnawed. Steele was looking in all directions. Sorry, that's my... Um, Upstairs neighbor walking. <laughs> Steele was still looking in all directions, but his attention was where it should be now, on the construction work. The yard was piled with cut stone and construction timbers. Now that the ground was thawing, the foundations for the inner wall were being dug. Where it was still hard, Steele's engineers were injecting boiling water. Steam rose from the holes, obscuring the wind lasses and the diggers below. The place was louder than a battlefield, windlasses creaking, blades hacking at dirt, leaders shouting to work teams. It was also as crowded as close combat, though not nearly so chaotic. Steele watched a digger pack at the bottom of one of the trenches. There were thirty members, so close to each other that their shoulders sometimes touched. It was an enormous mob, but there was nothing of an orgy about the association. Even before Woodcarver, the construction and factory guilds had been doing this sort of thing. The thirty-member pack below was probably not as bright as a threesome. The front rank of ten swung mattocks in unison, carving steadily into the wall of dirt. When their heads and mattocks were extended high, the ten members behind them darted forward to scoop back the dirt and rocks that had just been freed. Behind them, a third tier of members hauled the dirt from the pit. Making it work was a complicated bit of timing. The earth was not homo homogenous, but it was well within the mental ability of the pack. They could go on like this for hours, shifting first and second ranks every few minutes. In years past, the guild's jealousy guarded the secret of each special melding. After a hard day's work, such a team would split into normally intelligent packs, each going home very well paid. Steel smiled to himself. Woodcarver had improved on the old guild tricks, but Flenzer had provided an essential refinement, actually a borrowing from the tropics. Why let the team break up at the end of a work shift? Flenzer work teams stayed together indefinitely, housed in barracks so small they could never recover their separate mi pack mines. It worked well. After a year or two, and with proper culling, the original packs in such teams were dull things that scarcely wanted to break away. For a moment, Steele watched the cut stone being lowered into the new hole and mortared into place. Then he nodded at the white jackets in charge and walked on. The foundation holes continued right up to the walls of the starship compound. This was the trickiest construction of all, the part that would turn the, cas the castle into a beautiful snare. A little more information via Andy Jeffrey, and he would know just what to build. The door to the starship compound was open just now, and a white jackets was sitting back to back in the opening. That guard heard the noise an instant before steel. Two of its members broke ranks to look around the side of the compound. Almost inaudibly, 
There came high screams, then honking attack calls. The white jackets leaped from the stairs and raced around the building. Steele and his guards weren't far behind. He skidded to a stop at the foundation trench on the far side of the ship. The immediate source of the racket was obvious. Three packs of white jackets were putting a team's talker to the question. They had separated out the verbal member and were beating it with truncheon whips. This close, the mental screams were almost as loud as the shouting. The rest of the digger team was coming out of the trench, breaking into functional packs and attacking the white jackets with their mattocks. How could things get so bloody screwed up? He could guess. These inner foundations were to contain the most secret tunnels of the entire castle, and the even more secret devices he planned to use against the two legs. Of course, all of the workers on such sensitive areas would be disposed of after the job was done. Stupid though they were, maybe they had guessed their fate. Under other circumstances, Steele might have backed off and simply watched. Failures like this could be enlightening. They let him identify the weaknesses in his subordinates, who was too bad and too good to continue in their jobs. This time was different. Andy Jeffrey were aboard the starship. There was no view through the wooden walls, and surely there was another white jackets on guard within, but even as he lunged forward, shouting to his servants, Steele's back-looking member caught sight of Jeffrey coming out of the compound. Two of the pups were on his shoulders, the rest of Andy spilling out around him. Stay back, he yelled at them in his sparse Sam Norsk. Danger, stay back. Amdi paused, but the two legs kept coming. Two soldier packs scattered out of his way. They had standing orders, never touch the alien. Another second and the careful work of a year would be destroyed. Another second and Steele might lose the world, all on account of stupidity and bad luck. But even as his back members were shouting at the two legs, his forward ones leaped atop a pile of stone. He pointed at the teams coming out of the trench. Kill the invaders! His personal guards moved close around him as Shrek and several troopers streamed by. Steele's consciousness sagged in the bloody noise. This was not the controlled mayhem of experience beneath Hidden Island. This was the random death flying in all directions. Arrows, spears, mattocks. Members of the digger team ran about, flailing and crying. They never had a chance, but they killed a number of the others in their dying. Steele backed away from the melee, toward Jeffrey. The two legs was still running toward him. Amdi followed, shouting in Sam Norsk. A single mindless team member, a single misaimed arrow, and the two legs would die and all would be lost. Never in his life had Steele felt such panic for the safety of another. He raced to the human, surrounding him. The two legs fell to his knees and grabbed Steele by a neck. Only a lifetime of discipline kept Steele from slashing back. The alien wasn't attacking, he was hugging. The digger team was almost all dead now and Shrek had pushed the surviving members too far away to be a threat. Steele's guards were securely around him only five or ten yards away. Amdi was all clumped together, cowering in the mine noise, but still shouting to Jeffrey. Steele tried to untangle himself from the human, but Jeffrey just grabbed one neck after another, sometimes two at a time. He was making burbling noises that didn't sound like Sam Norsk. Steele trembled under the assault. Don't show the revulsion. The human would not recognize it, but Amdi might. Jeffrey had done this before, and Steele had taken advantage even though it cost him. The mantis child needed physical contact. It was the basis for the relationship between Amdi and Jeffrey. Similar trust must come from letting this thing touch him. Steele slid ahead and neck across the creature's back, the way that he had seen parents do with pups down in the dungeon laboratories. Jeffrey hugged him harder and swept his long articulate paws across Steele's pelt. Revulsion aside, it was a very strange experience. Ordinarily, such close contact with another intelligent being could only come in battle or sex, and in either case, there wasn't much room for rational thought. But with this human, well, the creature responded with obvious intelligence, but there wasn't a trace of mind noise. You could think and feel it both at the same time. Steel bit down on a lip, trying to stifle his shivering. It was... it was like, like having sex with a corpse. Finally, Jeffrey stepped back, holding his hand up. He said something very fast, and Amdi said, Oh, Lord Steele, you're hurt. See the blood. And there was a red on the human's paw. Steele looked at himself. Sure enough, one rump had taken a nick. He hadn't even felt it till now. Steele backed away from the mantis and said to Amdi, It's nothing. Are you and Jeffrey unhurt? 
There was a rattling exchange between the two children, almost unintelligible to steal. We're fine. Thank you for protecting us. Fast thinking was something that Flenzer had carved into steel with knives. Yes, but it never should have happened. The woodcarvers disguised themselves as workers. I think they've been at this for days waiting for a chance at you. When we guessed the fraud, it was almost too late. You should really have stayed inside when you heard the fighting. Amdi hung his heads ashamedly and trans translated to Geoffrey. We're sorry. We got excited, and th then we thought you might get hurt. Steel made comforting noises. At the same time, two of him looked around the carnage. Where was the white jackets that had deserted, deserted the stairs right at the beginning? That pack would pay. His line of thought crashed to a halt as he noticed. Tyrethect. The Flenzer fragment was watching from the meeting hall. Now that he thought about it, he'd been watching si since right after the battle began. To others, his posture might seem, imp seem impassive, but Steele could see the grim amusement in the fragment's expression. He nodded briefly at the other, but inside, Steele cringed. He had been so close to losing everything, and the Flenzer had noticed. Well, let's get you two back to Hidden Island, he signaled to the keepers that had come up behind the starship. Not yet, Lord Steele, said Amdi. We just got here. A reply from Ravna should arrive very soon. Teeth grated, but out of sight of the children. Yes, please do stay. But we'll all be more careful now, right? Yes, yes, Amdi explained to the human. Steel stood four legs on shoulders and patted Geoffrey on the head. Steel had Shrek take the children back to the compound. Till they were out of sight, all his members looked on with the expression of pride and affection. Then he turned and walked across the pinkish mud. Where was that stupid white jackets? The meeting hall on Starship Hill was a small, temporary thing. It had been good enough to keep out the cold during the winter, but for a conference of more than three people it was a real madhouse. Steel stomped past the Flenzer fragment and collected himself on the loft with the best view of the construction. After a polite moment, Tyrethect entered and climbed to the facing loft. But all the decorum was an act of the groundlings outside. Now Flenzer's soft laughter hissed across the air to him, just loud enough for him to hear. Dear Steele, sometimes I wonder if you are truly my student, or perhaps some changeling inserted after my departure. Are you trying to screw this up? Steele glared back. He was sure there was no uneasiness in his posture. All that was held within. Accidents happen. The incompetence will be cold. Quite so. But that appears to be your response to all problems. If you hadn't been so bent on silencing the digger teams, they might not have rioted, and you would have had one less accident. The flaw was in their guessing. Such executions are a necessary part of military construction. Oh? You really think I had to kill all those who built the halls under Hidden Island? What? You mean you didn't? How? The Flenzer fragment smiled the old fanged smile. Think on it, Steel. An exercise. Steel arranged his notes on the desk and pretended to study them. Then all of him looked back at the other pack. Tyrethect, I honor you because of the Flenzer in you, but remember, you survive on my sufferance. You are not the Flenzer in waiting. The news had come late last fall, just before the winter closed the last pass over the ice fangs. The packs bearing the rest of the master hadn't made it out of the Parliament Bowl. The fullness of Flenzer was gone forever. That had been an indescribable relief to steal, and for a time afterward the fragment had been quite tractable. Not one of my lieutenants would blink if I killed all of you, even the Flenzer members. And I'll do it. If you push me hard enough, I swear I will. Of course, dear, dear Steel. Your, you command. For an instant, the other's fear showed through. Remember, Steel thought to himself, always remember. This is just a fragment of the master. Most of it is a little school teacher, not the great teacher with a knife. True. Its, true friendly, its two Flenzer members totally dominated the pack. The spirit of the master was right here in this room, but gentled. Tyrethect could be mangled, managed, and the power of the master used for Steel's ends. Good, Steel said smoothly. As long as you understand this, you can be of great use to the movement. In particular, he riffed through the papers. I want to review the visitor situation with you. I want some advice. Yes. We've convinced Ravna that her precious, precious Geoffrey is in imminent danger, 
M.D. Jeffrey has told her all about the woodcarver attacks and how we fear an overwhelming assault. And that may really happen. Yes, Woodcarver really is planning an attack, and she has her own source of magical help. We have something much better. He tapped the papers. The advice had been coming down since early winter. He remembered when M.D. Jeffrey had brought in the first pages. Pages of numerical tables, of directions and diagrams, all drawn in neat but childish style. Steel and the fragment had spent days trying to understand. Some of the references were obvious. The visitor's recipes required silver and gold in quantities that would otherwise finance a war. But what was this liquid silver? Tyrathect had recognized it. The master had used such a thing in his labs in the Republic. Eventually they acquired the amount specified, but many of the ingredients were given only as methods for creating them. Steele remembered the fragment musing over those, scheming against nature as if it were just another foe. The recipes of mystics were full of horn of squid and frozen moonlight. The directions from Ravna were sometimes even stranger. There were directions within directions, long detours spent in testing common materials to decide which really fit the greater plan. Building, testing, building. It was like the master's own method, but without the dead ends. Some of it made sense early on. They would have the explosives and guns that Woodcarver thought were her secret weapons. But so much was still unintelligible, and it never got easier. Steel and the Fragment worked through the afternoon, planning on how to set up the latest tests, deciding where to search for the new ingredients that Ravna demanded. Tyrathect leaned back, hissing on a, wonder a wondering sigh. Stage built upon stage, and soon we'll have our own radios. Old Woodcarver won't have a chance. You are right, Steel. With, you, with this, you can rule the world. Imagine knowing instantly what is happening in the Republic's capital, and being able to coordinate armies around that knowledge. The movement will be the mind of God. That was an old slogan, and now it could be true. I salute you, Steele. You have a grasp worthy of the movement. Was there the teacher's contempt in his smile? Radio and guns can give us the world, but clearly these are crumbs from the visitor's table. When do they arrive? Between 100 and 120 days from now. Revna has revised her estimate again. Apparently, even the two legs have problems flying between the stars. So we have that long to enjoy the movement's triumph. And then we are nothing, less than savages. It might have been safer to forego, forego the gifts and persuade the visitors that there is nothing here worth rescuing. Steele looked out through the window slits that cut horizontally between timbers. He could see part of the starship compound, and the castle foundations, and beyond that the islands of the fjord country. He was suddenly more confident, more at peace, than he'd been in a long time. It felt right to reveal his dream. You really don't see it, do you, Tyrathecht? I wonder if the whole master would understand, or whether I have exceeded him, too. In the beginning, we had no choice. The starship was automatically sending some sort of signal to Ravna. We could have destroyed it. Maybe Ravna would have lost interest, and maybe not. In which case we would have taken... We would be taken like a fish grilled from a stream... Perhaps I took the greater risk, but if I win, the prize would be far more than you imagine. The fragment was watching him, heads cocked. I've studied these humans, Jeffrey and, through my spies, the one down at Woodcarver's. Their race may be older than ours, and the tricks they've learned make, us, make them seem all-powerful. But the race is flawed. As singletons, they work with handicaps that we can scarcely imagine. If I can use those weaknesses... You know the average... Tynes care for his cares for its pups. We've manipulated parental sentiments often enough. Imagine how it must be for the humans. To them, a single pup is also an entire child. Think of the leverage that gives us. You're seriously betting everything on this? Ravna isn't even Jeffrey's parent. Steele made an irritated gesture. You haven't seen all of Amdi's translations. Innocent Amdi, the perfect spy. But you're right, saving the one child is not the main reason for this visit. I've tried to find out their real motive. There are 151 children in some kind of deathly stupor, all stacked up in coffins within the ship. The visitors are desperate to save the children, but there's something else they want. They never quite talk about it. I think it's in the machinery of the ship itself. For all we know, the children are a brood force, part of an invasion. That was an old fear, and, after watching Andy Jeffrey... Steele saw no chance of it. There could be other traps, but if the visitors are lying to us, then there is really nothing we can do to win. 
We'll be hunted animals. Maybe generations from now we'll learn their tricks, but it will be the end of us. On the other hand, we have good reason to believe that the two legs are weak, and whatever their goals, they do not involve us directly. You were there the day of the landing much closer than I. You saw how easy it was to ambush them, even though their ship is impregnable and their single weapon is a match for a small army. It is obvious that they do not consider us a threat. No matter how powerful their tools, their real fears are elsewhere. And in that starship, we have something they need. Look at the foundations of our new castle, Tyrethect. I've told MD Jeffrey that it is to protect the starship against Woodcarver. It will do that, later in the summer when I shatter Woodcarver upon its ramparts. But see the foundation of the curtain around the starship. By the time our visitors arrive, the ship will be envaulted. I've done some quiet tests on its hull. It can be breached. A few dozen tons of stone falling on it would quite nicely crush it. But Ravna is not to worry. This is all for the protection of her prize. And there will be an open courtyard nearby, surrounded by strangely high walls. I've asked Geoffrey to get Ravna's help on this. The courtyard will be just large enough to enclose Ravna's ship, protecting it too. There are many details still to be settled. We must make the tools Ravna describes. We must arrange the demise of Woodcarver well before the visitors arrive. I need your help in all those things, and I expect to receive it. In the end, if the visitors are treacherous, we will make the best stand that can be. And if they are not, well, I think you'll agree that my reach has been at least matched by my teach has at least matched my teachers. For once, the Flenser fragment had no reply. The ship's control cabin was Geoffrey and Amdi's favorite place in all of Lord Steele's domain. Being here could still make Geoffrey very sad, but now the good memories seemed the stronger, and here was the best hope for the future. Amdi was still entranced by the window displays, even if the views were all of wooden walls. By their second visit, they had already come to regard the place as their private kingdom, like Geoffrey's treehouse back on Strom. And in fact, the cabin was much too small to hold more than a single pack. Usually a member of their bodyguard would sit just inside the entrance to the main hold, but even that seemed to be an uncomfortable duty. This was a place where they were important. For all their rambunctiousness, Amdi and Geoffrey realized the trust that Lord Steele and Ravna were placing in them. The two kids might race around out of doors, driving their guards to distraction, but the equipment in this command cabin must be treated as cautiously as when Mom and Dad were here. In some ways, there was not much left in the ship. The data sets were destroyed. Jeffrey's parents had them outside when Woodcarver attacked. During the winter, Mr. Steele had carried out most of the loose items to study. The cold sleep boxes were now safe in cool chambers nearby. E Every day, M.D. Jeffrey inspected the boxes, looked at each familiar face, checked the diag displays. No sleeper had died since the ambush. What was left on the ship was hard fastened to the hull. Jeffrey had pointed out the control boards and status elements that managed the container shell's rocket. They stayed strictly away from those. Mr. Steele's quilting shrouded the walls. Jeffrey's folks' baggage and sleeping bags and exercisers were gone. But there was, were still the ACC webbing and hard-fastened equipment. And over the months, M.D. Jeffrey had brought in paper and pens and blankets and other junk. There was always a light breeze from the fans sweeping through the cabin. It was a happy place, strangely carefree even with all the memories it brought. This was where they would save the tines and all the sleepers. And this was the only place in the world where M.D. Jeffrey could talk to another human being. In some ways, the means of talking seemed as medieval as Lord Steele's castle. They had one flat display, no depth, no color, no pictures. All they could coax from it were alphanumerics. But it was connected to the ship's ultrawave comm, and that was still programmed to track their rescuers. There was no voice recognition attached to the display. Jeffrey had almost panicked before he realized that a lower part of the screen worked as a keyboard. It was a laborious job typing in every letter of every word, although Amdi had gotten pretty good at it, using four noses to peck at the keys. And nowadays he could read Sam Norsk even better than Jeffrey. Amdi Jeffrey spent many afternoons here. If there was a message waiting from the previous day, they would bring it up page by page and Amdi would copy and translate it. Then they would enter the questions and answers that Mr. Steele had talked to them about. There was a lot of waiting. Even if Ravna was watching at the other end, it could take several hours to get a reply. 
but the link was so much better during the, than during the winter. They could almost feel Ravna getting closer. The unofficial conversations with her were often the high point of the day. So far, this day has been quite different. After the false workers attacked, Andy Jeffrey had the shakes for about half an hour. Mr. Steele had been wounded trying to protect them. Maybe there was nowhere that was safe. They messed with the outside displays, trying to peek through the cracks in the rough planking of the compound's walls. If we'd been able to see out, we would have been we could have warned Mr. Steele, said Jeffrey. We should ask him to put some holes in the walls. We could be like sentries. They batted the idea around a bit. Then the latest message started coming in from the rescue ship. Jeffrey jumped into the ACC webbing by the display. This was his dad's old spot, and there was plenty of room. Two of Amdi slid in behind him, beside him. Another member hopped on the armrest and braced its paws on Jeffrey's shoulders. Its slender neck extended towards the screen to get a good view. The rest scrambled to arrange paper and pens. It was easy to play back messages, but Amdi Jeffrey got a certain thrill out of seeing the stuff coming out coming down live. There was the initial header stuff. That wasn't so interesting, after about the thousandth time you saw it. Then Ravna's actual words. Only this time it was just tabular data, nothing to support the radio design. Nuts, it's just numbers, said Jeffrey. Numbers, said Amdi. He climbed a free member onto the boy's lap. It stuck its nose close to the screen, cross-checking what the one by Jeffrey's shoulder was seeing. The four on the floor were busy scratching away, translating the decimal digits on the screen into the X's and O's and the ones and deltas of Tyne's base four notation. Almost from the beginning, Jeffrey had realized that Andy was really good at math. Jeffrey wasn't envious. Andy said that hardly any of the Tynes were that good either. Andy was a very special pack. Jeffrey was proud that he had such a neat friend. Mom and Dad would have liked Andy, still. Jeffrey sighed and relaxed in the webbing. This number stuff was happening more and more often. Mom had read him a story once, Lost in the Slow Zone, about how some marooned explorers brought civilization to a lost colony, in that the heroes just collected the right materials and built what they needed. There had been no talk of precision or ratios or design. He looked away from the screen and petted the two of Andy that were sitting beside him. One of them wriggled under his hand. Their whole bodies hummed back at him. Their eyes were closed. If Jeffrey didn't know better, he would have assumed they were asleep. They were better. There, these were the parts of Amdi that specialized in talking. Anything interesting? Jeffrey said after a while. The one on his left opened its eyes and looked at him. This is that bandwidth idea Ravna was talking about. If we don't make things just right, we'll just get clicks and clacks. Oh, right. Jeffrey knew that the initial reinventions of radio were usually not good for much more than Morse code. Ravna seemed to think that they could jump that stage. What do you think Ravna is like? What? The scritching of pens on paper stopped for an instant. He had all of Amdi's attention, even though they'd talked of this before. Well, like you, only bigger and older? Yeah, but... Jeffrey knew Rav Ravna was from Sandra Kai. She was a grown-up, somewhere older than Joanna, and younger than Mom. What exactly does she look like? I mean, she's coming all this way just to rescue us and finish what Mom and Dad were trying to do. She must be a really great person. The scritching stopped again, and the display scrolled heedless on. They would have to replay it. Yes, Andy said after a moment. She, she must be a lot like, like Mr. Steele. It will be nice to meet someone I can hug the way you do, Mr. Steele. Jeffrey was a little miffed by that. Well, wait, you can hug me. The parts of Andy next to him purred loudly. I know, but I mean someone that's a grown-up, like a parent. Yeah. They got the tables translated and checked in about an hour. Then it was time to send up the latest things that Mr. Steele was asking about. There were about four pages, all neatly printed in Sam Norsk by Andy. Usually he liked to do the typing, too, all bunched up over the keyboard and display. Today, he wasn't interested. He lay all over Jeffrey, but he didn't pay any special attention to checking what was being keyed in. Every so often, Jeffrey felt a buzzing through his chest, or the screen mounting would make a strange sound, all in sympathy to the unhearable sounds that Amdi was making between his members. Jeffrey recognized the signs of deep thought. He finished typing in the last message, adding a few small questions of his own. Things like, how old are you and fam? Are you married? 
What are scrode riders like? Daylight had faded from cracks in the walls. Soon the digger teams would be turning in their hoes and marching off to the barracks over the edge of the hill. Across the straits, the towers on hidden islands would be golden in the mist, like something in a fairy tale. Their white jackets would be calling Amdi and Jeffrey out for supper any minute now. Two of Amdi jumped off the ACC webbing and began chasing each other around the chair. I've been thinking. I've been thinking. Ravna's radio thing. Why is it just for talking? She says all sound is just different frequencies of the same thing, but sound is all that thought is. If we could change some of the tables and make the receivers and transmitters to cover my tympana, why couldn't I think over the radio? I don't know. Bandwidth was a familiar constraint on many everyday activities, though Jeffrey had only a vague notion of exactly what it was. He looked at the last of the tables, still displayed on the screen. He had a sudden insight, something that many adults in technical cultures never attain. I use these things all the time, but I don't know exactly how they work. We can follow these directions, but how would we know what to change? Amdi was getting all excited now, the way he did when he thought of some great prank. No, 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 we don't have to understand everything. Three more of him jumped to the floor. He waved random sheets of paper up at Jeffrey. Ravna doesn't know for sure how we make sound. The directions include options for making small changes. I've been thinking. I can see how the changes relate. He paused and made a high-pitched squealing noise. Darn, I can't explain it exactly, but I think we can expand the tables, and that will change the machine in ob obvious ways. And then... Andy was beside himself for a moment, and speechless. Oh, Jeffrey, I wish you could be a pack, too. Imagine putting one of yourself on each different mountaintop, uh, each on a different ma mountaintop, and then using a radio to think. We could be as big as the world. Just then, there was a sound of an interpack gobbling from outside the cabin, and then the Samnorsk. Dinner time. We go now, and D. Jeffrey. Okay? It was Mr. Shrek. He spoke a fair amount of Samnorsk, though not as well as Mr. Steele. Amdi Jeffrey picked up the scattered sheets and carefully slipped them into pockets on the back of Amdi's jackets. They powered down the display equipment and crawled into the main hold. Do you think Mr. Steele will let us make the changes? Maybe we should also send them back to Ravna. The White Jackets member retreated from the hatch, and Amdi Jeffrey descended. A minute later they were out in the slanting sunlight. The two kids scarcely noticed. They were both caught up in Amdi's vision. Chapter 24 For Joanna, lots of things changed in the weeks after Scriber Jick Karamathan died. Most were for the better, things that might never have happened but for the murder, and that made Joanna very sad. She let Woodcarver live in her cabin and take the place of the helper pack. Apparently Woodcarver had wanted to do this from the beginning, but had been afraid of the human's anger. Now they kept the data set in the cabin. They were never less than four packs of Vin Vendacious's security surrounding the palace, and there was talk of building barracks around it. She saw the others during the day at meetings, and individually when they needed help at, with the data set. Scrupilo, Vendacious, and Scarbutt, the Pilgrim, all spoke fluent Sam Norsk now, more than good enough, so that she could see the character behind their inhuman forms. Scrupilo, Scrupilo, prissy and very bright, vendacious, as pompous as Scriber had ever, ever seemed, but without the playfulness and imagination. Pilgrim, Wickrack Scar. She felt a chill every time she saw his big, scarred one. It always sat in the back, hunched down to look unthreatening. Pilgrim obviously knew how the sight affected her, and tried not to offend, but even after Scriber's death she couldn't do more than, to than tolerate that pack. And after all, there could be traitors in the woods Carver Castle. It was only Vendacious's theory that the murder had been arrayed from outside. She kept a suspicious eye on Pilgrim. At night, Woodcarver chased the other packs away. She huddled around the fire pit and asked the data set questions that had no conceivable connection with fighting the Flenserists. Joanna sat with her and tried to explain things that Woodcarver didn't understand. It was strange. Woodcarver was something very like the queen of these people. She had this enormous, primitive, uncomfortable, ugly, yet still enormous, castle. She had dozens of servants, yet she spent most of each night in this little wood cabin with Joanna, and helped with the fire and the food at least as much as the pack who had been here before. So it was that woodcarver became Joanna's second friend among the Tynes, 
Scriber was the first, though she hadn't known it till after he was dead. Woodcarver was very smart and very strange. In some ways she was the smartest person Joanna had ever known, though that conclusion came slowly. She hadn't really been surprised when the Tynes mastered Samnorsk quickly. That's the way it was in most adventures, and more to the point, they had the language learning programs in the data set. But night after night, Joanna watched Woodcarver play with the set. The pack showed no interest in the military tactics and chemistry that preoccupied them all during the day. Instead, she read about the slow zone and the beyond and the history of the Stromley realm. She had mastered nonlinear reading faster than any of the others. Sometimes Joanna would just sit and stare over her shoulders. The screen was split into windows, the main one scrolling much faster than Joanna could follow. A dozen times a minute, Woodcarver might come upon words she didn't recognize. Most were just unfamiliar Sam Norsk. She'd tap a nose on the offending word and the definition would flicker briefly in a dictionary window. Other things were conceptual, and the new windows would lead the pack off into other fields, sometimes for just a few seconds, sometimes for many minutes, and sometimes the detour would become her new main path. In a way, she was everything that Scriber had wanted to be. Many times she had questions the dataset couldn't really answer. She and Joanna could talk late into the night. What was a human family like? What had Stromley Realm thought to make it at the High Lab? Joanna no longer thought of most packs as gangs of snake-necked rats. Deep past midnight, the dataset screen was brighter than the gray light from the fire pit. It painted the backs of woodcarver in cheerful colors. The pack gathered round her, looking up, almost like small children listening to a teacher. But Woodcarver was no child. Almost from the first, she had seemed old. Those late-night talks were beginning to teach Joanna about the Tynes, too. The pack said things she never did during the day. They were mostly things that must be obvious to other Tynes, but never talked about. The human girl wondered if Woodcarver, the queen, had anyone to confide in. Only one of Woodcarver's members was physically old. Two were scarcely more than puppies. It was the pattern of the pack that was half a thousand years old, and that showed. Woodcarver's soul was held together by little more than willpower. The price of immortality had been inbreeding. The original stock had been healthy, but after six hundred years, one of her youngest members couldn't stop drooling. It was constantly patting a kerchief to its muzzle. Another had milky white in its eyes, where there should have been deep brown. Woodcarver said it was stone-blind, but healthy and her best talker. Her oldest member was visibly feeble. It was panting all the time. Unfortunately, Woodcarver said it was the most alert and creative of all. When it died, once she started looking for it, Joanna could see the weakness in all of Woodcarver. Even the two healthiest members, strong and with plush, plush fur, walked a little strangely compared to normal pack members. Was that due to spinal deformities? The two were also gaining weight, which wasn't helping the problem. Joanna didn't learn this all at once. Woodcarver had told her about the various Tynish affairs, and gradually her own story came out too. She seemed glad to have someone to confide in, but Joanna saw a little self-pity in her. Woodcarver had chosen this path, apparently it was perversion to some, and had beaten the odds for longer than any other pack in recorded history. She was more wistful than anything else, that her luck had finally run out. Tyne's architecture tended to extremes, grotesquely oversized, or too cramped for human use. Woodcarver's council chamber was the, at the large extreme. It was not a cozy place. You could get three hundred humans into the bowl-shaped cavity with room to spare. The separated balconies that ran around its upper circumference could have held about another hundred more. Joanna had been here often enough before. This was where most work was done with the data set. Usually there was herself and Woodcarver, and whoever else needed information. Today was different. Not a day to consult the data set at all. This was Joanna's first council meeting. There were twelve packs in the high council, and they were all here. Every balcony contained a pack, and there were three on the floor. Joanna knew enough about Tynes to see, now, to see, for all the empty space, the place was hideously crowded. There was the mind noise of fifteen packs. Even with all the padded tapestries, she felt an occasional buzzing in her head or through the hands from the railing. Joanna stood with Woodcarver on the largest balcony. When they arrived, Vendacious was already down on the main floor, arranging diagrams. 
As the packs of the council came to their feet, he looked up and said something to Woodcarver. The queen replied in Sam Norsk, I know it will slow things down, but perhaps that's a good thing. She made a human laughing sound. Peregrine, Wickrack Scar, was standing on the next balcony over, just like some council pack. Strange. Joanna had not yet figured out why, but Scarbutt seemed to be one of Woodcarver's favorites. Pilgrim, would you translate for Joanna? Pilgrim bobbed several heads. Is, is that okay, Joanna? The girl hesitated an instant, then nodded back. It made sense. Next to Woodcarver, Pilgrim spoke better Sam Norsk than any of them. As Woodcarver sat down, she took the data set from Joanna and popped it open. Joanna glanced at the figures on the screen. She's made notes. Her surprise didn't have a chance to register. Before the queen was talking again. This time in the gobble sounds of interpack talk. After a second, Pilgrim began translating. Everyone, please sit. Hunker down. This meeting is crowded enough as it is. Joanna almost smiled. Pilgrim Rickrack Scar was pretty good. He was imitating Woodcarver's human voice perfectly. His translation even captured the wry authority of her speech. After some shuffling around, only one or two heads were visible sticking up from each balcony. Most stray thought noise could now be caught in the padding around the balcony or absorbed by the quilted canopy that hung over the room. Vendacious, you may proceed. On the main floor, Vendacious stood and looked up in all directions. He started talking. Thank you, came the translation, now imitating the security chief's tones. The woodcarver asked me to call this meeting because of the urgent developments in the north. Our sources re there report that Steel is fortifying the region around Joanna's starship. Gobble gobble interruption. Scrupilo? That's not news. That's what our cannon and gunpowder are for. Vendacious. Yes, we've known of the plans for some time. Nevertheless, the completion date has been advanced, and the final version will have walls a good deal thicker than we had figured. It also appears that once the enclosure is complete, Steele intends to break apart the starship and distribute its cargo through its various laboratories. For Joanna, the words came like a kick in the stomach. Before there had been a chance, if they fought hard enough, they might recapture the ship. She might finish her parents' mission, perhaps even get rescued. Pilgrim said something on his own account, translating. So what's the new deadline? They're confident of having the main walls complete in just under ten, ten days. Woodcover bent a pair of noses to the keyboard, tapped in a note. At the same time, she stuck a head over the railing and looked down at the security chief. I've noticed before that Steele tends to be a bit over-optimistic. Do you have an objective estimate? Yes, the walls will be complete between eight and eleven ten days from now. Woodcarver. We had been counting on at least fifteen. Is this a response to our plans? On the floor below, Vendacious drew himself together. That was our first suspicion, Your Majesty. But as you know, we have a number of very special sources of information. Sources we shouldn't discuss even here. What a braggart. Sometimes I wonder if he knows anything. I've never seen him stick his asses out in the field. Huh? It took Joanna a second to realize that this was Pilgrim, editorializing. She glanced across the railing. Three of Pilgrim's heads were visible, two looking her way. They bore an expression she recognized as a silly smile. No one else seemed to react to his comment. Apparently he could focus his translation on Joanna alone. She glared at him and after a moment he resumed his business-like translation. Steele knows we plan to attack, but he does not know about our special weapons. This change in schedule appears to be a matter of random suspicion. Unfortunately, we are the worse for it. Three or four counselors began talking at once. Much loud unhappiness, came Pilgrim's voice, summing up. They're full of, I knew this plan would never work, and why did we ever agree to attack the Flunzerists in the first place? Right next to Joanna, Woodcarver emitted a shrill whistle. The recriminations dribbled to a halt. Some of you forget your courage. We agreed to attack Hidden Island because it has been a deadly threat, one we thought would, we could destroy with Joanna's cannons, and one, one that could surely destroy us if Steele ever learns to use the starship. One of Woodcarver's members, crouching on the floor, reached out to brush Joanna's knee. Pilgrim's vo focused voice chuckled in her ear. And there's also the little matter of getting you home and making contact with the stars, but you can't say that aloud to the pragmatic types. 
in case you haven't guessed, that's one reason one reason you're here, to remind the chuckleheads that there's more in heaven than they have dreamed. He paused and switched back to translating Woodcarver. No mistake was made in undertaking this campaign. Avoiding it would be deadly as as deadly as fighting and losing. So, do we have a, any chance of getting an effective army up in the coast of time? Up of the coast in time? She jabbed the nose in the direction of a balcony across the room. Scruplio, please be brief. The last thing Scruplio can be is brief. Oops, sorry. More editorializing from Peregrine. Scruplio stuck a couple of more heads into view. I've already discussed this with Vendatius, your majesty. Raising an army, traveling up the coast. Those all could be done in well under ten ten days. It's the cannon, and perhaps training packs to use the cannon. That is the problem. That is my special area of responsibility. Woodcarver said something abrupt. Yes, Majesty, we have the gunpowder. It is every bit as powerful as Dataset says. The gun tubes have been a much greater problem. Till very recently, the metal cracked at the breach as it cooled. Now I think I have that fixed. At least I have two un unblemished gun tubes. I had hoped for several ten days of testing. Woodcarver interrupted. But that is something that we can't afford now. She came completely to her feet and looked all around the council room. I want full-size testing immediately. If it's successful, we'll start making gun tubes as fast as we can. And if not... Two days later. The funniest thing was that Scrupilo expected her to inspect the gun tube before he fired it. The pack walked excitedly around the rig, explaining things in awkward Sam Norsk. Joanna followed, frowning seriously. Some meters off, mostly hidden behind a berm. Woodcarver and her high council were watching the exercise. Well, the thing looked real enough. They'd mounted it on a small cart that could roll back into a pile of dirt under the recoil force. The tube itself was a single cast piece of metal about a meter long with a ten centimeter bore. Gunpowder and shot went in the front end. The powder was ignited through a tiny fire hole at the rear. Joanna ran her hand through the barrel. The, le the leaden surface was bumpy, and there seemed to be pieces of dirt caught in the metal. Even the walls of the bore were not completely smooth. Would that make a difference? Scrupilo was explaining how he had used straw in the molds to keep the metal from cracking as it cooled. Yekko. You should try it out with small amounts of gunpowder first, she said. Scrupilo's voice became a bit conspiratorial, more focused. Just between you and me, I did that. It went very good. Now for big test. Hmm, so you're not a complete flake. She smiled at the nearest of him, a member with no black at all in his head fur. In a kooky way, Scrupilo reminded her of some scientists at the high lab. Scrupilo stepped back from the cannon and said loudly, Is it all okay to go now? Two of them were looking nervously at the high counselors beyond the berm. Um, yes, it looks fine to me, and of course it should. The design was copied straight from Neorgian models in Joanna's history files. But be careful. If it doesn't work right, it could kill anybody nearby. Yes, yes. Having gotten her official endorsement, Scrupilo swept around the piece and shooed Joanna toward the sidelines. As she walked back to Woodcarver, he continued in Tynish, which no doubt, no doubt explaining the test. Do you think it will work? Woodcarver asked her quietly. She seemed even more feeble than usual. They had spread a woven mat for her on the mossy heather behind the berm. Most of her lay quietly, heads between paws. The blind one looked asleep. The young jeweler cuddled against it, twitching nervously. As usual, Peregrine Rickrack Scar was nearby. But he wasn't translating now. All his attention was on Scrupilo. Joanna thought of the straw, the straw that Scrupilo had used in the molds. Woodcarver's people were really trying to help, but she shook her head. I, who knows... She came to her knees and looked over the berm. The whole thing looked like a circus act from a history file. There were the performing animals, the cannon. There was even the circus tent. Vendacious had insisted on hiding the operation from possible spies in the hills. The enemies might see something, but the longer steel lacked details the better. The Scrupilo pack hustled around the cannon, talking all the time. 
Two of them hauled up a keg of black powder, and he began pushing the stuff down the barrel. A wad of silk paper followed the powder down the barrel. He tamped it into place, then loaded the cannonball. At the same time, the rest of him pushed the cart around to point out the tent. They were on the forest side of the castle yard, between the old and new walls. Joanna could see a patch of green hillside, drizzly clouds hanging low. About a hundred meters away was the old wall. In fact, this was the same stretch of stone where Scriber had been killed. Even if the damn cannon didn't blow up, no one had any idea how far the shot would go. Joanna was betting it wouldn't even get to the wall. Scrupilo was on this side of the gun show, or of the gun now, trying to light a long wooden firing wand. Wand. <laughs> With a sinking feeling in her stomach, Joanna knew this couldn't work. They were all fools and amateurs, she as much as they, and this poor guy is going to get killed for nothing. Joanna came to her feet. Gotta stop it. Something grabbed her belt and pulled her down. It was one of Woodcarver's members, one of the fat ones that couldn't walk quite right. We have to try, the pack said softly. Scrupilo had the wand alight now. Suddenly he stopped talking. All of him but the white-headed one ran for the protection of the berm. For an instant, it seemed like strange cowardice, and then Joanna understood. A human playing with something explosive would also try to shield his body, except for the hand that held the match. Scrupilo was risking a maiming, but not a death. The white-headed one looked across the trampled heather to the rest of Scrupilo. It didn't seem uh, upset so much as attentively listening. At this distance, it couldn't be a part of Scrupilo's mind, but the creature was probably smarter than any dog and apparently it was getting some kind of directions from the rest. Whitehead turned and walked toward the cannon. It belly-crawled the last meter, taking what cover there was in the dirt behind the gun cart. It held the wand so the flame at its tip came slowly down on the fire hole. Joanna ducked behind the berm. The explosion was a sharp snapping sound. Woodcarver shuddered against her, and whistles of pain came from all around the tent. Poor Scrupilo. Joanna felt tears starting. I have to look. I'm partly responsible. Slowly she stood and forced herself to look across the field where a minute ago the cannon had, the cannon had been, and still is. Thick smoke floated from both ends, but the tube was intact. And more. Whitehead was wobbling dazedly around the cart, uh, his fur, white fur now covered with soot. The rest of Scrupilo raced out to Whitehead. The five of him ran round and round the cannon, bounding each o over each other in triumph. For a long moment, the rest of the audience just stared. The gun was in one piece. The gunner had survived, and, almost as a side effect, Joanna looked over the gun up the hillside. There was a meter-wide notch on the top of the old wall, where none had been before. Vendacious would have a hard time disguising that from an enemy inspection. Dumb silence gave way to the noisiest affair Joanna had seen yet. There was the usual gobbling and other sounds, hissing that hovered right up at the edge of sensibility. On the other side of the tent, the two tines she didn't know ran into each other. For a moment of mindless jubilation, jubilation, they were an enormous pack of nine or ten members. We'll get the ship back yet. Joanna turned to hug Woodcarver, but the queen was not shouting with the others. She huddled with her heads close together, shivering. Woodcarver? She petted the neck of one of the big, fat ones. It jerked away, its body spasming. Stroke? Heart attack? The names of olden-day killers popped into her mind. Just how would they apply to a pack? Something was terribly wrong, and nobody else had noticed. Joanna bounced back to her feet. Pilgrim, she screamed. Five minutes later, they had Woodcarver out of the tent. The place was still a madhouse, but had gone deathly quiet to Joanna's ears. She'd helped the queen do her carriage, but after that no one would let her near. Even Pilgrim, so eager to translate everything the day before, brushed her aside. It will be okay, was all that he said as he ran out the front of the carriage and grabbed the reins of the shaggy, uh, what's it's. The carriage pulled out, surrounded by several packs of guards. For an instant, the weirdness of the Tynes world came crashing back on Joanna. This was uh, obviously a great emergency. A person might be dying. People were rushing this way and that, and yet the packs drew into themselves. No one crowded close. No one could touch each other. The instant passed, and Joanna was running out of the tent after the carriage. 
She tried to keep the heather along the muddy path, keep to the heather along the muddy path, and almost caught up. Everything was wet and chill, gunmetal gray. Everyone had been so intent on the test. Could this be more flenzer treachery? Fl Joanna stumbled, went down on her knees in the mud. The carriage turned the corner onto cobblestones. Now it was lost to sight. She got up and slogged on through the wet, but a little bit slower now. There was nothing she could do, nothing she could do. She made friends with Scriber, and Scriber had been killed. She had made friends with Woodcarver, and now... She walked along the cobbled alley between the castle's storehouses. The carriage was out of sight, but she could hear its clatter on ahead. Vendacious's security packs ran in both directions past her, stopping briefly in side niches to allow opposing traffic by. Nobody answered her questions. Probably none of them even spoke Sam Norsk. Joanna almost got lost. She could hear the carriage, but it had turned somewhere. She heard it again behind her. They were taking Woodcarver to Joanna's place. She went back, and a few minutes later was climbing the path to the two-story cabin she had shared with Woodcarver these last weeks. Joanna was too pooped to run any more. She walked slowly up the hillside, vaguely aware of her wet and muddy state. The carriage was stopped about five meters short of the door. Guard packs were strung, along, uh, strung out along the hill, but their bows weren't knocked. The afternoon sunlight found a break in the western clouds and shone for a moment on the damp heather and glistening timbers, lighting them bright against the dark sky above the hills. It was a combination of light and dark that had always seemed especially beautiful to, do to Joanna. Please let her be okay. The guards let her pass. Peregrine Rickraxgar was standing around the entrance, three of him watching her approach. The fourth, Scarbutt, had its long neck stuck through the doorway, watching whatever was inside. She wanted to be back here when it happened, he said. What happened, said Joanna. Pilgrim made the equivalent of a shrug. It was the shock of that cannon going off, but almost anything could have done it. There was something odd about the way his heads were bobbing around. With a shock, Joanna realized the pack was smiling, full of glee. I want to see her, Scarbutt backed hastily away as she started for the door. Inside, there was only light from the door and the high window slits. It took a second for Joanna's eyes to adjust. Something smelled wet. Woodcarver was lying in a circle, a circle on the quilted mattress she used every evening. She crossed the room and went to her knees beside the pack. The pack edged nervously away from her touch. There was blood and what looked like a pile of guts in the middle of the mattress. Joanna felt vomit rising in her. W Woodcarver, she said very softly. One of the queen moved back towards Joanna and put its muzzle in the girl's hand. Hello, Joanna. It's so strange to have someone next to me at a time like this. You're bleeding. What's the matter? Soft, human-sounding laughter. I'm hurt, but it's good. See? The blind one was holding something small and wet in its jaws. One of the others was licking it. Whatever it was, it was wiggling, alive. And Joanna remembered how strangely plump and awkward parts of Woodcarver had become. A baby? Yes, and I'm going to have another in a day or two. Joanna sat back on the floor timbers and covered her face with her hands. She was going to start crying again. Why didn't you tell me? Woodcarver didn't say anything for a moment. She licked the little one all around, then set it against the tummy of the member that must be its mother. The newborn snuggled close, nuzzling into the belly fur. It didn't make any noise that Joanna could hear. Finally, the queen said, I don't know if I can make you understand. This has been very hard for me. Having babies? Joanna's hands were sticky with the blood on the quilt. Obviously this had been hard, but that's how all lives must start on a world like this. It was a pain that needed the support of friends, pain that needed that led to joy. No, having the babies isn't it. I've borne more than a hundred in my memory's time, but these two are the ending of me. How can you understand? You humans don't even have the choice to keep on living. Your offspring can never be you. But for me, it's the end of a soul six hundred years old. You see, I'm going to keep these two to be a part of me. And for the first time in all the centuries, I am not both the mother and the father. A newbie I'll become. Joanna looked at the blind one and the drooler. Six hundred years of incest. How much longer could Woodcarver have continued before the mind itself decayed? Not both the mother and the father. But then who is the father? She blurted out. Who do you think? 
The voice came from just beyond the door. One of Peregrine Wickrackscar's heads peered through the corner just far enough to show an eye. When Woodcarver makes a decision, she goes for extremes. She's been the most tightly held soul of all time, but now she has blood, genes, Dataset would say, from packs all over the world, from one of the flakiest pilgrims who ever cast his soul upon the wind. Also from one of the smartest, said Woodcarver, her voice wry and wistful at the same time. The new soul will be at least as intelligent as before, and probably a lot more flexible. And I'm a little bit pregnant myself, said Pil Pilgrim, but I'm not the least bit sad. I've been a foursome for so long, for too long. Imagine having pups by Woodcarver herself. Maybe I'll turn all conservative and settle down. Ha! Even two from me is not enough to slow your pilgrim soul. Joanna listened to the banter. The ideas were so alien, and yet the overtones of affection and humor were somehow very familiar. Somewhere, then she had it. When Joanna was just five years old, and Mom and Dad brought little Jeffrey home, Joanna couldn't remember the words or even the sense of what they'd said, but the tone was the same as what went between Woodcarver and Pilgrim. Joanna slid back to a sitting position, the tension of the day evaporating. Scrupilo's artillery really worked. There was a chance of getting on, getting the ship. And even if they failed, she felt a little bit like she was back home. C can I pet your puppy? Chapter 25 The voyage of the Out of Band 2 had begun in catastrophe, where life and death were a difference of hours or minutes. In the first weeks there had been terror and loneliness, and the resurrection of fam. The OOB had fallen quickly towards the galactic plane, away from Relay. Day by day the whirl of stars tilted up to meet them, till it was the single band of light, the Milky, w the Milky Way, as seen from the perspective of Neorgia and Old Earth, and from most of all habitable planets of the galaxy. Twenty thousand light years in three weeks, but that had been on a path through the middle beyond. Now in the galactic plane they were still six thousand light years from their goal at the bottom of the beyond. The zone interfaces roughly followed surfaces of constant mean density. On a classic, on a galactic scale, the bottom was a vaguely lens-shaped surface surrounding much of the galactic disk. The OOB was moving in the plane of the disk now, more or less toward the galactic center. Every week took them deeper toward the slowness. Worse, their path and all variants that made any progress extended right through a region of massive zone shifting. The net news had called it the Great Zone Storm, through of course, though of course there was not the slightest physical feeling of turbulence within the volume. But some days their progress was less than 80% what they'd expected. Early on, they'd known that it was not the only storm that was slow, it was not only the storm that was slowing them. Blue Shell had gone outside, looking over the damage that still remained from their escape. So it's the ship itself. Rad Ravna had glared out from the bridge, watching the now imperceptible crawl of near stars across the heavens. The confirmation was no revelation, but what to do? Blue Shell trundled back and forth across the ceiling. Every time he reached the far wall, he queried ship's management <coughs> about the pressure seal on the nose lock. Ravna glared at him. Hey, that was the nth time you've checked status in the last three minutes. If you really think something is wrong, then fix it. The scrowed rider's wheeled progress came to an abrupt halt. Franz waved uncertainly. But I was just outside. I want to be sure I shut the port correctly. Oh, you mean I've already checked it? Ravna looked up at him and tried to get the sting out of her voice. Blue Shell wasn't the proper target for her frustration. Yep, at least five times. I'm sorry, he paused going into the stillness of complete concentration. I've committed the memory. Sometimes the habit was cute, and sometimes just irritating. When the writers tried to think on more than one thing at a time, their scrodes were sometimes unable to maintain short-term memory. Blue Shell especially got trapped into cycles of behavior, repeating an action and immediately forgetting the accomplishment. Fam grinned, looking a lot cooler than Ravna felt. What I don't see is why you writers put up with it. What? Well, according to the ship's library, you've had these scrowed gadgets since before there was a net. So how come you haven't improved the design, gotten rid of the silly wheels, upgraded the memory tracking? 
I bet that even a slow zone combat programmer like me could come up with a better design than the one you're writing. It's really a matter of tradition, Blue Shell said primly. We're grateful to whatever gave us wheels and memory in the first place. Hmm. Ravna almost smiled. By now she knew Fem well enough to guess that he was thinking what he was thinking, namely that plenty of writers might have gone on to better things in the transcend. Those remaining were likely to have self-imposed limitations. Yes, tradition. Many who once were writers have changed, even transcended. But we persist. Greenstock paused, and when she continued sounded even more shy than usual. You've heard of the writer myth. No, said Ravna, distracted in spite of herself. In the time ahead she would know as much about these writers as about any human friends, but for now there were still surprises. Not many have. Not that it's a secret. It's just that we don't make much of it. It does. It comes close to being religion, but one we don't proselytize. Four or five billion years ago, someone built the first scrodes and raised the first writers to sentience. That much is verified fact. The myth is that something destroyed our creator and all its works. A catastrophe so great that from this distance it is not even understood as an act of mind. There were plenty of theories about what the galaxy had been like in the distant past, in the time of Ur-Partition. <clears throat> but the net couldn't be forever. There had to be a beginning. Ravna had never been a big believer in ancient wars and catastrophes. So in a sense, Greenstock said, we writers are the faithful ones, waiting for what created us to return. The traditional scroll and the traditional interface are a standard. Staying with it has made our patience possible. Quite so, said Blue Shell. And the design itself is very subtle. My lady, even if the function is simple. He rolled to the center of the ceiling. The scroll of tradition imposes a good discipline, concentration on what's truly important. Just now I was trying to worry about too many things. Abruptly he returned to the topic at hand. Two of our drive spines were never recovered from the damage at relay. Three more appear to be degrading. We thought this slow progress was just the storm, but now I've studied the spines up close. The diagnostic warnings were no false alarm. And it's still getting worse? Unfortunately so. So how bad will it get? Blue Shell drew all his tendrils together. My Lady Ravna, we can't be certain of the extrapolations yet. It may not get much worse than now, or... You know the OOB was not fully ready to for departure. There were the final consistency checks still to do. In a way, I worry about that more than anything. We don't know what bugs may lurk. Especially when we breach the bottom and our normal automation must be retired. We must watch the drives very carefully, and hope. It was the nightmare that haunted travelers, especially at the bottom of the beyond. With ultra-drive gone, suddenly a light year was not a matter of minutes, but of years. Even if they fired up the ram scoop and went into cold sleep, Jeffrey Olsen thought would be a thousand years dead before they reached him, and the secret of his parents' ship buried in some medieval midden. Fam Nguyen waved at the slowly shifting star fields. Still, this is the beyond. Every hour we go farther than the fleet of Cheng Ho could in a decade. He shrugged. Surely there's some place we can get repairs. Several. So much for a quick flight, all unobserved, Ravna sighed. The final fitting at Relay was to include spares and bottom compatibility software. All that was, all that was far away might have bins now. She looked at Greenstock. Do you have any ideas? About what? Greenstock, Greenstock said. Ravna bit her lip in frustration. Some said the writers were a race of comedians. They were indeed, but it was mostly unintentional. Blue Shell rattled at his mate. Oh, you mean, where can we get help? Yes, there are several possibilities. Sandra Kai is 3,900 lights spinward from here, but outside this storm, we... Too far, Blue Shell and Ravna smoke almost in chorus. Yes, yes, but remember, the Sandra Kai worlds are mainly human. You're home, my lady Ravna. And Blue Shell and I know them well. After all, they were the source of the crypto shipment we brought to Relay. We have friends there and you, a family. Even Blue Shell agrees that we can get the work done without notice there. Yes, if we could get there. 
Blue Shell's voter voice sounded petulant. Okay, but what are the other choices? They are not so well known. I'll make a list. Her fronds drifted across a console. Our last chance for choice is rather near our planned course. It's a single system civilization. The net name is... It translates as harmonious repose. Rest in peace, eh? said Fan. But they had agreed to voyage on quietly, always watching the bad drive spines, postponing the decision to stop for help. The days became, became weeks, and weeks slowly counted into months. Four voyagers on a quest toward the bottom. The drive became worse, but slowly, right on OOB's diagnostic projections. The blight continued to spread across the top of the beyond, and its attacks on network archives extended far, far beyond its network or its de direct reach. Communication with Jeffrey was improving. Messages trickled in at the rate of one or two a day. Sometimes, when OOB's antenna swarm was tuned just right, he and Ravna would talk almost in real time. Progress was being made on the Times world, faster than she had expected perhaps fast enough that the boy could save himself. It should have been a hard time, locked up in the single ship with just three others, with only a thread of communication to the outside, and that with a lost child. In any case, it was rarely boring. Ravna found that each of them had plenty to do. For herself, it was managing the ship's library, coaxing out of it the plans that would help Mr. Steele and Geoffrey. OOB's library was nothing compared to the archive at Relay, or even the university libraries at Sandrick High, Without proper search automation, uh, it could be just as unknowable. And as their voyage proceeded, the automation needed more and more special care. That and things could never be boring with Fam around. He had a dozen projects and curiosity about everything. Voyaging time can be a gift, he'd say. Now we have time to catch ourselves up, time to get ready for whatever we find ahead. He was learning Sam Norsk. It went slower than his faked learning on Relay, but the guy had a natural bent for languages, and Ravna gave him plenty of practice. He spent several hours a day in OOB's workshop, often with Blue Shell. Reality graphics were a new thing to him, but after a few weeks he was beyond toy prototypes. The pressure suits he built had power packs and weapon stores. We don't know what things may be like when we arrive. Powered armor could be really useful. At the end of each workday, they could, would all meet at the command deck to compare notes, to consider the latest from Jeffrey and Mr. Steele, to review the drive status. For Ravna, this could be the happiest time of the day, and sometimes the hardest. Fam had rigged the display automation to show castle walls all around. A huge fireplace replaced the normal window to on calm status. The sound of it was almost perfect. He had even coaxed, coaxed a small amount of fire heat from that wall. This was a castle hall out of Fam's memory, from Canberra, he said. But it wasn't that different from the age of princesses on Neorja, though most of those castles had been in tropical swamps, where big fireplaces were rarely used. For some perverse reason, even the writers seemed to enjoy it. Greenstock said it reminded her of a trading stop from her first years with Blue Shell. Like travelers who have walked through a long day, the four of them rested in a coziness of the Phantom Lodge. And when the new business was settled, Fam and the riders would trade stories, often late into the night. Ravna sat beside him, the least talkative of the four. She joined in the laughter and sometimes the discussion. There was the time Blue Shell had a humor fit at Fam's faith in public key encryption, and Ravna knew some stories of her own to illustrate the writer's opinion. But this was also the hardest time for her. Yes, the stories were wonderful. Blue Shell and Greenstock had been to so many places, and at heart they were traitors. Swindles and bargains and good done were all part of their lives. Fam listened to his friends, almost enraptured, and then told his own stories, of being a prince on Canberra, of being a slow zone trader and explorer, and for all the limitations of the slowness, his life's adventures surpassed even the Skode Riders. Ravna smiled and tried to pretend enthusiasm. For Fam's stories were too much. He honestly believed them, but she couldn't imagine one human seeing so much, doing so much. Back on Relay, she had claimed his memories were synthetic, a little joke of old one. She had been very angry when she said it, and more than anything she wished she never had, because it was so clearly the truth. Greenstock and Blue Shell never noticed, 
but sometimes in the middle of a story, Fam would stumble on his memories, and a look of barely concealed panic would come into his eyes. Somewhere inside, he knew the truth, too, and she suddenly wanted to hug him, comfort him. It was like having a terribly wounded friend, with whom you can talk but never mutually admit the scope of the injuries. Instead, she pretended the lapses didn't exist, smiling and laughing at the rest of his story. And Old One's jape was also unnecessary. Fam didn't have to be a great hero. He was a decent person, although ebullient, e ebullient and kind of a rule-breaker. He had every bit as much persistence as she, and more courage. What craft Old One must have had to make such a person? What power? And how she hated him for making a joke of such a person. Of Fam's god-shatter, there was scarcely a sign, for that Ravna was very grateful. Once or twice a, twice a month, he had a dreamy spell. For a day or two after, he would go nuts with some new project, often something he couldn't clearly explain. But it wasn't getting worse. He wasn't drifting away from her. And the god-shatter may save us in the end, he would say, when, he had the, when she had the courage to ask him about it. No, I don't know how. He tapped his forehead. It's still God's own crowded attic up there. It's more than memory. Sometimes it needs all my mind to think with, and there's no room left for self-awareness, and afterwards I can't explain, but sometimes I have a glimmer. Whatever Jeffrey's parents brought to the Tyne's world, it can hurt the blight. Call it an antidote. Better yet, a countermeasure. Something taken from the perversion as it was a borning in the Stromley lab. Something the perversion didn't even suspect, suspect was gone until much later. Revna sighed. It was hard to imagine good news that was also so frightening. The Stromers could sneak something like that right out of the perversion's heart? Maybe. Or maybe, countermeasure used the Stromers to, to escape the perversion. To hide inaccessibly deep and wait to strike. And I think the plan might work. Rav, at least, if I... If Old One's God Shatter can get down there and help it. Look at the news. The blight is turning the top of the beyond upside down, hunting for something. Hitting Relay was the least of it, a small byproduct of its murdering old one. But it's looking in all the wrong places. We'll have our chance at countermeasure. She thought of Jeffrey's messages. The rot on the walls of Jeffrey's ship. You think that's what it is? Fam's eyes went vague. Yes, it seems completely passive, but he says it, it was there from the beginning that his parents kept him away from it. He seems a little disgusted by it. That's good. Probably keeps his tiny friends away from it. A thousand questions flitted up. Surely they must they must in Fam's mind, too. And they could know the answer to none of them now. Yet some day they would stand before that unknown, and Old One's dead hand would act. Through Fam. Revna shivered, and didn't say anything more for a time. Month by month, the gunpowder project stayed right on the schedule of the library's development program. The Tynes had been able to make the stuff easily. There had been very little backtracking through the development tree. Alloy testing had been the critical event that slowed things, but they were over the hump there, too. The packs of Hidden Island had built the first three prototypes, breech-loading cannons, that were small enough to be carried by a single pack. Jeffrey guessed that they could begin mass production in another ten days. The radio project was the weird one. In one sense, it was behind schedule. In another, it had become something more than Ravna had ever imagined. After a long period of normal progress, Jeffrey had come back with a counterplan. It consisted of a complete reworking of the tables for the acoustic interface. I thought these jokers were first-time medievals, Fam Nguyen said when he saw Jeffrey's message. That's right. And in principle, they just reasoned out consequences to what we sent them. They want to support pack thought across the radio. Huh. Yes. We described how the tables specified the transdu transducer grid. All in non-technical sand Norsk. That included showing how small table changes would make the grid different. But look, our design would give them three kilohertz band. A nice voice grade connection. You're telling me that implementing this new table would give them 200 kilohertz. Yes, that's what my data set says. He grinned his cocky smile. Ha, ah, and that's my point. Sure, in principle we gave them enough information to do the mod. It looks to me like making this expanded spec table is equivalent to solving a... Hmm. He counted rows and columns. A 500-node numerical PDE. 
and little Jeffrey claims that all his data sets are destroyed and that his ship computer is not generally usable. Ravna leaned back from the display. Sorry, I see what you mean. You get so used to everyday tools, sometimes you forget what it must be like without them. You... you think this might be, uh, countermeasures doing? Fam Nguyen hesitated, as if he hadn't considered the possibility. Then, no, no, it's not that. I think this Mr. Steele is playing games with our heads. All we have is a bite, bite stream from Jeffrey. What do we really know about what's going on? Well, I'll tell you some things I know. We're talking about to a young human child who was raised in the Stromley realm. You've been reading most of his messages in Trisk's translation. That loses a lot of collo colloquialisms and the little errors of a child who is a native speaker of San Norsk. The only way this might be faked is by a group of human adults. And after 20 plus weeks of knowing Jeffrey, I'll tell you even that is unlikely. Okay, so suppose Jeffrey is for real. We have this eight-year-old kid down in the Tynes world. He's telling us what he considers to be the truth. I'm saying it looks like someone is lying to him. Maybe we can trust what he sees with his own eyes. He says that these creatures aren't sapient except in groups of five or so. Okay, we'll believe that. Fam rolled his eyes. Apparently his reading had shown how rare group intelligences were this side of the transcend. The kid says that he didn't see anything but small towns from space, and that everything on the ground is medieval. Okay, we'll buy that. But what are the chances that his race is, this race is smart enough to do PDEs in their heads, and do them just from the implications in your message? Well, there have been some humans that smart. She could name one case in Yoran history, another couple from Old Earth. If such abilities were common among the packs, they were smarter than any natural race she had heard of. So this isn't first-time medievalism. Right. I bet this is some colony fallen on hard times, like your Neorja and my Canberra, except they have the good luck of being in the beyond. These dog packs have a working computer somewhere. Maybe it's under control of their priest class. Maybe they don't have much else, but they're holding out on us. But why? We'd be helping them in any case. And Jeffrey has told us how this group saved him. Fam started to smile again, the old supercilious smile. Then he sobered. He was really starting to trying to break that habit. You've been on a dozen different worlds, Ravna, and I know you've read about thousands more, at least in survey. You probably know of varieties of medievalism I've never guessed. But remember, I've actually been there, I think. The last was a nervous mutter. I've read about the age of princesses, Ravna said mildly. Yes, and I'm sorry for belittling that. In any medieval politics, the blade and the thought are closely connected but they become much more closely bound for someone who's lived through it. Look, even if we believe everything that Geoffrey says he's seen, this hidden island kingdom is a sinister thing. You mean the names? Like Flenzers, Steel, Tynes? Harsh names aren't necessarily meaningful, Fam laughed. I mean, when I was eight years old, one of my titles was already Lord Master Disemboweler. He saw the look on Ravna's face and hurriedly added, and at that age, I hadn't even witnessed more than a couple of executions. No, the names were only a small part of it. I'm thinking of the kid's description of the castle, which seems to be close by the ship, and this ambush he thinks is he was rescued from. It doesn't add up. You asked, what could they gain from be betraying us? I can see that question from their point of view. If they're a fallen colony, they have a clear idea of what they've lost. They probably have some remnant technology and are paranoid as hell. If I were them, I'd seriously consider ambushing the rescuers if those rescuers seemed weak or careless. And even if we come on strong, look at the questions Jeffrey asks for Steel. The guy is fishing, trying to figure out what we really value. The refugee ship, Jeffrey and the cold sleepers, or something on the ship. By the time we arrive, Steel will probably have wiped the local opposition, thanks to us. My guess is we're in for some heavy blackmail when we get to the Tyne's world. I thought we were talking about the good news. Ravna paged back through recent messages. Fam was right. The boy was telling the truth as he knew it, but... I don't see how we can play things any differently. If we don't help steal against the woodcarvers... Yeah, we don't know enough to do much else. Whatever else is true, the woodcarvers seem to have a valid threat to Jeffrey and the ship. I'm just saying we should be thinking about all the possibilities. One thing we absolutely mustn't do is show interest in countermeasure. If the locals know how desperate we are for that, we don't have a chance. And it may be time to start planting a few lies of our own, 
Steele's been talking about building a landing place for us within his castle. There's no way OOB could fit, but I think we should play along. Tell Jeffrey that we can separate from our ultra drive, something like his container ship. Let Steele concentrate on building harmless traps. He hummed one of his strange little marching tunes. About the radio thing, why don't we compliment the Tynes real casually for improving our design? I wonder what they'd say. Pham Nguyen got his answer less than three days later. Jeffrey Olsendot said that he had done the optimization, so if he believed the kid, there was no evidence for hidden computers. Pham was not at all convinced. So, just by coincidence, we have Isaac Newton on the other end of the line? Ravna didn't argue the point. It was an enormous bit of luck, yet she went over the earlier messages, in language and general knowledge, and the boy seemed very ordinary for his age. But occasionally, there were situations involving mathematical insight, not formal, taught math, where Geoffrey said striking things. Some of those conversations had been under fine conditions, with turnaround times of less than a minute. It all seemed too consistent to be the lie Pham Nguyen thought. Geoffrey Olsen thought, you are someone I very much want to meet. There was always something. Problems with the Tynes' developments, fears that the murderous woodcarvers might attack Mr. Steele, worries about steadily degrading, drive spines, and zone turbulence that slowed OOB's progress even further. Life was by turns, and at once frustrating, boring, frightening, and yet. One night, about four months into the flight, Ravna woke up in the cabin she had come to share with Fan. Maybe she had been dreaming, but she couldn't remember anything except for that it had been no nightmare. There was no special noise in the room, nothing to wake her. Beside her, Fan was sleeping soundly in their hammock net. She eased her arm down his back, drawing him gently toward her. His breathing changed. He mumbled something placid and unintelligible. In Ravna's opinion, sex in zero-G was not the experience some people bragged it up to be, but really sleeping with someone. That was much, much nicer in free fall. An embrace could be light and enduring and effortless. Ravna looked around the dimly lit cabin, trying to imagine what had woken her. Maybe it had just been the problems of the day. Powers knew there had been enough of those. She nestled her face against Pham's shoulder. Yes, always problems, but in a way she in a way she more content than she had been in years. Sure there were problems. <laughs> Poor Jeffrey's situation. All the people lost at Strom and the relay. But she had three friends and a love. Alone on a tiny ship bound for the bottom. She was less lonely than she'd been since leaving Sandra Kai. More than ever in her life, maybe she could do something to help with the problems. And then she guessed, part in sadness, part in joy, that years from now she might look back on these months as goldenly happy. Chapter 26 And finally, almost five months out, it was clear there was no hope of going on without repairing the drive spines. The OOB was suddenly doing only a quarter of a light year per hour in a volume that tested good for two. And things were getting worse. They would have no trouble making it to Harmonious Repose, but beyond that. Harmonious Repose, an ugly name, thought Ravna. Pham's light-hearted translation was, worse, rest in peace. In the beyond, almost everything habitable was in use. Civilizations were transient and races faded, but there were always new people moving up from below. The result was most often patchwork, polyspecific systems. Young races just up from the slowness lived uneasily within the remnants of older peoples. According to the ship's library, R.I.P. had been in the beyond for a long time. It had been continuously inhabited for at least 200 million years, time for 10,000 species to call it home. The most recent notes showed better than 100 racial terrains. Even the youngest was the residue of a dozen emigrations. The place should be peaceful to the point of being mor moribund. So be it. They jigged the OOB three light years spinward. Now they were flying down the main net trunk towards RIP. They'd be able to listen to the news the whole way in. Harmonious repose advertised. At least one species valued external goods, specializing in ship outfitting and repair. An industrious, hard-footed race, the ad said. Eventually, she saw some video. The creatures walked on ivory tusks and had a froth of short arms growing from just below their necks. The ads included net addresses of satisfied users. Too bad we can't follow up on those. Instead, Ravna sent a short message in Trisquillen, requesting generic drive replacements and listing possible methods of payment. Meantime, the bad news kept rolling in. 
Crypto, zero, as received by OOB Shipboard Ad Hoc. Language Path, Baylor-esque, Twisqualine, SJK Units. From Alliance for the Defense, claimed cooperative of five polyspecific empires in the beyond below Stromley realm. No record of existence before the fall of the realm. Subject, call to action. Distribution, threat of the blight, war trackers interest group, homo sapiens interest group. Date, 158.00 days since fall of relay. Key phrases, action, not talk. Text of message. Alliance forces are preparing for action against the tools of the perversion. It is time for our friends to declare themselves. At the moment, we do not need your military pledges, but in the very near future, we will need support services, including free net time. In the coming seconds, we will be watching closely to see who supports our action and who may be enslaved to the perversion. If you live with the human infestation, you have a choice. Act now with a good possibility of victory, or wait and be destroyed. Death to vermin. There were plenty of secondary messengers, including speculation about who Death to Vermin, a.k.a. Alliance for the Defense, had in mind. There were also rumors of military movement. This wasn't making the splash the fall of Relay had, but it did have the attention of several news groups. Ravna swallowed hard and looked away from the display. Well, they're still making big noises. She tried for a light tone, but it didn't come out that way. Fam Nguyen touched her shoulder. Quite true and real killers generally don't advertise beforehand. But there was more sympathy than conviction to his voice. We still don't know that this is more than a single loudmouth. There's no definite word of ship movements. What can they do, after all? Ravna pushed herself up from the table. Not much, I hope. There are hundreds of civilizations with small human settlements. Surely they've taken precautions since this death to, to vermin stuff began. By the powers, I wish I knew Sandrakai was safe. It had been more than two years since she'd seen Lynn and her parents. Sometimes Sendrick High seemed something from another life, but just knowing it was there had been more comfort than she realized. Now, on the other side of the command deck, the Scrod Riders had been working on the repair specs. Now Blue Shell rolled toward them. I do fear for the small settlements, but the humans at Sendrick High are the driving force of that civilization. Even the name is a human one. Any attack on them would be an attack on the entire civilization. Greenstock and I have traded there often enough, and with their commercial security forces. Only fools or bluffers would announce an invasion beforehand. Ravna thought a moment, brightened. The Dero, Kimes, and Loafers would stand against any threat to humankind at Sandra Kai. Yeah, we're not a ghetto there. Things might be very bad for isolated humans, but Sandra Kai would be okay. Bluffers. Well, it's not called the net of a million lies for nothing. She pulled her mind back from worries beyond her control. But one thing is clear. Stopping at harmonious repose, we must be damn sure to not look like anything human. And of course, part of not looking human was that there would be no sign of Ravna and Fam. The writers would do all the talking. Ravna and the writers went through all the ship's exterior programs, weeding out human nuances that had crept in since they left Relay. And if they were actually boarded... Well, they would never survive such a determined search, but if they isolated, uh, but they isolated things humans in a fake Jovian hold, the two humans would slip in there if necessary. Fam Nguyen checked what they did, and found more than one slip up. For a barbarian programmer, he wasn't bad. But then they were rapidly reaching the depths where the best computer equipment wasn't that much more sophisticated than what he had known. Ironically, there was one thing they could not disguise that the OOB was from the top of the beyond. True, the ship was a bottom lugger and based on a mid-beyond design, but there was an elegance to the refit that screamed of nearly superhuman competence. The damn thing has the feel of a hand axe built in a factory, was how Fam Nguyen put it. Ripper security was an encouraging thing. A perfunctory vol velocity check and no boarding. OOB hopped into the system and finished a rocket burn to match position slash velocity vector with the heart of harmonious repose and Saint Rindel's repair harbor. Fam, if you're a saint, you gotta be honest, right? Out of band was ab uh, above the ecliptic and some 80 million kilometers from RIP's single star. Even knowing what to expect, the view was spectacular. 
The inner system was as dusty slash gassy as a stellar nursery, even though the primary was a three billion year old G star. The sun was surrounded by millions of rings more spectacular than around any planet. The largest and brightest resolved into myriads more. Even in the natural view, there was bright color here, threads of green and red and violet. Warping of the ring plane laid lakes of shadow beyond, between colored hillsides, hillsides a million kilometers across. There were occasional objects, structures, sticking far enough uh, up from the ring plane to cast needle-like shadows out system. Infrared and proper motion windows showed more conventional features. Beyond the rings lay a massive asteroid belt, and far beyond that a single Jovian planet, its own million-click ring system a puny afterthought. There were no other planets, either detected or on file. The largest objects in the main ring system were 300 kilometers across, but there appeared to be thousands of them. At St. Rindell's direction, they brought the ship down to the ring plane and matched velocities with the local junk. That last was a big impulsive burn, three Gs for almost five minutes. Just like old, old times, Fam Nguyen said. In freefall again, they looked out upon their harbor. Up close it looked like planetary ring systems Ravna had known all her life. There were objects of all sizes down to less than a hand span across, uncounted globs of icy froth, gently touching, sticking, separating. The debris hung nearly motionless all about them. This was chaos that had been tamed long ago. In the plane of the rings, they couldn't see more than a few hundred meters. The debris blocked further views, and it wasn't all loose. Greenstock pointed to a line of white that seemed to curve from infinity, pass close by them, and then retreat forever in the other direction. Looks like a single structure, she said. Ravna stepped up the magnification. In planetary ring systems, the frothy snowballs sometimes accreted into strings thousands of clicks long. The white thread spread wide beyond the window. The display said it was almost a kilometer across. This arc was definitely not made of snowballs. She could see ship locks and communications nodes. Checking with images from their approach, Ravna could see that the whole thing was better than a forty, m better than forty million kilometers long. There were a number of breaks scattered along the arc. That figured. The scaled tensile strength of such a structure could be near zero. Depending on local distortions, it would pull apart briefly, then gently come together some time later. The whole affair was vaguely reminiscent of train cars coupling and uncoupling on some old-time Nioran railway. Over the next hour, they moved care so carefully into the dock at the ring arc. The only thing regular about the structure was its linearity. Some of the modules were clearly designed for linking fore and aft. Others were jumbled heaps of oddball equipment meshed in with dirty ice. The last few kilometers, they drifted through a forest of ultra-drive spines. Two-thirds of the berths were occupied. Blue Shell opened a window on St. Rindell's business specs. Hmm, hmm. Sir Rindell seems extraordinarily busy. He angled some fronds back at the ships in the exterior view. Fam, maybe he's just running a junkyard. Blue Shell and Greenstock went down to the cargo lock to prepare for their first trip ashore. The Scrod Riders had been together for two hundred years, and Blue Shell came from a star trader tradition before that. Yet the two argued back and forth about the best approach to take with St. Rindell. Of course, harmonious repose is typical, dear Blue Shell. I would remember the type even if I'd never ridden a Scrod, but our business here is not like anything we've done before. Blue Shell grumped wordlessly, and pushed another trade packet under his cargo scarf. The scarf was more than pretty. The material was tough, elastic stuff that protected what it covered. It was the same procedure they had always followed in new ring systems, and it had worked well before. Finally, he replied, certainly there are differences, mainly that we have very little to trade for the repairs and no previous commercial contacts. If we don't use hard business sense, we'll get nothing here. He checked the various sensors strung across his strode, across his scrode, and then spoke to the humans. Do you want me to move any of the cameras? Do they all have a clear view? St. Rindo was a miser when it came to renting bandwidth, or maybe it was simply cautious. Fam Nguyen's voice came back. No, they're okay. Can you hear me? He was speaking through a microphone inside their scrodes. The link itself was encrypted. Yes. 
The Scrode Riders passed through the OOB's locks into St. Rindell's Ark habitat. From within, transparency arched around them, lines of natural windows that dwindled into the distance. They looked out upon St. Rindell's current customers in the ring fluff beyond. The sun was dimmed in the view, but there was a haze of brightness, a super corona. That was a power sat swarm, no doubt. Ring systems did not naturally make good use of the central fire. For a moment, the riders stopped in their tracks, taken by the, the image of a sea greater than any sea. The light might have been the sunset through a shadow sur shallow surf. And to them, the drifting of thousands of nearby particles looked like food in a slow tidal surge. The concourse was crowded. The creatures here had ordinary enough body plans, though none were species of green stock recognized for certain. The tusk-like type that ran St. Rindell's was most numerous. After a moment, one such drifted out from the wall near the OOB's lock. It buzzed something that came out as Trisquillin. For trading, we go this way. Its ivory legs moved agilely across netting into an open car. The Scrode Riders settled behind, and they accelerated along the arc. Blue Shell waggled at Greenstock. The old story, eh? What good are their legs now? It was the oldest rider humor, but it was always worth a laugh. Two legs or four legs, evolved from flippers or jaws or whatever, were all very good for movement on land, but in space, it scarcely mattered. The car was making about 100 meters per second, swaying slightly whenever they passed one from one ring segment to the next. Blue Shell kept up a steady patter of conversation with their guide, the sort of pitch that Greenstock knew was one of his great joys in life. Where are we going? What are those creatures there? What sort of things are they in search of at St. Rindell's? All jovial and almost humanly brisk. Where short-term memory was failing him, he depended on his scrode. Tuskleg spoke only reduced grammar Trisquillin and didn't seem to understand some of the questions. We go to the master seller. Helper creatures those are. Allies of big new customer. Their guide's limited speech bothered dear Blue Shell not at all. He was collecting responses more than answers. Most races had interests that were obscure to the likes of Blue Shell and Greenstock. No doubt there were billions of creatures in harmonious repose who were totally inscrutable to riders or humans or Durkokimes. Yet simple dialogue often gave insight on the two more most important questions. What do you have that might be useful to me, and how can I persuade you to part with it? Dear Blue Shell's questions were sounding out the other, trying to find the parameters of personality and interest and ability. It was a team game the two Scrode Riders played. While Blue Shell chattered, Greenstock watched everything around them, running her Scrode's recorders on all bands, trying to place this environment in the context of others they had known. Technology. What would these people need? What could work? In space this flat, there would be little use for agrav fabric. And this low in the beyond, a lot of the more sophisticated imports from above would spoil almost immediately. Workers outside the long windows wore articulated pressure suits. The force field suits of the high beyond would last only a few weeks down here. They passed trees that twisted and twisted. Some of the trunks circled the wall of the ark. Others trailed along their path for hundreds of meters. Tusk-legged gardeners floated everywhere about the plants, yet there was no evidence of agriculture. All this was ornament. In the ring plain beyond the windows there were occasional towers, structures that sprouted a thousand kilometers above the plain and cast the pointy shadows they had seen on their final approach to the system. Ravna's voice and fans buzzed against her stock, softly asking Greenstock about the towers, speculating on their purpose. She stored their theories for later consideration, but she doubted them. Some would only work in the high beyond, and others would uh, be clumsy given the civilization's other accomplishments. Greenstock had visited eight ring system civilizations in her life. They were a common consequence of accidents and wars, and occasionally of deliberate habitat design. According to OOB's library, Harmonious Response had been a normal planetary system up until ten million years ago. Then there'd be a real estate dispute. A young race from below had thought to colonize and exterminate the moribund inhabitants. The attack had been a miscalculation, for the moribund could still kill, and the system was reduced to rubble. Perhaps the young race survived, but after ten million years, if there were any of those young killers left, 
they would now be the most frail of the system's elder races. Perhaps a thousand new races had passed through in that time, and almost every one had done something to tailor to the rings and gas cloud left from the debacle. What was left was not a ruin at all, but old, old. The ship's library contained, claimed that no race had transcended from harmonious response in a thousand years, or harmonious repose in a thousand years. The fact was more important than all the others. The current civilizations were in their twilight, refining mediocrity. More than anything else, the system had the feel of an old and beautiful tide pool, groomed and tended, shielded from the exciting waves that might upset its bonsai plumes. Most likely the tusk legs were the liveliest species about, perhaps the only one interested in trade with the outside. Their car slowed and spiraled into a small tower. By the fleet, what I wouldn't give to be out there with them, Pham Nguyen waved at the views coming in from the scrode cameras. Ever since the riders left, he'd been at the windows, alternately gaping wide-eyed at the ringscape and bouncing abstractedly between the command deck's floor and ceiling. Ravna had never seen him so absorbed, so intense. However fraudulent his memories of trading days, he truly thought he could make a difference, and he may be right. Fan came down from the ceiling, pulled close to the screen. It looked like serious bargaining was about to begin. The scrode riders had already had arrived in a spherical room, perhaps fifty meters across. Apparently they were floating near the center of it. The forest grew inward from all directions, and the riders seemed to float just a few meters from the treetops. Here and there between the branches they could see the ground a mosaic of flowers. St. Rindell's sails creatures were scattered all about the tallest trees. They sat with their ivory limbs twined about the treetops. Tusk-like races were a common thing in the galaxy, but these were the first Ravna had known. The body plan was totally unlike anything from home, and even now she didn't have a clear idea of their appearance. Sitting in the trees, their legs had more of the aspect of, ske of a skeletal fingers grasping around the trunk. Their chief rep, who claimed to be St. Rindell himself, had scrimshaw covering two-thirds of its ivory. Two of the windows showed the carving close-up. Fam seemed to think that understanding the artwork might be useful. Progress was slow. Trisquillin was the common language, but good interpreting devices didn't work this deep in the beyond, and St. Rindell's folk were, the only mar were only marginally familiar with the trade talk. Ravna used, was used to clean translation. Even the net messages she dealt with were usually intelligible, though sometimes misleadingly so. They'd been talking for twenty minutes, and had only just established that St. Rindell might have the ability to repair OOB. It was the usual riderly driftiness, and something more. The tedium seemed to please Pham Nguyen. Rav, this is almost like a Chang Ho operation, face to face with critters in scarcely a common language. We sent them a description of a repair problem hours ago. Why should it take so long for a simple yes or no? Because they're haggling, said Pham, his grin broadening. Honest St. Riddle here. He waved at the scrimshawed local, wants to convince us just how hard the job is. Lord, I wish I was out there. Even Blue Shell and Greenstalk seemed a little strange now. Their Triskelin was stripped down, barely more complex than St. Rindell's, and much of the discussion seemed very roundabout. Working for Vrindimi, Ravna had had some experience with sales and trading, but haggling? You had your pricing databases and strategy support, and directions from Grander's people. You either had a deal or you didn't. What was going on between the riders and St. Rindell was one of the more alien things Ravna had ever seen. Actually, things are going pretty well, I think. You saw when we arrived, the bone legs took away Blue Shell's samples. But now they know precisely what we have. There's something in those samples they want. Yeah? Sure. St. Rindell isn't bad-mouthing our stuff for his health. Damn it, it's possible we don't have anything on board they could want. This was never intended to be a trade expedition. Blue Shell and Greenstock had scavenged product samples from the ship's supplies, things that the OOB could survive without. These included sensoria and some low beyond computer gear. Some of that would be a serious loss, but one way or another, we need those repairs. Fam chuckled. No, there's something there St. Rindell wants. Otherwise he wouldn't still be jawing. And to see how he keeps needling us about his other customers' needs, St. Rindell is a human kind of guy. Something like a human song came over the link to the riders. 
Ravna phased Greenstock's cameras toward the sound. From the forest floor on the far side of Blue Shell, three new creatures had appeared. Why, they're beautiful. Butterflies, said Ravna. Huh? I mean, they look like butterflies, you know? Um, insects with large colored wings. Giant butterflies, actually. The newcomers had a generally humanoid body plan. They were about 150 centimeters tall and covered with a soft-looking brown fur. Their wings sprouted from behind their shoulder blades. At full spread, they were almost two meters across, soft blues and yellows, some more intricately patterned than others. Surely they were artificial, or a gengineered affectation. They would have been useless for flying about in any reasonable gravity, but here in zero-g, the three floated at the entrance for just a moment, their huge soft eyes looking at the riders. Then they swept their wings in measured sweeps and drifted gracefully into the air above the forest. The entire effect was something out of a children's video. They had pert button noses, like pet joracorns, and eyes as wide and bashful as any human animator ever drew. Their voices sounded like youngsters singing. St. Rindel and his buddies sidled around their treetops. The tallest visitor sang on, its wings gently flexing. After a moment, Ravna realized it was speaking fluent Trisk, with a front end adapted to the creature's natural speech. St. Rindel, greetings. Our ships are ready for your repairs. We have made fair payment, and we are in a great hurry. Your work must begin at once. St. Rindel's Trisk specialist translated the speech for his boss. Ravna leaned across Fam's back. So maybe our friendly repairman really is overbooked, she said. Yeah. St. Rindel came back around his treetop. His little arms picked at the green needles and as he made a reply. Honored customers, you made offer of payment, not fully accepted. What you ask is in short supply, difficult to do. The cuddly butterfly made a squeaking noise that might have passed for joyous laughter in a human child. The sense behind its singing was different. Times are changing, Rindel creature. Your people must learn. We are. We will not be stymied. You know my fleet's sacred mission. We count every passing hour against you. Think on the fleet you will face. Uh, if your lack of cooperation is ever known, is ever even suspected. There was a sweep of blue and yellow wings, and the butterfly turned. Its dark, bashful eyes rested on the riders. And these potted plants, they are customers? Dismiss them. Till we are gone, you have no other customers. Ravna sucked in a breath. The three had no visible weapons, but she was suddenly afraid for Blue Shell and Greenstock. Well, what do you know, Fam said. Butterflies in jackboots. Chapter 27 According to the clock, it took less than half an hour for the scrolled riders to make it back. It seemed a lot longer to Fam Nguyen, even though he tried to keep up a casual front with Ravna. Maybe they were both keeping up a front. He knew she still considered him a fragile case. But the rider's cameras showed no more signs of the killer butterflies. Finally, the cargo lock cracked open, and Blue Shell and Greenstock were back. I was sure the wily tusk legs were just pretending there was a strong demand, said Blue Shell. He seemed as eager to rehash the story as Fam was. Yeah, I thought so too. In fact, I still think those butterflies might just be part of an act. It's all too melodramatic. Blue Shell's fronds rattled in a way that Fam recognized as a kind of shiver. I wager not, Sir Fam. Those were aprahanti. Just the look on them fills you with dread, does it not? They're rare these days, but a star trader knows the stories. Still, this is a little much even for the aprahanti. Their, he hegem their hegemony has been on the wane for several centuries. He rattled something at the ship, and the windows were filled with the views of nearby berths in the repair harbor. There was more rider rattling, this time between Greenstock and Blue Shell. Those other ships are a uniform type, you know. A high beyond design like ours, but more, um, militant. Greenstock moved close to a window. There are twenty of them. Why would so many need drive repairs all at once? Militant? Fam looked at the ships with a critical eye. He knew the major features of Beyonder vessels by now. These appeared to have a rather, la rather large cargo capacity. Elaborate sensoria, too. Hmm. Okay, so the butterflies are hard types. How scared is St. Rindel and company? The scrode riders were silent for a long moment. 
Fan couldn't tell if his question was being given serious consideration or if they had simultaneously tra lost track of the conversation. He looked at Ravna. How about the local net? I'd like to get some background. She was already running comm routines. They weren't accessible earlier. We couldn't even get the news. That was something Fan could understand, even if it was damned irritating. The local net was a RIP-wide ultra-wave computer and communication network, perhaps a billion times more complex than anything FAM had known, but conceptually similar to organizations in the slow zone. And FAM knew and had seen what vandals could do to such structures. Cheng Ho had dealt with some, at least one obnoxious civilization by perverting its computer net. Not surprisingly, St. Rindell hadn't provided them with links to the RIP net and as long as they were in harbor, the OOB's antenna swarm was necessarily down, so they were also cut off from the known net and the news groups. A grin lit Ravna's face. Hey, now we've got read access, maybe more. Greenstock, Blue Shell, wake up. Rattle. I wasn't asleep, claimed Blue Shell, just thinking on Sir Fam's question. St. Rindell is obviously afraid. As usual, Greenstock didn't make excuses. She rolled around her mate to get a better look at Ravna's newly opened comm window. There was an iterated triangle design with Trisk annotations. It meant nothing to Fam. That's interesting, said Greenstock. I am chuckling, said Blue Shell. It is more than interesting. St. Rindell is a hard trading type. But look, he is making no charge for this service, not even a percentage of barter. He is afraid, but he still wants to deal with us. Hmm, so something from their high beyond samples was enough to make him risk afferenti violent apra hanti violence. Just hope it's not something we really need to. Okay, Rav, see if just a second, the woman replied. I want to check the news. She started a search program. Her eyes flickered quickly across her console window, and after a second she choked, and her face paled. By the powers, no. What is it? But Ravna didn't reply, or put the news to a main window. Fam grabbed the rail in front of her console and pulled himself around so he could see what she was reading. Crypto, zero, as received by Harmonious Repose Communication Synod. Language path, Baylor-esque, Trisquiline, SJK units. From Alliance for the Defense, claimed cooperative of five polyspecific empires in the beyond below Stromly Realm. No record of existence before the fall of the realm. Subject. Bold victory over the perversion. Distribution. Threat of the blight. War Tracker's interest group. Homo sapiens interest group. Date. 159.06 days since fall of relay. Key phrases. Action, not talk. A promising beginning. Text of message. 100 seconds ago, Alliance forces began action against the tools of the blight. By the time you read this, the Homo sapiens worlds known as Sandra Kai will have been destroyed. Note well, for all the talk and theories that have flown about the Blight, this is the first time anyone has successfully acted. Sandra Kai was one of only three systems outside of the Stromly realm known to harbor humans in any numbers. In one stroke, we have destroyed a third of the perversion's potential for expansion. Updates will follow. Death to vermin. There was one other message in the window, an update of sorts but not from death to vermin. Crypto, zero. Billing, charity slash general interest, as received by Harmonious Repose, Communication Synod, Language Path, Sam Norsk, Trisquiline, SJK Units. From Commercial Security, Sandra Kai. Note from the lower protocol layer. This message was received at Sneerot Down during the Sandra Kai, along the Sandra Kai bearing. The transmission was very weak, perhaps from a shipboard transmitter. Subject, please help. Distribution, threats interest group. Date, 5.33 hours since disaster at Sandra Kai. Text of message. Earlier today, relativistic projectiles struck our main habitations. Facilities cannot be less than 25 billion. Three billion may still live in transit and in smaller habitats. We are still under attack. Enemy craft are in the inner system. We see glow bombs. They are killing everyone. Please, we need help. Nay, nay, nay. Ravna drove up against him, her arms tight around him, her face buried in his shoulder. She sobbed incoherent Sam Norsk. Her whole body shuddered against him. He felt tears coming to his own eyes. So strange. She had been the strong one, 
and he the fragile crazy. Now it was turned all around, and what could he do? Father, mother, sister, gone, gone. It was the disaster they thought could not happen, and now it had. In one minute, she had lost everything she grew up with, and was suddenly alone in the universe. For me, that happened not long ago. The thought came strangely, strangely dispassionate. He hooked the foot into the deck and gently rocked Ravna back and forth, trying to comfort her. The sounds of grief, grief gradually quieted, though he could still feel her sobs through his chest. She didn't raise her face from the tear-soaked place on his shirt. Fam looked over her head at Blue Shell and Greenstalk. Their fronds looked strange, almost wilted. Look, I want to take Ravna away for a bit. Learn what you can, and I'll be back. Yes, Sir Fam, and they seemed to, do to droop even more. It was an hour before Fam returned to the command deck. When he did, he found the riders deep in rattling conference with OOB. All the windows were filled with flickering strangeness. Here and there, Fam recognized a pattern or a printed legend, enough to guess that he was seeing ordinary ship displays, but optimized to rider senses. Blue Shell noticed him first. He rolled abruptly toward him, and his voter voice came out a little squeaky. Is she all right? Fam gave a little nod. She's sleeping now, sedated, and with the ship watching her in case I've misjudged her. Look, she'll be okay. She's been hit hard, but she's the toughest one of us all. Greenstock's frond rattled his smile. I have often thought that. Blue Shell was mo motionless for an instant. Then, well, to business, to business, he said. Something to the ship. And the windows reformatted in the compromise usable by both humans and riders. We've learned a lot while you were gone. St. Rindell indeed has something to fear. The Aprahanti ships are a small fragment of the death to vermin extermination fleets. These are stragglers on their way to Sandrakai. All dressed up for a massacre and no place to go. So now they want some of the action for their own. Yes, apparently Sandra Kai put up some resistance and there were some escapes. The commander of this fleetlet thinks he can intercept some of these, if he can get prompt repairs. What kind of extortion is really possible? Could these twenty ships destroy R.I.P.? No, it's the reputation of the greater force these ships are part of, and the great killing at Sandra Kai. So St. Rindell is very timid with them, and what they need for repairs is the same class of regrowth agent that we need. We really are in competition with them for Rindell's business. Blue Shell's fronds slapped together, the sort of go get em enthusiasm he displayed when a hot deal was remembered. But it turns out we have something St. Rindell really, really wants, S something he'll even risk tricking the ap Aprahanti to get. He paused dramatically. Fan thought back over the things they had offered the RIPers. Lord, not the low zone ultrawave gear. Okay, I'll bite. What do we have to give to him? A set of flamed trellises. Ha <laughs> ha. Huh? Fam remembered the name from the list of odds and ends the scrode riders had scrounged up. What's a flame, flamed trellis? Blue Shell poked a frond into his satchel and extended something stubby and black to Fam. An irregular solid, about 40 centimeters by 15, smooth to the touch. For all its size, it, it didn't mass more than a couple of grams. An artfully smoothed cinder. Fam's curiosity triumphed over greater concerns. But what's it good for? Blue Shell dithered. After a moment, Greenstock said a little shyly, There are theories. It's pure carbon, a fractal polymer. We know it's very common in transcendent cargoes. We think it's used as packing material for some kinds of sentient property. Or perhaps the excrement of such property, Blue Shell buzz muttered. Ah, but that's not important. What is, is the occasional... That occasional races in the middle beyond prize them. And why that? Again, we don't know. St. Rindell's folk are certainly not the final user. The tusk legs are far too sensible to be ordinary trellis customers. So, we have three hundred of these wonderful things, more than enough to overcome St. Rindell's fears of the Abrahanti. While Fam had been away with Ravna, St. Rindell had come up with a plan. Applying the regrowth agent would be too obvious in the same harbor with the Aprahanti ships. Besides, the chief butterfly had demanded the OOB move out. St. Rindell had a small harbor about 16 million clicks from the R around the RIP system. The move was even plausible, for it happened that there was a scrode rider terrain in the harmonious repose system, and currently it was just a few hundred kilometers from Rindell's second harbor. 
They would rendezvous with the tusk legs, exchanging repairs for 217 flamed trellises. And if the trellises were perfectly matched, Rindell promised to throw in an agrav wreath it. After the fall of Relay, that would be very welcome. Huh. Old Blue Shell just never stopped wheeling and dealing. The OOB slipped free of its moorings and carefully drifted up from the ring plane, tiptoeing out. Fam kept a close watch on the EM and ultrawave windows, but there was no target locking emanations from the Aprahanti vessels, nothing more than casual radar contact. No one followed. Little OOB and its potted plants were beneath the notice of the great warriors. One thousand meters above the ring plane, three, the Scrode Riders chatter, both with Fam and between themselves, dwindled to naught. Their stalks and fronds angled so that the sensing surfaces looked out in all directions. The sun and its power cloud was a blaze of light on one side of the deck. They were above the rings, but still so close. It was like standing at sunset on a beach of colored sands that stretched to an infinite horizon. The Scrode Riders stared into it, their fronds gently swaying. Twenty kilometers above the rings, one thousand, they lit the OOB's main torch and accelerated towards the system. The Scrode Riders came slowly out of their trance. Once they arrived at the second harbor, the regrowth would take about five hours, assuming Rindell's agent had not deteriorated. The saint claimed it was recently imported from the top and undiluted. Okay, when do we deliver the tre trellises? On completion of the repairs, we can't depart until Saint Rindell or his customers are satisfied that all the pieces are genuine. Fam drummed his fingers on the comm console. This operation brought back a lot of memories, some of them higher raising. So they got the goods while we're still in the middle of our IP. I don't like it. See here, Sir Fam. Your experience with star trading was in the slow zone, where exchanges were separated by decades or centuries of travel time. I admire you for that, more than I can say, but it gives you a twisted view of things. Up here in the beyond, the notion of return business is important. We know very little of St. Rindell's inner motivation, but we do know his repair business has existed for at least forty years. Sharp dealing we can expect from him, but if he robbed or murdered very many, trader groups would know, and his little business would starve. Hmph. <laughs> no point in arguing with it right now. But Fam guessed that his situation was special. This situation was special. Rindell, and the RIPers in general, had death to vermin sitting on their doorstep, and stories of major chaos coming from the direction of Sandra Kai. With that background, they might just lose their courage once they had the trellises. Some precautions were in order. He drifted off the ship, off to the ship's machine's shop. Chapter 28 Ravna came to the cargo deck as Blue Shell and Greenstock were preparing the trellises for delivery. She moved hesitantly, pushing awkwardly from point to point. There were dark rings, almost bruises, beneath her eyes. She returned Fam's hug almost tentatively, but didn't let go. I want to help. Is there anything I can do to help? The Scrode Riders left their trellises and rolled over. Blue Shell ran a frond gently across Ravna's arm. Nothing for you to do now, my lady Ravna. We have everything well, uh, in hand. We'll be back in less than an hour, and then we can be rid of here. But they let her check their cameras and cargo strap downs. Fam drifted close by her as she inspected the trellises. The twisted carbon blocks looked stranger than the one alone had. Properly stacked, they fit perfectly. More than a meter across, the stack looked like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle carved from coal. Counting a separate bag of loose spares, they totaled less than half a kilogram. Huh. Damn things should be flammable as hell. Fam resolved to <clears throat> play with the remaining odd trellises after they were safely back in deep space. Then the Scrode Riders were through the cargo lock with their delivery, and they could only follow along on their cameras. This secondary harbor was not really part of the tusk legs race tusk tusk leg races terrain the inside of the air arc was far different from what they had seen on the scrode rider's first trip there were no exterior views cramped passages wound between irregular walls pocked with dark holes insects flew everywhere often covering parts of the camera balls to fam the place looked filthy there was no evidence of the terrain's owners, unless they were the pallid worms that sometimes stuck a featureless head up from the burrow hole. Over his voice link, Blue Shell opined that these were very ancient tenants of the R.I.P. system. After a million years, and a hundred transcendent emigrations, 
The residue might still be sentient, but stranger than anything evolved in the slow zone. Such a people would be protected from the physical extinction by ancient automation, but they would also be inward turning, totally cautious, absorbed in concerns that were inane by any outside standard. It was the type that most often lusted after trellis work. Pham tried to keep an eye on everything. The riders had to travel almost four kilometers from the harbor lock to each plane, to, or to reach the place where the trellises would be validated. Pham counted two exterior locks along the way, and nothing that looked especially threatening. But then, how, he, how would he know what threatening looked like here? He had the OOB mountain exterior watch. The lar a large shepherd satellite floated on the outer side of the ring, but there were no ships out, other ships in this harbor. The EM and ultra environment seemed placid, and what could be seen on the local net did not make the ship's defenses suspicious. Pham looked up from the reports. Ravna had drifted across the deck to the outside view. The repair work was visible, though not spectacular. A pale greenish aura hung around the damaged spines. It was scarcely brighter than the glow you often see on ship hulls in low planetary orbit. She turned and said softly, Is it really getting fixed? As far as we can... I mean, yes. Ship's automation was monitoring the regrowth, but they wouldn't know for sure till they tried to fly with it. Fam was never sure why Rendell had the Scrod Riders pass through the Wormhead's terrain. Maybe, if the creatures were the ultimate trellis users, they wanted to look at the stellars. Sellers. Or maybe it had some connection with the treachery that ultimately followed. In any case, the riders were soon out of it, and into a polyspecific concourse, as crowded as any low-tech bazaar. Pham's jaw sagged. Everywhere he looked, there was a different class of savant. Intelligent life, life is a rare development in the universe. In all his life in the slow zone, he had only known three human races, or three non-human races. But the universe is a big place, and with Ultra Drive, it was easy to find another life. The beyond collected the detri detritus of countless migrations, an accumulation that finally made civilization ubiquitous. For a moment, he lost track of his surveillance programs and his general sus suspicions, drowned in the wonder of it. Ten species, twelve, individuals brushed familiar familiarly by one another. Even Relay had not been like this. But then harmonious repose was a civilization lost in stagnation. These races had been part of the R.I.P. complex for thousands of years. The ones that could interact had long since learned to do so. And nowhere did he see butterfly wings on creatures with large, compassionate eyes. He heard a small sound of surprise from the far side of the deck. Ravna was standing close by a window that looked out from one of Greenstalk's side cameras. What is it, Rav? Scrode riders, see? She pointed into the mob and zoomed the view. For a moment, the images towered over her. Through the passing chaos, he had a glimpse of whole forms and graceful fawns. Fronds. Except for cosmetic stripes and tassels, they looked very familiar indeed. Yeah, there's a small colony of them hereabouts. He opened the channel to Greenstock and told her about the sighting. I know. We smelled them. Sigh. I wish we had time to visit them after this. Finding friends in far places? Always nice. She helped Blue Shell push the trellises around a blue balloon aquarium. They could see Rindel's people just ahead. Six tux tusk legs sat on the wall around what might be test equipment. Blue Shell and Greenstock pushed their ball of frothy carbon into the group. The scrimshod one leaned close to the pile and reached out to fondle the pieces with its tiny arms. One after another, the trellises were placed in the tester. Blue Shell moved in close to watch and Pham set the main windows to look through his cameras. Twenty seconds passed. Rindel's Trisk interpreter said, First seven test true. Make an interlocked septet. Only then did Pham realize he had been holding his breath. The next three septets pa passed too. Another sixty seconds. He glanced at the ship's repair status. OOB considered the job done, but for sign-off commit uh, to the local net, from the local net. Another few minutes and we can kiss this place goodbye. But there are always problems. St. Rindell bitched about the twelfth and fifteenth sets. Blue Shell argued at length, grudgingly produced replacement pieces from his bag of spares. Pham couldn't tell if the Scrode Rider was debating for the fun of it, or if he really was short on good replacements. Twenty-five sets okayed. 
Where is Greenstock going? said Ravna. What? Fam, Fam called up the view from Greenstock's cameras. She was five meters from Blue Shell and moving away. He panned wildly about. A local scrode rider was on her left and another floated inverted above her. Its fronts touched hers in an apparently amiable conversation. Greenstock? There was no reply. Blue Shell, what's happening? But that rider was in gesticulating argument with the tusk legs. Still another set of trellises had failed their examination. Blue Shell. After a moment, the rider's voice came over their private channel. He sounded drifty, the way he often did when he was jammed or overloaded. Not to bother me now, Sir Fan. I'm down to three perfect replacements. I must persuade these fellows to settle for what they already have. Ravna broke in. But what about Greenstock? What's happening to her? The cameras have lost sight of each other. Greenstock and her companions emerged from a dense crowd and floated across the middle of the concourse. They were using gas jets instead of wheels. Someone was in a hurry. The seriousness of events finally got through to Blue Shell. The view from his scrode turned wildly as he rolled back and forth around St. Rindell's people. There was the rattle of rider talk, and then his voice came back on the inside channel, plaintive and confused. She's gone. She's gone. I must. I have to. Abruptly, he rolled back to the tusk legs and resumed the argument that had just been interrupted. After a couple of seconds, his voice came back on the inside channel. What should I do, Sir Fan? I have a sail here still incomplete, yet my green stock has wandered off. Or been kidnapped. Get us the sail, Blue Shell. Green stock will be okay. OOB. Plan B. He grabbed the headset and pushed off from the console. Ravna rose with him. Where are you going? He grinned. Out. I thought St. Rindell might lose his halo when the crunch came, and I made plans. She followed him as he glided towards the floor hatch. Look, I want you to stay on deck. I can only carry so much snoop equipment. I'll need your coordination. But... He went through the hatch head first, missing the rest of her objection. She didn't follow, but a second later her voice was back, in his headset. Some of the tremor was gone from her voice. The old Ravna was there, fighting out from under her other problems. Okay. I'll back you, but what can we do? Fan pulled himself hand over hand down the passageway, accelerating to a speed that would have left a lubber caroming off the walls. Ahead loomed the uncompromising wall of the cargo lock. He swatted a hand gently at the wall and flipped head over heels. He dragged his hands precisely against the wall flanges, slowing just enough so that the impact with the hatch did not break his ankles. Inside the lock, the ship had his suit already power up. Fan, you can't go out. Evidently, she was watching through the lock's cameras. They'll know we're a human expedition. His head and shoulders were already in the suit's top shell. He felt the bottom pushing up around him, the seals fastening. Not necessarily. And by now, it probably doesn't matter. There are plenty of two arms slash two leg critters around, and I've glued some camouflage to this outfit. He cupped his chin in the helmet controls and reset the displays. The armored pressure suit was a very primitive thing compared to the field suits of Relay, yet the Cheng Ho would have given a starship for this gear. He'd originally put the thing together to impress the Tynes, but it's going to get some early testing. He chinned up the outside view. What Ravna was seeing. His figure was unrelieved black, more than two meters tall. The hands were back at, backed with carapace claws, and every edge of his figure was razor-sharp razor and spined. These most recent additions should break the lines of this strictly human form, and hopefully be intimidating as hell. Fam cycled the lock and pushed off, into the wormhead's terrain. Walls of mud stood all around, misty and humid air and swarms of insects. Revna's voice was in his ear. I've got a low-level query, probably automatic. Why you send... Why you send a third negotiator? Sorry, that's uh, the garbage man outside. Ignore it. Fam, be careful. These middle beyond cultures, the old ones, they keep nasty things in reserve. Otherwise, they wouldn't still be around. I'll be a good citizen, as long as I'm treated nice. He was already halfway to the concourse gate. He chinned up a small window from Blue Shell's camera. All this high bandwidth calm was courtesy of the local net. Strange that Rindel was still providing the service. Blue Shell seemed to be negotiating still. Maybe there wasn't a scam. Or anyway, not one that St. Rindel was in on. Fam, I've lost the video from Greenstock. 
Just as she went into some kind of tunnel, her location beacon is still clear. The concourse gate made an opening for him, and then Fan was in the crowded market volume. He heard the ra raucous hubbub even through his armor. He moved slowly, sticking to the most uncrowded paths, following guide ropes that threaded the space. The mob was no problem. Everyone made way, some with almost panicky haste. Fam didn't know whether it was his razor spines or the trace of chlorine in his suit leaked. Maybe that last touch was a bit much, but the whole point was to look non-human. He slowed even more, doing his best not to nick anyone. Something awfully like a target destination laser flickered in his rear window. He ducked quickly around an aquarium as Ravna said, The terrain just com complained to your suit. You are in violation of dress code, is how the translation comes out. Is it my chlorine BO, or have they detected my guns? What about the outside? Any butterflies in sight? No. Ship activity hasn't changed much during the last five hours. No Aprahanti movement, or change in comm status. Long pause. Indirectly from the OOB bridge, he could hear Blue Shell talking with Ravna, the words indistinct but excited. He jabbed around, trying to find the direct connection. Then Ravna was talking to him again. Hey, Blue Shell says Rindel has accepted the shipment. He's unloading the Agrav fabric right now, and OOB just got a commit on the repairs. So they were ready to fly, except that three of them were still ashore, and one of them was missing. Fan floated over the top of the aquarium and finally caught direct sight of Blue Shell. He tweaked the suit's gas jets very carefully and settled down beside the rider. His arrival was about as welcome as finger mites at a picnic. The scrimshod one had been chattering away, tapping his articulated network on the wall as his helper translated into Trisk. Now the creature drew in his tusks, and the neck arms folded themselves. The others followed suit. All of them sidled up the wall, away from Blue Shell and Fam. Our business is now complete. We don't know where your friend has gone, said the Trisk interpreter. Blue Shell's fronds extended after them, wavering. But, but just a little guidance is all we need. Who... It was no use. St. Rindel and his merry crew kept going. Blue Shell rattled in abrupt frustration. His fronds angled slightly, turning all attention on Fam Nguyen. Sir Fam, I am doubting now your expertise as a traitor. St. Rindel might have helped. Maybe. Fam watched the tux tusk legs disappear into the crowd, pulling the trellises behind them like a big black balloon. Ugh, maybe Rindel was simply an honest traitor. What are the chances that Greenstock would abandon you in the middle of something like that? Blue Shell dithered for a moment. In an ordinary trade stop, she might have noticed some extraordinary profit opportunity, but here I... Ravna's voice interrupted sympathetically. Maybe she just, uh, forgot the context? No, Blue Shell was definite. The Scrode would never permit such a failure, not in the middle of a hard trade. Fam shifted windows around inside a helmet looking in all directions. The crowd was still keeping an open space around them. There was no evidence of cops. Would I know if I saw them? Okay, said Fam. We have a problem. Whether I'd come out or not. I suggest we take a little walk. See if we can find where Greenstock went. Rattle. We have a little choice now. We have little choice now. My lady Ravna, do please try to reach the Tusk Legs interpreter. Perhaps he can link us to the local Scroad Riders. He came off the wall, rotated on gas jets. Come along, Sir Finn. Blue Shell led the way across the concourse, vaguely in the direction Greenstock had gone. Their path was anything but straight, more a drunkard's walk that once took them almost back to their starting place. Delicately, delicately, the Scrode Rider responded when Finn complained about the pace. The Rider never insisted on passage through clots of critters. If they did not respond to the gentle waving of his fronds, he detoured all around them, and he kept Fam directly behind him so the intimidation factor of the razored armor was of no use. These people may look very peaceable to you, Sir Fam, easy to push around, but note, this is among themselves. These races have had thousands of years to accommodate to one another, to achieve local commensality. To outsiders they will necessarily be less tolerant, else they would have been overrun, overrun long ago. Fam remembered the dress code warning and decided not to argue. The next twenty minutes would have been the experience of a lifetime for a Cheng Ho trader to be within arm's reach of a dozen different intelligent species, but when they finally reached the far wall, Fam was grinding his teeth. Twice more he received a dress code warning, the only bright spot, 
St. Rindel was extending the courtesy of local net support, and Ravna had more information. The local Scrodrider colony is about a hundred kilometers from the concourse. There's some kind of transport station beyond the wall you're at. And the tunnel Greenstock had entered was just ahead of them. From this angle, they could see the dark of space beyond it. For the first time, there was no problem with crowds. Scarcely anyone was entering or leaving the hole. Laser light twinkled on his rear windows. Dress code violation. Fourth warning, it says. Please leave the volume at once. We're going. We're going. Darkness. And Pham boosted the gain on his helmet windows. At first he thought the transport station was open to space, that the locals had restraint fields as in the high beyond. Then he noticed the pillars merged into transparent walls. They were still indoors in the old-fashioned way, but the view... They were on the starward side of, side of the arc. The ring particles were like dark fish floating silently a few tens of meters out from him. In the further distance, structures stuck out of the ring plane far enough to get sun dazzle. But the brightest object was almost overhead, the blue of ocean, the white of cloud. Its soft light flooded the ground around him. However far the Cheng Ho fared, such a sight had been welcome. Yet this was not quite the real thing. This was only approximately spherical, and its face was bisected by the ring shadow. It was a small object, not more than a few hundred clicks above them, one of the shepherd satellites they had seen on the way in. The shepherd's haze of atmosphere was crisply bounded by the sides of a vast canopy. He dragged his attention down from the view. Ten to one, that's the scrode rider's terrain. Of course, Blue Shell replied. It's typical. The surf in such mini-gravity can never be what I prefer, but... Dear Blue Shell, Sir Fam, over here. It was Greenstock's voice. According to Fam's suit, it was a local connection, not relayed through the OOB. Blue Shell's fronds angled in all directions. Are you all right, Greenstock? They rattled back and forth at each other for a few seconds. Then Greenstock resumed in Trisk. Sir Fam, yes, I'm all right. I'm sorry to upset you all so much, but I could tell the deal with Rindell was going to work out, and then these local riders stopped by. They're wonderful people, Sir Fam. They invited us across to their terrain. Just for a day or so, it will be a wonderful rest before we go on our way, and I think they may be able to help us. Like the quest romances he'd found in Ravna's bedtime library, the weary travelers part way to their goal, find a friendly haven and some special gift. Fam switched to a private line to Blue Shell. Is that really Greenstock? Is she under duress? It's her, and free, Sir Fam. You heard us speaking. I've been with her two hundred years. No one's twisting her fronds. Then why the hell did she skip out on us? Fam surprised himself, almost hissing the words. Long pause. That is strange. My guess? These local writers somehow know something very important to us. Come, Sir Fam, but carefully. He rolled away in what seemed a random direction. Rav, what do you... Fam noticed the red light blinking, blinking on his calm status panel, and his irritation chilled. How long had the link to Ravna been down? Fam followed Blue Shell, floating low behind the other, using his gas jets to pace the scrode rider. This entire area was covered with the stickum that riders liked for zero-g rolling, yet right now the place seemed deserted. Nobody in sight were just a hundred meters away there was light and crowds. The whole scene, thing screamed ambush, yet it didn't make sense. If death to vermin, or their stooges, had spotted them, a simple alarm would have served. Some Rindel game? Fam powered up the suit's beam weapons and enabled countermeasures. Midge cameras fitted off in all directions. So much for dress codes. The bluish moonlight washed the plane, showing soft mounds and angular arrays of unknown equipment. The surface was pocked with holes, tunnel entrances. Blue Shell said something muddled about the beautiful night, how much fun it would be to sit on the seashore of a hundred kilometers above them. Fam scanned in all directions, trying to identify fields of fire and killing zones. The view from one of the midges showed a forest of leafless fronds, scrode riders standing silent in the moonlight. They were two hillocks away, silent, motionless, without any lights, perhaps just enjoying the moonlight. In the midge's amplified view, Fam had no trouble identifying Greenstock. She was just standing she was standing at one end of a line of five riders, her whole stripes clearly visible. There was a hump on the front of her scrode, and a rod like projection. Some kind of restraint? He floated a couple of midges near. A weapon, 
all those riders were armed. We're already aboard the transport, Blue Shell, came Greenstock's voice. You'll see it in a few more meters, just on the other side of the ventilator pile, apparently referring to the mound that he and the scrode rider were approaching. But Pham knew that there was no flyer there. Greenstock and her guns were to the side of her their progress. Treachery, very workmanlike, but also very low-tech. Pham almost shouted out to Blue Shell. Then he noticed that the flat ceramic re rectangle mounted in the hill just a few meters behind the rider. The nearest midge reported it was some kind of explosive, probably a directional mine. A low-resolution camera, barely more than a motion sensor, was mounted behind beside it. Blue Shell had rolled nonchalantly past the thing, all while ch with chattering with green stock. They let him past. New suspicions rose, dark and grim. Pham broke to a stop, backing quickly, never touching ground. The only sounds he made were the quiet hisses of his gas jets. He detached one of his wrist claws and had a midge fly it close past the mine sensor. There was a flash of pale fire and a loud noise. Even five meters to the side, the shockwave pushed him back. He had a glimpse of blue shell thrown frond over wheels on the far side of the mine. Edged metal nickered about, but mindlessly. Nothing came back to attack again. Several midges were destroyed by the blast. Fan took advantage of the racket to accelerate hard, scooting up a nearby hill and into a shallow valley, alley, that looked down on the scrode riders. The ambushers rolled forward around the hill, rattling happily at one another. Fan held his fire, curious. After a moment, Blue Shell floated into the air a hundred meters away. Fam, he said, planetively. Fam. The ambushers ignored Blue Shell. Three of them disappeared around the hill. Fam's midges saw them stop in cons consternation. Franz erect. They had suddenly realized he'd gotten away. The five spread out, searching the area, hunting him down. There was no persuasive talk from Greenstock anymore. There was a sharp cracking sound and blaster fire glowed from beneath, behind a hill. Somebody was a little nervous on the trigger. Above it all floated Blue Shell, the perfect target, yet still untouched. His speech was a combination of Trisk and Ryder Rattle now, and where Fam could understand it, he heard fear. Why are you shooting? What is the problem? Greenstock, please! The paranoid in Fam Nguyen was not deceived. I don't want you up there looking down. He sighted his main bean gun on the rider, then shifted his aim and fired. The blast was not invisible wavelengths, but there were gigajoules in the pulse. Plasma coruscated along the beam, missing blue shell by less than five meters. Well above the scrode rider, the beam struck whole crystal. The explosion was spectacular, an ascentic glare that sent flowing fragments in the th a thousand rays. Fam flew sideways even as the ceiling flared. He saw Blue Shell spinning off, regain control, and move precipitously for cover. Where Fam's beam had hit, a corona of light was dimming from blue through orange and red, its light still brighter than the shepherd moon overhead. His warning shot had been like a great finger pointing back toward his location. In the next fifteen seconds, four of the ambushers fired on the place Fam had been. There was silence, then faint rustling. In a game of self, the five might think themselves easy winners. They hadn't. They still hadn't realized how well equipped he was. Fam smiled at the pictures coming in from his midges. He had every one of them in sight, and Blue Shell too. If it were just these four, five, there would be no problem. But surely reinforcements, or at least complications, were on the way. The wound in the ceiling had cooled to darkness, but there was a hole there, there now, half a meter across. The sound of hissing wind came from it, a sound that brought reflex fear to Fam even his armor. It might take a while before the leak affected the scrode riders, but it was an emergency nonetheless. It would attract notice. He stared at the hole. Down here it was stirring a breeze, but in the few meters right below the hole, there was a miniature tornado of dust and loose junk, hurtling up and about. And beyond the transparent hole in space, a gap of dark and then a glittering plume where the debris emerged from the arc's shadow into the sunlight. A neat idea struggled for his attention. Oops, the five riders had roughly encircled him. Now one blundered into view, saw him, and snapped a shot. Fam returned fire and the other exploded in a cloud of superheated water and charred flesh. Its undamaged scrode sailed across the space between the hills, collecting panicky fire from the others. Fam changed position again moving in the direction he knew was farthest from his enemy's positions. 
A few more minutes of peace. He looked up at the crystal plume. There was something, yes. If reinforcements should come, why not for him? He sighted on the plume and shunted his voice line through the gun's trigger circuit. He almost started talking, then thought, better lower the power on this one. Details. He aimed again, fired continuously, and said, Ravna, I sure as hell, hell hope you have your eyes open. I need help, and briefly described the crazy events of the last ten minutes. This time his beam was putting out less than ten thousand joules per second, not enough to glow the air. But reflecting off the plume beyond the hull, the modulation should be visible for thousands of clicks, in particular to the OOB on the other side of the habitat. The scrode riders were closing in again. Damn, no way he could leave this passage on automatic send. He needed the transmitter for more important things. Fan flew from valley to valley, maneuvering behind the rider that was farthest from the others. One against three, four. He had superior firepower and information, but one piece of bad luck and he was dead. He floated up on his next target, quietly, carefully. A sear of light brushed his arm, flaring the armor incandescent. White hot drops of metal sprayed as he twisted out of the way. He boosted straight across the space between three hillocks, firing down on the rider there. Lights crisscrossed around him, and then he was under cover again. They were fast, almost as if they had automatic aiming gear. Maybe they did. Their scrodes. Then the pain hit. Fan folded on himself, gasping. If this were like wounds he remembered, they would be char to the bone. Tears floated in his eyes and consciousness disappeared in a nauseated faint. He came to. It could only be a second or two later, else he'd never have wakened. The others were a lot closer now, but the one he'd fire on was just a glowing crater and random scrode fragments. His suit's automation brought the damaged armor in close to his side. He felt the chill of local anesthetic, and the pain dimmed. Fam eased around the hill, trying to keep all three of his antagonists simultaneously out of sight. They had caught him they had caught on to his midges. Every few seconds a glow erupted, or a hilltop turned into a glowing slag. It was overkill, but the midges were dying, and he was losing his greatest advantage. Where is Blue Shell? Fam cycled through the views of his remaining midges, then his own. The bastard was back in the air, high above the combat, untouched by his fellow riders. Reporting everything I do. Fam ro rolled over, awkwardly bringing his gun to bear on the tiny figure. He hesitated. You're getting soft, a new wind. Blue Shell abruptly accelerated downwards, his cargo scarf billowing out behind him. Evidently, he was using his gas jet's full power. Against the background noise of bubbling metal and blast beam thunder, his fall was totally silent. He was driving straight for the nearest of the attackers. Thirty meters up, the rider released something large and angular. The two separated, Blue Shell breaking and diving to the side. He disappeared behind the hills. At the same time, much nearer, came a solid thud slash crunch. Fan spent his next last next to last midge for a peek around the hillside. He had a glimpse of a scrode, and Fromm's frond splayed all about a squashed stalk. There was a flash of light, and the midge was gone. Only two ambushes left. One was green stalk. For ten seconds, there was no more firing, yet things were not completely silent. The slumped, glowing metal of his arm popped and sputtered as it cooled. High above, there were the sussers of air escaping the hole. Fitful breezes whispered around ground level, making it impossible to keep position without constant tweaking at his jets. He paused, letting the current carry him silently out of his little valley. There, a ghostly hiss that was not his own. Another. The two were closing in on him, from different directions. They might not know his exact position, but they could obviously coordinate their own. The pain faded in and out, along with consciousness, short pulses of agony and darkness. He dared not fool with more anesthetic. Fam saw frond tips peeping over a nearby hill. He halted, walked the fronds. Most likely, there was just enough vision area in the tips to sense motion. Two seconds passed. Fam's last midge showed the other attacker floating silently in from the side. Any second now, the two would pop up. At that instant, Fam would have given anything for an armed midge. In all his stupid hacking, he'd never gotten around to that. No help for it. He waited for a moment of clear consciousness, long enough to boost over the enemy and shoot. There was a rattle of fronds, loud self-announcement. Fam's midge caught sight of Blue Shell rolling behind slatted walls a hundred meters away. 
The scrode rider rushed from protection to protection, but always closer to Greenstock's position. And the rattling? Was it a pleading? Even after five months with the riders, Pham had only the vaguest sense of their rattle talk. Greenstock, the Greenstock who had always been the shy one, the compulsively honest one, rattled nothing back. She swung her beamer around, raking the slats with fire. The third rider popped up just far enough to shoot at the slats. His angle would have been just right to fry Blue Shell where he stood, except that the movement took him directly in front of Pham Nguyen's gun. Even as Pham fired, he was boosting out of his hole. Now was his only chance, if he could turn, fire back on Greenstock before she was done with Blue Shell. The maneuver was an easy head over heels that should have left him upside down and facing back upon Greenstock, but nothing was easy for him now, and Pham came around spinning too fast, and the landscape dwindling beneath him. But there was Greenstock all right, swinging her weapon back toward him. And there was Blue Shell, racing from between pillars that glowed white in the heat of Greenstock's fire. His voice was loud in Pham's ear. I beg, don't kill her, don't kill. Greenstock hesitated, then turned the weapon back on the advancing Blue Shell. Pham triggered his gun, letting his spin drag the beam across the ground. Consciousness ebbed. Aim, aim right. He furrowed the land below with a glowing molten arrow that ended at something dark and slumped. Blue Shell's tiny figure was still rolling across the wreckage, trying to reach her. Then Pham had turned too far and could not remember how to change the view. The sky swung closely, pa slowly pa past his eyes. A bluish moon with a sharp shadow across its middle. A ship floating close, with feathery spines like some giant bug. What in the Cheng Ho? Where am I? And consciousness fled. Chapter 29 There were dreams. He'd lost a captaincy once again, been busted down to tending potted plants in the ship's greenhouse. Sigh. Pham's job was to water them and make them bloom, but then he noticed the pots had wheels and moved behind his back, waiting, softly rattling. What had been beautiful now was now sinister. Pham had been willing to water and weed the creatures. He had always admired them. Now he was the only one who knew they were the enemy of life. More than once in his life, Pham Nguyen had wakened inside medical automation. He was almost used to coffin close tanks, plain green walls, wires, and tubes. This was different, and it took him a while to realize just where he was. Willowy trees bent close around him, swaying just a little in the warm breeze. He seemed to be lying on the softest moss in a tiny glade above a pond. Summer haze hung in the air above the water. It was all very nice except that the leaves were furry, and not quite the green of anything he had ever seen. This was someone else's notion of home. He reached up towards the nearest branch, and his hand hit something unyielding just fifty centimeters above his face. A curved wall. For all the trick pictures, this was about the same size as the surgeons he remembered. Something clicked behind his head. The idol slid past him, taking its warm breeze with it. Somebody, Ravna, floated just beyond the cylinder. Hi, fam. She reached past the surgeon's hole to squeeze his hand. Her, crisp, her kiss was tremulous, and she looked haunted, as if she'd been crying a lot. Hi, yourself, he said. Memory came back in jagged pieces. He tried to push off the bed and found another similarity between this surgeon and the ones of Chang Ho. He was securely plugged in. Ravna laughed a little weakly. Surgeon, disconnect. After a moment, Pham drifted free. It's still holding my arm. No, that's the sling. Your left arm is going to take a while to regrow. It almost got burned off, Pham. Oh. He looked down at the white cocoon that meshed his arm against his side. He remembered the gunfight now, and realized that parts of his dream were deadly real. How long have I been out? The anxiety spilled into his voice. About thirty hours. We're more than sixty light years out from harmonious repose. We're doing okay, except now everyone in creation seems to be chasing us. The dream. His free hand clamped hard on Ravna's arm. The Scrode Riders, where are they? Not on board, pray the fleet. W what's left of Greenstock is in the other surgeon. Blue Shell is. Why has he let me live? Pham's eyes roved the room. They were in a utility cabin. Any weapons were at least twenty meters away. Hmm. More important than guns. Get command console privileges with the OOB, if it was not already too late. He pushed out of the surgeon and drifted out of the room. Ravna followed. 
Take it easy, fam. You just came out of a surgeon. What have they said about the shootout? Poor Greenstock's not in a position to say anything, fam. Blue Shell says pretty much what you did. Greenstock was grabbed by the rogue riders, forced to lure you two into a trap. Hmm. Hmm. Fam strove for a noncommittal tone. So maybe there was a chance. Maybe Blue Shell was not yet perverted. He continued his one-handed progress up the ship's axis corridor. A minute later, he was on the bridge. Revna tagging behind. Fam, what's the matter? There's a lot we have to decide, but... How right you are. He dived onto the command deck and made for the command console. Ship, do you recognize my voice? Ravna began. Fam, what's this? Yes, sir. All about. Command privileges, he said. Capabilities granted while the riders were ashore. Would they still be in place? Granted. The Scrode Riders had had thirty hours to plan their defense. This was all too easy. Too easy. Suspend command privileges for the Scrode Riders. Isolate them. Yes, sir, came the ship's reply. Liar, but what more could he do? The sweep towards panic crested, and suddenly he felt very cool. He was Cheng Ho, and he was also God Shatter. Both riders were in the same cabin, Greenstock in the other copy of the ship's surgeon. Pham opened a window on the room. Blue Shell sat on a wall beside the surgeon. He looked wilted, as when they heard about Sandra Kai. He angled his fronds at the video pickup. Sir Pham, the ship tells me you've suspended our privileges. What is going on, Pham? Ravna had a dug a foot into a fl- the floor and stood glaring at him. Pham ignored both questions. How is Greenstock doing? he said. The fronds turned away, seemed to be even more limp. She lives. I thank you, Sir Pham. It took great skill to do what you did. Considering everything, I could not have asked for more. What did I do? He remembered firing on Greenstock. Had he pulled his arm, his aim? He looked inside the surgeon. This was quite different from the human configuration. This one was mostly water-filled, with turbulent aeration along the patient's fronds. Asleep? Greenstock looked frailer than she remembered, her fronds waving randomly in the water. Some were nicked, but her body seemed whole. Her eyes traveled downward toward the base of the stock, where a rider is normally attached to its scrode. The stump ended in a cloud of surgical tubing and Pham remembered the last instant of the firefight, blasting the scrode out from under the green stock. What is a rider like without anything to ride? He pulled his eyes from away from the wreckage. I've deleted your command privileges because I don't trust you. My former friend, tool of my enemy. Blue Shell didn't answer. After a moment, Ravna spoke. Pham, without Blue Shell, I'd never have gotten you out of that habitat. Even then, we were stuck in the middle of the RIP system. The shepherd satellite was screaming for our blood. They had figured out we were human. The Aprahanti were trying to break harbor and come down on us. Without Blue Shell, we'd never have convinced local security to let us go ultra. We'd probably have been blown away the second we cleared the ring plane. We'd all be dead now, fam. Don't you know what happened down there? Some of the indignation left Ravna's face. Yes, but understand about Scrodes. They are a mechanical contrivance. It's easy enough to disconnect the cyber part from the mechanical linkages. These guys were controlling the wheels and aiming the gun. Hmm. On the window beside Ravna, he could see Blue Shell standing with his fronds motionless, not rushing to agree. Triumphant? That doesn't explain Greenstock's sucking us into the trap. He raised a hand. Yeah, I know. She was bludgeoned into doing it. Only problem, Ravna, she had no hesitation. She was enthusiastic, bubbly. He stared over the woman's shoulder. She was under no compulsion. Didn't you tell me that, Blue Shell? A long pause, finally. Or, a long pause. Finally. Yes, Sir Fam. Ravna turned, drifting back so she could see both of them. But, but, it's still absurd. Greenstock has been with us from the beginning. A thousand times she could have destroyed the ship, or gotten word to the outside. Why change? Why chance this stupid ambush? Yes, why didn't they betray us before? Up until she asked the question, Pham had not known. He knew the facts, but had no co- coherent theory to hang them on. Now it all came together. The ambush, his dreams and the surgeon, even the paradoxes. Maybe she wasn't a traitor before. We really did escape the relay without pursuit, without anyone knowing of us, much less our exact destination. Certainly no one expected humans to show up at harmonious repose. He paused, trying to get it all together. The ambush. 
The ambush, it wasn't stupid, but it was completely ad hoc. The enemy had no backup. Their weapons were dumb, simple things. Insight. Why? I'll bet if you look at the wreckage of Reenstock's scrode, you'll find her beam gun was some sort of cutter tool, and the only sensor on the Claymore mine was a motion detector. It had some civil use. All the gadgets were pulled together on a very short notice by people who had not been expecting a fight. No, our enemy was very surprised by our appearance. You think the Opera Hanti could... Not the Opera Hanti. From what you said, they didn't break moorage till after the gunfight, when the Rider Moon started screaming about us. Whoever's behind this is independent of the butterflies, and must be spread in very small numbers across many star systems, a vast set of trip wires, listening for things of interest. They noticed us, and weak as their outpost was, they tried to grab our ship. Only when we were getting away did they advertise us. One way or another, they didn't want us to get away. He jerked a hand at the Ultra Trace window. If I read that right, we've got more than 500 ships on our tail. Ravna's eyes flicked to the display and back. Her voice was abstracted. Yes, that's part of the main Aprahanti fleet, and... There will be lots more, only they won't all be butterflies. What are you saying, then? Why would Scrode Riders wish us ill? A conspiracy is senseless. They've never had a nation-state, much less an interstellar empire. Fam nodded. Just peaceful settlements, like that shepherd moon in polyspecific civilizations all across the beyond. His voice softened. No, Rav, the Scrode Riders are not the real enemy here. It's the thing behind them, the Stromly perversion. Incredulous silence, but he noticed how tightly Blue Shell held his fronds now. That one knew. It's the only explanation, Ravna. Greenstock really was our friend, and loyal. My guess is that the only a small minority of the riders are under the perversion's control. When Greenstock fell in with them, she was converted, too. Th that's impossible. This is the middle of the beyond, fam. Greenstock had courage, stubbornness. No brainwashing could have changed her so quickly. A frightened desperation had come into her eyes. One explanation or another, some terrible thing must be true. And I'm still here, alive and talking. A datum for God shatter. Maybe there was yet a chance. He spoke almost as the understanding hit him. Greenstock was loyal, yet she was totally converted in seconds. It wasn't just a perversion of her scrode, or some drug. It was as if both Ryder and scrode had been designated from the beginning to respond. He looked across at Blue Shell, trying to gauge his reaction to what he would say next. The writers have awaited their creator for a long time. Their race is very old, far older than anyone except the senescent. They're everywhere, but in small numbers, always practical and peaceful. And somewhere in the beginning, a few billion years ago, their precursors were trapped in an evolutionary cul-de-sac. Their creator built the first scrodes and made the first riders. Now I think we know the who and the why. Yes, yes, I know there have been other upliftings. What's marvelous about this one is how stable it turned out to be. The greater scrodes are tradition, Blue Shell says, but that's a word I apply to cultures into much shorter time scales. The greater scrodes of today are identical to the ones a billion years ago, and the devices that can be made anywhere in the beyond. Or they are devices that can be made anywhere in the beyond. Yet the design is clearly high beyond or transcendent. That has been one of his earliest humiliations about the beyond. He had looked at the design diagram, dissections really, of scrodes. On the outside, the thing was a mechanical device, with moving parts even. And the text claimed that the whole thing would be made with the simplest of factories, scarcely more than what existed in some places in the slow zone. And yet the electronics was a seemingly random mass of components, without any trace of hierarchical design or modularity. It worked, and far more efficiently than something designed by human-equivalent minds, but repair and debugging of the cyber component was out of the question. No one in the beyond understands of the potential of scrodes, much less the adaptations forced on their riders. Isn't that so, Blue Shell? The rider clapped his fronds hard against his central so stock. A again, a furious rattling. It was something Fam had never seen before. Rage? Terror? Blue Shell's voter voice was distorted with non-linearities. You ask? You ask? It's monstrous to ask me to help you in this. The voice skeetered into high frequencies and he stood mute, his body shivering. Fam of the Cheng Ho felt a stab of shame. The other knew and understood, and deserved better than this. The riders must be destroyed, but they should not have to listen to his judging. His hand swept towards the communications cutoff, 
stopped. No, this is your last chance to observe the perversion's work. Ravna's glance snapped back and forth between the human and Scrode Rider, and he could tell that she understood. Her face had the same stricken look as when she learned about Sandra Kai. You're saying the perversions made the original Scrodes. And modified the Riders, too. It was long ago, and certainly not the same instance of the perversion that the Stromers created, but... The Blight, that was the other common name for the perversion, and closer to Old One's view. For all of the perversion's transcendence, its lifestyle was more similar to a disease than anything else. Maybe that helps to fool the Old One. But now Fam could see. The Blight lived in pieces, across extraordinary reaches of time. It hid in archives, waiting for ideal conditions, and it created helpers for its blossoming. He looked, or for its blooming. He looked at Ravna, and suddenly realized a little more. You've had thirty hours to think about this, Rav. You saw the record from my suit. Surely you must have guessed some of this. Her gaze dropped from his. A little, she finally said. At least she was no longer denying. You know what we have to do, he said softly. Now that he understood what must be done, the god shatter eased its grip. Its will would be done. What is that? said Ravna, as if she didn't know. Two things. Post this to the net. Who would believe? The net of a million lies. Enough would. Once they look, most folk will be able to see the truth here, and take the proper action. Ravna shook her head. No, barely audible. The net must be told, Ravna. We've discovered something that could save a thousand worlds. This is the Blight's hidden edge, at least in the middle and low beyond. She just shook her head again. But screaming this truth would kill billions. In honest defense, he bounced slowly towards the ceiling, pushed himself back towards the deck. There were tears in her eyes now. These are exactly the arguments that you used to kill my family, my worlds, and I will not be part of it. But the claims are true this time. I've had enough po pogroms, fam. Gentle toughness, and almost unbelievable. You would make this decision yourself, Rav. We know something that others, leaders wiser than either of us, should be free to decide upon. You would keep them from making that choice? She hesitated, and for an instant Fam thought the civilized rule follower in her would bring her around. But then her chin came up. Yes, Fam, I would deny them the choice. He made the noncommittal noise and drifted back toward the command console. No point in talking to her about what else must be done. And Fam, we will not kill Blue Shell and Greenstock. There's no choice, Rav. His hands played with the touch controls. Greenstock was perverted. We have no idea how much of that survived the destruction of her scrode, or how long it will be before Blue Shell goes bad. We can't take them along, or let them go free. Ravna drifted sideways, her eyes fixed on his hands. B be careful who you kill, Fan, she said softly. As you say, I've had thirty hours to think about my decisions, thirty hours to think about yours. So, Fan raised his hands from the controls. Rage, God Shatter, chased briefly through his mind. Ravna, 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 a voice saying goodbye inside his head. Then all became very cold. He had been so afraid that the riders had perverted the ship. Instead, this stupid fool had acted for them, voluntarily. He drifted slowly toward her. Almost unthinking, he held his arm and hand at combat ready. How do you intend to prevent me from doing what has to be done? But he had already guessed. She didn't back away, even when his hand was centimeters from her throat. Her face held courage and tears. What do you think, fam? While you are in the surgeon, I rearranged things. Hurt me, and you will be hurt worse. Her eyes swept the walls behind him. Kill the riders, and, and you will die. They stared at each other for a long moment, measuring. Maybe there weren't weapons buried in the walls. He probably could kill her before she could defend. But then there were a thousand ways the ship could have been programmed to kill him and all that would be left would be the riders, flying down to the bottom, to their prize. So what do we do then? he finally said. As b before, we go rescue Jeffrey. We go to recover the countermeasure. I'm willing to put some restrictions on the riders. A truce with monsters, mediated by a fool. He pushed off and sailed around her, back down the Axis corridor. Behind him, he heard a sob. They stayed well clear of each other for the next few days, Fam was allowed shallow access to ship controls. 
He found suicide programs threaded through the application layers. But a strange thing, and the reason for chagrin if he had been capable of it. The changes dated for, from hours after his confrontation with Ravna. She'd had nothing when she stood against him. Thank the powers I didn't know. The thought was forgotten almost before he formed it. So, the charade would proceed right to the end, a continuing game of lie and subterfuge. Grimly, he set himself to winning that game. Fleets behind them, traitors surrounding him. By the Cheng Ho and his own god shatter, the perversion would lose. The Scrode Riders would lose. And for all her courage and goodness, Ravna Bergenstadt would lose. Chapter 30 Tyrathect was losing the battle within herself. Oh, it wasn't near ended. Better perhaps to say that the tide had turned. In the beginning, there had been little triumphs, as when she let Andy Jeffrey play alone with the comm set without even the children guessing what she was responsible. But such were many ten days past, and now, some days she would be entirely in control of herself. Others, and these often seemed the happiest, would begin with her seeming in control. It was not yet clear what sort of day today would be. Tyrathect paced along the hoardings that topped the new castle's walls. The place was certainly new, but hardly yet a castle. Steel had built in a panicky haste. The south and west walls were very thick, with embedded tunnels. But there were spots on the north side that were simply palisades backed by stony rubble. Nothing more could be done in the time that Steel had been given. She stopped for a moment, smelling fresh sawn timber. The view down Starship Hill was as beautiful as she had ever seen it. The days were getting longer. Now there was only twilight between the setting and the rising of the sun. The local snow had retreated to its summer patches, leaving heather to turn green in the warmth. From here she could see miles to where the bluish sea haze clamped down on offshore islands. By the conventional wisdom, it would be suicide to attack the new castle, even if it's even in its present ramshackle state, with less than a horde. Tyrathect smiled bitterly to herself. Of course, Woodcarver would ignore that wisdom. Old Woodcarver thought she had a secret weapon that could breach these walls from, a few hun from hundreds of feet away. Even now, Steel's spies were reporting that Woodcarvers had taken the bait, that their small army and their crude cannon had begun the overland trek up the coast. She descended the wall stairs to the yard, she heard faint thunder. Somewhere north of Streamsdale, Steele's own cannoneers were beginning the morning practice. When the air was just right, you could hear it. There was to be no testing near the farmlands, and none but high servants and isolated workers knew of the weapons. But by now, Steele had thirty of the devices and gunpowder to match. The greatest lack was gunners. Up close, the noise of firing was hellish. Sustained firing could deafen. Ah, but the weapons themselves, they had a range of almost eight miles, three times as great as woodcarvers. They could deliver gunpowder bombs that exploded on impact. There were places beyond the northern hills where the forest was gouged bare and slumping landsides, landsides showed naked rock, all from sustain, sustained barrages of gunfire. And soon, perhaps today, the Flenserist would have radio, too. God damn you, woodcarver! Of course Tyrathect had never met the woodcarver, but Flenser had known that pack well. Flenser was mostly woodcarver's offspring. The gentle woodcarver had borne him and raised him to power. It had been woodcarver who taught him about the freedom of thought and experiment. Woodcarver should have known the pride that lived in Flenser, should have known that he would go to extremes his parent never dared. And when the new one's monstrous nature became clear, when his first experiments were discovered, Woodcarver should have had him killed, or at the very least, fragmented. Instead, Flenser had been allowed to take exile, to create things like steel, and they to create their own monsters, ultimately to build this hierarchy of madness. And now, a century overdue, Woodcarver was coming to correct her mistake. She came with her toy guns, as overconfident and idealistic as ever. She came into a trap of steel and fire that none of her people would survive. If only there were some way to warn the woodcarver. Tyrathect's only reason for being here was the oath she had sworn herself to, bring Flinzer's movement down. If woodcarver knew what awaited her here, if she even knew of the traitors in her own camp, there might be a chance. 
Last fall, Tyrathect had come close to sending an anonymous message south. There were traders who visited through both kingdoms. Her Flenser memories told her which were likely independent. She almost passed one a note, a single piece of silk paper, reporting the starship's landing and Jeffrey's survival. In that, she had missed death by less than a day. Steele had shown her a report from the South, about the other human in Woodcarver's progress with the data set. There were things in the report that could only be known by someone at, a, at the top of Woodcarver's. Who? She didn't ask, but she guessed it was Vendacious. The Flenser in Tyrathect remembered that sibling pack well. They'd had dealings. Vendacious had none of the raw genius of their joint parent, but there was a broad streak of opportunism in him. Steele had shown her the report only to puff himself up, to prove to Tyrathect that he had succeeded in something that Flenser had never attempted, and it was a coup. Tyrathect had complimented Steele with more than a, the usual sincerity, and quietly shelved her plans of warning. With a spy at the top of Woodcarver's, any message would be pointless suicide. Now Tyrathect padded across the castle's outer yard. There were still plenty of construction going on, but the teams were smaller. Steel was building timber lodges all over the yard. Many were empty shells. Steel hoped to persuade Ravna to land at a special spot near the inner keep. The inner keep. That was the only thing about this castle built to the standards of Hidden Island. It was a beautiful structure. It could really be what Steel told Andy Jeffrey. A shrine to honor Jeffrey's ship and protect it from woodcarver attack. The central dome was a smooth sweep of cantilevers and fitted stone as wide as the main meeting hall on Hidden Island. Tyrathect watched it with one pair of eyes as she trotted around it. Steel intended to face the dome with the finest pink marble. It would be visible for dozens of miles into the sky. The deadfalls built into its structure were the centerpiece of Steel's plan, even if the rescuers didn't land in his other trap. Shrek and two other high servants stood on the steps of the castle's meeting hall. They came to attention as she approached. The three backed away quickly, bellies scraping stone but not as quickly as last fall. They knew that the other Flenser fragments had been destroyed. As Tyrathect swept past them, she almost smiled. For all her weakness and all her problems, she knew she could best these ones. Steel was already inside, alone. The most important meetings were all like this, just Steel and herself. She understood the relationship. In the beginning, Steel had been simply terrified of her, the one person he believed he could never kill. For ten days, he had teetered be between groveling before her and dismembering her. It was amusing to see the bonds Flenser had installed years before still having force. Then had come word of the death of the other fragments. Tyrathect was no longer Flenser in waiting. She had half expected death to come then, but in a way this made her safer. Now Steel was less afraid, and his need for intimate ad advice could be satisfied in ways he saw less threatening. She was his bottled demon, Flenser wisdom without the Flenser threat. This afternoon he seemed almost relaxed, nodding casually to Tyrathect as she entered. She nodded back. In many ways, Steel was her, Flenser's, finest creation. So much effort had been spent honing Steel. How many packs worth of members had been sacrificed just to get the combination that was Steel? She, Flenser, had wanted brilliance, ruthlessness. As Tyrathect, she could see the truth. With all the flensing, Flenser had created a poor, sad thing. It was a strange... But sometimes, Steel seemed like Flenser's most pitiable victim. Ready for the big test, Tyrathect said. At long last, the radios seemed complete. In a moment, I wanted to ask you about timing. My sources tell me Woodcarver's army is on its way. If they make reasonable progress, they should be in here in five ten days. That's at least three ten days before Ravna's ship arrives. Quite. We will have your old enemy disposed of long before we go for the high stakes. But... Something is strange about the two legs' recent messages. How much do you think they suspect? Is it possible that Andy Jeffrey are telling them more than we know? It was an uncertainty Steele would have masked back when she had been Flenser in waiting. Tyrathect slid to a seated position before replying. You might know the answer if you had bothered to learn more of two legs' language, dear Steele, or let me learn more. Through the winter, Tyrathect had been desperate to talk about to talk to the children alone, to get warning to the ship. She was of two minds about that now. Amdi Jeffrey were so transparent, so innocent. If they glimpsed anything of Steele's treachery, they couldn't hide it. And what might the rescuers do if they knew Steele's villainy? Tyrathect had been one starship in flight, had seen one starship in flight. Just its landing could be a terrible weapon. Besides, 
If Steele's plan succeeds, it won't need the alien's goodwill. Aloud, Tyrathect continued, As long as you can continue ma your magnificent performance, you have nothing to fear from the child. Can't you see that he loves you? For an instant, Steele seemed pleased, and then the suspicion returned. I don't know. Amdi always seems to taunt me, as though he sees through my act. Poor Steele. Amidriani Fani was his greatest success, Amdriani Fani was his greatest success, and he would never understand it. In this one thing, Steele had truly exceeded his master, had discovered and honed a technique that had once been woodcarver's. The fragment eyed his former student almost hungrily. If only he could do him all over again. There must be a way to combine the fear and the flensing with love and affection. The resulting tool would truly merit the name Steele. Tyrathrek shrugged. Take my word for it. If you can continue your kindness act, both children will be faithful. As for the rest of your question, I have noticed some change in Ravna's messages. She seems much more confident of their arrival time, yet something has gone wrong for them. I don't think they're any more suspicious than before. They seem to accept that Geoffrey was responsible for Amdi's idea about the radios. That lie was a good move, by the way. It played to their sense of superiority. On a fair battlefield, we are probably their betters, and they must not guess that. But what are they suddenly so tense about? The fragment shrugged. Patience, dear Steel. Patience and observation. Perhaps Andy Jeffrey have noticed this too. You might subtly inspire them to ask about it. My guess is that two legs have their own politics to worry about. He stopped and turned all his heads on Steel. Could you have your source down at Woodcarver's ferret about with the question? Perhaps I will. That data set is Woodcarver's one great advantage. Steele sat in silence for a moment, nervously chewing at his lips. Abruptly, he shook himself all over, as if to drive off the manifold threats he saw encroaching. Shrek! There was the sound of pause. The hatch creaked open and Shrek stuck a head inside. Sir? Bring the radio outfits in here, then ask Amdi Jeffrey if he can come down and talk to us. The radios were beautiful things. Ravna claimed that the basic device could be invented by civilizations scarcely more advanced than Flinzer's. That was hard to believe. There were so many steps in the making, so many meaningless detours. The final results? Eight one-yard squares of night darkness. Glints of gold and silver showed in the strange material. That, at least, was no mystery. A part of Flenser's gold and silver had gone into the construction. Amdi Jeffrey arrived. They raced around the central floor, poked at the radios, shouted to steel and the Flenser fragment. Sometimes it was hard to believe they were not truly one pack, that the two legs was not another member. They clung to each other as a single pack might. As often as not, Amdi answered questions about two legs before Geoffrey had a chance to speak, using the I pack pronoun to identify both of them. Today, however, there seemed to be a disagreement. Oh, please, my lord, let me be the one to try it. Geoffrey rattled off something in Sam Norsk. When Amdi didn't translate, he repeated the words more slowly, speaking directly to Steele. No. It is something something dangerous, Amdi is something small, and also time something narrow. The fragment strained for the meaning. Damn, sooner or later, the ignorance of the two legs language was going to cost them. Steele listened to the human, then sighed the most marvelously patient sigh. Please, Amdi, Geoffrey, what is problem? He spoke in Sam Norsk, making more sense to the Flenser fragment than the human child had. Amdi dithered for a moment. Jeffrey thinks the radio jackets are too big for me, but look, it doesn't fit so badly. Amdi jumped all around one of the night-dark squares, dragging it heedlessly off its velvet pallet onto the floor. He pulled the fabric over the back and shoulders of his largest member. Now the radio was roughly the shape of a great cloak. Steele's tailors had added clasps at the shoulders and gut. But the thing was vastly outsized for little Amdi. It stood like a tent around one of him. See? See? The tiny head poked out, looking first at Steel and then at Tyrathect, willing their belief. Geoffrey said something. The Amdi pack squeaked back angrily. Then, Geoffrey worries about everything, but somebody has to test the radios. There's this little problem with speed. Radio goes much faster than sound. Geoffrey's just afraid it's so fast it might confuse the pack using it. That's foolish. How much faster could it be than the heads together thought? He asked it as a question. Tyrathect smiled. The pack of puppies couldn't quite lie, but he guessed that Amdi knew the answer to this question, and it, that it did not support his argument. On the other side of the hall, Steele listened with heads cocked, the picture of benign tolerance. I'm sorry, Amdi, it's just too dangerous for you to be the first. But I am brave, and I want to help. 
I'm sorry, after we know it's safe. Amdi gave a shriek of outrage, much higher than normal interpack talk, almost in the range of thought. He swarmed around Geoffrey, whacking at the human's legs with his butt ends. Hideous traitor, he cried, and continued the insults in Samnorsk. It took about ten minutes to get him calmed down to a sulk. He and Geoffrey sat on the floor, grumbling at each other in Samnorsk. Tyrethect watched the two, and Steele on the other side of the room. If irony were something that made sound, they would all be deaf by now. All their lives, Flinzer and Steele had experimented on others, usually unto death. Now they had a victim who literally begged to be victimized, and he must be rejected. There was no question about the rejection. Even if Geoffrey had not raised objections, the Amdi pack was too valuable to be risked. Furthermore, Amdi was an eightsum. It was a miracle that such a large pack could function at all. Whatever dangers there were with radio would be much greater for him. So a proper victim would be found. A proper wretch. Surely there were plenty of those in the dungeons beneath Hidden Island. Tyrethect thought back on all the packs she remembered killing. How she hated Flenzer, his calculating cruelty. I am so much worse than Steel. I made Steel. She remembered where her thoughts had been in the last hour. This was one of the bad days, one of the days when Flenzer sneaked out from the recesses of her mind, when she rode the power of his reason higher and higher, till it became rationalization, and she became him. Still, for a few more seconds, she might be in control. What could she do with it? A soul that was strong enough might dis not deny itself, might become a different person, might at the very least end itself. I, I will try the radio. The words were spoken almost before he thought them. Weak, silly, frill. What? said Steele. But the words had been clear, and Steele had heard. The Flunzer fragment smiled dryly. I want to see what this radio can do. Let me try it, dear Steele. They took the radios out into the yard, on the side of the starship that was hidden from general view. Here it would just be Amdi Jeffrey, Steele, and whoever I am at the moment. The Flunzer fragment laughed at the upwelling fear. Discipline, she had thought. Perhaps that was best. He stood in the middle of the yard and let the human help him with the radio gear. Strange to see another intelligent being so close and towering over him. Jeffrey's incredibly articulate paws arranged the jackets loosely on his backs. The inside material was soft, deadening, and unlike normal clothing, the radios covered the wearer's tympana. The boy tried to explain what he was doing. See? This thing. He pulled at the corner of the great cloak. Goes over your head. The inside has something that makes sound into radio. The fragment shrugged, shrugged away as the boy tried to pull the cover forward. No, I can't think. Only by standing just so, all members facing inward, could the fragment maintain full consciousness. Already the weight, weaker parts of him were edging toward isolation panic. The conscience that was Tyrethect would learn some th something today. Oh, I'm sorry. Geoffrey turned and spoke to Amdi, something about using the old design. Amdi was heads together, just thirty feet away. He had been all frowns, sullen at being denied, nervous to be apart from the two legs. But as the preparations continued, the frowns eased. The puppy's eyes grew wide with happy fascination. The fragment felt a wave of affection for the puppies that came and went almost too fast to be noticed. Now Amdi edged nearer, taking advantage of the fact that the cloaks muffled much of the fragment's thought sounds. Geoffrey says maybe we shouldn't have tried to make it the mind size, make the mind size radio, he said. But this will be so much better, I know it. And, he said with transparent slyness, you could still let me test it instead. No, Amdi, this is the way it must be. Steele's voice was all soft sympathy. Only the Flenzer fragment could see the broad grin on a couple of the Lord's members. Well, okay. The puppies crept a little nearer. Don't be afraid, Lord Tyrethect. We've had the radios in sunlight for some time. They should have lots of power. To make them work, you just pull all the belts tight, even the ones at your neck. All of them at once? Amdi fidgeted. That's probably best. Otherwise, there will be such a mismatch of speeds that... He said something to the two legs. Geoffrey leaned close. The belt goes here, and this here. He pointed to the braid bone straps that drew the head covering close. Then just pull this with your mouth. The harder you pull, the louder the radio, Amdi added. Okay. The fragment drew himself together. He shrugged the jackets into place, tightening the shoulder and gut belts. Deadly muffling. The jackets almost seemed to mold themselves to his tympana. He looked at himself and grasped desperately for what was left of consciousness. The jackets were beautiful, magic darkness yet with a hint of golden silver of a flunzerous lord. Beautiful instruments of torture. 
Even Steele had not imagined such twisted revenge. Had he? The fragment grabbed the head straps and pulled. Twenty years ago, when Tyrethect was new, she had loved to hike with her fission parent on the grassy dunes along Lake, Lake Kit Cherry. That was before their great falling out, before loneliness drove Tyrethect to the Republic's capital and her search for meaning. Not all of the shore of Lake, Lake Kit Cherry was beaches and dunes. Farther south there was the rockness, where streams cut through stone to the water. Sometimes, especially when she and her parents had fought, Tyrethect could walk up from the shore, along streams bordered by sheer smooth cliffs. It was a sort of punishment. There were places where the stone had a glassy haze and didn't absorb sound at all. Everything was echoed, right up to the top of thought. It was as if she were surrounded by copies of herself, and copies beyond them, all thinking the same sounds, but out of step. Of course, echoes are often a problem with unquilted stone walls, especially if the size and geometry are wrong. But these cliffs were perfect reflectors, a quarrier's nightmare. And there were places where the shape of the rockness conspired with the sounds. When Tyrethect walked there, she couldn't tell her own thoughts from the echoes. Everything was garbled with barely offset resonance. At first it had been a great pain that sent her running, but she forced herself back again and again, and finally learned to think even in the worst of the narrows. M.D. Jeffrey's radio was just a little like the Kitcherry Cliffs. Enough to save me, maybe. Tyrethect came to consciousness all piled in a heap. At most seconds had passed since she brought the radios to life. M.D. and Steele were simply staring at her. The human was rocking one of her bodies, talking to her. Tyrethect licked the boy's paw, then stood partly up. She heard only her own thoughts, but they had some of the jarring difference of the stone echoes. She was back on her bellies again. Part of her was vomiting in the dirt. The world shimmered out of tune. Thought is there. Grab it. Grab it. All a matter of coordination, of timing. She remembered M.D. Jeffrey talking about how fast the radio was. In a way, this was the reverse of the problem of the screaming cliffs. She shook her head, mastering the weirdness. Give me a moment, she said, and her voice was almost calm. She looked around, slowly. If she concentrated and didn't move fast, she could think. Suddenly she was aware of the great cloaks, pressing in on all her tympana. She should have been deafened, isolated, yet her thoughts were no muzzier than after a bad sleep. She got to her feet again and walked slowly around the open space between Amdi and Steele. Can you hear me? she asked. Yes, said Steele. He edged nervously away from her. Of course. The cloaks muffled sound like any heavy quilt. Anything in the range of thought would be totally absorbed. But interpack speech and Sam Norsk were low-pitched sound. They would be scarcely affected. She stopped, holding all her breath. She could hear birds on, and the sounds of timber being sawn somewhere on the far side of the inner yard. Yet Steele was only thirty feet from her. His thought no noise should have been a loud intrusion, even confusing. She strained to hear. There was nothing but her own thoughts and the stickety, buzzing noise that seemed to come from all directions. And we thought this would give us control and battle, she said, wonderingly. All of her turned and walked toward Amdi. He was twenty feet away, ten feet. Still no thought noise. Amdi's eyes were wide. The puppies held their ground. In fact, all eight of them seemed to lean toward her. You knew about this all along, didn't you? Tyrethect said. I hoped. Oh, I hoped. He stepped closer. Five feet. The eight of them, him, looked at the five of her at a, from a distance of inches. He extended a nose, brushing muzzles with Tyrethect. His thought sounds came only faintly through the cloak, no louder than if he were fifty feet away. For a moment they looked at each other in stark astonishment, nose to nose, and they could both still think. Amdi gave a whoop of glee and bounded in among Tyrethect, rubbing back and forth across her legs. See, Geoffrey, he shouted in Sam Norsk, it works, it works. Tyrethect wobbled under the assault, almost lost hold of her thoughts. What had just happened? In all the history of the world there had never been such a thing. If thinking packs could work paw by jowl, there were consequences and consequences, and she got dizzy all over again. Steele moved a little closer, and suffered a flying hug from Geoffrey Olsendot. Steele was trying his best to join the celebration, but he wasn't quite sure what had happened. He hadn't lived the consequences like Tyrethect. Wonderful progress for the first try, he said. But it must be painful, even so. Two of him looked sharply at her. We should get that gear off you, and give you a rest. No, Tyrethect and Amdi said almost together. She smiled back at Steele. We haven't really tested it yet, have we? The whole purpose was long-distance communications. 
We thought that was the purpose, anyway. In fact, even if it had no better range than talk sounds, it was already a towering success in Tyrethek's mind. Oh, Steele smiled weakly at Amdi, and glared hidden faces at Tyrethek. Jeffrey was still hanging on two of his necks. Steele was a picture of barely concealed anguish. Well, go slowly, then. We don't know what might happen if you run out of range. Tyrethek disentangled two of herself from Amdi and stepped a few feet away, though it was as thought was as clear and as potentially confusing as before. By now she was beginning to get the feel of it, though. She had very little trouble keeping her balance. She walked the two, another thirty feet, about the maximum range a pack could coordinate in the quietest conditions. It's like I'm still heads together, she said wonderingly. Ordinarily, at thirty feet, thoughts were faint and the time lag so bad that coordination was difficult. How far can I go? she murmured the question to Amdi. He made a human giggling sound and slid ahead close to hers. I'm not sure. It should be good at least to the outer walls. Well, she said in a normal voice, for steel. Let's see if I can spread a little bit further. The two of her walked another ten yards. She was more than sixty feet across. Steel was wide-eyed. And now? Tyrethek laughed. My thoughts as crisp as before. She turned her to and walked away. Wait, roared Steele, bounding to his feet. That's far. Then he remembered his audience, and his fury became more a fright and concern for her welfare. That's far too dangerous for the first experiment. Come back. From where she sat with Amdi, Tyrethek smiled brightly. But Steele, I never left, she said in Sam Norsk. Amdi Jeffrey laughed and laughed. She was one hundred fifty feet across. Her two broke into a careful trot, and she watched Steele swallow back foam. Her thoughts still had the sharp, abrupt quality of closer than heads together. How fast is this radio thing? She passed close by Shrek, and the guards posted at the edge of the field. Hey, hey, Shrek, what do you say? One of her said at his stupefied faces. Back with Amdi and the rest of her, Steele was shouting at Shrek, telling him to follow her. Her trot became an easy run. She split, one going north of the inner yard, the other south. Shrek and company followed, clumsy with shock. The dome of the inner keep was between her, a sweeping hulk of stone. Her radio thoughts faded into the stickety buzzing. Can't think, she mumbled to Amdi. Pull on the mouth straps, make your thoughts louder. Tyrethek pulled, and the buzzing faded. She regained her balance and raced around the starship. One of her was in a construction area now. Artisans looked up in shock. A loose member usually meant a fatal accident or a pack run amok. In either case, the singleton must be restrained. But Tyrethek's member was wearing a great cloak that sparkled here and there of gold, and behind her, Shrek and his guards were shouting for everyone to stand back. She turned a head to steel, and her voice was joy. I saw her. She ran through the cowering workers, ran toward the south and the west walls. She was everywhere, spreading and spreading. These seconds would make memories that would outlast her soul, that would be legends in the minds of her descendants a thousand years from now. Steel hunkered down. Things were totally out of his control now. Shrek's people were all on the far side of the inner keep. All that he and Amdi Jeffrey could know came from Tyrethect and the clamor of alarms. Amdi bounced around her. Where are you now? Where? Almost to the outer wall. Don't go beyond that, Steele said quietly. Tyrethect scarcely heard. For a few more seconds, she would drink this glorious power. She charged up the inside stairs. Guards scuttled back, some members jumping back into the yard. Shrek still followed, shouting for her safety. One of, one of her reached the parapet, then the other. She gasped. Are you all right? said Amdi. Aye. Tyrethek looked about her. From her places on the south wall, she could see herself back in the castle yard. A tiny clump of gold and black was that was her three and Amdi. Beyond the northeast wall stretched forest and valleys, the trails up into the Ice Fang Mountains. To the west was Hidden Island and the misty inner waters. These were things that had, she had seen a thousand times as Flenzer how he had loved them, his domain. But now, she was seeing as if in a dream. Her eyes were so far apart. Her pack was almost as wide as the castle itself. The parallax view made Hidden Island seem just a few paces away. New Castle was like a model spread out around her. Almighty pack of packs. This was God's view. Shrek's troopers were edging closer. He had sent a couple packs back to get directions. A couple of minutes. I'll come down in a couple of minutes. She spoke the words to the troopers on the palisade and set and to steal back in the yard. Then she turned to survey her domain. She had only extended two of herself across less than a quarter of a mile, but there was no perceptible time lag. 
coordination had the same abrupt feel it did when she was all together. And there was plenty more pull in the braid bone straps. What if all five of her spread out, moved miles apart? All of the Northland would be her private room. And Flenser? Ah, Flenser. Where was he? The memories were still there, but Tyrethect remembered the loss of consciousness right when the radios began working. It took a special skill of coordination to think in the face of such terrible speed. Perhaps Lord Flenser had never walked between those close cliffs when he was new. Tyrethect smiled. Perhaps only her mindset could hold when using the radios. In that case, Tyrethect looked again across the landscape. Flenser had made a great empire. If these new developments were managed properly, then the coming victories could make it infinitely grander. He turned to Shrek's troopers. Very well, I'm ready to return to Lord Steel. Chapter 31 It was high summer when Woodcarver's army left for the north. The preparations had been frantic, with Vendacious driving himself and everyone else to the point of exhaustion. There had been cannons to make. Scrupilo cast seventy tubes before getting thirty that would, could, would fire reliably. There had been cannoneers to train, and safe methods of firing to discover. There had been wagons to build and curhogs to buy. Surely word of the preparations had long ago filtered north. Woodcarver's was a port city. They could not close down the commerce that moved through it. Vendacious warned them of this in more than one inner council meeting. Steele knew they were coming. The trick was in keeping the Flenserists uncertain as to numbers and timing and exact purpose. We have one greatest advantage over the enemy, he said. We have agents in the high councils, in his highest councils. We know what he knows of us. They couldn't disguise the obvious from the spies, but the details were a different matter. The army departed along inland routes, a dozen wagons here, a few squads there. In all, there were a thousand packs in the expedition, but they would never be together till they reached deep forest. It would have been easier to take the first part of the trip by sea, but the Flenserists had spotters hidden high in the fjordlands. Any ship movement, even deep in woodcarver territory, would be known in the north. So they traveled on forest paths through areas that Vendacious had cleared of enemy agents. At first the going was very easy, at least for those with the wagons. Joanna rode in one of the rear ones, with Woodcarver and Dataset. Even I'm beginning to treat the thing like an oracle, thought Joanna. Too bad it couldn't really predict the future. The weather was as beautiful as Joanna had ever seen it on the Tyne's world. An endless afternoon. It was strange that such unending fairness would make her so nervous, but she couldn't help it. This was so much like her first time on this world, when everything had gone wrong. During the first day arounds of the journey, while they were still in home territory, Woodcarver pointed out every peak that came into view and tried to translate its name into Sam Norsk for her. After six hundred years, the queen knew her land well. Even the patches of snow, the one that lasted all through the summer, were known to her. She showed Joanna a sketchbook that she had brought along. Each page was from a different year and showed her special snow patches, as they had appeared on the same day of the summer. Riffling through the leaves, it was almost like a crude piece of animation. Joanna could see the patches moving, growing over a period of decades, then retreating. Most packs don't live long enough to feel it, said Woodcarver, but to me, the patches that last all summer are like living things. See how they move? They are like wolves, held off from our lands by our fire that is the sun. They circle about, grow. Sometimes they link together and a new glacier starts towards the sea. Joanna had laughed a little nervously. Are they winning? For the last four centuries, no. The summers have often been hot and windy. In the long run, I don't know, and it doesn't matter quite so much to me anymore. She rocked her two little puppies for a moment and laughed gently. Peregrine's little ones are not even thinking yet, and I'm already losing my long view. Joanna reached out to stroke her neck, but they are your puppies too. I know, most of my puppies, pups have been with other packs, but these are the first that I have kept to be me. Her blind one nuzzled at the one of the puppies. It wriggled and made a sound that warbled at the top of Joanna's hearing. Joanna held the other on her lap. Tyne pups looked more like baby sea moles than dogs. Their necks were so long compared to their bodies, and they seemed to develop much more slowly than the puppy she and Geoffrey had raised. Even now they seemed to have trouble focusing. She moved her fingers slowly back and forth in front of one puppy's head. Its efforts to track were comical. And after sixty days, Woodcarver's pups couldn't really walk. The queen wore two special jackets with carrying pouches on the sides. Most of the waking day, her little one stayed there, suckling through the fur on her tummy. 
In some ways, Woodcarver treated her offspring as a human would. She was very nervous when they were taken from her sight. She liked to cuddle them and play little games of coordination with them. Often she would lay both of them on their backs and pat their paws in a sequence of eight, then abruptly tap the one or the other on the belly. The two wriggled furiously at the attack, their little legs waving in all directions. I nibble the one whose paw was last touch. Peregrine is worthy of me. These two are already thinking a little, see? She pointed to the puppy that had convulsed into a ball, avoiding most of her surprise tickle. In other ways, Tynish parenting was alien, almost scary. Neither Woodcarver nor Peregrine ever talked to their pups in audible tones, but their ultrasonic thoughts seemed to be constantly probing the little ones. Some of it was so simple and regular that it set sympathetic vibrations through the walls of the little wagon. The wood buzzed under Joanna's hands. It was like a mother humming a lullaby, but she could see it had another purpose. These little creatures responded to the sounds, twitching in complicated rhythms. Peregrine said it would be another thirty days before the pups could contribute conscious thought to the pack, but they were already being trained and exercised for the function. They camped part of each day round, the troops standing turns in, at sentry lines. Even during the traveling part of the day, they stopped numerous times to clear the trail or await the return of scouts, or simply to rest. At one such stop, Joanna sought, sat with Peregrine in the shade of a tree that looked like pine but smelled of honey. Pilgrim played with his young ones, helping them to stand and walk a few, a few steps. She could tell by the buzzing in her head that she was thinking at the pops. And suddenly they seemed more like marionettes than children to her. Why don't you let them play by themselves, or with their... Brothers? Sisters? What do you call siblings born to the other pack? With Woodcarver's pups. Even more than Woodcarver, the pilgrim had tried to learn human customs. He was by far the most flexible pack she knew. After all, if you can accommodate a murderer in your own mind, you must be flexible. But Pilgrim was visibly startled by her question. The buzzing in her head stopped abruptly. He laughed weakly. It was a very human laugh, although a bit theatrical. Peregrine had spent hours at interactive comedy on Dataset, whether for entertainment or insight she didn't know. Play? By themselves? Yes. I see how natural that would seem to you. To us, it would be a kind of perversion. No. Worse than that, since perversions are at least fun for some people some of the time. But if a pup were raised a singleton, or even a duo, it would be making an animal of what could be a, a sturdy member. You mean that pups can never have a life of their own? Peregrine cocked his heads and scrunched close to the ground. One of him continued to nose around the puppies, but Joanna had his attention. He loved to puzzle over human exotica. Well, sometimes there is a tragedy, an orphan pup left to itself. Often there is no cure for it. The creature becomes too independent to meld with any pack. In any case, it's a very lonely, empty life. I have personal memories of just how unpleasant. You're missing a lot. I know you've watched children's stories on Dataset. It's sad you can never be young and foolish. Hey, I never said that. I've been young and foolish lots. It's my way of life. And most packs are that way, when they have several young members by different parents. As they talked, one of Peregrine's pups had struggled to the edge of the blanket they sat on. Now it was awkwardly extended its neck into the flowers that grew from the roots of a nearby tree. As it scruffed around in the green and purple, Joanna felt the buzzing begin again. The pup's movement became a tad more organized. Wow, I can smell the flowers with him. I bet we'll be seeing through each other's eyes well before we get to Flenser's hidden island. The pup backed up, and the two did a little dance on the blanket. Peregrine's heads bobbed in time with the movement. They are such bright little ones, he grinned. Oh, we are not so different from you, Joanna. I know humans are proud of their young ones, but Woodcarver and I wonder what ours will become. She is so brilliant, and I am, well, a bit mad. Will these two make me a scientific genius? Will Woodcarver's turn her into an adventurer? Heh <laughs> heh. Woodcarver's a great broodketter, but she's even she's not sure what our new souls will be like. Oh, I can't wait to be six again. It had taken Scriber and Pilgrim and Joanna only three days to, stay, to sail from Flinzer's domain to the harbor at Woodcarver's. It would take his army almost thirty days to walk back to where Joanna's adventure began. On the map, it had looked a torturous path, wriggling this way and that through the fjordland. Yet the first ten days were amazingly easy. The weather stayed dry and warm. It was like a day, the day of the ambush stretched out forever and ever. A dry wind summer, Woodcarver called it. There should be occasional storms, at least cloudiness. Instead, the sun circled endless, endlessly above the forest canopy, 
and when they broke into the open, never for long, and then only when Vendacious was sure that it was safe, the sky was clear and almost cloudless. In fact, there was already uneasiness about the weather. At noon it could get downright hot. The wind was constant, drying. The forest itself was drying out. They must be careful with fire. And with the sun always up and no clouds, they might be seen by lookouts many kilometers away. Scrupilo was especially bothered. He hadn't expected to fire the cannons en route, but he had wanted to drill his troops more in the open. Officially, Strupilo was a council member and the Queen's chief engineer. Since his experiment with the cannon, he had insisted on the title Commander of Cannoneers. To Joanna, the engineer had always seemed curt and impatient. His members were almost always moving, with jerky abruptness. He spent almost as much time with the data set as the Queen of Peregrine Wickraxgar. Yet he had uh, very little interest in people-oriented subjects. He has a blindness for all but machines, Woodcarver once said of him. But that's how I made him. He's invented much, even before you came. Scrupilo has fallen in love with the cannons. For most packs, firing the thing was a painful experience. Since that first test, Scrupilo had fired at the things again and again, trying to improve the tubes, the powder, the inexplosive rounds. His fur was scored with dozens of powder burns. He claimed that nearby gun thunder cleared the mind, but almost everybody else agreed it made you daft. During rest stops, Scroop was a familiar figure, strutting up and down the line, haranguing his can cannoneers. He claimed even the shortest stop was an opportunity for training, since the real combat, uh, in real combat, speed would be essential. He had designed special e paulets based on Nior and Gunner's earmuffs. They didn't cover his low sound ears at all, but instead the forehead and shoulder tympana of his trigger member. Actually, tying the muffs down was a mind numbing thing to do, but for the moments right around firing it was worth it. Scrupilo wore his own muffs all the time, but unsnugged. They looked silly little they looked like silly little wings sticking out from his head and shoulders. He obviously thought the effect was raffish, and in fact his gunner crews also made the big thing of wearing the gear at all times. After a while, even Joanna could see that the drill was paying off. At least, they could swing the gun tubes around at an instant's notice, stuff them with fake powder and ball, and shout the tinish equivalent of bang. The army carried much more gunpowder than food. The packs were to live off the forest. Joanna had little experience with camping in an atmosphere. Were forests usually this rich? It was certainly nothing like the urban forests of Strom, where you needed a special license to walk off marked paths, and most of the wildlife were mechanical imitations of Nioran originals. This place was wilder than even the stories of Niora. After all, that world had been well settled before it fell to medievalism. The Tynes had never been civilized, had never spread cities across continents. Pilgrim guessed that there were fewer than thirty million packs in all the world. The Northwest was only beginning to be settled. Game was everywhere. In their hunting, the Tynes were like animals. Troopers raced through the underforest. The favorite hunt was one of sheer endurance, where the prey was chased until it stopped or until it dropped. That was rarely practical here, but they almost got they got almost as much pleasure from chasing the unwary into ambushes. Joanna didn't like it. Was this a medieval perversion, or a particularly tinish one peculiarly tinish one? If allowed the time, the troops didn't use their bows and knives. The pleasure of the hunt included slashing at throats and bellies with teeth and claws, not that the forest creatures were without defenses. For millions of years threat and counter threat had evolved here. Almost every animal could generate ultrasonic screeching that totally drowned the thought of any nearby pack. There were parts of the forest that seemed silent to Joanna, but through which the army drove at a cautious gallop, troops and drivers writhing in agony from the unseen assault. Some of the forest animals were more sophisticated. Twenty-five days out, the army was stuck trying to get across the biggest valley yet. In the middle, mostly hidden by the forest, a river flowed down to the western sea. The walls of these valleys were nothing Joanna had seen in the parks of Strom. If you took a cross-section at right angles to the river, the walls made a U-shape. They were cliff-like steep at the high edges, then became slopes, and finally a gentle plain where the river ran. That's how the ice gouges it, explained Woodcarver. These are places further up, there are places further up, where I've actually watched it happen. And she showed Joanna explanations in the data set. That was happening more and more. Pilgrim and Woodcarver, and sometimes even Scrupilo, seemed to know more of a child's modern education than Joanna. 
They had already been across a number of small valleys. Getting down the steep parts was always tedious, but so far the paths had been good. Vendacious took them to the edge of the latest valley. Woodcarver and Staff stood under the forest cover just short of the drop-off. Some meters back, Joanna sat, surrounded by a peregrine rickrack scar. The trees at this elevation reminded Joanna a little of pines. The leaves were narrow and sharp and lasted all year, but the bark was blistered white and the wood itself was pale blonde. Strangest of all were the flowers. They sprouted purple and violet from the exposed roots of the trees. Tyne's world had no analogue of honeybees, but there was constant motion among the flowers as thumb-sized mammals climbed from plant to plant. There were thousands of them, but they seemed to have no interest in anything except the flowers and the sweetness that oozed from them. She leaned back among the flowers and admired the view while the queen gobbled with vendacious. How many kilometers could you see from here? The air was as clear as she had even known it on Tyne's world. East and west the valley seemed to stretch forever. The river was a silver thread where it occasionally showed through the forest of the valley floor. Pilgrim nudged her with a nose and nodded toward the queen. Woodcarver was pointing this way and that way, over the drop-off. Argument is in the air. You want a translation? Yeah. Woodcarver doesn't like this path. Pilgrim's voice changed to the tone the queen used when speaking Sam Norsk. The path is completely exposed. Anyone on the other side can sit and count our every wagon, even from miles away. A mile is a fat kilometer. Vendacious whipped his heads around in that in indignant way of his. He gobbled something that Joanna knew was angry. Pilgrim chuckled and changed his voice to imitate the security chiefs. Your Majesty, my scouts have scoured the valley and far wall. There is no threat. You've done miracles, I know, but do you seriously claim to have covered that entire north face? That's five miles away, and I know from my youth that there are dozens of cavelets. You have those memories yourself. That stopped him, said Pilgrim, laughing. Come on, just translate. She was quite capable of interpreting body language and tone by now. Sometimes even the tinish chords made sense. Hmph, <laughs> okay. The queen hiked her baby packs around and sat down. Her tone became conciliatory. If this weather weren't so clear, or if there were night times, we might try it, but... You remember the old path, twenty miles inland from here? That should be overgrown by now, and the road coming back is... Gobble hiss from Vendacious, angry. I tell you, this is safe. We'll lose days on the other path. If we arrive late at Flensers, all my work will be for nothing. You must go forward here. Oops, Pilgrim whispered, unable to resist a little editorializing. Old Vendacious may have gone too far with that. The queen's heads arched back. Pilgrim's imitation of her human voice said, I understand your anxiety, pack of my blood, but we go forward where I say. If that is intolerable to you, I will regretfully accept your resignation. But you need me. Not that much. Joanna suddenly realized that the whole mission could fall apart right here, without a, even a shot being fired. Where would we be without Vendacious? She held her breath and watched the two packs. Parts of Vendacious walked in quick circles, stopping for angry instants to stare at Woodcarver. Finally, all his necks drop, drooped. Um, my apologies, your majesty. As long as you find me of use, I beg to continue in your service. Now Woodcarver relaxed, too. She reached to pet her puppies. They had responded with her mood, thrashing in their carriers and hissing. Forgiven. I want your independent advice, Vendacious. It has been miraculously good. Vendacious smiled weakly. I didn't think the jerk had it in him, Pilgrim said near Joanna's ear. It took two day arounds to reach the old path. As Woodcarver had predicted, it was overgrown. More, in places where there was no sign of the path at all, just young trees growing from slumped earth. It would take days to get down to the valley this side, the valley side this way. If Woodcarver had any misgivings about the decision, she didn't mention them to Joanna. The queen was six hundred years old. She talked often enough about the inflexibility of age. Now Joanna was getting a clear example of what that meant. When they came to a washout, trees were cut down and a bridge constructed on the spot. It took a day to get by each such spot. But progress was agonizingly slow, even where the path was still in place. No one rode in the carts now. The edge of the path had worn away, and the cartwheels sometimes turned on nothingness. On Joanna's right, she could look down at tree crowns, where there were a few meters from her feet. They ran into the wolves six days along the detour, when they had almost reached the valley floor. Wolves, that's what Pilgrim called them anyway. What Joanna saw looked like gerbils. They had just completed a kilometer stretch of easy going. Even under the trees they could feel the wind, dry and warm and moving ceaselessly down the valley. 
The last patches of snow between the trees were being sucked to nothingness, and there was a haze of smoke beyond the north wall of the valley. Joanna was walking alongside Woodcarver's cart. Pilgrim was about ten meters behind, chatting occasionally with them. The queen herself had been very quiet these last days. Suddenly there was a screech of tinish alarm from above them. A second later, Vendacious shouted from a hundred meters ahead. Through gaps in the trees, Joanna could see troopers on the next switchback above them, unlimbering crossbows, firing into the hillside above them. The sunlight came dappled through the forest cover, bringing plenty of light but in splotches that broke and moved as the soldiers hustled about. Chaos, but there were things that up there that weren't tines. Small, brown, or gray, they fitted through the, flitted through the shadows and the splotches of light. They swept up the hillside, coming upon the soldiers from the opposite direction that they were shooting. Turn around, turn around, Joanna screamed, but her voice was lost in the turmoil. Besides, who there could understand her? Olive Woodcarver was peering up at the battle. She grabbed Joanna's sleeve. You see something up there? Where? Joanna stuttered an explanation, but now Pilgrim had seen something too. His gobbled shouting came loud over the battle. He raced back up the trail to where Scrupilo was trying to get a cannon unlimbered. Joanna, help me! Woodcarver hesitated, then said, Yes, it may be that bad. Help with the cannon, Joanna. It was only fifty meters to the gun cart, but uphill. She ran. Something heavy smashed into the path just behind her. Part of a soldier. It twisted and screamed. Half a dozen gerbil-sized hunks of fur were attached to the body, and its pelt was streaked with red. Another member fell past her. Another. Joanna stumbled, but kept running. Wickraxgar was standing heads together just a few meters from Scrupilo. He was armed in every adult member, mouth knives and steel tines. He waved Joanna down next to him. We run on a nest of... of wolves. His speech was awkward, slurred. Must we be between here and the path above? A lump, like a little castle tower. Gotta kill Nest. Can you see? Evidently he could not. He was looking all over. Joanna looked back up at the hillside. There seemed to be less fighting now, just sounds of tinish agony. Joanna pointed. You mean there, that dark thing? Pilgrim didn't answer. His members were twitching, his mouth knives waving randomly. She leaped away from the flashing metal. He had already cut himself. Sound attack. She looked back along the path. She'd had more than a year to know the packs, and what she was seeing now was madness. Some packs were exploding, racing in all directions to distances where th thought couldn't possibly be sustained. Others, Woodcarver on her cart, huddled in heaps, with scarcely a head showing. Just beyond the nearest uphill trees, she could see a gray tide.